preface of the bishop's secret this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by david wales the bishop's secret by fergus hume preface in his earlier works notably in the mystery of a handsome cab and the silent house in pimlico mr hume won a reputation second to none for plot of the stirring ingenious misleading and finely surprising kind and for working out his plot in vigorous and picturesque english in the bishop's secret while there is no falling off in plot and style there is a welcome and marvellous broadening out as to the cast of characters representing an unusually wide range of typical men and women these are not laboriously described by the author but are made to reveal themselves in action and speech in a way that has for the reader all the charm of personal intercourse with living people mr hume's treatment of the peculiar and exclusive ecclesiastical society of a small english cathedral city is quite worthy of anthony trollope and his leading character bishop pendle is equal to trollope's best bishop the rev mr cargram the bishop's poor and most unworthy protege is a meaner uriah heep mrs pansey is the embodiment of all shrewishness and yields unlimited amusement the gipsies are genuine such as george borrow himself would have pictured them not the ignorant caricatures so frequently drawn by writers too lazy to study their subject besides these types there are several which seem to have had no exact prototypes in preceding fiction such are dr graham the man with the scar the mosque family father mother and daughter gabriel pendle miss winchelow and last but not least mr baltic a detective so unique in character and methods as to make conan doyle turn green with envy all in all this story is so rich in the essential elements of worthy fiction in characterization exciting adventure suggestions of the marvellous wit humour pathos and just enough of tragedy that it is offered to the american public in all confidence that it will be generally and heartily welcomed the publishers end of preface Chapter One of The Bishop's Secret by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter One Enter Mrs. Pansy as Chorus. Of late years, an anonymous mathematician has declared that in the British Isles the female population is seven times greater than the male. Therefore, in these days is fulfilled the scriptural prophecy that seven women shall lay hold of one man and entreat to be called by his name miss daisy norsham a veteran belgravian spinster decided after some disappointing seasons that this text was particularly applicable to london doubtful therefore of securing a husband at the rate of one chance in seven or dissatisfied at the prospect of a seventh share in a man she resolved upon trying her matrimonial fortunes in the country she was plain this lady as she was poor nor could she rightly be said to be in the first flush of maidenhood in all matters other than that of man-catching she was shallow past belief still she did hope by dint of some brisk campaigning in the diocese of borminster to capture a whole man unto herself her first step was to wheedle an invitation out of mrs pansey an archdeacon's widow then on a philanthropic visit to town and she arrived towards the end of july in the pleasant cathedral city of Berminster, in time to attend a reception at the bishop's palace thus the autumn manoeuvres of miss norsham opened most auspiciously mrs pansey with whom this elderly worshipper of hymen had elected to stay during her visit was a gruff woman with a scowl who looked all nose and eyebrows few ecclesiastical matrons were so well known in the diocese of Berminster as was mrs pansey not many it must be confessed were so ardently hated for there were few pies indeed in which this dear lady had not a finger few keyholes through which her eye did not peer her memory and her tongue severally and combined had ruined half the reputations in the county in short she was a renowned social bully and like most bullies she gained her ends by scaring the lives out of meeker and better-bred people than herself 
these latter feared her scenes as she rejoiced in them and as she knew the pasts of her friends from their cradle upwards she usually contrived by a pitiless use of her famous memory to put to rout any one so ill-advised as to attempt a stand against her domineering authority when her tall gaunt figure invariably arrayed in the blackest of black silks was sighted in a room those present either scuttled out of the way or judiciously held their peace for every one knew mrs pansey's talent for twisting the simplest observation into some evil shape calculated to get its author into trouble she excelled in this particular method of making mischief possessed of ample means and ample leisure both of these helped her materially to build up her reputation of a philanthropic bully she literally swooped down upon the poor taking one and all in charge to be fed physicked worked and guided according to her own ideas in return for benefits conferred she demanded an unconditional surrender of free will nobody was to have an opinion but mrs pansey nobody knew what was good for them unless their ideas coincided with those of their patroness which they never did mrs pansey had never been a mother yet in her own opinion there was nothing about children she did not know she had not studied medicine therefore she dubbed the doctors a pack of fools saying she could cure where they failed be they tinkers tailors soldiers sailors mrs pansey invariably knew more about their vocations than they themselves did or were ever likely to do in short this celebrated lady for her reputation was more than local was what the american so succinctly terms a she-boss and in a less enlightened age she would indubitably have been ducked in the burfleet river as a meddlesome scolding clattering jade indeed had any one been so brave as to ignore the flight of time and thus suppress her the righteousness of the act would most assuredly have remained unquestioned now as miss norsham wanted for her own purposes to know the ropes she was fortunate to come within the gloom of mrs pansey's silken robes for mrs pansey certainly knew every one if she did not know everything and whomsoever she chaperoned had to be received by Berminster society whether Berminster society liked it or not all protégés of mrs pansey sheltered under the aegis of her terrible reputation and woe to the daring person who did not accept them as the most charming the cleverest and in every way the most desirable of their sex but in the memory of man no one had ever sustained battle against mrs pansey and so this feminine selkirk remained monarch of all she surveyed and ruled over a community consisting mainly of canons vicars and curates with their respective wives and offsprings there were times when her subjects made use of language not precisely ecclesiastic and not infrequently mrs pansey's name was mentally included in the commination service thus it chanced that daisy the spinster found herself in mrs pansey's carriage on her way to the episcopalian reception extremely well pleased with herself her dress her position and her social guardian angel the elder lady was impressively gloomy in her usual black silk fashioned after the early victorian mode when elegance invariably gave place to utility her headgear dated back to the later georgian epoch it consisted mainly of a gauze turban twinkling with jet ornaments her bosom was defended by a cuirass of cold-looking steel beads finished off at the throat by a gigantic brooch containing the portrait and hair of the late archdeacon her skirts were lengthy and voluminous so that they swept the floor with a creepy rustle like the frou-frou of a brocaded spectre she wore black silk mittens and on either bony wrist a band of black velvet clasped with a large cameo set hideously in pale gold thus attired a veritable caricature by leech this survival of a prehistoric age sat rigidly upright and mangled the reputations of all and sundry miss norsham in all but age was very modern indeed her neck was lean her arms were thin she made up for lack of quality by display of quantity in her decollete costume she appeared as if composed of bones and diamonds the diamonds represented the bulk of miss norsham's wealth 
and she used them not only for the adornment of her uncomely person but for the deception of any possible suitor into the belief that she was well dowered she affected gauzy fabrics and fluttering baby ribbons so that her dress was as the fleecy flakes of snow clinging to a well-preserved ruin for the rest she had really beautiful eyes a somewhat elastic mouth and a straight nose well powdered to gloss over its chronic redness her teeth were genuine and she cultivated what society novelists term silvery peals of laughter in every way she accentuated or obliterated nature in her efforts to render herself attractive ichabod was writ large on her powdered brow and it needed no great foresight to foresee the speedy approach of acidulated spinsterhood but to do her justice this regrettable state of single blessedness was far from being her own fault if her good fortune had but equalled her courage and energy she should have relinquished celibacy years ago oh dear dear mrs pansey said the younger lady strong in adjectives and interjections and reduplications of both is the bishop very very sweet oh, he's sweet enough as bishops go growled mrs pansey in her deep-toned voice he might be better and he might be worse there is too much popish superstition and worship of idols about him for my taste if the departed can smell added the lady with an illustrative sniff the late archdeacon must turn in his grave when those priests of baal and dagon burn incense at the morning service still bishop pendle has his good points although he is a time-server and a sycophant is he one of the lancashire pendles dear mrs pansey a twenty-fifth cousin or thereabouts he says he is a nearer relation but i know much more about it than he does if you want an ornamental bishop with good legs for gaiters and a portly figure for an apron dr pendle's the man but as a god-fearing priest with a groan a simple worshipper groan and a lowly repentant sinner groan he leaves much much to be desired oh mrs pansey the dear bishop a sinner why not cried mrs pansey ferociously aren't we all miserable sinners dr pendle's a human worm just as you are as i am you may dress him in lawn sleeves and a mitre and make pagan genuflections before his throne but he is only a worm for all that what about his wife asked daisy to avert further expansion of this text a poor thing my dear with a dilated heart and not as much blood in her body as would fill a thimble she ought to be in a hospital and would be too if i had my way lolling all day long on a sofa and taking glasses of champagne between doses of iron and extract of beef then giving receptions and wearing herself out how he ever came to marry the white-faced doll i can't imagine she was a mrs creek when she caught him oh really a widow of course of course you don't suppose she's a bigamist even though he's a fool do you and the eyebrows went up and down in the most alarming manner and the bishop he was a london curate then married her some eight and twenty years ago and i dare say he has repented of it ever since they have three children george with a whisk of her fan at the mention of each name who is a good-looking idiot in a line regiment gabriel a curate as white-faced as his mother and no doubt afflicted as she is with heart trouble he was in whitechapel but his father put him in a curacy here it was sheer nepotism and then there is lucy she is the best of the bunch which is not saying much they've engaged her to young sir harry brace and now they are giving this reception to celebrate having inveigled him into the match engaged sighed the fair daisy enviously oh do tell me if this girl is really really pretty hm said the eyebrows a pale washed-out rag of a creature but what can you expect from such a mother no brains no style no conversation always a simpering weak-eyed rag baby oh my dear what fools men are ah you may well say that dear mrs pansey assented the spinster thinking wrathfully of this unknown girl who had succeeded where she had failed is it a very very good match 
ten thousand a year and a fine estate my dear sir harry is a nice young fellow but a fool an absentee landlord too grumbled mrs pansey resentfully always running over the world poking his nose into what doesn't concern him like the wandering jew or the flying dutchman ah my dear husbands are not what they used to be the late archdeacon never left his fireside while i was there i knew better than to let him go to paris or pekin or some of those sinks of iniquity cook and gaze indeed snorted mrs pansey indignantly i would abolish them by act of parliament they turn men into so many satans walking to and fro upon the earth oh the immorality of these latter days no wonder the end of all things is predicted miss norsham paid little attention to the latter portion of this diatribe as sir harry brace was out of the matrimonial market it conveyed no information likely to be of use to her in the coming campaign she wished to be informed as to the number and the names of eligible men and forewarned with regard to possible rivals and who is really and truly the most beautiful girl in beorminster she asked abruptly mab arden replied mrs pansey promptly there now with an emphatic blow of her fan she is pretty if you like though i dare say there is more art than nature about her who is mab arden dear mrs pansey she is miss whichello's niece that's who she is whichello oh good gracious me what a very very funny name is miss whichello a foreigner foreigner bah cried mrs pansey like a stentorian ram she belongs to a good old english family and in my opinion she disgraces them thoroughly a meddlesome old maid who wants to foist her niece on to george pendle and she's likely to succeed too added the lady rubbing her nose with a vexed air for the young ass is in love with mab although she is three years older than he is mr cargram also likes the girl though i dare say it is money with him really mr cargram yes he is the bishop's chaplain a jesuit in disguise i call him with his moping and mowing and sneaky ways butter wouldn't melt in his mouth oh dear no i gave my opinion about him pretty plainly to dr graham i can tell you and graham's the only man with brains in this city of fools is dr graham young asked miss norsham in the faint hope that mrs pansey's list of inhabitants might include a wealthy bachelor young he's sixty if you call that young and in his second childhood an atheist too tom paine colonel ingersoll viscount amberley those are his gods the pagan i'd burn him on a tar-barrel if i had my way it's a pity we don't stick to some customs of our ancestors oh dear me are there no young men at all plenty and all idiots brainless officers whose wives would have to ride on a baggage wagon silly young squires whose ideal of womanhood is a brazen barmaid and simpering curates put into the church as the fools of their respective families i don't know what men are coming to groaned mrs pansey the late archdeacon was clever and pious he honoured and obeyed me as the marriage service says a man should do i was the light of the dear man's eyes had mrs pansey stated that she had been the terror of the late archdeacon's life she would have been vastly nearer the truth but such a remark never occurred to her although she had bullied and badgered the wretched little man until he had seized the first opportunity of finding in the grave the peace denied him in life she really and truly believed that she had been a model wife the egotism of first person singular was so firmly ingrained in the woman that she could not conceive what a scourge she was to mankind in general what a trial she had been to her poor departed husband in particular if the late archdeacon pansey had not died he would doubtless have become a missionary to some cannibal tribe in the south seas in the hope that his tough helpmate would be converted into long pig but unluckily for beorminster he was dead and his relict was a mourning widow who constantly referred to her victim as a perfect husband and yet mrs pansey considered that anthony trollope's celebrated mrs prouty was an overdrawn character as to miss norsham she was in the depths of despair 
for if mrs pansey was to be believed there was no eligible husband for her in beorminster it was with a heavy heart that the spinster entered the palace and it was with the courage born of desperation that she perked up and smiled on the gay crowd she found within End of chapter one chapter two of the bishop's secret by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two the bishop is wanted the episcopalian residence situate some distance from the city was a medieval building enshrined in the remnant of a royal chaise and in its perfect quiet and loneliness resembled the palace of the sleeping beauty its composite architecture was of many centuries and many styles for bishop after bishop had pulled down portions and added others had levelled a tower here and erected a wing there until the result was a jumble of diverse designs incongruous but picturesque time had mellowed the various parts into one rich coloured whole of perfect beauty and elevated on a green rise surrounded by broad stone terraces with towers and oriels and turrets and machicolated battlements clothed with ivy buried amid ancient trees it looked like the realization of a poet's dream only long ages and many changing epochs only home-loving prelates ample monies and architects of genius could have created so beautiful and unique a fabric it was the admiration of transatlantic tourists with a twang the desire of millionaires aladdin's industrious genie would have failed to build such a masterpiece unless their masters had arranged to inhabit it five centuries or so after construction time had created it as time would destroy it but at present it was in perfect preservation and figured in steel plate engravings as one of the stately homes of england no wonder the mitre of Berminster was a coveted prize when its gainer could dwell in so noble and matchless a mansion as the present prelate was an up-to-date bishop abreast of his time and fond of his creature comforts the interior of the palace was modernized completely in accordance with the luxurious demands of nineteenth-century civilization the stately reception-rooms thrown open on this night to what the Berminster weekly chronicle strong in foreign tongues tautologically called the elite and creme de la creme of the diocese were brilliantly illuminated by electric lamps and furnished magnificently throughout in keeping with their palatial appearance the ceilings were painted in the italian style with decently clothed olympian deities the floors were of parquetry polished so highly and reflecting so truthfully that the guests seemed to be walking in some magical way upon still water noble windows extending from floor to roof were draped with purple curtains and stood open to the quiet moonlit world without between these tall mirrors flashed back gems and colours moving figures and floods of amber radiance and enhanced by reduplicated reflections the size of the rooms amid all this splendour of warmth and tents and light moved the numerous guests of the bishop almost every invitation had been accepted for the receptions at the palace were on a large and liberal scale particularly as regards eating and drinking dr pendle in addition to his official salary possessed a handsome income and spent it in the lavish style of a cardinal wolsey he was wise enough to know how the outward and visible signs of prosperity and dignity affect the popular imagination and frequently invited the clergy and laity to feast at the table of mother church to show that she could dispense loaves and fishes with the best and vie with court and society in the splendour and hospitality of her entertainments as he approved of an imposing ritual at the cathedral so he affected a magnificent way of living at the palace mrs pansey and many others declared that dr pendle's aims in that direction were romish perhaps they were but he could scarcely have followed a better example since the church of peter owes much of its power to a judicious employment of riches and ritual and a dexterous gratification of the lust of the eye the anglican church is more dignified now than she was in the days of the georges and very rightly too since god's ministers should not be the poorest or meanest of men naturally as the host was clerical and the building ecclesiastical the clergy predominated at this entertainment the bishop and the dean were the only prelates of their rank present 
but there were archdeacons and canons and rectors and a plentiful supply of curates all in their own opinion bishops in embryo the shape and expression of the many faces were various ascetic worldly pale red round thin fat oval each one revealed the character of its owner some lean bent forms were those of men filled with the fire of religion for its own sake others stout jolly gentlemen in comfortable livings loved the loaves and fishes of the church as much as her precepts the descendants of friar tuck and the vicar of bray were here as well as those who would have been wycliffe's and latimer's had the fires of smithfield still been alight obsequious curates bowed down to pompous prebendaries bluff rectors chatted on cordial terms with suave archdeacons and in the fold of the church there were no black sheep on this great occasion the shepherds and pastors of the burminster flock were polite entertaining amusing and not too masterful so that the general air was quite arcadian the laity also formed a strong force there were lords magnificently condescending to commoners m p s who talked politics and m p s who had had enough of that sort of thing at st stephen's and didn't hearty squires from adjacent county seats prim bankers with whom the said squires were anxious to be on good terms since they were the priests of mammon officers from near garrison towns gay and light-hearted who had devoted themselves to the fairer portion of the company and a sprinkling of barristers literary men hardy explorers and such like minnows among tritons last but not least the mayor of burminster was present and posed as a modern whittington half commercial wealth half municipal dignity if some envious anarchist had exploded a dynamite bomb in the vicinity of the palace on that night the greatest the most intellectual the richest people of the county would have come to an untimely end and then the realm of england like the people themselves would have gone to pieces the burminster chronicle reporter also present with a flimsy book and a restless little pencil worked up this idea on the spot into a glowing paragraph very ungallantly the ladies have been left to the last but now the last shall be first although it is difficult to do the subject justice the matrons of surrounding parishes the ladies of burminster society the damsels of town and country were all present in their best attire chattering and smiling and becking and bowing after the observant and diplomatic ways of their sex such white shoulders such pretty faces such parisian toilettes such dresses of obviously home manufacture never were seen in one company the married ladies whispered scandal behind their fans and in a christian spirit shot out the lip of scorn at their social enemies the young maidens sought for marriageable men and lurked in darkish corners for the better ensnaring of impressionable males cupid unseen mingled in the throng and shot his arrows right and left not always with the best result as many post-nuptial experiences showed there was talk of the gentle art of needlework of the latest bazaar and the agreeable address delivered thereat by mr cargram the epicene pastime of lawn tennis was touched upon and ardent young persons discussed how near they could go to giant pope's cave without getting into the clutches of its occupant the young men talked golfing parish work horses church male millinery polo and shooting the young ladies chatted about paris fashions and provincial adaptations thereof the london season the latest engagement and the necessity of reviving the flirtatious game of croquet black coats coloured dresses flashing jewels many-hued flowers the restless crowd resembled a bed of gaudy tulips tossed by the wind and all this chattering laughing clattering glittering mass of well-bred well-groomed humanity moved and swayed and gyrated under the white glare of the electric lamps herbs in Rus, belgravia in the provinces vanity fair amid the cornfields no wonder this entertainment of bishop and mrs pendle was the event of the burminster year like an agreeable jupiter amid adoring mortals the bishop with his chaplain in attendance moved through the rooms bestowing a word here a smile there and a hearty welcome on all a fine-looking man was the bishop of burminster 
as stately in appearance as any prelate drawn by du Maurier. He was over six feet, and carried himself in a soldierly fashion, as became a leader of the church militant. His legs were all that could be desired to fill out Episcopalian gaiters, and his bland, clean-shaven face beamed with smiles and benignity. But Bishop Pendle was not the mere figurehead Mrs. Pansy's malice declared him to be. He had great administrative powers, great organizing capabilities, and controlled his diocese in a way which did equal credit to his heart and head. As he chatted with his guests and did the honors of the palace, he seemed to be the happiest of men and well worthy of his exalted post. With a splendid position, a charming wife, a fine family, an obedient flock of clergy and laity, the bishop's lines were cast in pleasant places. There was not even the proverbial crumpled rose-leaf to render uncomfortable the bed he had made for himself. He was like an ecclesiastical Jacob, blessed above all men. "'Well, Bishop,' said Dr. Graham, a meagre sceptic, who did not believe in the endurance of human felicity, "'I congratulate you.' "'On my daughter's engagement?' asked the prelate, smiling pleasantly. "'On everything. Your position, your family, your health, your easy conscience.' all is too smooth too well with you it can't last your lordship it can't last and the doctor shook his bald head as no doubt solon did at croesus when he snubbed that too fortunate monarch i am indeed blessed in the condition of life to which god has been pleased to call me oh, no doubt no doubt but remember polycrates bishop and throw your ring into the sea my dear dr graham said the bishop rather stiffly i do not believe in such paganism god has blessed me beyond my deserts no doubt and i thank him in all reverence for his kindly care hm hm muttered graham shaking his head when men thank fortune for her gifts she usually turns her back on them i am no believer in such superstitions doctor well well bishop you have tempted the gods let us see what they will do gods or god doctor demanded the bishop with magnificent displeasure oh, whichever you like my lord whichever you like the bishop was nettled and rather chilled by this pessimism he felt that it was his duty as a churchman to administer a rebuke but dr graham's pagan views were well known and a correction however dexterously administered would only lead to an argument a controversy with graham was no joke as he was as subtle as socrates in discovering and attacking his adversary's weak points so not judging the present a fitting occasion to risk a fall the bishop smoothed away an incipient frown and blandly smiling moved on followed by his chaplain graham looked grimly after this modern cardinal wolsey i have never soliloquized the sceptic i have never known a man without his skeleton i wonder if you have one my lord you look cheerful you seem thoroughly happy but you are too fortunate if you have not a skeleton now i feel convinced you will have to build a cupboard for one shortly you thank blind fortune under the alias of god well well we shall see the result of your thanks wolsey napoleon bismarck they all fell when most prosperous hm 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 dr graham had no reason to make this speech beyond his belief founded upon experience that calms were always succeeded by storms at present the bishop stood under a serene sky and in no quarter could graham descry the gathering of the tempest he prophesied but for all that he had a premonition that evil days were at hand and sceptic as he was he could not shake off the uneasy feeling his mother had been a highland woman and the celt is said to be gifted with second sight perhaps graham inherited the maternal gift of forecasting the future for he glanced ominously at the stately form of his host and shook his head he thought the bishop was too confident of continuous sunshine in the meantime dr pendle quite free from such forebodings unfortunately came within speaking distance of mrs pansey who in her bell of st paul's voice was talking to a group of meek listeners daisy norsham had long ago seized upon gabriel pendle and was chatting with him on the edge of the circle quite heedless of her chaperon's monologue 
when mrs pansey saw the bishop she swooped down on him before he could get out of the way which he would have done had courtesy permitted it mrs pansey was the one person dr pendle dreaded and if the late archdeacon had been alive he would have encouraged the missionary project with all his heart to every man his own fear mrs pansey was the bishop's bishop cried the lady in her most impressive archdiaconal manner about that public house the derby winner it must be removed cargrim who was deferentially smiling at his lordship's elbow cast a swift glance at gabriel when he heard mrs pansey's remark he had a belief founded upon spying that gabriel knew too much about the public house mentioned which was in his district and this belief was strengthened when he saw the young man start at the sound of the name instinctively he kept his eyes on gabriel's face which looked disturbed and anxious too much so for social requirements it must be removed repeated the bishop gently and why mrs pansey why bishop you ask why because it is a hotbed of vice and betting and gambling that's why but i really cannot see i have not the power it's near the cathedral too interrupted mrs pansey whose manners left much to be desired scandalous when god erects a house of prayer the devil builds a chapel there isn't it your duty to eradicate plague spots bishop before dr pendle could answer this rude question a servant approached and spoke in a whisper to his master the bishop looked surprised a man to see me at this hour at this time said he repeating the message aloud who is he what is his name i don't know your lordship he refused to give his name but he insists upon seeing your lordship at once i can't see him said the bishop sharply let him call to-morrow my lord he says it is a matter of life and death dr pendle frowned most unbecoming language he murmured perhaps it may be as well to humour him where is he in the entrance hall your lordship take him into the library and say i will see him shortly most unusual said the bishop to himself then added aloud mrs pansey i am called away for a moment pray excuse me we must talk about the derby winner later on said mrs pansey determinedly oh yes that is uh, really I'll, I'll see shall i accompany your lordship murmured cargrim officiously no mr cargrim it is not necessary i must see this man as he speaks so strongly but i dare say he is only some pertinacious person who thinks that a bishop should be at the complete disposal of the public the exacting public with this somewhat petulant speech dr pendle walked away not sorry to find an opportunity of slipping out of a noisy argument with mrs pansey that lady's departing words were that she should expect him back in ten minutes to settle the question of the derby winner or rather to hear how she intended to settle it cargrim pleased at being left behind since it gave him a chance of watching gabriel urged mrs pansey to further discussion of the question and had the satisfaction of seeing that such discussion visibly disconcerted the curate and dr pendle in all innocence he left the reception rooms to speak with his untoward visitor in the library but although he knew it not he was entering upon a dark and tortuous path the end of which he was not destined to see for many a long day dr graham's premonition was likely to prove true for in the serene sky under which the bishop had moved for so long a tempest was gathering fast he should have taken the doctor's advice and have sacrificed his ring like polycrates but as in the case of that old pagan the gods might have tossed back the gift and pursued their relentless aims the bishop had no thoughts like these as yet he had no skeleton but the man in the library was about to open a cupboard and let out its grisly tenant to haunt prosperous bishop pendle to him as to all men evil had come at the appointed hour End of chapter two chapter three of the bishop's secret by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three the unforeseen happens i fear said cargrim with a gentle sigh i fear you are right about that public-house mrs pansey 
the chaplain made this remark to renew the discussion and if possible bring gabriel into verbal conflict with the lady he had a great idea of managing people by getting them under his thumb and so far quite deserved mrs pansey's epithet of a jesuit of late as cargrim knew by a steady use of his pale blue eyes the curate had been visiting the derby winner ostensibly on parochial business connected with the ill health of mrs mosk the landlord's wife but there was a handsome daughter of the invalid who acted as barmaid and gabriel was a young and inflammable man so putting this and that together the chaplain thought he discovered the germs of a scandal hence his interest in mrs pansey's proposed reforms right echoed the archdiaconal widow loudly of course i am right the derby winner is a nest of hawks william mosk would have disgraced heathen rome in its worst days as for his daughter well and mrs pansey threw a world of horror into the ejaculation miss mosk is a well-conducted young lady said gabriel growing red and injudicious lady bellowed mrs pansey shaking her fan and since when have brazen painted barmaids become ladies mr pendle she is most attentive to her sick mother protested the curate wincing no doubt sir i presume even jezebel had some redeeming qualities rubbish humbug don't tell me can good come out of nazareth good did come out of nazareth mrs pansey that is enough mr pendle do not pollute young ears with blasphemy and you the son of a bishop the curate of a parish remember what is to be the portion of mockers sir what happened to the men who threw stones at david oh but really dear mrs pansey you know mr pendle is not throwing stones people who live in glass houses dare not my dear i doubt your interest in this young person mr pendle she is one who tires her head and paints her face lying in wait for comely youths that she may destroy them she excuse me mrs pansey cried gabriel with an angry look you speak too freely and too ignorantly the derby winner is a well-conducted house for mrs mosk looks after it personally and her daughter is an excellent young woman i do not defend the father but i hope to bring him to a sense of his errors in time there is a charity which thinketh no evil mrs pansey and with great heat gabriel forgetting his manners walked off without taking leave of either the lady or miss norsham mrs pansey tossed her turban and snorted but seeing very plainly that she had gone too far held for once her virulent tongue cargrim rubbed his hands and laughed softly our young friend talks warmly mrs pansey the natural chivalry of youth my dear lady nothing more i'll make it my business to assure myself that it is nothing more said mrs pansey in low tones i fear very much that the misguided young man has fallen into the lures of this daughter of heath do you know anything about her mr cargrim too wise to commit himself to speech the chaplain cast up his pale eyes and looked volumes this was quite enough for mrs pansey she scented evil like a social vulture and taking cargrim's arm dragged him away to find out all the bad she could about the derby winner and its too attractive barmaid left to herself miss norsham seized upon dean alder to whom she had been lately introduced and played with the artillery of her eyes on that unattractive churchman mr dean was old and wizen but he was unmarried and rich so miss norsham thought it might be worth her while to play vivian to this clerical merlin his weak point speedily discovered was archaeology and she was soon listening to a dry description of his researches into Burminster municipal chronicles but it was desperately hard work to fix her attention Burminster explained the pedantic dean not unmoved by his listener's artificial charms is derived from two anglo-saxon words brr a hill and minster the church of a monastery anciently our city was called burminster the church of the hill for as you can see my dear young lady our cathedral is built on the top of a considerable rise and thence gained its name the townsfolk were formerly vassals and even serfs of the monastery which was destroyed by henry the eighth 
but the reformation brought about by that king put an end to the abbot's power the head of the Burminster monastery was a mitred abbot and bishop pendle is a mitred bishop interposed the fair daisy to show the quickness of her understanding and thereby displaying her ignorance all bishops are mitred said dr alder testily a crozier and a mitre are the symbols of their high office but the romish abbots of Burminster were not bishops although they were mitred prelates oh how very very amusing cried daisy suppressing a yawn and the name of the river dear mr dean does burfleet mean the church of the hill too certainly not miss norsham fleet formerly fleet is a scandinavian word and signifies a flood a stream a channel burfleet or as we now erroneously call it burfleet means in the vulgar tongue the flood or stream of the hill even in normandy the word flit has been corrupted for the town now called harfleur was formerly correctly designated as haverflit but i am afraid you find this information dull miss norsham this last remark was occasioned by daisy yawning it is true that she held a fan and had politely hidden her mouth when yawning unfortunately the fan was of transparent material and daisy quite forgot that mr dean could see the yawn which he certainly did in some confusion she extricated herself from an awkward situation by protesting that she was not tired but hungry and suggested that dr alder should continue his instructive conversation at supper mollified by this dexterous evasion which he saw no reason to disbelieve the dean politely escorted his companion to the regions of champagne and chicken both of which aided the lady to sustain further doses of dry as dust facts dug out of a monastic past by the persevering dr alder it was in this artful fashion that the town mouse strove to ensnare the church mouse and succeeded so well that when mr dean went home to his lonely house he concluded that it was just as well the monastic institution of celibacy had been abolished on leaving mrs pansey in disgust gabriel proceeded with considerable heat into the next room where his mother held her court as hostess mrs pendle was a pale slight small-framed woman with golden hair languid eyes and a languid manner owing to her delicate health she could not stand for any length of time and therefore occupied a large and comfortable armchair her daughter lucy who resembled her closely in looks but who had more colour in her face stood near at hand talking to her lover both ladies were dressed in white silk with few ornaments and looked more like sisters than mother and daughter certainly mrs pendle appeared surprisingly young to be the parent of a grown-up family but her continuance of youth was not due to art as mrs pansey averred but to the quiet and undisturbed life which her frail health compelled her to lead the bishop was tenderly attached to her and even at this late stage of their married life behaved towards her more like a lover than a husband he warded off all worries and troubles from her he surrounded her with pleasant people and made her life luxurious and peaceful by every means obtainable in the way of money and influence it was no wonder that mrs pendle treading the primrose path with a devoted and congenial companion appeared still young she looked as fair and fragile as a peri and as free from mortal cares is that you gabriel she said in a low soft voice smiling gently on her younger and favourite son you look disturbed my dear boy mrs pansey said gabriel and considering that the name furnished all necessary information sat down near his mother and took one of her delicate hands in his own to smooth and fondle oh indeed mrs pansey echoed the bishop's wife smiling still more and with a slight shrug cast an amused look at lucy who in her turn caught sir harry's merry eyes and laughed outright old catamaran said brace loudly oh harry hush interposed lucy with an anxious glance you shouldn't why not but for the present company i would say something much stronger oh i wish you would said gabriel easing his stiff collar with one finger my cloth forbids me to abuse mrs pansey properly what has she been doing now gabriel ordering the bishop to have the derby winner removed mother the derby winner 
repeated mrs pendle in puzzled tones is that a horse a public-house mother it is in my district and i have been lately visiting the wife of the landlord who is very ill mrs pansey wants the house closed and the woman turned out into the streets so far as i can make out the derby winner is my property said sir harry bluffly and it shan't be shut up for a dozen mrs pansies oh, think of a dozen mrs pansies murmured lucy pensively think of bedlam and pandemonium my dear thank goodness mrs pansey is the sole specimen of her kind nature broke the mould when that clacking nuisance was turned out she harry you really must not speak so loud mrs pansey might hear come with me dear i must look after our guests for i am sure mother is tired i am tired assented mrs pendle with a faint sigh thank you lucy i willingly make you my representative gabriel will stay beside me here is miss tancred observed harry brace in an undertone oh she must not come near mother whispered lucy in alarm take her to the supper-room harry but she'll tell me the story of how she lost her purse at the army and navy stores lucy you can bear hearing it better than mother can besides she'll not finish it she never does sir harry groaned but like an obedient lover intercepted a withered old dame who was the greatest bore in the town she usually told a digressive story about a lost purse but hitherto had never succeeded in getting to the point if there was one accepting the suggestion of supper with alacrity she drifted away on sir harry's arm and no doubt mentioned the famous purse before he managed to fill her mouth and stop her prosing lucy who had a quiet humour of her own in spite of her demure looks laughed at the dejection and martyrdom of sir harry and taking the eagerly proffered arm of a callow lieutenant ostentatiously and hopelessly in love with her went away to play her part of deputy hostess she moved from group to group and everywhere received smiles and congratulations for she was a general favourite and with the exception of mrs pansey every one approved of her engagement behind a floral screen a band of musicians who called themselves the yellow hungarians and individually possessed the most unpronounceable names played the last waltz a smooth swinging melody which made the younger guests long for a dance in fact the callow lieutenant boldly suggested that a waltz should be attempted with himself and lucy to set the example but his companion snubbed him unmercifully for his boldness and afterwards restored his spirits by taking him to the supper-room here they found miss tancred in the full flow of her purse story so lucy having pity on her lover bestowed her escort on the old lady as a listener and enjoyed supper at an isolated table with sir harry the sucking wellington could have murdered brace with pleasure and very nearly did murder miss tancred for he plied her so constantly with delicacies that she got indigestion and was thereby unable to finish about the purse gabriel and his mother were not long left alone for shortly there approached a brisk old lady daintily dressed who looked like a fairy godmother she had a keen face bright eyes like those of a squirrel and in gesture and walk and glance was as restless as that animal this piece of alacrity was miss winchelow who was the aunt of mab arden the beloved of george pendle mab was with her and gracious and tall looked as majestic as any queen as she paced in her stately manner by the old lady's side her beauty was that of juno for she was imperial and a trifle haughty in her manner with dark hair dark eyes and dark complexion she looked like an oriental princess quite different in appearance to her apple-cheeked silvery-haired aunt there was something jewish about her rich eastern beauty and she might have been painted in her yellow dress as esther or rebecca or even as jael who slew sisera on the going down of the sun well good folks said the brisk little lady in a brisk little voice and how are you both tired mrs pendle of course what else can you expect with late hours and your delicacies i don't believe in these social gatherings your presence here contradicts that assertion said gabriel giving up his chair oh i am a martyr to duty i came because mab must be amused 
I only hope she is not disappointed,' said Mrs Pendle, kindly, for she knew how things were between her eldest son and the girl. "'I am sorry George is not here, my dear.' Well, "'I did not expect him to be,' replied Mab, in her grave contralto voice, and with a blush. "'He told me that he would not be able to get leave from his colonel.' "'Ah, his colonel knows what is good for young men,' cried Miss Whichello. "'Work and diet both in moderate quantities. "'My dear Mrs. Pendle, if you only saw those people in the supper-room, "'simply digging their graves with their teeth, "'I pity the majority of them to-morrow morning.' "'Have you had supper, Miss Winchelow?' asked Gabriel. "'Oh, yes, a biscuit and a glass of weak whisky and water. Quite enough, too. Mab here has been drinking champagne. Recklessly.' "'Only half a glass, aunt. Don't take away my character.' "'My dear, if you take half a glass, you may as well finish the bottle for the harm it does you. Champagne is poison. Much or little, it is rank poison.' come away miss arden and let us poison ourselves suggested the curate it wouldn't do you any harm mrs pendle cried the little old lady you are too pale and champagne in your case would pick you up iron and slight stimulants are what you need i am afraid you are not careful what you eat i am not a dietitian miss whichello i am my dear ma'am and look at me sixty-two and as brisk as a bee i don't know the meaning of the word illness in a good hour be it spoken added miss whichello thinking she was tempting the gods by the way what is this about his lordship being ill the bishop ill faltered mrs pendle half rising he was perfectly well when i saw him last oh dear me what is this he's ill now in the library at all events wait mother said gabriel hastily i will see my father don't rise don't worry yourself pray be calm gabriel walked quickly to the library rather astonished to hear that his father was indisposed for the bishop had never had a day's illness in his life he saw by the demeanour of the guests that the indisposition of their host was known for already an uneasy feeling prevailed and several people were departing the door of the library was closed and locked cargrim was standing sentinel beside it evidently irate at being excluded you can't go in pendle said the chaplain quickly dr graham is with his lordship is this sudden illness serious i don't know his lordship refuses to see any one but the doctor he won't even admit me said cargrim in an injured tone what has caused it asked gabriel in dismay i don't know replied cargrim a second time his lordship saw some stranger who departed ten minutes ago and then he sent for dr graham I presume this stranger is responsible for the bishop's illness. End of chapter 3。4:The Bishop's Secret by Fergus Hume。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Chapter 4 : The Curiosity of Mr. Cargram。Like that famous banquet when Macbeth entertained unawares the ghost of gracious Duncan, the bishop's reception broke up in the most admired disorder it was not dr pendle's wish that the entertainment should be cut short on his account but the rumour magnified greatly of his sudden illness so dispirited his guests that they made haste to depart and within an hour the palace was emptied of all save its usual inhabitants dr graham in attendance on the bishop was the only stranger who remained for lucy sent away even sir harry although he begged hard to stay in hope of making himself useful and the most unpleasant part of the whole incident was that no one seemed to know the reason of bishop pendle's unexpected indisposition he was quite well when i saw him last repeated poor mrs pendle over and over again and i never knew him to be ill before what does it all mean perhaps papa's visitor brought him bad news suggested lucy who was hovering round her mother with smelling salts and a fan mrs pendle shook her head in much distress your father has no secrets from me she said decisively and from all i know it is impossible that any news can have upset him so much dr graham may be able to explain said gabriel i don't want dr graham's explanation whimpered mrs pendle tearfully i dislike of all things to hear from a stranger what should be told to myself 
as your father's wife he has no right to shut me out of his confidence and the library finished mrs pendle with an aggrieved afterthought certainly the bishop's conduct was very strange and would have upset even a less nervous woman than mrs pendle neither of her children could comfort her in any way for ignorant themselves of what had occurred they could make no suggestions fortunately at this moment dr graham with a reassuring smile on his face made his appearance and proceeded to set their minds at ease oh, tut tut my dear lady he said briskly advancing on mrs prindle what is all this uh, the bishop the bishop is suffering from a slight indisposition brought on by too much exertion in entertaining he will be all right to-morrow this visitor's had nothing to do with papa's illness then no miss lucy the visitor was only a decayed clergyman in search of help cannot i see my husband was the anxious question of the bishop's wife graham shrugged his shoulders and looked doubtfully at the poor lady better not mrs pendle he said judiciously i have given him a soothing draught and he is about to lie down there is no occasion for you to worry in the least to-morrow morning you will be laughing over this needless alarm i suggest that you should go to bed and take a stiff dose of valerian to soothe those shaky nerves of yours miss lucy will see to that i should like to see the bishop persisted mrs pendle whose instinct told her that the doctor was deceiving her well well said he good-humouredly a wilful woman will have her own way i know you won't sleep a wink unless your mind is set at rest so you shall see the bishop take my arm please i can walk by myself thank you replied mrs pendle testily and nerved to unusual exertion by anxiety she walked towards the library followed by the bishop's family and his chaplain which latter watched the scene with close attention she'll collapse after this said dr graham in an undertone to lucy you'll have a wakeful night i fear i don't mind that doctor so long as there is no real cause for alarm i give you my word of honour miss lucy that this is a case of much ado about nothing let us hope that such is the case said cargrim the jesuit in his softest tones whereupon graham looked at him with a pronounced expression of dislike as a man i don't tell lies as a doctor i never make false reports said he coldly there is no need for your pious hopes mr cargrim the bishop was seated at his desk scribbling idly on his blotting-pad and rose to his feet with a look of alarm when his wife and family entered his usually ruddy colour had disappeared and he was white-faced and haggard in appearance looking like a man who had received a severe shock and who had not yet recovered from it on seeing his wife he smiled reassuringly but with an obvious effort and hastened to conduct her to the chair he had vacated now my dear he said when she was seated this will never do i am so anxious george there is no need to be anxious retorted the bishop in reproving tones i have been doing too much work of late and unexpectedly i was seized with a faintness graham's medicine and a night's rest will restore me to my usual strength it's not your heart i trust george his heart jested the doctor his lordship's heart is as sound as his digestion we thought you might have been upset by bad news papa i have had no bad news lucy i am only a trifle overcome by late hours and fatigue take your mother to bed and you my dear added the bishop kissing his wife don't worry yourself unnecessarily good night and good sleep some valerian for your nerves bishop i have taken something for my nerves amy rest is all i need just now thus reassured mrs pendle submitted to be led from the library by lucy she was followed by gabriel who was now quite easy in his mind about his father cargrim and graham remained but the bishop taking no notice of their presence looked at the door through which his wife and children had vanished and uttered a sound something between a sigh and a groan dr graham looked anxiously at him and the look was intercepted by cargrim who at once made up his mind that there was something seriously wrong which both graham and the bishop desired to conceal the doctor noted the curious expression in the chaplain's eyes and with bluff good humour which was assumed as he disliked the man proceeded to turn him out of the library 
cargram bent on discovering the truth protested in his usual cat-like way against this sudden dismissal i should be happy to sit all night with his lordship he declared sit up with your grandmother cried graham gruffly go to bed sir and don't make mountains out of molehills good night my lord said cargram softly i trust you will find yourself fully restored in the morning thank you mr cargram good night when the chaplain sidled out of the room dr graham rubbed his hands and turned briskly towards his patient who was standing as still as any stone staring in a hypnotized sort of way at the reading lamp on the desk come my lord said he touching the bishop on the shoulder you must take your composing draught and get to bed you'll be all right in the morning mm, i trust so replied pendle with a groan of course bishop if you won't tell me what is the matter with you i can't cure you i am upset doctor that is all you have had a severe nervous shock said graham sharply and it will take some time for you to recover from it this visitor brought you bad news i suppose no said the bishop wincing he did not well well keep your own secrets i can do no more so i'll say good night and he held out his hand dr pendle took it and retained it within his own for a moment your allusion to the ring of polycrates graham what of it i should throw my ring into the sea also that is all ha ha you'll have to travel a considerable distance to reach the sea bishop good night good night and graham smiling in his dry way took himself out of the room as he glanced back at the door he saw that the bishop was again staring dully at the reading lamp graham shook his head at the sight and closed the door it is mind not matter he thought as he put on hat and coat in the hall the cupboard's open and the skeleton is out my premonition was true true esculapius forgive me that i should be so superstitious the bishop has had a shock what is it what is it that visitor brought bad news hm hm better to throw physic to the dogs in this case mind diseased secret trouble my punishment is greater than i can bear put this and that together there is something serious the matter well well i'm no paul pry is his lordship better said the soft voice of cargram at his elbow graham wheeled round much better good night he replied curtly and was off in a moment michael cargram the chaplain was a dangerous man he was thin and pale with light blue eyes and sleek fair hair and as weak physically as he was strong mentally in his neat clerical garb with a slight stoop and meek smile he looked a harmless commonplace young curate of the tabby-cat kind no one could be more tactful and ingratiating than mr cargram and he was greatly admired by the old ladies and young girls of Berminster. But the men, one and all, even his clerical brethren, disliked and distrusted him, although there was no apparent reason for their doing so. Perhaps his too deferential manners and pronounced effeminacy, which made him shun manly sports, had something to do with his masculine unpopularity. But from the bishop downward he was certainly no favorite, and in every male breast he constantly inspired a desire to kick him the clergy of the diocese maintained towards him a kind of dr fell attitude and none of them had more to do with him than they could help with all the will in the world and with all the desire to interpret brotherly love in its most liberal sense the burminster levites found it impossible to like mr cargram hence he was a kind of clerical ishmael and as dangerous within as he looked harmless without how such a viper came to warm himself on the bishop's hearth no one could say mrs pansey herself did not know in what particular way mr cargram had wriggled himself so she expressed it into his present snug position but to speak frankly there was no wriggling in the matter and had the bishop felt himself called upon to explain his business to any one he could have given a very reasonable account of the election of cargram to the post of chaplain the young man was the son of an old schoolfellow to whom pendle had been much attached and from whom in the earlier part of his career he had received many kindnesses this schoolfellow 
he was a banker had become a bankrupt a beggar finally a suicide through no fault of his own and when dying had commended his wife and son to the bishop's care cargram was then fifteen years of age and being clever and calculating even as a youth had determined to utilize the bishop's affection for his father to its fullest extent he was clever as has been stated he was also ambitious and unscrupulous therefore he resolved to enter the profession in which dr pendle's influence would be of most value for this reason and not because he felt a call to the work he entered holy orders the result of his wisdom was soon apparent for after a short career as a curate in london he was appointed chaplain to the bishop of Berminster. so far so good the position for a young man of twenty-eight was by no means a bad one the more so as it gave him a capital opportunity of gaining a better one by watching for the vacancy of a rich preferment and getting it from his patron by asking directly and immediately for it cargram had in his eye the rectorship of a wealthy easy-going parish not far from Berminster, which was in the gift of the bishop the present holder was aged and infirm and given so much to indulgence in port wine that the chances were he might expire within a few months and then as the chaplain hoped the next rector would be the reverend michael cargram once that firm position was obtained he could bend his energies to developing into an archdeacon a dean even into a bishop should his craft and fortune serve him as he intended they should but in all these ambitious dreams there was nothing of religion or of conscience or of self-denial if ever there was a square peg which tried to adapt itself to a round hole michael cargram allegorically speaking was that article with all his love for the father dr pendle could never bring himself to like the son and determined in his own mind to confer a benefice on him when possible if only to get rid of him but not the rich one of heathcroft which was the delectable land of cargram's desire the bishop intended to bestow that on gabriel and cargram in his sneaky way had gained some inkling of this intention afraid of losing his wished-for prize he was bent upon forcing dr pendle into presenting him with the living of heathcroft and to accomplish this amiable purpose with the more certainty he had conceived the plan of somehow getting the bishop into his power hitherto so open and stainless was dr pendle's life he had not succeeded in his aims but now matters looked more promising for the bishop appeared to possess a secret which he guarded even from the knowledge of his wife what this secret might be cargram could not guess in spite of his anxiety to do so but he intended in one way or another to discover it and utilize it for the furtherance and attainment of his own selfish ends by gaining such forbidden knowledge he hoped to get dr pendle well under his thumb and once there the prelate could be kept in that uncomfortable position until he gratified mr cargram's ambition for a humble chaplain to have the whip-hand of a powerful ecclesiastic was a glorious and easy way for a meritorious young man to succeed in his profession having come to this conclusion which did more credit to his head than to his heart cargram sought out the servant who had summoned the bishop to see the stranger a full acquaintance with the circumstances of the visit was necessary to the development of the rev michael's ingenious little plot this is a sad thing about his lordship's indisposition said he to the man in the most casual way for it would not do to let the servant know that he was being questioned for a doubtful purpose yes sir replied the man tis most extraordinary i never knowed his lordship took ill before i suppose that gentleman brought bad news sir possibly john possibly was this gentleman a short man with light hair i fancy i saw him lord no mr cargham he was tall and lean as a rake looked like a military gentleman sir don't know as i call him gentry either replied john half to himself he wasn't what he thought he was a decayed clergyman john inquired cargram remembering graham's description there was lots of decay but no clergy about him sir i fancy i knows a parson when i sees one clergymen don't have scars on their cheekses as i knows of oh indeed said cargram mentally noting that the doctor had spoken falsely so he had a scar 
a red scar sir on the right cheek from his temple to the corner of his mouth he was as dark as pitch in looks with a military moustache and two black eyes like gimlets his clothes was shabby and his looks was horrid bad-tempered too sir i should say for when he was with his lordship i eared his voice quite angry like it ain't no clergy as it speak like that to our bishop mr cargrim and his lordship was taken ill when this visitor departed john right off sir when i got back to the library after showing him out i found his lordship ghastly pale and his paleness was caused by the noisy conduct of this man couldn't have been caused by anything else sir dear me dear me this is much to be deplored sighed cargrim in his softest manner and a clergyman too Begging your pardon sir he weren't no clergyman cried john who was an old servant and took liberties he was more like a tramp or a gypsy i wouldn't have left him near the plate i know we must not judge too harshly john perhaps this poor man was in trouble he didn't look like it mr cargrim he went in and came out quite cocky like i wonder his lordship didn't send for the police his lordship is too kind-hearted john this stranger had a scar you say yes sir a red scar on the right cheek dear me no doubt he has been in the wars good night john let us hope that his lordship will be better after a night's rest good night sir the chaplain walked away with a satisfied smile on his meek face i must find the man with the scar he thought and then who knows End of chapter four chapter five of the bishop's secret by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five the derby winner as its name denotes Burminster was built on a hill or to speak more precisely on an eminence elevated slightly above the surrounding plain in former times it had been surrounded by aguish marshes which had rendered the town unhealthy but now that modern enterprise had drained the finlands Burminster was as salubrious a town as could be found in england the rich black mud of the former bogs now yielded luxuriant harvests and in autumn the city with its mass of red-roofed houses climbing upward to the cathedral was islanded in a golden ocean of wheat and rye and bearded barley for the purposes of defence the town had been built originally on the slope of the hill under the very shadow of the minster and round its base the massive old walls yet remained which had squeezed the city into a huddled mass of uncomfortable dwellings within its narrow girdle but now open and life extended beyond these walls and houses streets villas and gardens spread into the plain on all sides broad white roads ran to southbury junction ten miles away to manufacturing iron grip the smoke of whose furnaces could be seen on the horizon and to many a tiny hamlet and sleepy town buried amid the rich meadowlands and golden cornfields and high above all lorded the stately cathedral with its trio of mighty towers whence morning and evening melodious bells pealed through the peaceful lands beyond the walls the modern town was made up of broad streets and handsome shops on its outskirts appeared comfortable villas and stately manors gardens and woody parks in which dwelt the aristocracy of Burminster but the old town with its tall houses and narrow lanes was given over to the plebeians save in the cathedral close where dwelt the canons the dean the archdeacon and a few old-fashioned folk who remained by preference in their ancestral dwellings from this close which surrounded the open space wherein the cathedral was built narrow streets trickled down to the walls and here was the seven dials the white chapel the very worst corner of Burminster the Burminster police declared that this network of lanes and alleys and malodorous cul-de-sacs was as dangerous a neighbourhood as any london slum and they were particularly emphatic in denouncing the public-house known as the derby winner and kept by a certain william mosk who was a sporting scoundrel and a horsey scamp this ill-famed hostel was placed at the foot of the hill in what had once been the main street and being near the east gate caught in its web most of the thirsty passers-by who entered the city proper either for sightseeing or business it affected a kind of spurious respectability which was all on the outside 
for within it was as iniquitous a den as could well be conceived and was usually filled with horse-copers and sporting characters who made bets and talked racing and rode or drove fiery steeds and who lived on and swindled through the noblest of all animals mr mosk a lean lightweight who wore loud check suits tight in the legs and short in the waist was the presiding deity of this inferno and as the ormuz to this aramanes gabriel pendle was the curate of the district charged with the almost hopeless task of reforming his sporting parishioners and all this with considerable irony was placed almost in the shadow of the cathedral towers not a neighbourhood for mr cargrim to venture into since many sights therein must have displeased his exact tastes yet two days after the reception at the palace the chaplain might have been seen daintily picking his way over the cobblestone pavements as he walked he thought and his thoughts were busy with the circumstances which had led him to venture his saintly person so near the spider's web of the derby winner the bishop london curiosity gabriel this unpleasant neighbourhood so ran the links of his chain of thought the day following his unexpected illness brought no relief to the bishop at all events to outward seeming for he was paler and more haggard than ever in looks and as dour as a bear in manner with mrs pendle he strove to be his usual cheerful self but with small success as occasionally he would steal an anxious look at her and heave deep sighs expressive of much inward trouble all this was noted by cargrim who carefully strove by sympathetic looks and dexterous remarks to bring his superior to the much desired point of unburdening his mind gabriel had returned to his lodgings near the east gate and to his hopeless task of civilizing his degraded centaurs lucy after the manner of maids in love was building air castles with sir harry's assistance and mrs pendle kept her usual watch on her weak heart and fluctuating pulse the bishop thus escaped their particular notice and it was mainly cargrim who saw how distraught and anxious he was as for dr graham he had departed after a second unsatisfactory visit swearing that he could do nothing with a man who refused to make a confidant of his doctor bishop pendle was therefore wholly at the mercy of his suspicious chaplain to be spied upon to be questioned to be watched and to be made a prey of in his first weak moment but the worried man filled with some unknown anxiety was quite oblivious to cargrim's manoeuvres for some time the chaplain in spite of his watchfulness failed to come upon anything tangible likely to explain what was in the bishop's mind he walked about restlessly he brooded continuously and instead of devoting himself to his work in his usual regular way occupied himself for long hours in scribbling figures on his blotting paper and muttering at times in anxious tones cargrim examined the blotting paper and strained his ears to gather the sense of the mutterings but in neither case could he gain any clue to the bishop's actual trouble at length it was on the morning of the second day after the reception dr pendle abruptly announced that he was going up to london that very afternoon and would go alone the emphasis he laid on this last statement still further aroused cargrim's curiosity shall i not accompany your lordship he asked as the bishop restlessly paced the library no mr cargrim why should you said the bishop abruptly and testily your lordship seems ill and i thought there is no need for you to think sir i am not well and my visit to london is in connection with my health or with your secret thought the chaplain deferentially bowing i have every confidence in dr graham continued pendle but it is my intention to consult a specialist i need not go into details mr cargrim as they will not interest you oh your lordship your health is my constant thought your anxiety is commendable but needless responded the bishop dryly i am due at southbury this sunday i believe there is a confirmation at st mark's your lordship very good you can make the necessary arrangements mr cargrim to-day is thursday i shall return to-morrow night and shall rest on saturday until the evening when i shall ride over to southbury attend at st mark's and return on sunday night does not your lordship desire my attendance asked cargrim 
although he knew that he was the morning preacher at the cathedral on sunday no answered dr pendle curtly i shall go and return alone the bishop looked at cargrim and cargrim looked at the bishop each striving to read the other's thoughts then the latter turned away with a frown and the former much exercised in his mind advanced towards the door of the library dr pendle called him back not a word about my health to mrs pendle he said sharply certainly not your lordship you can rely upon my discretion in every way replied the chaplain with emphasis and glided away as soft-footed as any panther and as dangerous i wonder what that fellow suspects thought the bishop when alone i can see that he is filled with curiosity but he can never find out the truth or even guess at it i am safe enough from him all the same i'll have a fool for my next chaplain fools are easier to deal with cargrim would have given much to have overheard this speech but as the door and several passages were between him and the talker he was ignorant of the incriminating remarks the bishop had let slip still baffled but still curious he busied himself with attending to some business of the sea which did not require the personal supervision of dr pendle and when that prelate took his departure for london by the three o'clock train cargrim attended him to the station full of meekness and irritating attentions it was with a feeling of relief that the bishop saw his officious chaplain left behind on the platform he had a secret and with the uneasiness of a loaded conscience fancied that every one saw that he had something to conceal particularly cargrim in the presence of that good young man this spiritual lord high-placed and powerful felt that he resembled an insect under a microscope and that cargrim had his eye to the instrument conscience made a coward of the bishop but in the case of his chaplain his uneasy feelings were in some degree justified on leaving the railway station which was on the outskirts of the modern town cargrim took his way through the brisk population which thronged the streets and wondered in what manner he could benefit by the absence of his superior as he could not learn the truth from dr pendle himself he thought that he might discover it from an investigation of the bishop's desk for this purpose he returned to the palace forthwith and on the plea of business shut himself up in the library dr pendle was a careless man and never locked up any drawers even those which contained his private papers cargrim who was too much of a sneak to feel honourable scruples went through these carefully but in spite of all his predisposition to malignity was unable to find any grounds for suspecting dr pendle to be in any serious trouble at the end of an hour he found himself as ignorant as ever and made only one discovery of any note which was that the bishop had taken his cheque-book with him to london to many people this would have seemed a natural circumstance as most men with banking accounts take their cheque-books with them when going on a journey but cargrim knew that the bishop usually preferred to fill his pockets with loose cash when absent for a short time and this deviation from his ordinary habits appeared to be suspicious hm thought the chaplain rubbing his chin i wonder if that so-called clergyman wanted money if he had wished for a small sum the bishop could easily have given it to him out of the cash-box going by this reasoning he must have wanted a lot of money which argues blackmail hm has he taken both cheque-books or only one the reason for this last query was that bishop pendle had accounts in two different banks one in Berminster, as became the bishop of the sea the other in london in accordance with the dignity of a spiritual lord of parliament a further search showed mr cargrim that the Berminster cheque-book had been left behind hm said the chaplain again that man must have gone back to london dr pendle is going to meet him there and draw money from his town bank to pay what he demands i'll have a look at the butts of that cheque-book when it comes back the amount of the cheque may prove much i may even find out the name of this stranger but all this as cargrim very well knew was pure theory the bishop might have taken his cheque-book to london for other reasons than paying blackmail to the stranger for it was not even certain that there was any such extortion in the question dr pendle was worried it was true and after the departure of his strange visitor he had been taken ill but these facts proved nothing 
and after twisting and turning them in every way and connecting and disconnecting them with the absence of the london cheque-book mr cargrim was forced to acknowledge that he was beaten for the time being then he fancied he might extract some information from gabriel relative to his father's departure for london for mr cargrim was too astute to believe in the consulting a specialist excuse still this might serve as a peg whereon to hang his inquiries and develop further information so the chaplain after meditating over his five o'clock cup of tea took his way to the east gate in order to put gabriel unawares into the witness-box yet for all these doings and suspicions cargrim had no very good reason save his own desire to get dr pendle under his thumb he was groping in the dark he had not a shred of evidence to suppose that the uneasiness of the bishop was connected with anything criminal nevertheless the chaplain put himself so far out of his usual habits as to venture into the unsavoury neighbourhood wherein stood the derby winner truly this man's cobweb spinning was of a very dangerous character when he took so much trouble to weave the web as in excelsior the shades of night were falling fast when cargrim found himself at the door of the curate's lodging here he met with a check for gabriel's landlady informed him that mr pendle was not at home and she did not know where he was or when he would be back cargrim made the sweetest excuses for troubling the good lady left a message that he would call again and returned along monk street on his way back to the palace through the new town by going in this direction he passed the derby winner not without intention for it was this young man's belief that gabriel might be haunting the public-house to see mrs mosk or as was more probable to the malignant chaplain her handsome daughter as he came abreast of the derby winner it was not too dark but that he could see a tall man standing in the doorway cargrim at first fancied that this might be gabriel and paced slowly along so as to seize an opportunity of addressing him but when he came almost within touching distance he found himself face to face with a dark-looking gipsy fiery-eyed and dangerous in appearance he had a lean cruel face a hawk's beak for a nose and black black hair streaked with grey but what mostly attracted cargrim's attention was a red streak which traversed the right cheek of the man from ear to mouth at once he recalled john's description a military-looking gentleman with a scar on the right cheek he thought hm this then is the bishop's visitor end of chapter five chapter six of the bishop's secret by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six the man with the scar this engaging individual looked at cargrim with a fierce air he was not sober and had just reached the quarrelsome stage of intoxication which means objection to every one and everything consequently he cocked his hat defiantly at the curate and although he blocked up the doorway made no motion to stand aside cargrim was not ill-pleased at this obstinacy as it gave him an opportunity of entering into conversation with the so-called decayed clergyman who was as unlike a parson as a rabbit is like a terrier uh, do you know if mr pendle is within my friend asked the chaplain with bland politeness the stranger started at the mention of the name his face grew paler his scar waxed redder and with all his dutch courage there was a look of alarm visible in his cold eyes i don't know said he insolently yet with a certain refinement of speech i shouldn't think it likely that a pothouse like this would be patronized by a bishop uh, pardon me sir i speak of mr gabriel pendle the son of his lordship then pardon me sir mimicked the man if i say that i know nothing of the son of his lordship and what's more i'm damned if i want to i see you are more fortunate in knowing his lordship himself said the chaplain with great simplicity the stranger plucked at his worn sleeve with a look of irony do i look as though i were acquainted with bishops said he scoffingly is this the kind of coat likely to be admitted into episcopalian palaces yet it was admitted sir if i am not mistaken you called at the palace two nights ago did you see me certainly i saw you replied cargrim salving his conscience with the jesuitic saying that the end justifies the means 
and i was informed that you were a decayed clergyman seeking assistance i have been most things in my time observed the stranger gloomily but not a parson you are one i perceive cargrim bowed i am the chaplain of bishop pendle and the busybody of Berminster, i should say rejoined the man with a sneer see here my friend and he rapped cargrim on the breast with a shapely hand if you interfere in what does not concern you there will be trouble i saw dr pendle on private business and as such it has nothing to do with you hold your tongue you black crow and keep away from me cried the stranger with sudden ferocity or i'll knock your head off now you know and with a fierce glance the man moved out of the doorway and sauntered round the corner before cargrim could make up his mind how to resent this insolence hm said he to himself with a glance at the tall retiring figure that is a nice friend for a bishop to have he's a jailbird if i mistake not and he is afraid of my finding out his business with pendle birds of a feather sighed mr cargrim entering the hotel i fear i sadly fear that his lordship is but a whited sepulchre a look into the bishop's past might show me many things of moment and the fat living of heathcroft seemed almost within cargrim's grasp as he came to this conclusion now then sir interrupted a sharp but pleasant female voice and what may you want mr cargrim wheeled round to answer this question and found himself face to face with a bar glittering with brass and crystal and bright-hued liquors in fat glass barrels also with an extremely handsome young woman dressed in an astonishing variety of colours she was high-coloured and frank-eyed with a great quantity of very black hair twisted into many amazing shapes on the top of her head in manner she was as brisk as a bee and as restless as a butterfly and being adorned with a vast quantity of bracelets and lockets and brooches all of gaudy patterns jingled at every movement this young lady was miss bell mosk whom the frequenters of the derby winner called a dashing beauty and mrs pansey a painted jade with her glittering ornaments her bright blue dress her high colour and a general air of vivacity she glowed and twinkled in the lamplight like some gorgeous plumaged parrot and her free speech and constant chatter might have been ascribed to the same bird miss mosk i believe said the polite cargrim marvelling that this gaudy female should be the refined gabriel's notion of feminine perfection i am miss mosk replied bell taking a comprehensive view of the sleek black-clothed parson what can i do for you i am mr cargrim the bishop's chaplain miss mosk and i wish to see mr pendle mr gabriel pendle bell flushed as red as the reddest cabbage rose and with downcast eyes wiped the counter briskly with a duster why should you come here to ask for mr pendle said she in guarded tones i called at his lodgings miss mosk and i was informed that he was visiting a sick person here my mother replied bell not knowing what an amazing lie the chaplain was telling yes mr pendle comes often to see uh, my mother is he here now asked cargrim noticing the hesitancy at the end of her sentence because i wish to speak with him on business he is upstairs i dare say he'll be down soon oh don't disturb him for my sake i beg but if you will permit me i shall go up and see mrs mosk here comes mr pendle now said bell abruptly and withdrew into the interior of the bar as gabriel appeared at the end of the passage he started and seemed uneasy when he recognized the chaplain cargrim he cried hurrying forward why are you here and he gave a nervous glance in the direction of the bar a glance which the chaplain saw and understood but discreetly left unnoticed i wish to see you he replied with great simplicity they told me at your lodgings that you might be here so why interrupted gabriel sharply i left no message to that effect cargrim saw that he had made a mistake i speak generally my dear friend generally he said in some haste your worthy landlady mentioned several houses in which you were in the habit of seeing sick people amongst others this hotel mrs mosk is very ill i have been seeing her said gabriel shortly ay ay you have been seeing mrs mosk gabriel changed colour and cast another glance towards the bar for the significance of cargrim's speech was not lost on him 
do you wish to speak with me he asked coldly i should esteem it a favour if you would allow me a few words said cargrim politely i'll wait for you outside and in his turn the chaplain looked towards the bar thank you i can come with you now was gabriel's reply made with a burning desire to knock cargrim down miss mosk i am glad to find that your mother is easier in her mind it's all due to you mr pendle said bell moving forward with a toss of her head directed especially at mr cargrim your visits do mother a great deal of good i am sure they do said the chaplain not able to forego giving the girl a scratch of his claws mr pendle's visits here must be delightful to everybody i dare say retorted bell with heightened colour other people's visits would not be so welcome perhaps not miss mosk mr pendle has many amiable qualities to recommend him he is a general and deserved favourite come come cargrim interposed gabriel anxiously for the fair bell's temper was rapidly getting the better of her if you are ready we shall go good evening miss mosk good evening mr pendle said the barmaid and directed a spiteful look at cargrim for she saw plainly that he had intentionally deprived her of a confidential conversation with gabriel the chaplain received the look which he quite understood with an amused smile and a bland inclination of the head as he walked out arm in arm with the reluctant pendle bell banged the pewters and glasses about with considerable energy for the significant demeanour of cargrim annoyed her so much that she felt a great inclination to throw something at his head but then miss mosk was a high-spirited girl and believed in actions rather than speech even though she possessed a fair command of the latter well cargrim said gabriel when he found himself in the street with his uncongenial companion what is it it's about the bishop my father is there anything the matter with him i fear so he told me he was going to london oh, what of that said gabriel impatiently he told me the same thing yesterday has he gone he left by the afternoon train do you know the object of his visit to london no what is his object he goes to consult a specialist about his health what cried gabriel anxiously is he ill i think so some nervous trouble brought on by worry by worry has my father anything on his mind likely to worry him to that extent cargrim coughed significantly i think so said he again he has not been himself since the visit of that stranger to the palace i fancy the man must have brought bad news did the bishop tell you so no but i am observant you know privately gabriel considered that cargrim was a great deal too observant and also of a meddlesome nature else why had he come to spy out matters which did not concern him needless to say gabriel was thinking of bell at this moment however he made no comment on the chaplain's speech but merely remarked that doubtless the bishop had his own reasons for keeping silent and advised cargrim to wait until he was consulted in connection with the matter before troubling himself unnecessarily about it my father knows his own business best finished gabriel stiffly if you will forgive my speaking so plainly oh, certainly certainly pendle but i owe a great deal to your father and i would do much to save him from annoyance by the way with an abrupt change of subject do you know that i saw the stranger who called at the palace two nights ago during the reception when where at this hotel this evening he looks a dangerous man gabriel shrugged his shoulders it seems to me cargrim that you are making a mountain out of a molehill a stranger sees my father and afterwards you meet him at a public house there's nothing strange in that you forget hinted cargrim sweetly this man caused your father's illness we can't be sure of that and in any case my father is quite clever enough to deal with his own affairs i see no reason why you should have hunted me out to talk such nonsense good night to you cargrim and with a curt nod the curate stalked away considerably annoyed by the meddlesome spirit manifested by the chaplain he had never liked the man and now that he was in this interfering mood liked him less than ever it would be as well thought gabriel that mr cargrim should be dismissed from his confidential office as soon as possible otherwise he might cause trouble and gabriel mentally thought of the high-coloured young lady in the bar 
his conscience was not at ease regarding his admiration for her and he dreaded lest the officious cargrim should talk about her to the bishop altogether the chaplain like a hornet had annoyed both dr pendle and his son and the bishop in london and gabriel in Bermondster were anything but well disposed towards this clerical busybody who minded everybody's business instead of his own it is such people who stir up muddy water and cause mischief meanwhile the busybody looked after the curate with an evil smile and gratified at having aroused such irritation as the abrupt parting signified turned back to the derby winner he had seen bell he had spoken to gabriel he had even secured an unsatisfactory conversation with the unknown man now he wished to question mrs mosk and acquaint himself with her nature and attitude also he desired to question her concerning the military stranger and with this resolve presented himself again before miss mosk smiling and undaunted what is it asked the young lady who had been nursing her grievances a mere trifle miss mosk i wish to see your mother why was bell's blunt demand my reasons are for mrs mosk's ears alone oh are they well i'm afraid you can't see my mother in the first place she's too ill to receive any one and in the second my father does not like clergymen dear dear uh, not even mr pendle mr pendle is an exception retorted bell blushing and again fell to wiping the counter in a fury so as to keep her hands from mr cargrim's ears i wish to see mrs mosk particularly reiterated cargrim who was bent upon carrying his point if not your father will do my father is absent in southbury why do you want to see my mother i'll tell her that myself with your permission said cargrim suavely you shan't then replied bell and flung down her duster with sparkling eyes in that case i must go away replied cargrim seeing he was beaten and i thank you miss mosk for your politeness by the way he added as he half returned will you tell that gentleman with a scar on the cheek that i wish to see him also seems to me you wish to see everybody about here said bell scornfully i'll tell mr jentham if you like now go away i'm busy jentham repeated cargrim as he walked homeward now i wonder if i'll find that name in the bishop's cheque-book end of chapter six chapter seven of the bishop's secret by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven an interesting conversation when mr cargrim took an idea into his head it was not easy to get it out again and to this resolute obstinacy he owed no small part of his success he was like the famous drop of water and would wear away any human stone however hard it might be again and again when baffled he returned with gentle persistence to the object he had in view and however strong of will his adversary happened to be that will was bound in the long run to yield to the incessant attacks of the chaplain at the present moment he desired to have an interview with mrs mosk and he was determined to obtain one in spite of bell's refusal however he had no time to waste on the persuasive method as he wished to see the invalid before the bishop returned to achieve this end he enlisted the services of mrs pansey that good lady sometimes indulged in a species of persecution she termed district visiting which usually consisted in her thrusting herself at untoward times into poor people's houses and asking them questions about their private affairs when she had learned all she wished to know and had given her advice in the tone of a command not to be disobeyed she would retire leaving the evidence of her trail behind her in the shape of a nauseous little tract with an abusive title it was no use any poor creature refusing to see mrs pansey for she forced herself into the most private chambers and never would retire unless she thought fit to do so of her own will it was for this reason that cargrim suggested the good lady should call upon mrs mosk for he knew well that neither the father nor the daughter nor the whole assembled domestics of the hotel would be able to stop her from making her way to the bedside of the invalid and in the devastated rear of mrs pansey the chaplain intended to follow 
his principal object in seeing mrs mosk was to discover what she knew about the man called jentham he was lodging at the derby winner as cargrim ascertained by later inquiry and it was probable that the inmates of the hotel knew something as to the reasons of his stay in Berminster. Mr. Mosk, being as obstinate as a mule, was not likely to tell Cargrim anything he desired to learn. Bell, detesting the chaplain, as she took no pains to conceal, would probably refuse to hold a conversation with him. But Mrs. Mosk, being weak-minded and ill, might be led by dexterous questioning to tell all she knew and what she did know might in cargrim's opinion throw more light on jentham's connection with the bishop therefore the next morning cargrim called on the archdeacon's widow to inveigle her into persecuting mrs mosk with a call mrs pansey with all her acuteness could not see that she was being made use of luckily for cargrim i hear the poor woman is very ill sighed the chaplain after he had introduced the subject and i fear that her daughter does not give her all the attention an invalid should have the jezebel growled mrs pansey what can you expect from that flaunting hussy she is a human being mrs pansey and i expect at least human feelings can you get blood out of a stone mr cargrim no you can't is that red-cheeked dutch doll a pelican to pluck her breast for the benefit of her mother no indeed i dare say she passes her sinful hours drinking with young men i'd whip her at a cart's tail if i had my way gabriel pendle is trying to bring the girl to a sense of her errors rubbish she's trying to bring him to the altar more like i'll go with you mr cargrim and see the minx i have long thought that it is my duty to reprove her and warn her mother of such goings-on as for that weak-minded young pendle cried mrs pansey shaking her head furiously i pity his infatuation but what can you expect from such a mother as his mother can a fool produce sense no i am afraid you will find the young woman difficult to deal with that makes me all the more determined to see her mr cargrim i'll tell her the truth for once in her life marry young pendle indeed snorted the good lady i'll let her see speak to her mother first urged cargrim who wished his visit to be less warlike as more conducive to success i'll speak to both of them i dare say one is as bad as the other i must have that public-house removed it's an eyesore to berminster a curse to the place it ought to be pulled down and the site ploughed up and sown with salt come with me mr cargrim and you shall see how i deal with iniquity i hope i know what is due to myself where is miss norsham asked the chaplain when they fell into more general conversation on their way to the derby winner husband hunting dean alder is showing her the tombs in the cathedral tombs indeed it's the altar she's interested in my dear lady the dean is too old to marry he is not too old to be made a fool of mr cargrim as for daisy norsham she'd marry methuselah to take away the shame of being single not that the match with alder will be out of the way for she's no chicken herself i rather thought mr dean had an eye to miss whichello stuff rejoined mrs pansey with a sniff she's far too much taken up with dieting people to think of marrying them she actually weighs out the food on the table when meals are on no wonder that poor girl mab is thin but she isn't too thin for her height mrs pansey she seems to me to be well covered you didn't notice her at the palace then snapped the widow avoiding a direct reply she wore a low-necked dress which made me blush i don't know what girls are coming to they'd go about like so many eves if they could oh mrs pansey remonstrated the chaplain in a shocked tone well it's in the bible isn't it man you aren't going to say holy writ is indecent are you well really mrs pansey clergyman as i am i must say that there are parts of the bible unfit for the use of schools to the pure all things are pure mr cargrim you have an impure mind i fear remember the thirty-nine articles and speak becomingly of holy things however let that pass added mrs pansey in livelier tones here we are and there's that hussy hanging out from an upper window like the jezebel she is this remark was directed against bell 
who apparently in her mother's room was at the window amusing herself by watching the passers-by when she saw mrs pansey and the chaplain stalking along in black garments and looking like two birds of prey she hastily withdrew and by the time they arrived at the hotel was at the doorway to receive them with fixed bayonets young woman said mrs pansey severely i have come to see your mother and she cast a disapproving look at bell's gay pink dress she is not well enough to see either you or mr cargrim said bell coolly all the more reason that mr cargrim as a clergyman should look after her soul my dear girl thank you mr pendle is doing that indeed mr pendle then combines business with pleasure bell quite understood the insinuation conveyed in this last speech and firing up would have come to high words with the visitors but that her father made his appearance and as she did not wish to draw forth remarks from mrs pansey about gabriel in his hearing she discreetly held her tongue however as mrs pansey swept by in triumph followed by cargrim she looked daggers at them both and bounced into the bar where she drew beer for thirsty customers in a flaming temper she dearly desired a duel of words with the formidable visitor mosk was a lean tall man with a pimpled face and a military moustache he knew mrs pansey and like most other people detested her with all his heart but she was as he thought a great friend of sir harry brace who was his landlord so for diplomatic reasons he greeted her with all deference hat in hand i have come with mr cargrim to see your wife mr mosk said the visitor thank you ma'am i'm sure it's very kind of you replied mosk who had a husky voice suggestive of beer she'll be honoured to see you i'm sure uh, this way ma'am is she very ill demanded the chaplain as they followed mosk to the back of the hotel and up a narrow staircase she ain't well sir but i can't say she's dying we do all we can to make her easy oh from mrs pansey i hope your daughter acts toward her mother like as a daughter should i'd like to see the person that says she don't cried mr mosk with sudden anger i'd knock his head off bell's a good girl none better let us hope your trust in her is justified sighed the mischief-maker and passed into the sick-room leaving mosk with an uneasy feeling that something was wrong if the man had a tender spot in his heart it was for his handsome daughter and it was with a vague fear that after presenting his wife to her visitors he went downstairs to the bar mrs pansey had a genius for making mischief by a timely word bell said he gruffly what's that old cat hinting at what about asked bell tossing her head till all her ornaments jingled and wiping the counter furiously about you she don't think i should trust you what right has she to talk about me i'd like to know cried bell getting as red as a peony i've never done anything that any one can say a word against me who said you had snapped her father but that old cat hints let her keep her hints to herself then because i'm young and good-looking she wants to take my character away nasty old puss that she is that's just it my gal you're too young and good-looking to escape folks talking and i hear that young mr pendle comes round when i'm away who says he doesn't father it's to see mother he's a parson ain't he yes and he's gentry too i won't have him paying attention to you you'd better wait till he does flashed out bell i can take care of myself i hope if i catch him talking other than religion to you i'll choke him in his own collar cried mr mosk with a scowl so now you know i know as you're talking nonsense father time enough for you to interfere when there's cause now you clear out and let me get on with my work reassured by the girl's manner mosk began to think that mrs pansey's hints were all moonshine and after cooling himself with a glass of beer went away to look into his betting book with some horsey pals in the meantime mrs pansey was persecuting his wife a meek nervous little woman who was propped up with pillows in a large bed and seemed to be quite overwhelmed by the honour of mrs pansey's call so you are weak in the back are you said the visitor in loud tones if you are what right have you to marry and bring feeble children into the world bell isn't feeble said mrs mosk weakly she's a fine set-up gal set up and stuck up retorted mrs pansey i tell you what my good woman you ought to be downstairs looking after her 
Lord, Mom, there ain't nothing wrong. I do devoutly hope. Nothing as yet, but you shouldn't have young gentlemen about the place. I can't help it, Mum," said Mrs. Mosk, beginning to cry. I'm sure we must earn our living somehow. This is an hotel, isn't it? And Mosk's a popular character, ain't he? I'm sure it's hard enough to make ends meet as it is. We owe rent for half a year and can't pay, and won't pay, wailed Mrs. Mosk, unless my husband comes home on skinflint. Comes home on skinflint, woman? What do you mean? Skinflint's a horse, mum, as Mosk have put his shirt on. Mrs. Pansy wagged her plumes and groaned. I'm sadly afraid your husband is a son of perdition, Mrs. Mosk. Put his shirt on skinflint, indeed. He's a good man to me, anyhow, cried Mrs. Mosk plucking up spirit. Drink and betting, continued Mrs. Pansy, pretending not to hear this feeble defiance. What can we expect from a man who drinks and bets? And associates with bad characters, put in Cargram, seizing his chance. That he don't, sir, said Mrs. Mosk with energy. May I beg of you to put a name to one of them? Gentham, said the chaplain softly. Who is Gentham, Mrs. Mosk? I know no more nor a babe unborn, sir. He'd been here two weeks, and I did see him twice afore my back got so bad as to force me to bed. But I don't see why you called him bad, sir. He pays his way. Oh, groaned Mrs. Pansy, is it the chief end of man to pay his way? It is with us, mum, retorted Mrs. Mosk meekly. There ain't no denying it, and Mr. Jentham do pay proper, though he is a gypsy. He's a gypsy, is he? said Cargram alertly so he says sir and i knows as he goes sometimes to that camp of gypsies on southbury heath where does he get his money from better not inquire into that mr cargram said mrs pansy with a sniff oh mr jentham's honest i'm sure mum he's been at the gold diggings and have made a trifle of money indeed i don't know where he ain't been sir the four pints of the compass is all plain sailing to him and his air-breath escapes is too awful I shivers and shudders when I ears em. What is he doing here? He's on business, but I don't know what kind. Oh, he knows how to hold his tongue, does Jentham. He is a gypsy. He consorts with gypsies. He has money, and no one knows where he comes from, summed up Cargram. I think, Mrs. Pansy, we may regard this man as a dangerous character. I shouldn't be surprised to hear he was an anarchist said Mrs. Pansy, who knew nothing about the man. Well, Mrs. Mosk, I hope we've cheered you up. I'll go now. Read this tract, bestowing a grimy little pamphlet, and don't see too much of Mr. Pendle. But he comforts me, said poor Mrs. Mosk. He reads beautiful. Mrs. Pansy grunted. Bold as she was, she did not like to speak quite plainly to the woman, as too free speech might inculpate Gabriel and bring the bishop to the rescue besides mrs pansy had no evidence to bring forward to prove that gabriel was in love with bell mosk therefore she said nothing but like the mariner's parrot thought the more shaking out her dark skirts she rose to go with another grunt full of unspoken suspicions good day mrs mosk said she pausing at the door when you are low-spirited send for me to cheer you up mrs mosk attempted a curtsey in bed which was a failure owing to her sitting position, but Mrs. Pansy did not see the attempt as she was already halfway down the stairs, followed by Cargram. The chaplain had learned a trifle more about the mysterious Jentham and was quite satisfied with his visit, but he was more puzzled than ever. A tramp, a gypsy, an adventurer! What had such a creature in common with Bishop Pendle? To Mr. Cargram's eye, the affair of the visit began to assume the proportions of a criminal case. But all the information he had gathered proved nothing, so it only remained to wait for the bishop's return and see what discoveries he could make in that direction. If Jentham's name was in the checkbook, the chaplain would be satisfied that there was an understanding between the pair. And then his next move would be to learn what the understanding was. When he discovered that, he had no doubt but that he would have Dr. Pendle under his thumb, which would be a good thing for Mr. Cargram and an unpleasant position for the bishop. Mrs. Pansy stalked down to the bar, and seeing Bell therein, silently placed a little tract on the counter. No sooner had she left the house than Bell snatched up the tract and, rushing to the door, 
flung it after the good lady you need it more than i do she cried and bounced into the house again it was with a quiver of rage that mrs pansey turned to the chaplain she was almost past speech but with some difficulty and much choking managed to convey her feelings in two words the creature gasped mrs pansey and shook her skirts as if to rid herself of some taint contracted at the derby winner End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of The Bishop's Secret by Fergus Hume This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 on Saturday night The bishop returned on Saturday morning instead of on Friday night, as arranged, and was much more cheerful than when he left, a state of mind which irritated Cargram in no small degree, and also perplexed him not a little if dr pendle's connection with jentham was dangerous he should still be ill at ease and anxious instead of which he was almost his old genial self when he joined his wife and lucy at their afternoon tea sir harry was not present but mr cargram supplied his place an exchange which was not at all to lucy's mind the pendles treated the chaplain always with a certain reserve and the only person who really thought him the good young man he appeared to be was the bishop's wife but kindly Mrs. Pendle was the most innocent of mortals, and all geese were swans to her. She had not the necessary faculty of seeing through a brick wall with which nature had gifted Mrs. Pansy in so extraordinary a degree. As a rule, Mr. Cargram did not come to afternoon tea, but on this occasion he presented himself, ostensibly to welcome back his patron, in reality to watch him also he was determined at the very first opportunity to introduce the name of jentham and observe what effect it had on the bishop with these little plans in his mind the chaplain crept about the tea-table like a tame cat and handed round cakes and bread with his most winning smile his pale face was even more inexpressive than usual and none could have guessed from outward appearance his malicious intents least of all the trio he was with they were too upright themselves to suspect evil in others i am glad to see you are better bishop said mrs pendle languidly trifling with a cup of tea your journey has done you good change of air change of air my dear a wonderful restorative your business was all right i hope oh yes indeed i hardly went up on business and what i did do was a mere trifle replied the bishop smoothing his apron has gabriel been here to-day he added obviously desirous of turning the conversation twice said lucy who presided over the tea-table and the second time he told mamma that he had received a letter from george ah yeah a letter from george is he quite well lucy we shall see that for ourselves this evening papa george is coming to Berminster and will be here about ten o'clock to-night how vexing exclaimed dr pendle i intended going over to southbury this evening but i can't miss seeing george right over to-morrow morning bishop suggested his wife sunday morning my dear well papa said lucy smiling you're not a strict sabbatarian you know i am not so good as i ought to be my dear said dr pendle playfully pinching her pretty ear well well i must see george i'll go to-morrow morning at eight o'clock you'll send a telegram to mr vassar to that effect if you please mr cargram say that i regret not being able to come to-night certainly my lord in any case i am going to Berminster this evening you are usually more stay-at-home mr cargram thank you lucy i will take another cup of tea i do not care for going out at night as a rule my lord observed the chaplain in his most sanctimonious tone but duty calls me into Berminster i am desirous of comforting poor sick mrs mosk at the derby winner oh that is gabriel's pet invalid cried lucy peering into the teapot he says mrs mosk is a very good woman let us hope so observed the bishop stirring his new cup of tea i do not wish to be uncharitable my dear but if mrs pansey is to be believed that public-house is not conducted so carefully as it should be but is mrs pansey to be believed bishop asked his wife smiling i don't think she would tell a deliberate falsehood my love all the same she might exaggerate a little into much said lucy with a pretty grimace 
what is your opinion of this hotel mr cargrim the chaplain saw his opportunity and seized it at once my dear miss pendle he said showing all his teeth as the derby winner is the property of sir harry brace i wish i could speak well of it but candor compels me to confess that it is a badly conducted house oh, tut tut said the bishop what is this you don't say so harry shall shut it up at once cried lucy the pretty puritan it is a resort of bad characters i fear sighed cargrim and mrs mosk being an invalid is not able to keep them away what about the landlord mr cargrim aha replied the chaplain turning towards mrs pendle who had asked this question he is a man of lax morals his boon companion is a tramp called jentham jentham repeated dr pendle in so complacent a tone that cargrim with some vexation saw that he did not associate the name with his visitor and who is jentham oh i hardly know said the chaplain making another attempt he is a tramp as i have reason to believe and consorts with gipsies i saw him myself the other day a tall lean man with a scar the bishop rose and walking over to the tea-table placed his cup carefully thereon with a scar he repeated in low tones a man with a scar jentham indeed what do you know of this person mr cargrim oh absolutely nothing rejoined the chaplain with a satisfied glance at the uneasy face of his questioner he is a gipsy he stays at the derby winner and pays regularly for his lodgings and his name is jentham i know no more i don't suppose there is more to know cried lucy lightly if there is the police will find out miss pendle the bishop frowned as the man so far as we know has done nothing against the laws said he quickly i see no reason why the police should be mentioned in connection with him evidently from what mr cargrim says he is a rolling stone and probably will not remain much longer in Beorminster. let us hope that he will take himself and his bad influence away from our city in the meantime it is hardly worth our while to discuss a person of so little importance in this skilful way the bishop put an end to the conversation and cargrim fearful of rousing his suspicions did not dare to resume it in a little while after a few kind words to his wife dr pendle left the drawing-room for his study as he passed out cargrim noticed that the haggard look had come back to his face and once or twice he glanced anxiously at his wife in his turn cargrim examined mrs pendle but saw nothing in her manner likely to indicate that she shared the uneasiness of her husband or knew the cause of his secret anxiety she looked calm and content and there was a gentle smile in her weary eyes evidently the bishop's mind was set at rest by her placid looks for it was with a sigh of relief that he left the room cargrim noted the look and heard the sigh but was wholly in the dark regarding their meaning though i dare say they have to do with jentham and this secret he thought when bowing himself out of the drawing-room whatever the matter may be dr pendle is evidently most anxious to keep his wife from knowing of it mm, all the better he rubbed his hands together with a satisfied smirk such anxiety shows that the secret is worth learning sooner or later i shall find it out and then i can insist upon being the rector of heathcroft i have no time to lose so i shall go to the derby winner to-night and see if i can induce this mysterious jentham to speak out he looks a drunken dog so a glass of wine may unloosen his tongue from this speech it can be seen that mr cargrim was true to his jesuitic instincts and thought no action dishonourable so long as it aided him to gain his ends he was a methodical scoundrel too and arranged the details of his scheme with the utmost circumspection for instance prior to seeing the man with the scar he thought it advisable to find out if the bishop had drawn a large sum of money while in london for the purpose of bribing the creature to silence therefore before leaving the palace he made several attempts to examine the cheque-book but dr pendle remained constantly at his desk in the library and although the plotter actually saw the cheque-book at the elbow of his proposed victim he was unable without any good reason to pick it up and satisfy his curiosity 
he was therefore obliged to defer any attempt to obtain it until the next day as the bishop would probably leave it behind him when he rode over to southberry this failure vexed the chaplain as he wished to be forearmed in his interview with jentham but as there was no help for it he was obliged to put the cart before the horse in other words to learn what he could from the man first and settle the bribery question by a peep into the cheque-book afterwards the ingenious mr cargrim was by no means pleased with this slip-slop method of conducting business there was method in his villainy that evening after dispatching the telegram to southberry the chaplain repaired to the derby winner and found it largely patronized by a noisy and thirsty crowd the weather was tropical the workmen of beorminster had received their wages so they were converting the coin of the realm into beer and whisky as speedily as possible the night was calm and comparatively cool with the spreading darkness and the majority of the inhabitants were seated outside their doors gossiping and taking the air children were playing in the street their shrill voices at times interrupting the continuous chatter of the women and the derby winner flaring with gas was stuffed as full as it could hold with artisans workmen irish harvesters and stablemen all more or less exhilarated with alcohol it was by no means a scene into which the fastidious cargrim would have ventured of his own free will but his desire to pump jentham was greater than his sense of disgust and he walked briskly into the hotel to where mr mosk and bell were dispensing drinks as fast as they were able the crowd having an inherent respect for the clergy as became the inhabitants of a cathedral city opened out to let him pass and there was much less swearing and drinking when his black coat and clerical collar came into view mosk saw that the appearance of the chaplain was detrimental to business and resenting his presence gave him but a surly greeting as to bell she tossed her head shot a withering glance of defiance at the bland newcomer and withdrew to the far end of the bar my friend said cargrim in his softest tones i have come to see your wife and inquire how she is she's well enough growled mosk pushing a foaming tankard towards an expectant navvy and what's more sir she's asleep sir so you can't see her oh, i should be sorry to disturb her mr mosk so i will postpone my visit till a more fitted occasion you seem to be busy to-night so busy that i've got no time for talking sir oh, far be it from me to distract your attention my worthy friend was the chaplain's bland reply but with your permission i will remain in this corner and enjoy the humours of the scene mosk inwardly cursed the visitor for making this modest request as he detested parsons on account of their aptitude to make teetotalers of his customers he was a brute in his way and a radical to boot so if he had dared he would have driven forth cargrim with a few choice oaths but as his visitor was the chaplain of the ecclesiastical sovereign of beorminster and was acquainted with sir harry brace the owner of the hotel and further as mosk could not pay his rent and was already in bad odour with his landlord he judged it wise to be diplomatic lest a word from cargrim to the bishop and sir harry should make matters worse he therefore grudgingly gave the required permission though this man ain't a sight fit for the likes of you sir he grumbled waving his hand this lot smells and they swears and they gets rowdy in their cups so i won't answer as they won't offend you my duty has carried me into much more unsavoury localities my friend the worse the place the more is my presence as a clergyman necessary you ain't going to preach sir cried mosk in alarm oh no that would indeed be casting pearls before swine replied cargrim in his cool tones but i will observe and reflect the landlord looked uneasy i know as the place is rough he said apologetically but tain't my fault you won't go talking to sir harry i hope sir and take the bread out of my mouth oh, make your mind easy mosk it is not my place to carry tales to your landlord and i am aware that the lower orders cannot conduct themselves with decorum especially on saturday night i repine that such a scene should be possible in a christian land but i don't blame you for its existence that's all right sir said mosk with a sigh of relief i'm rough but honest whatever lies may be told to the contrary 
if i can't pay my rent that ain't my fault i hope as it ain't to be expected as i can do miracles the age of miracles is past my worthy friend replied cargrim in conciliatory tones we must not expect the impossible nowadays by the way with a sudden change have you a man called uh, jentham here yes i have growled mosk looking suspiciously at his questioner what do you know of him sir nothing but i take an interest in him as he seems to be one who has known better days he don't know them now at all events mr cargrim he owes me money for his last week he does he paid all right at first but he don't pay now indeed said the chaplain pricking up his ears he owes you money that he does more nor two quid sir but he says he'll pay me soon ah he says he'll pay you soon repeated cargrim he expects to receive money then i suppose so the lord knows beg pardon sir though goodness knows where it's coming from he don't work or get wages as i can see i think i know thought cargrim then added aloud uh, is the man here in the coffee-room yonder sir half drunk he is and lying like a good one the yarns he reels off is wonderful no doubt a man like that must be interesting to listen to with your permission mr mosk i'll go into the coffee-room straight ahead sir will you take something to drink if i may make so bold mr cargrim uh, no my friend no thank you all the same and with a nod cargrim pushed his way into the coffee-room to see the man with the scar End of chapter eight chapter nine of the bishop's secret by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine an exciting adventure mr cargrim found a considerable number of people in the coffee-room and these with tankards and glasses before them were listening to the conversation of jentham tobacco smoke filled the apartment with a thick atmosphere of fog through which the gas-lights flared in a nebulous fashion and rendered the air so hot that it was difficult to breathe in spite of the windows being open at the head of the long table sat jentham drinking brandy and soda and speaking in his cracked refined voice with considerable spirit his rat-like quick eyes glittering the while with alcoholic lustre he seemed to be considerably under the influence of drink and his voice ran up and down from bass to treble as he became excited in narrating his adventures whether these were true or false cargrim could not determine for although the man trenched again and again on the marvellous he certainly seemed to be fully acquainted with what he was talking about and related the most wonderful stories in a thoroughly dramatic fashion like ulysses he knew men and cities and appeared to have travelled as much as that famous globe-trotter in his narration he passed from china to chile sailed forth to the pole steamed south to the horn described the paradise of the south seas and discoursed about the wild wastes of snowy siberia the capitals of europe appeared to be as familiar to him as the chair he was seated in and the steppes of russia the deserts of africa the sheep runs of australia were all mentioned in turn as adventure after adventure fell from his lips and mixed up with these geographical accounts were thrilling tales of treasure hunting of escapes from savages of perilous deeds in the secret places of great cities and details of blood and war and lust and hate all told in a fiercely dramatic fashion the man was a tramp a gypsy a ragged penniless rolling stone but in his own way he was a genius cargrim wondered with all his bravery and endurance and resource that he had not made his fortune the eloquent scamp seemed to wonder also for said he striking the table with his fist i have never been able to hold what i won i've been a millionaire twice over but the gold wouldn't stay it uh, drifted away it was swept away it vanished like macbeth's witches into thin air look at me you country cabbages i've reigned a king amongst savages a poor sort of king say you but a king's a king say i and king i have been yet here i am sitting in a berminster gutter but i don't stay in it by blank 
he confirmed his purpose with an oath not i i've got my plans laid and they'll lift me up to the stars yet have you the money mister inquired a sceptical listener what's that to you cried jentham and finished his drink yes i have money he set down his empty glass with a bang at least i know where to get it bah you fools one can get blood out of a stone if one knows how to go about it i know i know my tom tiddler's ground isn't far from your holy township and he began to sing southbury heath's tom tiddler's ground gold and silver are there to be found it's dropped by the priest kicked up by the knave for the one is a coward the other is brave more brandy waiter make it stiff sunny stiff 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 the man's wild speech and rude song were unintelligible to his stupid drink bemused audience but the keen brain of the schemer lurking near the door picked up their sense at once dr pendle was the priest who was to drop the money on southbury heath and jentham the knave who was to pick it up as certainly as though the man had given chapter and verse cargrim understood his enigmatic stave his mind flashed back to the memory that dr pendle intended to ride over to southbury in the morning across the heath without doubt he had agreed to meet there this man who boasted that he could get blood out of a stone and the object of the meeting was to bribe him to silence but however loosely jentham alluded to his intention of picking up gold he was cunning enough with all his excitement to hold his tongue as to how he could work such a miracle undoubtedly there was a secret between dr pendle and this scamp but what it might be cargrim could by no means guess was jentham a disreputable relation of the bishop's had dr pendle committed a crime in his youth for which he was now being blackmailed what could be the nature of the secret which gave this unscrupulous blackguard a hold on a dignitary of the church cargrim's brain was quite bewildered by his conjectures hitherto jentham had been in the blabbing stage of intoxication but after another glass of drink he relapsed into a sullen silent condition and with his eyes on the table pulled fiercely at his pipe so that his wicked face looked out like that of a devil from amid the rolling clouds of smoke his audience waited open-mouthed for more stories but as their entertainer seemed too moody to tell them any more they began to talk amongst themselves principally about horses and dogs it was now growing late and the most respectable of the crowd were moving homeward cargrim felt that to keep up the dignity of his cloth he should depart also for several looks of surprise were cast in his direction but jentham and his wild speeches fascinated him and he lurked in his corner watching the sullen face of the man until the two were left the sole occupants of the room then jentham looked up to call the waiter to bring him a final drink and his eyes met those of mr cargrim after a keen glance he suddenly broke into a peal of discordant laughter which died away into a savage and menacing growl hello he grumbled here is the busybody of Burminster. and what may you want mr paul pry a oh, little civility in the first place my worthy friend said cargrim in silky tones for he did not relish the insolent tone of the satirical scamp i am no friend to spies how dare you speak to me like that fellow you call me a fellow and i'll knock your head off cried jentham rising with a savage look in his eyes if you aren't a spy why do you come sneaking round here i came to see mrs mosk explained the chaplain in a mighty dignified manner but she is asleep so i could not see her in passing the door of this room i heard you relating your adventures and i naturally stopped to listen to hear if i had anything to say about my visit to your bishop i suppose growled jentham unpleasantly i have a great mind to tell him how you watch me you infernal devil dodger respect my cloth sir begin by respecting it yourself damn you what would his lordship of Burminster say if he knew you were here his lordship does know jentham started perhaps he sent you he said looking doubtful no he did not contradicted cargrim who saw that nothing was to be learned while the man was thus bemused with drink i have told you the reason of my presence here and as i am here i warn you as a clergyman not to drink any more you have already had more than enough jentham was staggered by the boldness of the chaplain and stared at him open-mouthed 
then recovering his speech he poured forth such a volley of vile words at cargrim that the chaplain stepped to the door and called the landlord he felt that it was time for him to assert himself this man is drunk mosk said he sharply and if you keep such a creature on your premises you will get into trouble creature yourself cried jentham advancing towards cargrim i'll wring your neck if you use such language to me i've killed fifty better men than you in my time mosk he turned with a snarl on the landlord get me a drink of brandy i think you've had enough mr jentham said the landlord with a glance at cargrim and you owe me money curse you what of that raved jentham stamping do you think i'll not pay you i've not seen the colour of your money lately you'll see it when i choose i'll have hundreds of pounds next week hundreds and he broke out fiercely get me more brandy don't mind that devil dodger go to bed said mosk retiring go to bed jentham ran after him with an angry cry so cargrim feeling himself somewhat out of place in this pothouse row nodded to mosk and left the hotel with as much dignity as he could muster as he went the burden of jentham's last speech hundreds of pounds hundreds of pounds rang in his ears and more than ever he desired to examine the bishop's cheque-book in order to ascertain the exact sum the secret he thought must indeed be a precious one when the cost of its preservation ran into three figures when cargrim emerged into the street it was still filled with people as ten o'clock was just chiming from the cathedral tower the gossipers had retired within and lights were gleaming in the upper windows of the houses but knots of neighbours still stood about here and there talking and laughing loudly cargrim strolled slowly down the streets towards the east gate musing over his late experience and enjoying the coolness of the night air after the sultry atmosphere of the coffee-room the sky was now brilliant with stars and a silver moon rolled aloft in the blue arch shedding down floods of light on the town and investing its commonplace aspect with something of romance the streets were radiant with the cold clear lustre the shadows cast by the houses lay black as indian ink on the ground and the laughter and noise of the passers-by seemed woefully out of place in this magical white world cargrim was alive to the beauty of the night but was too much taken up with his thoughts to pay much attention to its mingled mystery of shadow and light as he took his musing way through the wide streets of the modern town he was suddenly brought to a standstill by hearing the voice of jentham some distance away evidently the man had quarrelled with the landlord and had been turned out of the hotel for he came rolling along in a lurching drunken manner roaring out a wild and savage ditty picked up no doubt in some land at the back of beyond oh i have trekked the eight world climes and sailed the seven seas i have made my pile a hundred times and chucked the lot in sprees but when my ship comes home my lads why curse me don't i know the spot that's worth the bloomin earth the spot where i shall go they call it kalao oh for oh it's kalao for on no condition is extradition allowed in kalao jentham roared and ranted the fierce old chanty with as much gusto and noise as though he were camping in the wastelands to which the song applied instead of disturbing the peace of a quiet english town as his thin form came swinging along in the silver light men and women drew back with looks of alarm to let him pass and cargrim not wishing to have trouble with the drunken bully slipped into the shadow of a house until he passed as usual there was no policeman visible and jentham went bellowing and storming through the quiet summer night like the dissolute ruffian he was he was making for the country in the direction of the palace and wondering if he intended to force his way into the house to threaten dr pendle the chaplain followed immediately behind but he was careful to keep out of sight as jentham was in just the excited frame of mind to draw a knife and cargrim knowing his lawless nature had little doubt but that he had one concealed in his boot or trouser belt the delicate coward shivered at the idea of a rough and tumble encounter with an armed buccaneer on went jentham swinging his arms with mad gestures and followed by the black shadow of the chaplain until the two were clear of the town then the gipsy turned down a shadowy lane cut through a footpath and when he emerged again into the broad roadway 
found himself opposite the iron gates of the episcopalian park here he stopped singing and shook his fist at them come out you devil dodger he bellowed savagely come out and give me money or i'll shame you before the whole town you clerical hypocrite then he took a pull at a pocket flask cargram listened eagerly in the hope of hearing something definite and jentham gathered himself together for further denunciation of the bishop when round the corner tripped two women towards whom his drunken attention was at once attracted with a hoarse chuckle he reeled towards them come along my beauty he hiccuped stretching out his arms here's your haven wine and women i love em both the women both shrieked and rushed along the road pursued by the ruffian just as he had laid rude hands on the last one a young man came racing along the footpath and swung into the middle of the road the next moment jentham lay sprawled on his back and the lady assaulted was clinging to the arm of her preserver why it's mab said the young man in surprise george cried miss arden and burst into tears oh george curse you both growled jentham rising slowly i'll be even with you for that blow my lad i'll kick you into the next field if you don't clear out retorted george pendle did he hurt you ma'am no no but i was afraid i was at mrs tears and was coming home with ellen when that man jumped on to us oh 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 the villain cried captain pendle who is he it was at this moment that all danger being over cargram judged it judicious to emerge from his retreat he came forward hurriedly as though he had just arrived on the scene what is the matter he exclaimed i heard a scream what captain pendle miss arden this is indeed a surprise captain pendle cried jentham the son of the bishop curse him george whirled his stick and made a dash at the creature but was restrained by mab who implored him not to provoke further quarrels george took her arm within his own gave a curt nod to the chaplain whom he suspected had seen more of the affray than he chose to admit and flung a word to jentham clear out you dog he said or i'll hand you over to the police come mab yonder is ellen waiting for you we'll join her and i shall see you both home jentham stood looking after the three figures with a scowl you'll hand me over to the police george pendle will you he muttered loud enough for cargram to overhear take care i don't do the same thing to your father and like a noisome and dangerous animal he crept back in the shadow of the hedge and disappeared aha chuckled cargram as he walked towards the park gates it has to do with the police then my lord bishop so much the better for me so much the worse for you End of chapter nine Chapter Ten of The Bishop's Secret by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten Morning Service in the Minster. The cathedral is the glory of Berminster, of the county, and indeed of all England, since no churches surpass it in size and splendor save the minsters of York and Canterbury. Founded and endowed by Henry the Second in eleven eighty four for the glory of God it is dedicated to the blessed st wolf of osserton a holy hermit of saxon times who was killed by the heathen danes bishop gandalf designed the building in the picturesque style of anglo-norman architecture and as the original plans have been closely adhered to by successive prelates the vast fabric is the finest example extant of the norman superiority in architectural science it was begun by gandalf in eleven eighty five and finished at the beginning of the present century therefore as it took six hundred years in building every portion of it is executed in the most perfect manner it is renowned both for its beauty and sanctity and forms one of the most splendid memorials of architectural art and earnest faith to be found even in england that land of fine churches the great central tower rises to the height of two hundred feet in square massiveness and from this point springs a slender and graceful spire to another hundred feet so that next to salisbury the great archetype of this special class of ecclesiastical architecture it is the tallest spire in england 
two square towers richly ornamented embellish the western front and beneath the great window over the central entrance is a series of canopied arches the church is cruciform in shape and is built of portland stone the whole being richly ornamented with pinnacles buttresses crocketed spires and elaborate tracery statues of saints kings queens and bishops are placed in niches along the northern and southern fronts and the western front itself is sculptured with scenes from holy scripture in the quaint grotesque style of medieval art no ivy is permitted to conceal the beauties of the building and elevated in the clear air far above the smoke of the town it looks as fresh and white and clean-cut as though it had been erected only within the last few years spared by henry the eighth and the iconoclastic rage of the puritans time alone has dealt with it and time has mellowed the whole to a pale amber hue which adds greatly to the beauty of the mighty fane Berminster Cathedral is a poem in stone. Within, the nave and transepts are lofty and imposing, with innumerable arches springing from massive marble pillars. The rood screen is ornate, with figures of saints and patriarchs. The pavement is diversified with brasses and carved marble slabs, and several crusaders' tombs adorn the side chapels. The many windows are mostly of stained glass, since these were not destroyed by the Puritans, and when the sun shines on a summer's day the twilight interior is dyed with rich hues and quaint patterns as the bishop of Burminster is a high churchman the altar is magnificently decorated and during service what with the light and colour and brilliancy the vast building seems unlike the dead aspect of many of its kind to be filled with life and movement and living faith a romanist might well imagine that he was attending one of the magnificent and imposing services of his own faith save that the uttered words are spoken in the mother tongue as became a city whose whole existence depended upon the central shrine the services at the cathedral were invariably well attended the preaching attracted some the fine music many and the imposing ritual introduced by bishop pendle went a great way towards bringing worshippers to the altar a cold frigid undecorated service appealing more to the intellect than the senses would not have drawn together so vast and attentive a congregation but the warmth and colour and musical fervour of the new ritual lured the most careless within the walls of the sacred building bishop pendle was right in his estimate of human nature for when the senses are enthralled by colour and sound and vast spaces and symbolic decorations the reverential feeling thus engendered prepares the mind for the reception of the sublime truths of christianity a pure faith and a gorgeous ritual are not so incompatible as many people think god should be worshipped with pomp and splendour we should bring to his service all that we can invent in the way of art and beauty if god has prepared for those who believe the splendid habitation of the new jerusalem with its gates of pearl and its streets of gold why should we his creatures stint our gifts in his service and debar the beautiful things which he inspires us to create with brain and hand from use in his holy temple out of the fullness of the heart the mouth speaketh and out of the fullness of the hand the giver should give date et dabitur the great luther was right in applying this saying to the church one of the congregation at st wolf's on this particular morning was captain george pendle and he came less for the service than in the hope after the manner of those in love of meeting with mab arden during the reading of the lessons his eyes were roving here and there in search of that beloved face but much to his dismay he could not see it finally on a chair near a pillar he caught sight of Miss Wichello in her poke bonnet and black silk cloak, but she was alone, and there were no bright eyes beside her to send a glance in the direction of George. Having ascertained beyond all doubt that Mab was not in the church, and believing that she was unwell after the shock of Jentham's attack on the previous night, George withdrew his attention from the congregation and settled himself to listen attentively to the anthem it was worthy of the cathedral and higher praise cannot be given 
i have blotted out as a thick cloud sang the boy soloist in a clear sweet treble i have blotted out thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins then came the triumphant cry of the choir borne on the rich waves of sound rolling from the organ return unto me for i have redeemed thee the lofty roof reverberated with the melodious thunder and the silvery altos pierced through the great volume of sound like arrows of song return 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 called the choristers louder and higher and clearer and ended with a magnificent burst of harmony with a sublime proclamation the lord hath redeemed jacob and glorified himself in israel when the white-robed singers resumed their seats the organ still continued to peal forth triumphant notes which died away in gentle murmurs it was like the passing by of a tempest the stilling of the ocean after a storm mr cargram preached the sermon and with a vivid recollection of his present enterprise waxed eloquent on the ominous text be sure thy sin will find thee out his belief that the bishop was guilty of some crime for the concealment of which he intended to bribe jentham had been strengthened by an examination on that very morning of the cheque-book dr pendle had departed on horseback for southbury after an early breakfast and after hurriedly dispatching his own cargrin had hastened to the library here as he expected he found the cheque-book carelessly left in an unlocked drawer of the desk and on looking over it he found that one of the butts had been torn out the previous butt bore a date immediately preceding that of dr pendle's departure for london so cargram had little difficulty in concluding that the bishop had drawn the next check in london and had torn out the butt to which it had been attached this showed as the chaplain very truly thought that dr pendle was desirous of concealing not only the amount of the check since he had kept no note of the sum on the butt but of hiding the fact that the cheque had been drawn at all this conduct coupled with the fact of jentham's allusion to tom tiddler's ground and his snatch of extempore song confirmed cargram in his suspicions that pendle had visited london for the purpose of drawing out a large sum of money and intended to pay the same over to jentham that very night on southbury heath with this in his mind it was no wonder that cargram preached a stirring sermon he repeated his warning text over and over again he illustrated it in the most brilliant fashion and his appeals to those who had secret sins to confess them at once were quite heartrending in their pathos as most of his congregation had their own little peccadilloes to worry over mr cargram's sermon made them quite uneasy and created a decided sensation much to his own gratification if bishop pendle had only been seated on his throne to hear that sermon cargram would have been thoroughly satisfied but alas the bishop worthy man was confirming innocent sinners at southbury and thus lost any chance he might have had of profiting by his chaplain's eloquence however the congregation could not be supposed to know the secret source of the chaplain's eloquence and his withering denunciations were supposed to arise from a consciousness of his own pure and open heart the female admirers of cargram particularly dwelt in after-church gossip on this presumed cause of the excellent sermon they had heard and when the preacher appeared he was congratulated on all sides miss tancred for once forgot her purse story and absolutely squeaked in the highest of keys in her efforts to make the young man understand the amount of pleasure he had given her even mrs pansey was pleased to express her approval of so well chosen a text and looked significantly at several of her friends as she remarked that she hoped they would take its warning to heart george came upon his father's chaplain grinning like a heathen idol in the midst of a tempestuous ocean of petticoats and the bland way in which he sniffed up the incense of praise showed how grateful such homage was to his vain nature at that moment he saw himself a future bishop and that at no very great distance of time indeed had the election of such a prelate been in the hand of his admirers he would have been elevated that very moment to the nearest vacant episcopalian throne captain pendle looked on contemptuously at this priest-worship the sneaking cad he thought 
sneering at the excellent cargram i dare say he thinks he is the greatest man in beorminster just now he looks as though butter wouldn't melt in his mouth there was no love lost between the chaplain and the captain for on several occasions the latter had found cargram a slippery customer and lax in his notions of honour while the curate knowing that he had not been clever enough to hoodwink george hated him with all the fervour and malice of his petty soul however he hoped soon to have the power to wound captain pendle through his father so he could afford to smile blandly in response to the young soldier's contemptuous look and he smiled more than ever when brisk miss whichello with her small face ruddy as a winter apple marched up and joined in the congratulations in future i shall call you boanerges mr cargram she cried her bright little eyes dancing you quite frightened me i looked into my mind to see what sins i had committed and found none i'm sure said the courtly chaplain you would have found one if you had looked long enough growled mrs pansey who hated the old maid as a rival practitioner amongst the poor and that is you did not bring your niece to hear the sermon i don't call such carelessness christianity don't look at my sins through a microscope mrs pansey i did not bring mab because she is not well oh really dear miss winchelow chimed in daisy norsham why i thought that your sweet niece looked the very picture of health all those strong tall women do not like poor little me you need dieting retorted miss whichello with a disparaging glance your face is pale and pasty if it isn't powder it's bad digestion miss whichello cried the outraged spinster i'm an old woman my dear and you must allow me to speak my mind i'm sure mrs pansey always does you need not be so very unpleasant no really the truth is always unpleasant said mrs pansey who could not forbear a thrust even at her own guest but miss whichello doesn't often hear it with a dig at her rival come away daisy mr cargram next time you preach take for your text the tongue is a two-edged sword do mr cargram cried miss whichello darting an angry glance at mrs pansey and illustrate it with the one to whom it particularly applies ladies ladies remonstrated cargram while both combatants ruffled their plumes like two fighting cocks and the more timid of the spectators scuttled out of the way how the situation would have ended it is impossible to say as the two ladies were equally matched but george saved it by advancing to greet miss whichello when the little woman saw him she darted forward and shook his hand with unfeigned warmth my dear captain pendle she cried i am so glad to see you and thank you for your noble conduct of last night why miss whichello it was nothing murmured the modest hero indeed i must say it was very valiant said cargram graciously do you know ladies that miss arden was attacked last night by a tramp and captain pendle knocked him down oh really how very sweet cried daisy casting an admiring look at george's handsome face which appealed to her appreciation of manly beauty what was miss arden doing to place herself in the position of being attacked by a tramp asked mrs pansey in a hard voice this must be looked into thank you mrs pansey i have looked into it myself said miss whichello captain pendle come home with me to luncheon and tell me about it mr cargram you come also both gentlemen bowed and accepted the former because he wished to see mab the latter because he knew that captain pendle did not want him to come as miss whichello moved off with her two guests mrs pansey exclaimed in a loud voice poor young men luncheon indeed they will be starved i know for a fact that she weighs out the food in scales then having had the last word she went home in triumph end of chapter ten chapter eleven of the bishop's secret by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven miss whichello's luncheon party the little lady trotted briskly across the square and guided her guests to a quaint old house squeezed into one corner of it here she had been born some sixty-odd years before 
here she had lived her life of spinsterhood save for an occasional visit to london and here she hoped to die although at present she kept death at a safe distance by hygienic means and dietary treatment the house was a queer survival of three centuries with a pattern of black oak beams let into a whitewashed front its roof shot up into a high gable at an acute angle and was tiled with red clay squares mellowed by time to the hue of rusty iron a long lattice with diamond panes and geraniums in flower-pots behind them extended across the lower story two little jutting windows also the criss-cross pattern looked like two eyes in the second story and high up in the third the casement of the attic peered out coyly from under the eaves at the top of a flight of immaculately white steps there was a squat little door painted green and adorned with a brass knocker burnished to the colour of fine gold the railings of iron round the area were also coloured green and the appearance of the whole exterior was as spotless and neat as miss whichello herself it was an ideal house for a dainty old spinster such as she was and rested in the very shadow of the bishop gandalf's cathedral like the nest of a bright-eyed wren mab my dear cried the wren herself as she led the gentleman into the drawing-room i have brought captain pendle and mr cargram to luncheon mab arose out of a deep chair and laid aside the book she was reading i saw you crossing the square captain pendle she said shaking his hand mr cargram i am glad to see you are you not glad to see me whispered george in low tones do you need me to tell you so was mab's reply with a smile and that smile answered his question oh my dear such a heavenly sermon cried miss whichello fluttering about the room it went to my very heart it could not have gone to a better place replied the chaplain in the gentle voice which george particularly detested i am sorry to hear you have suffered from your alarm last night miss arden my nerves received rather a shock mr cargram and i had such a bad headache that i decided to remain at home i must receive your sermon second-hand from my aunt why not first-hand from me said cargram insinuatingly whereupon captain george pulled his moustache and looked savage oh i won't tax your good nature so far rejoined mab laughing what is it auntie for the wren was still fluttering and restless my dear you must content yourself with captain pendle till luncheon for i want mr cargram to come into the garden and see my fig tree real figs grow on it mr cargram said miss whichello solemnly the very first figs that have ever ripened in Burminster. i am glad it is not a barren fig tree said cargram introducing a scriptural allusion in his most clerical manner barren indeed it has five figs on it really sitting under its shade one would fancy one was in palestine do come mr cargram and miss whichello fluttered through the door like an escaping bird with pleasure the more so as i know we shall not be missed damn muttered captain pendle when the door closed on cargram's smile and insinuating looks captain pendle exclaimed miss arden becomingly shocked captain pendle indeed said the young man slipping his arm round mab and why not george i thought mr cargram might hear he ought to like the ass his ears are long enough still he is anything but an ass george if he isn't an ass he's a beast rejoined pendle promptly and it comes to much the same thing well you need not swear at him if i didn't swear i'd kick him mab and think of the scandal to the church cargram's a sneaking time-serving sycophant i wonder my father can endure him i can't i don't like him myself confessed mab as they seated themselves in the window seat i should think not cried captain george in so deliberate and disgusted a tone that mab laughed whereat he kissed her and was reproved so that both betook themselves to argument as to the righteousness or unrighteousness of kissing on a sunday george pendle was a tall slim and very good-looking young man in every sense of the word he was as fair as mab was dark with bright blue eyes and a bronzed skin against which his smartly pointed moustache appeared by contrast almost white 
with his upright figure his alert military air and merry smile he looked an extremely handsome and desirable lover and so mab thought although she reproved him with orthodox modesty for snatching a kiss unasked but if men had to request favours of this sort there would not be much kissing in the world moreover stolen kisses like stolen fruit have a piquant flavour of their own the quaint old drawing-room with its low ceiling and twilight atmosphere was certainly an ideal place for love-making it was furnished with chairs and tables and couches which had done duty in the days of miss whichello's grandparents and if the carpet was old so much the better for its once brilliant tints had faded into soft hues more restful to the eye in one corner stood the grandfather of all pianos with a front of drawn green silk fluted to a central button beside it a prim canterbury filled with primly bound books of yellow-paged music containing the battle of the prague the maiden's prayer cherry ripe and the canary birds quadrilles such tinkling melodies had been the delight of miss whichello's youth and as she had a fine finger for the piano her own observation she sometimes tinkled them now on the jingling old piano when old friends came to see her also there were chippendale cupboards with glass doors filled with a most wonderful collection of old china older even than their owner chinese jars heaped up with dried rose leaves spreading around a perfume of dead summers bright silken screens from far japan footstools and fender stools worked in worsted which tripped up the unwary and a number of oil paintings valuable rather for age than beauty none of your modern flimsy drawing-rooms was miss whichello's but a dear delightful cosy room full of faded splendours and relics of the dead and gone so dearly beloved from the yellow silk fire-screen swinging on a rosewood pole to the drowsy old canary chirping feebly in his brass cage at the window all was old world and marvellously proper and genteel withal a quiet perfumed room delightful to make love in to the most beautiful woman in the world as captain george pendle knew very well though it really isn't proper for you to kiss me observed mab folding her slender hands on her white gown you know we are not engaged i know nothing of the sort my dearest prude you are the only woman i ever intend to marry have you any objections if so i should like to hear them i am two years older than you george a man is as old as he looks a woman as she feels i am quite convinced miss arden that you feel nineteen years of age so the disparity rests rather on my shoulders than on yours you don't look old laughed mab letting her hand lie in that of her lovers but i feel old old enough to marry you my dear what is your next objection your father does not know that you love me my mother does lucy does and with two women to persuade him my dear kind old father will gladly consent to the match i have no money my dearest neither have i two negatives make an affirmative and that affirmative is to be uttered by you when i ask if i may tell the bishop that you are willing to become a soldier's wife oh george cried mab anxiously it is a very serious matter you know how particular your father is about birth and family my parents are dead i never knew them for my father died before i was born and my mother followed him to the grave when i was a year old if my dear mother's sister had not taken charge of me and brought me up i should very likely have gone on the parish for as auntie says my parents were paupers my lovely pauper what is all this to me here is your answer to all the nonsense you have been talking and george with the proverbial boldness of a soldier laid a fond kiss on the charming face so near to his own oh george began the scandalized mab for the fifth time at least and was about to reprove her audacious lover again when miss whichello bustled into the room followed by the black shadow of the parson george and mab sprang apart with alacrity and each wondered while admiring the cathedral opposite if miss whichello or cargram had heard the sound of that stolen kiss apparently the dear unsuspecting old jenny wren had not 
for she hopped up to the pair in her bird-like fashion and took george's arm come good people she said briskly luncheon is ready and so are your appetites i've no doubt mr cargrim take in my niece in five minutes the quartet were seated round a small table in miss whichello's small dining-room the apartment was filled with oak furniture black with age and wondrously carved the curtains and carpet and cushions were a faded crimson rep and as the gaily striped sun-blinds were down the whole was enwrapped in a sober brown atmosphere restful to the eye and cool to the skin the oval table was covered with a snow-white cloth on which sparkled silver and crystal round a nankin porcelain bowl of blue and white filled with deep red roses the dinner plates were of thin china painted with sprawling dragons in yellow and green the food in spite of mrs pansey's report was plentiful and dainty and the wines came from the stock laid down by the father of the hostess in the days when dignitaries of the church knew what good wine was it is true that a neat pair of brass scales was placed beside miss whichello but she used them to weigh out such portions of food as she judged to be needful for herself and did not mar her hospitality by interfering with the appetite of her guests the repast was tempting the company congenial and the two young men enjoyed themselves greatly miss whichello was an entertainer worth knowing if only for her cook mab my dear cried the lively old lady i am ashamed of your appetite don't you feel better for your morning's rest much better thank you auntie but it is too hot to eat try some salad my love it is cool and green and excellent for the blood if i had my way people would eat more green stuff than they do like so many nebuchadnezzars suggested cargrim always scriptural well some kinds of grass are edible you know mr cargrim although we need not go on all fours to eat them as he did so many people would need to revert to their natural characters of animals if that custom came in said george smiling a certain great poet remarked that every one had a portion of the nature of some animal observed cargrim especially women then mrs pansey is a magpie cried mab with an arch look at her aunt she is a magpie and a fox and a laughing hyena my dear oh auntie what a trinity i suppose cargrim all you black-coated parsons are rooks said george no doubt captain and you soldiers are lions auntie is a jenny wren and mab is a white peacock said miss whichello with a nod captain pendle protect me laughed mrs arden i decline to be called a peacock you are a golden bird of paradise miss arden ah that is a pretty compliment captain pendle thank you while george laughed and cargrim rather tired of these zoological comparisons strove to change the subject by an allusion to the adventure of the previous night the man who attacked you was certainly a wolf he said decisively who was the man asked miss whichello carefully weighing herself some cheese some tramp who has been in the wars replied george carelessly a discharged soldier i dare say at least he had a long red scar on his villainous-looking face i saw it in the moonlight marking him as with the brand of cain a scar repeated miss whichello in so altered a tone that cargrim stared at her and hastened to explain further so as to learn if possible the meaning of her strange look a scar on the right cheek he said slowly from uh, the ear to the mouth what kind of a looking man is he said the old lady pushing away her plate with a nervous gesture something like a gypsy lean tall and swarthy with jet-black eyes and an evil expression he talks like an educated person you seem to know all about him cargrim said captain pendle in some surprise while miss whichello her rosy face pale and scared sat silently staring at the tablecloth i have several times been to an hotel called the derby winner explained the chaplain to see a sick woman and there i came across this scamp several times he stays there i believe what is his name asked miss whichello hoarsely jentham i have been informed jentham i don't know the name i don't suppose you know the man either auntie 
no my love replied miss whichello in a low voice i i don't suppose i know the man either is he still at the derby winner mr cargrim i believe so he portions his time between that hotel and a gipsy camp on southbury common what is he doing here really my dear lady i do not know auntie one would think you knew the man said mab amazed at her aunt's emotion no mab i do not said miss whichello vehemently more so than the remark warranted but if he attacks people on the high road he should certainly be shut up well good people she added with an attempt at her former lively manner if you are finished we will return to the drawing-room all attempts to restore the earlier harmony of the visit failed for the conversation languished and miss whichello was silent and distraught the young men shortly took their leave and the old lady seemed glad to be rid of them outside george and cargrim separated as neither was anxious for the other's company as the chaplain walked to the palace he reflected on the strange conduct of miss whichello she knows something about jentham he thought I wonder if she has a secret, too. End of chapter 11although the palace was so near Burminster, and the sphere of gabriel's labours lay in the vicinity of the cathedral bishop pendle did not judge it wise that his youngest son should dwell beneath the paternal roof to teach him independence to strengthen his will and character and because he considered that a clergyman should to a certain extent share the lot of those amongst whom he laboured the bishop arranged that gabriel should inhabit lodgings in the old town not far from the derby winner it was by reason of this contiguity that gabriel became acquainted with the handsome barmaid of the hotel and as he was a more weak-natured man than his father dreamed of it soon came about that he fell in love with the girl matters between them had gone much further than even cargrim with all his suspicions guessed for in the skilful hands of miss mosk the curate was as clay and for some time he had been engaged to his charmer no one knew this not even mrs mosk for the fair belle was quite capable of keeping a secret but gabriel was firmly bound to her by honour and belle possessed a ring which she kept in the drawer of her looking-glass and wore in secret as symbol of an engagement she did not dare to reveal on sunday evening she arrayed herself in her best garments and putting on this ring told her mother that she was going to church at first mrs mosk feebly objected as her husband was away in southbury and would not be back all night but as bell declared that she wanted some amusement after working hard at pulling beer all the week mrs mosk gave way she did not approve of bell's mention of evening service as amusement but she did approve of her going to church so when the young lady had exhibited herself to the invalid in all her finery she went away in the greatest good humour as the evening was hot she had put on a dress of pale blue muslin adorned with white ribbons a straw hat with many flowers and feathers and to finish off her costume her gloves and shoes and sunshade were white as these cool colours rather toned down the extreme red of her healthy complexion she really looked very well and when gabriel saw her seated in a pew near the pulpit behaving as demurely as a cat that is after cream he could not but think how pretty and pious she was it was probably the first time that piety had ever been associated with bell's character although she was not a bad girl on the whole but that gabriel should gift her with such a quality showed how green and innocent he was as regards the sex the church in which he preached was an ancient building at the foot of the hill crowned by the cathedral it was built of rough grey stone in the norman style of architecture and very little had been done to adorn it either within or without as the worshippers were few and poor and low church in their tendencies those who liked pomp and colour and ritual could find all three in the minster so there was no necessity to hold elaborate services in this grey cold little chapel in her heart bell preferred the cathedral with its music and choir its many celebrants and fashionable congregation but out of diplomacy she came to sit under gabriel and follow him as her spiritual guide 
nevertheless she thought less of him in this capacity than as a future husband likely to raise her to a position worthy of her beauty and merits of both of which she entertained a most excellent opinion as usual the pews were half empty but gabriel being a devout parson performed the service with much earnestness he read the lessons lent his voice to the assistance of the meagre choir and preached a short but sensible discourse which pleased every one bell did not hear much of it for her mind was busy with hopes that gabriel would shortly induce his father to receive her as a daughter-in-law it is true that she saw difficulties in the way but to a clever woman like herself she did not think them unconquerable having gone so far as to engage herself to the young man she was determined to go to the whole length and benefit as much as possible for her sacrifice as she thought it of accepting the somewhat trying position of a curate's wife with her bold good looks and aggressive love of dress and amusement bell was hardly the type likely to do credit to a parsonage but any doubts on that score never entered her vain mind when the service was over and the sparse congregation had dwindled away she went round to the vestry and asked jarper the cross old verger if she could see mr pendle jarper who took a paternal interest in the curate and did not like miss mosk overmuch since she stinted him of his full measure of beer when he patronized her father's hotel replied in surly tones that mr pendle was tired and could see no one but i must see him persisted bell who was as obstinate as a mule my mother is very ill then why don't you stay to home and look arter her she sent me out to ask mr pendle to see her and i want none of your insolence jacob jarper don't he be bold miss mox i have been verger here these sixty year i have and i don't want to be told my duty by sich as you such as me indeed cried bell with a flash of the paternal temper if i wasn't a lady i'd give you a piece of my mind he 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 chuckled jarper fears as you're all ladies by your own way of showin not that ye ain't handsome far be it from me to say as ye ain't but muster pendle well that's a different matter at this moment gabriel put an end to what threatened to develop into a quarrel by appearing at the vestry door on learning that mrs mosk wished to see him he readily consented to accompany bell but as he had some business to attend to at the church before he went he asked bell to wait for a few minutes i'll be some little time jarper said he kindly to the sour old verger so if you give me the keys i'll lock up and you can go home to your supper i am hungry mr pendle confessed jarper and it ain't at my time of life as old folk should starve i've locked up the whole church crypt in the vestry door and here's the key locked be careful with the light and put it out mr pendle for if you burns down the church what good is fine sermons i'd like to know it will be all right jarper i'll give you the key to-morrow good night good night jarper chimed in bell in her most stately manner thank ye muster pendle uh, good night but i don't want no beer from you this evening miss bell mosk growled the old man and chuckling over this exhibition of wit he hobbled away to his supper these common people are most insolent said bell with an affectation of fine ladyism let us go into the vestry gabriel i wish to speak to you oh you needn't look so scared there's nobody about now that old dot and carry one has gone this last in allusion to jarper's lameness bell please don't use such language remonstrated gabriel as he conducted her into the vestry some one might hear i don't care if some one does retorted miss mosk taking a chair near the flaring spluttering gas jet but i tell you there is no one about i wouldn't be here alone with you if, if there were i'm as careful of my own reputation as i am of yours i can tell you is your mother ill again asked gabriel arranging some sheets of paper on the table and changing the conversation oh she's no better and no worse but you better come and see her so that folks won't be talking of my having spoken to you a cat can't look at a jug in this town without they think she's after the cream you wish to speak with me bell yes i do come and sit alongside of me gabriel being very much in love obeyed with the greatest willingness and when he sat down under the gas jet would have taken bell in his arms but that she evaded his clasp there's no time for anything of that sort my dear said she sharply we've got to talk business you and i we have 
business about our engagement you've hit it gabriel that's the business i wish to understand how long is this sort of thing going on what sort of thing now don't pretend to misunderstand me cried bell with acerbity or you and i shall fall out of the cart what sort of thing indeed why my engagement to you being kept secret your pretending to visit mother when it's me you want my being obliged to hide the ring you gave me from father's eyes that's the sort of thing mr gabriel pendle i know it is a painful position dearest but painful position echoed the girl contemptuously oh i don't care two straws about the painful position it's the danger i'm thinking about danger what do you mean danger from whom from mrs pansey from mr cargram she guesses a lot and he knows more than is good for either you or i i don't want to lose my character bell no one dare say a word against your character i should think not retorted miss mosk firing up i'd have the law on them if they did i can look after myself i hope and there's no man i know likely to get the better of me i don't say i'm an aristocrat gabriel but i'm an honest girl and as good a lady as any of them i'll make you a first-class wife in spite of my bringing up gabriel kissed her my darling bell you are the sweetest and cleverest woman in the world you know how i adore you bell knew very well for she was sharp enough to distinguish between genuine and spurious affection strange as it may appear the refined and educated young clergyman was deeply in love with this handsome bold woman of the people some lovers of flowers prefer full-blown roses ripe and red to the most exquisite buds gabriel's tastes were the same and he admired the florid beauty of bell with all the ardour of his young and impetuous heart he was blind to her liking for incongruous colours and dress he was deaf to her bold expressions and defects in grammar what lured him was her ripe rich exuberant beauty what charmed him was the flash of her white teeth and the brilliancy of her eyes when she smiled what dominated him was her strong will and practical way of looking on worldly affairs opposite natures are often attracted to one another by the very fact that they are so undeniably unlike and the very characteristics in bell which pleased gabriel were those which he lacked himself undoubtedly he loved her but it may be asked did she love him and that is the more difficult question to answer candidly speaking bell had an affection for gabriel she liked his good looks his refined voice his very weakness of character was not unpleasing to her but she did not love him sufficiently to marry him for himself alone what she wished to marry was the gentleman the clergyman the son of the bishop of Berminster, and unless gabriel could give her all the pleasures and delights attendant on his worldly position she was not prepared to become mrs gabriel pendle it was to make this clear to him to clinch the bargain to show that she was willing to barter her milkmaid beauty and strong common sense for his position and possible money that she had come to see him not being bemused with love bell mosk was thoroughly practical and so spoke very much to the point never was there so prosaic an interview well it just comes to this she said determinedly i'm not going to be kept in the background serving out beer any longer if i am worth marrying i am worth acknowledging and that's just what you've got to do gabriel but my father faltered gabriel nervously for he saw in a flash the difficulties of his position what about your father he can't eat me can he he can cut me off with a shilling my dear and that's just what he will do if he knows i'm engaged to you surely bell with your strong common sense you can see that for yourself of course i see it retorted bell sharply for the speech was not flattering to her vanity all the same something must be done we must wait i'm sick of waiting gabriel rose to his feet and began to pace to and fro you cannot desire our marriage more than i do he said fondly i wish to make you my wife in as public a manner as possible but you know i have only a small income as a curate and would not wish us to begin life on a pittance i should think not i've had enough of cutting and contriving but how do you intend to get enough for us to marry on my father has promised me the rectorship of heathcroft the present incumbent is old and cannot possibly live long 
i believe he'll live on just to spite us grumbled bell how much is the living worth six hundred a year there's also the rectory you know well i dare say we can manage on that gabriel perhaps after all it will be best to wait but i don't like it neither do i my dear if you like i'll tell my father and marry you to-morrow then you would lose heathcroft it's extremely probable i would replied gabriel dryly in that case we'll wait said bell springing up briskly i don't suppose that old man is immortal and i'm willing to stick to you for another twelve months bell i thought you loved me sufficiently to accept any position i do love you gabriel but i'm not a fool and i'm not cut out for a poor man's wife i've had quite enough of being a poor man's daughter when poverty comes in at the door love flies out of the window that's as true as true no we'll wait till the old rector dies but if he lasts longer than twelve months i'll lose heart and have to look about me for another husband in my own rank of life bell said gabriel in a pained voice you are cruel rubbish replied the practical barmaid i'm sensible now come and see mother End of chapter twelve Chapter thirteen of the Bishop's Secret by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirteen A Stormy Night. Having given Gabriel plainly to understand the terms upon which she was prepared to continue their secret engagement, Bell kissed him once or twice to soften the rigour of her speech. Then she intimated that she would return alone to the Derby winner, and that Gabriel could follow after a reasonable interval of time had elapsed she also explained the meaning of these precautions if the old cats of the town saw you and i walking along on sunday night said she at the door of the vestry they would screech out that we were keeping company and in any case would couple our names together if they did father would make it so warm for me that i should have to tell the truth and then well added miss mosk with a brilliant smile you know his temper and my temper you are sure it is quite safe for you to go home alone said gabriel who was infected with the upper-class prejudice that every unmarried girl should be provided with a chaperon safe echoed the dauntless bell in a tone of supreme contempt my dear gabriel i'll be safe in the middle of timbuktu there are many of these rough harvest labourers about here you know i'll slap their faces if they speak to me i'd like to see them try it that's all and now good-bye for the present dear i must get home as soon as possible for there is a storm coming and i don't want to get my sunday go to meetin clothes spoilt when she slipped off like a white ghost into the gathering darkness gabriel remained at the door and looked up at the fast clouding sky it was now about nine o'clock and the night was hot and thundery and so airless that it was difficult to breathe overhead masses of dark cloud heavy with storm hung low down over the town and the earth panting and worn out with the heat waited thirstily for the cool drench of the rain evidently a witch tempest was brewing in the halls of heaven on no small scale and gabriel wished that it would break at once to relieve the strain from which nature seemed to suffer whether it was the fatigue of his day's labour or the late interview with bell which depressed him he did not know but he felt singularly pessimistic and his mind was filled with premonitions of ill like most people with highly strung natures gabriel was easily affected by atmospheric influence so no doubt the palpable electricity in the dry hot air depressed his nerves but whether this was the cause of his restlessness he could not say he felt anxious and melancholy and was worried by a sense of coming ill though what such ill might be or from what quarter it would come he knew not while thus gloomily contemplative the great bell of the cathedral boomed out nine deep strokes and the hollow sound breaking in on his reflections made him wake up shake off his dismal thoughts and sent him inside to attend to his work yet the memory of those forebodings occurred to him often in after days and read by the light of after events he was unable to decide whether the expectation of evil so strongly forced upon him then was due to natural or supernatural causes 
at present he ascribed his anxieties to the disturbed state of the atmosphere in the meantime bell who was a healthy young woman with no nerves to be affected by the atmosphere walked swiftly homeward along the airless streets there were few people on their feet for the night was too close for exercise and the majority of the inhabitants sat in chairs before their doors weary and out of temper nature and her creatures were waiting for the windows of the firmament to be opened for the air to be cleansed for life to be renewed bell met none of the harvesters and was not molested in any way had she been spoken to or hustled there is no doubt she would have been as good as her word and have slapped her assailant's face fortunately there was no need for her to proceed to such extremes at the door of the derby winner she was rather surprised to find miss whichello waiting for her the little old lady wore her poke bonnet and old-fashioned black silk cloak and appeared anxious and nervous and altogether unlike her usual cheery self bell liked miss whichello as much as she disliked mrs pansey therefore she greeted her with unfeigned pleasure although she could not help expressing her surprise that the visitor was in that quarter of the town so late at night miss whichello produced a parcel from under her voluminous cloak and offered it as an explanation of her presence this is a pot of calf's foot jelly for your mother miss mosk she said mr cargrim came to luncheon at my house to-day and he told me how ill your mother is i was informed that she was asleep so not wishing to disturb her i waited until you returned it is very kind of you to take so much trouble miss whichello said bell gratefully receiving the jelly i hope you have not been waiting long only ten minutes your servant told me that you would return soon i have been to church and stopped after service to talk to some friends miss whichello won't you come in for a few minutes i'll see if my mother is awake thank you i'll come in for a time but do not waken your mother on my account sleep is always the best medicine in case of sickness i hope mrs mosk is careful of her diet well she eats very little that is wise very little food but that little nourishing and frequently administered give her a cup of beef tea two or three times in the night my dear and you'll find it will sustain the body wonderfully i'll remember to do so replied bell gravely although she had no intention of remaining awake all night to heat beef tea and dose her mother with it especially as the invalid was not ill enough for such extreme measures but she was so touched by miss whichello's kindness that she would not have offended her by scouting her prescription for the world by this time miss whichello was seated in a little private parlour off the bar illuminated by an oil lamp this bell turned up and then she noticed that her visitor looked anxious and ill at ease once or twice she attempted to speak but closed her mouth again bell wondered if mrs pansey had been at work coupling her name with that of gabriel's and whether miss whichello had come down to relieve her conscience by warning her against seeing too much of the curate but as she knew very well miss whichello was too nervous and too much of a lady to give her opinion on questions unasked and therefore banishing the defiant look which had begun to harden her face she waited to hear if it was any other reason than bestowing the jelly which had brought the little old spinster to so disreputable a quarter of the town at so untoward an hour finally miss whichello's real reason for calling came out by degrees and in true feminine fashion she approached the main point by side issues uh, is your father in miss mosk she asked clasping and unclasping her hands feverishly on her lap no miss whichello he rode over this afternoon to southbury on business and we do not expect him back till to-morrow morning poor father sighed bell he went away in anything but good spirits for he is terribly worried over money matters the payment of his rent is troubling him perhaps yes miss whichello this is an expensive hotel and the rent is high we find it so difficult to make the place pay that we are behindhand with the rent sir harry brace our landlord has been very kind in waiting but we can't expect him to stand out of his money much longer i'm afraid in the end we'll have to give up the derby winner but it is no good my worrying you about our troubles concluded bell in a more vivacious tone what do you wish to see father about miss whichello anything that i can do well my dear it is this way said the old lady nervously 
you know that i have a much larger income than i need and that i am always ready to help the deserving oh i know miss whichello you give help where mrs pansey only gives advice i know who is most thought of that i do mrs pansey has her own methods of dispensing charity miss mosk tracks and interference muttered bell under her breath meddlesome old tabby that she is mr cargrim was at my house to-day as i told you pursued miss whichello not having heard this remark and he mentioned a man called jentham as a poor creature in need of help he's a poor creature i dare say said miss mosk tossing her head for he owes father more money than he can pay although he does say that he'll settle his bill next week but he's a bad lot a bad lot miss mosk as bad as they make em miss whichello don't you give him a penny for he'll only waste it on drink does he drink to excess i should think so he finishes a bottle of brandy every day oh miss mosk how very dreadful cried miss whichello quite in the style of daisy norsham why is he staying in Burminster? i don't know but it's for no good you may be sure if he isn't here he's hobnobbing with those gypsy wretches who have a camp on southbury common mother jael and he are always together can you describe him asked miss whichello with some hesitation he is tall and thin with a dark wicked-looking face and he has a nasty scar on the right cheek slanting across it to the mouth but the funny thing is that with all his rags and drunkenness there is something of the gentleman about him i don't like him yet i can't dislike him he's attractive in his own way from his very wickedness but i'm sure finished bell with a vigorous nod that he's a black-hearted nero he has done a great deal of damage in his time both to men and women i'm as sure of that as i sit here though i can give no reason for saying so miss whichello listened to this graphic description in silence she was very pale and held her handkerchief to her mouth with one trembling hand the other beat nervously on her lap and it was only by a strong effort of will that she managed to conquer her emotion i dare say you are right she observed in a tremulous voice indeed i might have expected as much for last night he frightened my niece and her maid on the high road i thought it would be best to give him money and send him away so that so evil a man should not remain here to be a source of danger to the town give him money cried miss mosk i'd give him the cat o nine tails if i had my way don't you trouble about him miss whichello he's no good but if i could see him i might soften his heart pleaded the old lady very much in earnest soften a brickbat rejoined bell you'd have just as much success with one as with the other besides you can't see him miss whichello at all events not to-night for he's on the common with his nasty gypsies and won't be back till the morning i wish he'd stay away altogether i do in that case i shall not trouble about him said the old lady rising on some future occasion i may see him but you need not say i was asking for him miss mosk i won't say a word he'd only come worrying around your house if he thought you wanted to give him money oh he mustn't do that he mustn't come there cried miss whichello alarmed he won't for i'll hold my tongue you can rest easy on that score miss whichello but my advice is don't pick him up out of the mire he'll only fall back into it again you have a bad opinion of him miss mosk the very worst replied bell conducting her guest to the door he's a jailbird and a scallywag and all that's bad well good night miss whichello and thank you for the jelly there is no need for thanks miss mosk good night and the old lady tripped up the street keeping in the middle of it lest any robber should spring out on her from the shadow of the houses the storm was coming nearer and soon would break directly over the town for flashes of lightning were weaving fiery patterns against the black clouds and every now and then a hoarse growl of thunder went grinding across the sky anxious to escape the coming downfall miss whichello climbed up the street towards the cathedral as quickly and steadily as her old legs could carry her just as she emerged into the close a shadow blacker than the blackness of the night glided past her a zigzag of lightning cut the sky at the moment and revealed the face of mr cargrim who in his turn recognized the old lady in the bluish glare 
miss whichello he exclaimed what a surprise you may well say that mr cargrim replied the old lady with a nervous movement for the sound of his voice and the sudden view of his face startled her not a little it is not often i am out at this hour but i have been taking some jelly to mrs mosk you are a good samaritan miss whichello i hope she is better i think so but i did not see her as she is asleep i spoke with her daughter however i trust you were not molested by that ruffian jentham who stays at the derby winner said cargrim with hypocritical anxiety oh no he is away on southbury heath with his gipsy friends i believe at least miss mosk told me so good night mr cargrim she added evidently not anxious to prolong the conversation i wish to get under shelter before the storm breaks let me see you to your door at least miss whichello rejected this officious offer by dryly remarking that she had accomplished the worst part of her journey and bidding the chaplain good-night tripped across the square to her own jenny wren nest cargrim looked after her with a doubtful look as she vanished into the darkness then turning on his heel walked swiftly down the street towards eastgate he had as much aversion to getting wet as a cat and put his best foot foremost so as to reach the palace before the rain came on besides it was ten o'clock a late hour for a respectable parson to be abroad she's been trying to see jentham thought mr cargrim recalling miss whichello's nervous hesitation i wonder what she knows about him the man is a mystery and is in Burminster for no good purpose miss whichello and the bishop both know that purpose i'm certain well well two secrets are better than one and if i gain a knowledge of them both i may inhabit heathcroft rectory sooner than i expect cargrim's meditations were here cut short by the falling of heavy drops of rain and he put all his mind into his muscles to travel the faster indeed he almost ran through the new town and was soon out on the country road which conducted to the palace but in spite of all his speed the rain caught him for with an incessant play of lightning and a constant roll of thunder came a regular tropical downpour the rain descended in one solid mass flooding the ground and beating flat the crops cargrim was drenched to the skin and by the time he slipped through the small iron gate near the big ones into the episcopalian park he looked like a lean water rat being in a bad temper from his shower bath he was almost as venomous as that animal and raced up the avenue in his sodden clothing shivering and dripping suddenly he heard the quick trot of a horse and guessing that the bishop was returning he stood aside in the shadow of the trees to let his superior pass by like the chaplain dr pendle was streaming with water and his horse's hoofs plashed up the sodden ground as though he were crossing a marsh by the vivid glare of the lightnings which shot streaks of blue fire through the descending deluge cargrim caught a glimpse of the bishop's face it was deathly pale and bore a look of mingled horror and terror another moment and he had passed into the blackness of the drenching rain leaving cargrim marvelling at the torture of the mind which could produce so terrible an expression it is the face of cain whispered cargrim to himself what can his secret be End of chapter thirteen Chapter Fourteen of *The Bishop's Secret* by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fourteen: Rumor Full of Tongues. It is almost impossible to learn the genesis of a rumor. It may be started by a look, a word, a gesture, and it spreads with such marvelous rapidity that by the time public curiosity is fully aroused, no one can trace the original source so many and winding are the channels through which it has flowed yet there are exceptions to this general rule especially in criminal cases where for the safety of the public it is absolutely necessary to get to the bottom of the matter therefore the rumour which pervaded Burminster on monday morning was soon traced by the police to a carter from southbury this man mentioned to a friend that when crossing the heath during the early morning he had come across the body of a man the rumour weak in its genesis stated first that a man had been hurt later on that he had been wounded by noon it was announced that he was dead 
and finally the actual truth came out that the man had been murdered the police authorities saw the carter and were conducted by him to the corpse which after examination they brought to the dead house in Berminster. Then all doubt came to an end, and it was officially declared during the afternoon that Jentham, the military vagabond, lately resident at the Derby Winner, had been shot through the heart. But even rumour, prolific as it is in invention, could not suggest who had murdered the man. So unusual an event in the quiet cathedral city caused the greatest excitement, and the streets were filled with people talking over the matter amateur detectives swilling beer in public houses gave their opinions about the crime and the more beer they drank the wilder and more impossible became their theories some suggested that the gypsies camped on southbury heath who were continually fighting amongst themselves had killed the miserable creature others asserting that the scamp was desperately poor hinted at suicide induced by sheer despair but the most generally accepted opinion was that Jentham had been killed in some drunken frolic by one or more Irish harvesters. The Burminster reporters visited the police station and endeavoured to learn what Inspector Tinkler thought. He had seen the body, he had viewed the spot where it had been found, he had examined the carter, Giles Craik, so he was the man most likely to give satisfactory answers to the questions as to who had killed the man and why he had been shot but inspector tinkler was the most wary of officials and pending the inquest and the verdict of twelve good men and true he declined to commit himself to an opinion the result of this reticence was that the reporters had to fall back on their inventive faculties and next morning published three theories side by side concerning the murder so that the Berminster Chronicle, containing these suppositions, proved to be as interesting as a police novel and quite as unreliable. But it amused its readers and sold largely, therefore proprietor and editor were quite satisfied that fiction was as good as fact to tickle the long ears of a credulous public. As the dead man had lodged at the Derby Winner, and many people had known him there, quite a sensation was caused by the report of his untimely end from morning till night the public-house was thronged with customers thirsting both for news and beer nevertheless although business was so brisk mosk was by no means in a good temper he had returned early that morning from southbury and had been one of the first to hear about the matter when he heard who had been killed he regarded the committal of the crime quite in a personal light for the dead man owed him money, and his death had discharged the debt in a way of which Mr. Mosk did not approve. He frequently referred to his loss during the day, when congratulated by unthinking customers on the excellent trade the assassination had brought about. "'For, as I always says,' remarked one wiseacre, "'et the nail went don't blow good to somebody.' "'Yeah,' growled Mosk in his beery voice, "'it's about as broad as it's long, so far as I'm concerned.' i've lost a couple of quid through jentham's goin and gettin shot and it will take a good many tankards of bitter at thruppence to make that up who do you think shot him mr mosk arsk me something easier can't you i don't know nothin about the cub i don't he comes here two three weeks ago and leaves owin me money where he comes from or who he is or what he's been doin to get shot i know no more nor you do all i does know finished mosk emphatically is as i've lost two bloomin quid and that's a lot to a poor man like me well father it's no good making a fuss over it cried bell who overheard his grumbling if jentham hadn't been shot we wouldn't be doing so well for my part i'm sorry for the poor soul for blackguard you mean no i don't i don't call any corpse a blackguard if he was one i dare say he's been punished enough now without our calling him names he wasn't the kind of man I fancied, but there's no denying he was attractive in his own wicked way. Ah, said a dirty-looking man, who was more than suspected of being a welcher, couldn't he slap up yarns about hingins and heathens as bows down to stocks and stones? Oh, no, not he. He could lie like one a year old, if that's what you mean, said Mosk. Bloomin' fine lying, anyhow, retorted the critic. I'd get orf the turf if I could spit him out that style make me fortune i would on the pipers you've been chucked off the turf often enough as it is replied the landlord sourly whereat to give the conversation a less personal application 
the dirty welcher remarked that he would drain another bitter i suppose you'll be as drunk as a pig by night said bell taking the order jentham was bad but he wasn't a swine like you gone he got drunk didn't he oh no you bet he didn't he got drunk like a gentleman at all events none of your sauce black or i'll have you chucked you know me by this time i hope in fact as several of the customers remarked miss bell was in a fine temper that morning and her tongue raged round like a prairie fire this bad humour was ascribed by the public to the extra work entailed on her by the sensation caused by the murder but the true cause lay with gabriel he had promised faithfully on the previous night to come round and see mrs mosk but to bell's anger had failed to put in an appearance the first time he had done such a thing as miss mosk's object was always to have an ostensible reason for seeing gabriel in order to protect her character she was not at all pleased that he had not turned her excuse for calling on him into an actual fact it is true that gabriel presented himself late in the afternoon and requested to see the invalid but instead of taking him up to the sick-room bell whirled the curate into a small back parlour and closed the door in order as she remarked to have it out with him now then said she planting her back against the door what do you mean by treating me like a bit of dirt you mean that i did not come round last night bell yes i do i told mother you would visit her i said to jacob jarper as i'd come to ask you to see mother and you would go and make me out a liar by not turning up what do you mean i was ill and couldn't keep my promise said gabriel shortly ill said bell looking him up and down well you do look ill you've been washed and wrung out till you're limp as a rag white in the face black under the eyes what have you been doing with yourself i'd like to know you were all right when i left you last night the weather affected my nerves exclaimed gabriel with a weary sigh passing his thin hand across his anxious face i felt that it was impossible for me to sit in a close room and talk to a sick woman so i went round to the stables where i keep my horse and took him out in order to get a breath of fresh air what you rode out at that late hour in all that storm the storm came on later i went out almost immediately after you left and got back at half-past ten it wasn't so very late well of all mad things said bell grimly it's easily seen mr gabriel pendle how badly you want a wife at your elbow where did you go i rode out to southbury heath replied gabriel with some hesitation lord a mercy where jentham's corpse was found the curate shuddered i didn't see any corpse he said painfully and slowly instead of keeping to the high road i struck out cross-country it was only this morning that i heard of the unfortunate man's untimely end you didn't meet any one likely to have laid him out no i met no one i felt too ill to notice passers-by but the ride did me good and i feel much better this morning you don't look better said bell with another searching glance one would think you had killed a man yourself bell protested gabriel almost in an hysterical tone for his nerves were not yet under control and the crude speeches of the girl made him wince well well i'm only joking i know you wouldn't hurt a fly but you do look ill that's a fact let me get you some brandy oh, no thank you brandy would only make me worse let me go up and see your mother i shan't you're not fit to see anyone go home and lie down till your nerves get right you can see me after five if you like for i'm going to the dead house to have a look at jentham's body what to see the corpse of that unhappy man cried gabriel shrinking away why not answered bell coolly for she had that peculiar love of looking on dead bodies characteristic of the lower classes i want to see how they killed him how who killed him the person as did it silly though i don't know who could have shot him unless it was that old cat of a mrs pansy well i can't stay here talking all day and father will be wondering what i'm up to you go home and lie down gabriel not just now i must walk up to the palace mm, the bishop will be in a fine way about this murder it's years since anyone got killed here i hope they'll catch the wretch as shot jentham though i can't say i liked him myself i hope they will catch him replied gabriel mechanically good day miss mosk i shall call and see your mother to-morrow good day mr pendle 
and thank you oh so much this particular form of farewell was intended for the ears of mr mosk and the general public but it failed in its object so far as the especial person it was intended to impress was concerned when the black-clothed form of gabriel vanished mr mosk handed over the business of the bar to an active pot-boy and conducted his daughter back to the little parlour bell saw from his lowering brow that her father was suspicious of her lengthened interview with the curate and was bent upon causing trouble however she was not the kind of girl to be daunted by black looks and moreover was conscious that her father would be rather pleased than otherwise to hear that she was honourably engaged to the son of bishop pendle so she sat down calmly enough at his gruff command and awaited the coming storm if driven into a corner she intended to tell the truth therefore she faced her father with the greatest coolness what do you mean by it cried mosk bursting into angry words as soon as the door was closed what do you mean you hussy now look here father said bell quickly you keep a civil tongue in your head or i won't use mine i'm not a hussy and you have no right to call me one no right ain't i your lawfully begotten father yes you are worse luck i'd have had a duke for my father if i'd been asked what i wanted wouldn't a bishop content you sneered mosk with a scowl on his pimply face you're talking of mr pendle are you said bell wilfully misunderstanding the insinuation yes i am you jade and i won't have it i tell you i won't won't have what father give it a name why this carrying on with that parson chap not as i've a word to say against mr pendle because he's worth a dozen of the cargram lot but he's gentry and you're not what's that got to do with it demanded bell with supreme contempt this much raved mosk clenching his fist that i won't have you running after him do you hear i hear there is no need for you to rage the house down father i'm not running after mr pendle he's running after me that's just as bad you'll lose your character bell fired up and bounced to her feet who dares to say a word against my character she asked panting and red old jarper for one he said you went to see mr pendle last night so i did oh you did did you and here you've been talking alone with him this morning for the last hour what do you mean by disgracing me disgracing you scoffed bell your character needs a lot of disgracing doesn't it now be sensible father she added advancing towards him and i'll tell you the truth i didn't intend to but as you are so unreasonable i may as well set your mind at rest what are you driving at growled mosk struck by her placid manner well to put the thing into a nutshell mr pendle is going to marry me marry you get along i don't see why you should doubt my word cried bell with an angry flush i'm engaged to him as honourably as any young lady could be he has written me lots of letters promising to make me his wife he has given me a ring and we're only waiting till he's appointed to be rector of heathcroft to marry well i'm damned observed mr mosk slowly is this true i'll show you the ring and letters if you like said bell tartly but i don't see why you should be so surprised i'm good enough for him i hope you're good-looking i dare say bell but he's gentry i'm going to be gentry too and i'll hold my own with the best of em as bishop pendle's daughter-in-law i'll scratch the eyes out of any of em as doesn't give me my place mosk drew a long breath bishop pendle's daughter-in-law he repeated looking at his daughter with admiration my stars you are a clever girl bell i'm clever enough to get what i want father so long as you don't put your foot into it hold your tongue until i tell you when to speak if the bishop knew of this now he'd cut gabriel off with a shilling oh he would would he said mosk in so strange a tone that bell looked at him with some wonder of course he would said she quietly but when gabriel is rector of heathcroft it won't matter we'll then have money enough to do without his consent give me a kiss my girl cried mosk clasping her to his breast you're a credit to me that you are oh curse it bell think of old mother pansy father and daughter looked at one another and burst out laughing End of chapter fourteen Chapter Fifteen of *The Bishop's Secret* by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Chapter Fifteen: The Gypsy Ring. Almost at the very time Mosk was congratulating his daughter on the conquest of the curate, Captain Pendle was paying a visit to the Jenny Wren nest. He had only succeeded in obtaining a Saturday to Monday leave from his colonel, who did not approve of young officers being too long or too often absent from their duties, and was rejoining his regiment that very evening. As soon as he could get away from the palace, he had left his portmanteau at the station and had come up to the cathedral close to see Mab. Much to his gratification, he found her alone in the quaint old drawing-room and blessed the providence which had sent him thither at so propitious an hour auntie is lying down exclaimed mab who looked rather worried and pale she has been so upset over this horrid murder egad it has upset every one said george throwing himself into a chair my father is so annoyed at such a thing happening in his diocese that he has retreated to his library and shut himself up i could hardly get him to say good-bye though upon my word added george waxing warm i don't see that the death of a wretched tramp is of such moment yet it seems to have annoyed every one including yourself said mab remarking how worried her lover looked and how far from being his pleasant natural self yes my dearest including myself when the bishop is annoyed my mother fidgets over him until she makes herself ill knowing this he is usually careful not to let her see him when he is out of sorts but to-day he was not so discreet and the consequence is that my mother has an attack of nerves and is lying on her sofa bathed in tears with lucy in attendance of course all this has upset me in my turn well george i suppose it is natural that the bishop should be put out for such a terrible crime has not been committed here for years indeed the chronicle of last week was remarking how free from crime this place was and naturally the gods gave him the lie by arranging a first-class murder straight away said george with a shrug but why everybody should be in such a state i can't see the palace is like an undertaker's establishment when business is dull the only person who seems at all cheerful is that fellow cargram he ought to be annoyed for the bishop's sake faith then he isn't mab he's going about rubbing his hands and grinning like a cheshire cat i think the sight of him irritated me more than the mourners i'm glad to go back to my work are you glad to leave me no you dear goose said he taking her hand affectionately that is the bitter drop in my cup however i have brought you something to draw us closer together there oh george cried mab looking in ecstasy at the ring he had slipped on her finger what a lovely lovely ring and what a queer one three turquoise stones set in a braid of silver i never saw so unique a pattern i dare say not it's not the kind of ring you'll come across every day and precious hard work i had to get it did you buy it in Berminster? asked miss arden putting her head on one side to admire the peculiar setting of the blue stones no i bought it from mother jail from mother jail that old gypsy fortune teller precisely from that very identical old witch of indoor i saw it on her lean paw when i was last in Berminster, and she came hovering round to tell my fortune the queer look of it took my fancy and i determined to secure it for our engagement ring however the old lady wasn't to be bribed into parting with it but last night i rode out to the camp on southbury common and succeeded in getting it off her she is a regular jew at a bargain and haggled for an hour before she would let me have it ultimately i gave her the price she asked and there it is on your pretty hand oh, how sweet of you george to take so much trouble i shall value the ring greatly for your sake and for your own too i hope it is a lucky ring and came from the east mother jael said in the old old days it looks rather egyptian so perhaps cleopatra wore it when she went to meet anthony oh such nonsense but it is a dear lovely ring and i'll wear it always i think i deserve a kiss from you for my trouble said george drawing her lovely glowing face towards him there darling the next ring i place on your finger will be a plain golden one not from the east but from an honest Berminster jeweller but george mab laid her head on his breast i am not sure if i ought to accept it really your father does not know of our engagement 
i intend to tell him when i next visit Berminster, my love indeed but that he takes this wretched murder so much to heart i would have told him to-day still you need not scruple to wear it dearest for your aunt and my mother are both agreed that you will make me the sweetest of wives auntie is always urging me to ask you to tell your father then you can inform her that i'll do so next why here is your aunt my dear auntie cried mab as miss winchello like a little white ghost moved into the room i thought your head was so bad oh, it is better now my dear replied the old lady who really looked very ill how do you do captain pendle hadn't you better call me george miss whichello no i hadn't my dear man at least not until your engagement with mab is an accomplished fact but it is an accomplished fact now auntie said mab showing the ring here is the visible sign of our engagement a strange ring but very charming pronounced miss whichello examining the jewel but does the bishop know i intend to tell him when i come back next week said george promptly at present he is too upset with this murder to pay much attention to my love affairs upset with this murder cried the little lady dropping into a chair i don't wonder at it i am quite ill with the news i'm sure i don't see why auntie this jentham tramp wasn't a relative you know miss whichello shuddered and if possible turned paler he was a human being mab she said in a low voice and it is terrible to think that the poor wretch however evil he may have been should have come to so miserable an end is it known who shot him captain pendle no there are all sorts of rumours of course but none of them very reliable it's a pity too added george reflectively for if i had only been a little earlier in leaving mother jail i might have heard the shot and captured the murderer what do you mean captain pendle cried miss whichello with a start why didn't i tell you oh of course i didn't it was mab i told what did you tell her questioned the old lady with some impatience that i was on southbury heath last night what were you doing there seeing after the gypsy ring for mab explained george pulling his moustache i bought it of mother jail and had to ride out to the camp to make the bargain as i'm going back into harness to-day there isn't much time to lose so i went off last night after dinner between eight and nine o'clock and the old jade kept me so long fixing up the business that i didn't reach home until eleven by jove i got a jolly ducking looked like an insane river god dripping with wet did you see anything of the murder captain pendle no i didn't even hear the shot though that wasn't to be wondered at considering the row made by rain and thunder where was the body found somewhere in a ditch near the high road i believe at all events it wasn't in the way or my g would have tumbled across it miss whichello reflected the bishop was over at southbury yesterday was he not she asked yes at a confirmation service he rode back across the common and reached the palace just before i did about half an hour or so did he hear or see anything not to my knowledge but the truth is i haven't had an opportunity of asking questions he is so annoyed at the disgrace to the diocese by the committal of this crime that he's quite beside himself i was just telling mab about it when you came in six o'clock cried captain george starting up as the chimes rang out i must be off if i'm late at barracks my colonel will parade me to-morrow and go down my throat spurs boots and all wait a moment captain pendle and i'll come with you but your headache auntie remonstrated mab my dear a walk in the fresh air will do me good i shall go with captain pendle to the station make your adieus young people while i put on my bonnet and cloak when miss whichello left the room mab who had been admiring her ring during the foregoing conversation was so impressed with its quaint beauty that she again thanked george for having given it to her this piece of politeness led to an exhibition of tenderness on the part of the departing lover and during the dragon's absence this foolish young couple talked the charming nonsense which people in their condition particularly affect realism is a very good thing in its own way but to set down an actual love conversation would be carrying it to excess only the exaggerated exaltation of mind attendant on love-making can enable lovers to endure the transcendentalism with which they bore one another 
and then the look which makes an arrow of the most trifling phrase the caress which gives the merest glance a most eloquent meaning how can prosaic pen and ink and paper report these fittingly the sympathetic reader must guess what george and mab said to one another he must fancy how they said it and he or she must see in his or her mind's eye how young and beautiful and glowing they looked when miss whichello as the prose of their poetry walked into the room the dear old lady smiled approvingly when she saw their bright faces for she too had lived in arcady although the envious gods had turned her out of it long since now captain pendle when you have done talking nonsense with that child i'm ready do call me george miss whichello entreated the captain no sir not until your father gives this engagement his episcopalian blessing no nonsense come along but miss whichello's bark was worse than her bite for she discreetly left the room so that the lovebirds could take a tender leave of each other and captain pendle found her standing on the steps outside with a broad smile on her face you are sure you have not forgotten your gloves captain pendle she asked smilingly no replied george innocently i have them with me oh exclaimed miss whichello marching down the steps like a toy soldier in my youth young men in your condition always forgot their gloves by jove i have left something behind me though your heart probably never mind it is in safe keeping none of your tricks sir come come and miss whichello marched the captain off with a twinkle in her bright eyes the little old lady was one of those loved by the gods for she would undoubtedly die young in heart still as she walked with captain pendle to the station in the gathering darkness she looked worried and white george could not see her face in the dusk and moreover was too much taken up with his late charming interview to notice his companion's preoccupation in spite of her sympathy miss whichello grew weary of a monologue on the part of george in which the name of mab occurred fifty times and more she was glad when the train steamed off with this too happy lover and promised to deliver all kinds of unnecessary messages to the girl george had left behind him but let them be happy while they can murmured miss whichello as she tripped back through the town poor souls if they only knew what i know as miss whichello had the meaning of this enigmatic speech in her mind she did not think it was necessary to put it into words but silent and pensive walked along the crowded pavement shortly she turned down a side street which led to the police station and there paused in a quiet corner to pin a veil round her head a veil so thick that her features could hardly be distinguished through it the poor lady adopted this as a kind of disguise forgetting that her old-fashioned poke bonnet and quaint silk cloak were as well known to the inhabitants of Berminster as the cathedral itself that early century garb was as familiar to the rascality of the slums as to the richer citizens even the police knew it well for they had often seen its charitable wearer by the bedsides of dying paupers it thus happened that when miss whichello presented herself at the police station to inspector tinkler he knew her at once in spite of her foolish little veil moreover in greeting her he pronounced her name oh hush hush mr inspector whispered miss whichello with a mysterious glance around i do not wish it to be known that i called here you can depend upon my discretion miss whichello ma'am said the inspector who was a bluff and tyrannical ex-sergeant and what can i do for you miss whichello looked round again i wish mr inspector said she in a very small voice to be taken by you to the dead house to the dead house miss whichello ma'am said the iron tinkler hardly able to conceal his astonishment although it was against his disciplinarian ideas to show emotion there is a dead man in there mr inspector whom i knew under very different circumstances more than twenty years ago answers to the name of jentham perhaps suggested mr inspector yes he called himself jentham i believe i i i wish to see his body and the little old lady looked anxiously into tinkler's purple face miss whichello ma'am said the ex-sergeant with an official air this request requires reflection do you know the party in question i knew him as i told you more than twenty years ago he was then a very talented violinist and i heard him play frequently in london what was his name miss whichello ma'am 
his name then mr inspector was amaru a stage name i take it to be ma'am yes a stage name what was his real name oh, i can't say replied miss whichello in a hesitating voice i knew him only as amaru hm. here he called himself jentham do you know anything about this murder miss whichello ma'am and the inspector fixed a bloodshot grey eye on the thick veil no no i know nothing about the murder cried miss whichello in earnest tones i heard that this man jentham looked like a gipsy and was marked with a scar on the right cheek from that description i thought he might be amaru and i wish to see his body to be certain that i am right well miss whichello ma'am said the stern tinkler after some deliberation your request is out of the usual course of things but knowing you as a good and charitable lady and thinking you may throw some light on this mysterious crime why i'll show you the corpse with pleasure Oh, one moment said the old lady laying a detaining hand on the inspector's blue cloth sleeve i must tell you that i can throw no light on the subject if i could i would i simply desire to see the body of this man and to satisfy myself that he is amaru oh, very good miss whichello ma'am you shall see it and you'll not mention that i came here mr inspector i give you my word ma'am the word of a soldier this way miss whichello this way following the rigid figure of the inspector the little old lady was conducted by him to a small building of galvanized tin in the rear of the police station several idlers were hanging about amongst them being miss bell mosk who was trying to persuade a handsome young policeman to gratify her morbid curiosity her eyes opened to their widest width when she recognized miss whichello's silk cloak and poke bonnet and saw them vanish into the dead house well i never said miss mosk i never thought she'd be fond of corpses at her time of life seeing as she'll soon be one herself the old lady and the inspector remained within for five or six minutes when they came out the tears were falling fast beneath miss whichello's veil is that the man asked tinkler in a low voice yes replied miss whichello that is the man i knew as amaru End of chapter fifteen Chapter Sixteen of *The Bishop's Secret* by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen: The Zeal of Inspector Tinkler. The strange affair of Jentham's murder continued to occupy the attention of the Berminster public throughout the week, and on the day when the inquest was held, popular excitement rose to fever heat. Inspector Tinkler feeling that the county expected him to do great things worthy of his reputation as a zealous officer worked his hardest to gather evidence likely to elucidate the mystery of the death but in spite of the most strenuous exertions his efforts resulted in total failure the collected details proved to be of the most meagre description and when the coroner sat on the body nothing transpired to reveal the name or even indicate the identity of the assassin who had provided him with a body to sit on it really seemed as though the southbury murder would end in being relegated to the list of undiscovered crimes for i can't work miracles explained the indignant tinkler when reproached with this result and somehow the case has got out of hand the motive for the shooting can't be got at the pistol used ain't to be picked up search how you may and as for the murderin villain who fired it if he ain't down below where he ought to be i'll take my oath as a soldier he ain't above ground take it how you will this case is a corker and no mistake it had certainly occurred to tinkler's bothered mind that miss whichello should be called as a witness if only to prove that at one time the dead man had occupied a better position in the world but after a short interview with her he had abandoned this idea miss whichello declared that she could throw no light on the affair and that she had lost sight of the quondam violinist for over thirty years her recognition of him as amaru had been entirely due to the description of his gypsy looks and the noticeable cicatrice on his face and she pointed out to tinkler that she had not seen the so-called jentham till after his death moreover it was unlikely that events which had occurred thirty years before could have resulted in the man's violent death at the present time 
and miss whichello insisted that she knew nothing of the creature's later circumstances or acquaintances being thus ignorant it was not to be expected that her evidence would be of any value so at her earnest request tinkler held his tongue and forbore to summon her as a witness miss whichello was greatly relieved in her own mind when the inspector came to this conclusion but she did not let tinkler see her relief from mosk the officer had learned that the vagabond who called himself jentham had appeared at the derby winner some three weeks previous to the time of his death he had given no information as to where he had last rested but so far as mosk knew had dropped down from the sky certainly his conversation when he was intoxicated showed that he had travelled a great deal and that his past was concerned with robbery and bloodshed and lawlessness but the man had talked generally as any traveller might had refrained from mentioning names and altogether had spoken so loosely that nothing likely to lead to a tangible result could be gathered from his rambling discourses he had paid his board and lodging for the first week but thereafter had lived on credit and at the time of his death had owed mosk over two pounds principally for strong drink usually he slept at the derby winner and loafed about the streets all day but at times he went over to the gypsy camp near southbury and fraternized with the romany this was the gist of mosk's information but he added as an afterthought that jentham had promised to pay him when certain monies which he expected came into his possession who was going to pay him this money asked tinkler pricking up his ears can't you ask me something easier growled mosk how should i know he said he was going to get the divs but who from or where from i don't know for he held his tongue so far there was no money in the pockets of the clothes worn by the body said tinkler musingly i dare say not mr inspector i don't believe the cove was expecting any money i don't twas all moonshine his talk to make me trust him for the bed and grub and a blamed fool i've been doing so grumbled mosk the pockets were turned inside out though oh they was was they mr inspector well that does look queer but if there was any light-fingered business to be done i dare say them gypsies have something to do with it did the man go to the gypsy camp on sunday night bell says he did replied mr mosk but i went over to southbury in the afternoon about a little loss as i'm sweet on so i don't know what he did say by hearsay bell on being questioned by the inspector declared that jentham had loitered about the hotel the greater part of sunday but had taken his departure about five o'clock he did not say that he was going to the camp but as he often paid a visit to it she presumed that he had gone there during that evening especially as you found his corpse on the common mr tinkler said bell no doubt the poor wretch was coming back from them gypsies hm it's not a bad idea said tinkler scratching his well-shaven chin strikes me as i'll go and look up mother jail the result of an interview with that iniquitous old beldame proved that jentham had certainly been the guest of the gypsies on sunday evening but had returned to Berminster shortly after nine o'clock he had stated that he was going back to the derby winner and as it was his custom to come and go when he pleased the romany had not taken much notice of his departure a vagrant like jentham was quite independent of time he was one of your lot i suppose said mr inspector taking a few notes in his pocket-book a secretive little article which shut with a patent clasp yes dearie yes lord bless ye mumbled mother jael blinking her cunning eyes he was one of the gentle romany sure enough was he with you long granny three week lovey just three week he come to berminster and got weary like one of you gentiles so he made hisself comfortable with us blackguards to blackguards and birds of a feather murmured tinkler then asked if jentham had told mother jael anything about himself <laughs> screeched the old hag he never told me a word he come and he goed but he kept his red rag to himself he did devil he was a cunning one that jentham was his name jentham mother or was it something else he called itself so dearie but i never knowed one of that gentle romany as had a gentile name we sticks to our own mostly job i should think so are you sure he was a gypsy of course i am my noble gorgio he could patter the calo jib with the best of em he knowed lots what the gentile don't know and he had the eagle beak and a peaked eye oh tiny jesus was a romany child or may i die for it do you know who killed him asked tinkler abruptly no lovey 
twarn't one of us though you puts ollies the wust on our backs job dog do never eat dog as i knows dearie he left your camp at nine o'clock thereabouts my lamb just arter nine was he sober or drunk betwixt and between lovey he could walk straight and talk straight and look arter his blessed life hm seems as though he couldn't said mr inspector dryly devil that's a true sayin said mother jael with a nod but i don't know what come to him dearie at the inquest mother jael was called as a witness and told the jury much the same story as she had related to tinkler with further details as to the movements of the gipsies on that night she declared that none of the tribe had left the camp that jentham had gone away alone comparatively sober and that she did not hear of his murder until late the next day in spite of examination and cross-examination mother jael could give no evidence as to jentham's real name or about his past or why he was lingering at Berminster. he come and he goed said mother jael with the air of an oracle and that was the extent of her information delivered in a croaking shuffling unconvincing manner the carter giles crake who had found the body was a stupid yokel whose knowledge was entirely limited to his immediate surroundings perched on his cart he had seen the body lying in a ditch half full of water on the other side of an earthen mound which extended along the side of the main road the spot where he discovered it was near Berminster and about five miles from the gypsy camp the man had been shot through the heart his pockets had been emptied and turned inside out and evidently after the murder the robber had dragged the body over the mound into the ditch giles had not touched the corpse being fearful of getting into trouble but had come on at once to Berminster to inform the police of his discovery it was dr graham who had examined the body when first discovered and according to his evidence the man had been shot through the heart shortly before ten o'clock on sunday night the pistol had been fired so close that the clothing of the deceased over the heart was scorched and blackened with the powder of the cartridge and from this fact added graham with one of his shrewd glances i gather that the murderer must have been known to jentham how is that doctor asked one of the jury because he must have held him in talk while contemplating the crime sir the murderer and his victim must almost have been breast to breast and while the attention of the latter was distracted in some way the assassin must have shot him at close quarters uh, this is all theory dr graham said the coroner who was a rival practitioner it seems to me that the whole case rests on theory retorted graham and shrugged his shoulders before the evidence concerning the matter closed inspector tinkler explained how difficult it had been to collect even the few details which the jury had heard he stated also that although the strictest search had been made in the vicinity of the crime the weapon with which it had been committed could not be found as the shooting had been done during a downfall of rain the assassin and his victim's footmarks were visible in the soft clay of the roadway also there were the marks of horses hoofs so it was probable that the murderer had been mounted if this were so neither gypsies nor harvesters could have killed the wretched man as neither the one lot nor the other possessed horses and the gypsies have horses to draw their caravans interrupted a sharp-looking juryman to draw their caravans i admit said the undaunted tinkler but not to ride on besides i would remind you mr jobson as mother jael declares that none of her crowd left the camp on that night oh she'd declare anything muttered jobson who had no great opinion of tinkler's brains have the footmarks in the road been measured no they haven't mr jobson then they should have mr inspector you can tell a lot from a footmark as i've heard it's what the french call the bertignon system of identification that's what it is i don't need to go to france to learn my business said tinkler tartly and if i did get the measurements of them footmarks how am i to know which is which jentham's or his murderers and how can i go round the whole of Berminster to see whose feet fit em i ask you that mr jobson sir at this point judging that the discussion had gone far enough the coroner intervened and said that mr inspector had done his best to unravel a very difficult case that he had not succeeded was the fault of the case and not of mr inspector and for his part he thought that the thanks of the Berminster citizens were due to the efforts of so zealous and intelligent an officer as tinkler 
this sapient speech reduced the recalcitrant drobson to silence but he still held to his opinion that the overconfident tinkler had bungled the matter and in this view he was silently but heartily supported by shrewd dr graham who privately considered that mr inspector tinkler was little better than an ass however he did not give vent to his offensive opinion the summing up of the coroner called for little remark he was a worthy country doctor with as much brains as would cover a sixpence and the case was beyond him in every way his remarks to the jury equally stupid with the exception of jobson were to the effect that it was evidently impossible to find out who had killed jentham that the man was a quarrelsome vagabond who probably had many enemies that no doubt while crossing the common in a drunken humour he had met with some one as bad as himself and had come to high words with him and that the unknown man being armed had no doubt shot the deceased in a fit of rage he robbed the body i dare say gentlemen concluded the coroner and then threw it into the ditch to conceal the evidence of his crime as we don't know the man and are never likely to know him i can only suggest that you should find a verdict in accordance with the evidence supplied to you by the zeal of inspector tinkler man has done all he can to find out this cane but his efforts have been vain so we must leave the punishment of the murderer to god and as holy scripture says that murder will out i have no doubt that some day the criminal will be brought to justice after this wise speech it was not surprising that the jury brought in a verdict that the deceased jentham met with a violent death at the hands of some person or persons unknown that being the kind of verdict which juries without brains as in the present instance generally give having thus settled the matter to their own bovine satisfaction the jury went away after having been thanked for their zeal by the coroner that gentleman was great on zeal hm 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 said dr graham to himself there's too much zeal altogether i wonder what monsieur de talleyrand would have thought of these cabbages and their zeal well mr inspector he added aloud so you finished off the matter nicely we have done our best dr graham sir and you don't know who killed the man no sir i don't and what's more i don't believe anybody ever will know huh, that's your opinion is it do you read much mr inspector a novel at times sir I i'm fond of a good novel then let me recommend to your attention the works of a french author by the name gaborio there's a man in them called lecoq who would have found out the truth mr inspector fiction dr graham sir fiction true enough mr inspector but most fiction is founded on fact well sir said tinkler with a superior wise smile i should like to see our case in the hands of your mr lecoq so would i mr inspector or in the hands of sherlock holmes bless me tinkler they'd do almost as much as you have done it is a pity that you are not a character in fiction tinkler why sir why may i ask because your author might have touched you up in weak parts and have gifted you with some brains good day mr inspector while graham walked away chuckling at his banter of this red tape official the official himself stood gasping like a fish out of water and trying to realize the insult levelled at his dignity jobson a small man sidled round to the front of him and made a comment on the situation it all comes of your not measuring them footmarks said jobson in detective novels the clever fellows always do that but you'd never be put into a book not you you'll be put into jail cried the outraged inspector it's more than jentham's murderer will if you've got the catching of him said jobson and walked off End of chapter sixteen Chapter Seventeen of *The Bishop's Secret* by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seventeen: A Clerical Detective. All this time, Mister Michael Cargram had not been idle. On hearing of the murder, his thoughts had immediately centred themselves on the bishop. To say that the chaplain was shocked is to express his feelings much too mildly. He was horrified, thunderstruck, terrified in fact there was no word in the english tongue strong enough to explain his superlative state of mind it was characteristic of the man's malignant nature 
that he was fully prepared to believe in dr pendle's guilt without hearing any evidence for or against this opinion he was aware that jentham had been cognizant of some weighty secret concerning the bishop's past for the concealing of which he was to have been bribed and when the report of the murder reached the chaplain's ears he quite believed that in place of paying the sum agreed upon dr pendle had settled accounts with the blackmailer by shooting him cargrim took this extreme view of the matter for two reasons firstly because he had gathered from the bishop's movements and jentham's talk of tom tiddler's ground that a meeting on southbury heath had been arranged between the pair secondly because no money was found on the dead body which would have been the case had the bribe been paid to the circumstantial evidence that the turned-out pockets pointed to robbery mr cargrim at the moment strangely enough paid no attention in considering the case cargrim's wish was very much the father to the thought for he desired to believe in the bishop's guilt as the knowledge of it would give him a great deal of power over his ecclesiastical superior if he could only collect sufficient evidence to convict dr pendle of murdering jentham and could show him the links in the chain of circumstances by which he arrived at such a conclusion he had little doubt but that the bishop to induce him to hide the crime would become his abject slave to gain such an immense power and use it for the furtherance of his own interests cargrim was quite prepared to compound a possible felony so the last case of the bishop would be worse than the first instead of being in jentham's power he would be in cargrim's and in place of taking the form of money the blackmail would assume that of influence so mr cargrim argued the case out and so he determined to shape his plans yet he had a certain hesitancy in taking the first step he had as he firmly believed a knowledge that dr pendle was a murderer yet although the possession of such a secret gave him unlimited power he was afraid to use it for its mere exercise in the present lack of material evidence to prove its truth was a ticklish job cargrim felt like a man gripping a comet by its tail and doubtful whether to hold on or let go however this uncertain state of things could be remedied by a strict examination into the circumstances of the case therefore cargrim set his mind to searching them out he had been present at the inquest but none of the witnesses brought forward by the bungling tinkler had made any statement likely to implicate the bishop evidently no suspicion connecting dr pendle with jentham existed in the minds of police or public cargrim could have set such a rumour afloat by a mere hint that the dead man and the bishop's strange visitor on the night of the reception had been one and the same but he did not think it judicious to do this he wanted the bishop's secret to be his alone and the more spotless was dr pendle's public character the more anxious he would be to retain it by becoming cargrim's slave in order that the chaplain might be silent regarding his guilt but to obtain such an advantage it was necessary for cargrim to acquaint himself with the way in which dr pendle had committed the crime and this as he was obliged to work by stealth was no easy task after some cogitation the wily chaplain concluded that it would be best to hear the general opinion of the Burminster gossips in order to pick up any stray scraps of information likely to be of use to him afterwards he intended to call on mr inspector tinkler and hear officially the more immediate details of the case by what he heard from the police and the social prattlers cargrim hoped to be guided in constructing his case against dr pendle then there was the bishop's london journey the bishop's cheque-book with its missing butt the bishop's journey to and from southbury on the day and night when the murder had been committed all these facts would go far to implicate him in the matter also cargrim desired to find the missing pistol and the papers which had evidently been taken from the corpse this last idea was purely theoretical as was cargrim's fancy that jentham's power over dr pendle had to do with certain papers he argued from the fact that the pockets of the dead man's clothes had been turned inside out cargrim did not believe that the bishop had paid the blackmail therefore the pockets could not have been searched for the money and more so as no possible robber could have known that jentham would be possessed of a sum worth committing murder for on that night on the other hand if jentham had possessed papers which inculpated the bishop in any crime it was probable that after shooting him the assassin had searched for and had obtained the papers to which he attached so much value 
It was the bishop who had turned the pockets inside out, and, as Cargrim decided, for the above reason. Certainly from a common-sense point of view, Cargrim's theory, knowing what he did know, was feasible enough. Having thus arrived at a point where it was necessary to transmute thought into action, Mr. Cargrim assumed his best clerical uniform, his tallest and whitest jam-pot collar, and drew on a pair of delicate lavender gloves. Spotless and neat and eminently sanctimonious, the chaplain took his demure way towards Mrs. Pansy's residence, as he judged very rightly that she would be the most likely person to afford him possible information. The archdeacon's widow lived on the outskirts of Berminster, in a gloomy old barrack of a mansion, surrounded by a large garden, which in its turn was girdled by a high red brick wall with broken glass bottles on the top, as though Mrs. Pansy dwelt in a jail, and was on no account to be allowed out. Had such a thing been possible, the whole of Berminster's humanity, rich and poor, would willingly have subscribed large sums to build the wall higher, and to add spikes to the glass bottles anything to keep Mrs. Pansy in her jail, and prevent her issuing forth as a social scourge. Into the jail Mr. Cargram was admitted with a certain solemnity by a sour-faced footman whose milk of human kindness had turned acid in the thunderstorms of Mrs. Pansy's spite. This engaging Cerberus conducted the chaplain into a large and sepulchral drawing-room in which the good lady and Miss Norsham were partaking of afternoon tea mrs pansey wore her customary skirts of solemn black and looked more gloomy than ever but daisy the elderly sylph brightened the room with a dress of white muslin adorned with many little bows of white ribbon so that sartorially speaking she was very young and very virginal and quite angelical in looks both ladies were pleased to see their visitor and received him warmly in their several ways that is mrs pansey groaned and daisy giggled oh how very nice of you to call dear mr cargrim said the sylph mrs pansey and i are positively dying to hear all about this very dreadful inquest tea thank you uh, no sugar ah sighed mr cargrim taking his cup it is a terrible thing to think that an inquest should be held in berminster on the slaughtered body of a human being uh, bread and butter thank you it's a judgment declared mrs pansey and devoured a buttery little square of toast with another groan louder than the first oh do tell me who killed the poor thing mr cargrim gushed daisy childishly no one knows miss norsham the jury brought in a verdict of wilful murder against some person or persons unknown you must excuse me if i speak too technically but those are the precise words of the verdict and very silly words they are pronounced the hostess ex cathedra but what can you expect from a parcel of trading fools but mrs pansey no one knows who killed this man they should find out mr cargrim they have tried to do so and have failed that shows that what i say is true police and jury are fools said mrs pansey with the triumphant air of one clinching an argument oh dear it is so very strange said the fair daisy i wonder really what could have been the motive for the murder as the pockets were turned inside out said mr cargrim it is believed that robbery was the motive rubbish said mrs pansey shaking her skirts there is a deal more in this crime than meets the eye i believe general opinion is agreed upon that point said the chaplain dryly what is miss whichello's opinion demanded the archdeacon's widow cargrim could not suppress a start it was strange that mrs pansey should allude to mrs whichello when he also had his suspicions regarding her knowledge of the dead man i don't see what she has to do with it he said quietly with the intention of arriving at mrs pansey's meaning ah no more can any one else mr cargrim but i know i know know what dear mrs pansey oh really you are not going to say that poor miss whichello fired that horrid pistol i don't say anything daisy as i don't want to figure in a libel action but i should like to know why miss whichello went to the dead house to see the body did she go there are you sure exclaimed the chaplain much surprised i can believe my own eyes can't i snapped mrs pansey i saw her myself for i was down near the police station the other evening on one of my visits to the poor 
there while returning home by the dead house i saw that hussy of a bell mosque making eyes at a policeman and i recognized miss whichello for all her veil did she wear a veil i should think so and a very thick one but if she wants to do underhand things she should change her bonnet and cloak i knew them don't tell me certainly miss whichello's actions seemed suspicious and anxious to learn their meaning from the lady herself cargrim mentally determined to visit the jenny wren house after leaving mrs pansey instead of calling on miss tancred as he had intended however he was in no hurry and asking daisy for a second cup of tea to prolong his stay went on drawing out his hostess how very strange said he in allusion to mrs whichello i wonder why she went to view so terrible a sight as that man's body ah replied mrs pansey with a shake of her turban we all want to know that but i'll find her out that i will but dear mrs pansey you don't think sweet miss whichello has anything to do with this dreadful murder i accuse no one daisy i simply think what do you think questioned cargrim rather sharply i think what i think was mrs pansey's enigmatic response and she shut her mouth hard honestly speaking the artful old lady was as puzzled by miss whichello's visit to the dead house as her hearers and she could bring no very tangible accusation against her but mrs pansey knew well the art of spreading scandal and was quite satisfied that her significant silence about nothing would end in creating something against miss whichello when she saw cargrim look at daisy and daisy look back to cargrim and remembered that their tongues were only a degree less venomous than her own she was quite satisfied that a seed had been sown likely to produce a very fertile crop of baseless talk the prospect cheered her greatly for mrs pansey hated miss whichello as much as a certain personage she quoted on occasions is said to hate holy water you are quite an ear of dionysius said the chaplain with a complimentary smirk everything seems to come to you i make it my business to know what is going on mr cargrim replied the lady much gratified in order to stem the torrent of infidelity debauchery lying and flattery which rolls through this city oh dear me how strange it is that the dear bishop saw nothing of this frightful murder exclaimed daisy who had been reflecting he rode back from southbury late on sunday night i hear his lordship saw nothing i am sure said cargrim hastily for it was not his design to incriminate dr pendle if he had he would have mentioned it to me and you know miss norsham there was quite a tempest on that night so even if his lordship had passed near the scene of the murder he could not have heard the shot of the assassin or the cry of the victim the rain and thunder would in all human probability have drowned both besides which his lordship is neither sharp-eared nor observant said mrs pansey spitefully a man less fitted to be a bishop doesn't live oh dear mrs pansey you are too hard on him rubbish don't tell me what about his sons mr cargrim did they hear anything i uh, don't quite follow you mrs pansey bless the man i'm talking english i hope both george and gabriel pendle were on southbury heath on sunday night are you sure cried the chaplain doubtful if he heard aright of course i am sure snorted the lady would i speak so positively if i wasn't no indeed i got the news from my page-boy really from that sweet little cyril yes from that worthless scamp cyril cyril repeated mrs pansey with a snort the idea of a pauper like mrs jennings giving her brat such a fine name well it was cyril's night out on sunday and he did not come home till late and then made his appearance very wet and dirty he told me that he had been on southbury heath and had been almost knocked into a ditch by mr pendle galloping past i asked him which mr pendle had been out riding on sunday and he declared that he had seen them both george about eight o'clock when he was on the heath and gabriel shortly after nine as he was coming home i gave the wretched boy a good scolding no supper and a psalm to commit to memory george and gabriel pendle riding on southbury heath on that night said the chaplain thoughtfully it is very strange strange almost shouted mrs pansey it's worse than strange it's sabbath-breaking and their father riding also 
no wonder the mystery of iniquity doth work when those high in the land break the fourth commandment are you going mr cargrim yes i am sorry to leave such charming company but i have an engagement good-bye miss norsham your tea was worthy of the fair hands which made it good-bye mrs pansey let us hope that the authorities will discover and punish this unknown cain cain or jezebel said mrs pansey darkly it's one or the other of them whether the good lady meant to indicate miss whichello by the second name mr cargrim did not stay to inquire as he was in a hurry to see her himself and find out why she had visited the dead house he therefore bowed and smiled himself out of mrs pansey's jail and walked as rapidly as he was able to the little house in the shadow of the cathedral towers here he found miss whichello all alone as mab had gone out to tea with some friends the little lady welcomed him warmly quite ignorant of what a viper she was inviting to warm itself on her hearth and visitor and hostess were soon chattering amicably on the most friendly of terms gradually cargrim brought round the conversation to mrs pansey and mentioned that he had been paying her a visit i hope you enjoyed yourself i'm sure mr cargrim said miss whichello good-humouredly but it gives me no pleasure to visit mrs pansey well do you know miss whichello i find her rather amusing she is a very observant lady and converses wittily about what she observes she talks scandal if that is what you mean i am afraid that word is rather harsh miss whichello it may be sir but it is rather appropriate to mrs pansey well and who was she talking about to-day about several people my dear lady yourself amongst the number indeed miss whichello drew her little body up stiffly and had she anything unpleasant to say about me oh not at all she only remarked that she saw you visiting the dead house last week miss whichello let fall her cup with a crash and turned pale how does she know that was her sharp question oh, she saw you repeated the chaplain and in spite of your veil she recognized you by your cloak and bonnet i am greatly obliged to mrs pansey for the interest she takes in my business said miss whichello in her most stately manner i did visit the Burminster dead house there End of chapter seventeen Chapter Eighteen of *The Bishop's Secret* by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eighteen: The Chaplain on the Warpath. Miss Whichello's frank admission that she had visited the dead house rather disconcerted Mister Cargrim. From the circumstance of the veil, he had presumed that she wished her errand there to be unknown in which case her conduct would have appeared highly suspicious since she was supposed to know nothing about jentham or jentham's murder but her ready acknowledgment of the fact apparently showed that she had nothing to conceal cargrim for all his acuteness did not guess that of two evils miss whichello had chosen the least in truth she did not wish her visit to the dead house to be known but as mrs pansey was cognizant of it she judged it wiser to neutralize any possible harm that that lady could do by admitting the original statement to be a true one this honesty would take the wind out of mrs pansey's sails and prevent her from distorting an admitted fact into a fiction of hinted wickedness furthermore miss whichello was prepared to give cargrim a sufficient reason for her visit so that he might not invent one only by so open a course could she keep the secret of her thirty-year-old acquaintance with the dead man as a rule the little old lady hated subterfuge but in this case her only chance of safety lay in beating pansey cargrim and company with their own weapons and who can say that she was acting wrongly yes mr cargrim she repeated looking him directly in the face mrs pansey is right i was at the dead house and i went to see the corpse of the man jentham i suppose you and mrs pansey wonder why i did so oh my dear lady remonstrated the embarrassed chaplain by no means such knowledge is none of our business that is none of my business you have made it your business however observed miss whichello dryly else you would scarcely have informed me of mrs pansey's unwarrantable remarks on my private affairs well mr cargrim i suppose you know that this tramp attacked my niece on the high road yes miss whichello i know that 
very good as i considered that the man was a dangerous character i thought that he should be compelled to leave beorminster so i went to the derby winner on the night that you met me in order to to see mrs mosk interrupted cargrim softly hoping to entrap her in order to see mrs mosk and in order to see jentham i intended to tell him that if he did not leave beorminster at once that i should inform the police of his attack on miss arden also as i was willing to give him a chance of reforming his conduct i intended to supply him with a small sum for his immediate departure on that night however i did not see him as he had gone over to the gipsy camp when i heard that he was dead i could scarcely believe it so to set my mind at rest and to satisfy myself that mab would be in no further danger from his insolence when she walked abroad i visited the dead house and saw his body that mr cargrim was the sole reason for my visit and as it concerned myself alone i wore a veil so as not to provoke remark it seems that i was wrong since mrs pansey has been discussing me however i hope you will set her mind at rest by telling her what i have told you really my dear miss whichello you are very severe i assure you all this explanation is needless not while mrs pansey has so venomous a tongue mr cargrim she is quite capable of twisting my innocent desire to assure myself that mab was safe from this man into some extraordinary statement without a word of truth in it i shouldn't be surprised if mrs pansey had hinted to you that i had killed this creature as this was precisely what the archdeacon's widow had done cargrim felt horribly uncomfortable under the scorn of miss whichello's justifiable indignation he grew red and smiled feebly and murmured weak apologies all of which miss whichello saw and heard with supreme contempt mr cargrim by his late tittle-tattling conversation had fallen in her good opinion and she was not going to let him off without a sharp rebuke for his unfounded chatter cutting short his murmurs she proceeded to nip in the bud any further reports he or mrs pansey might spread in connection with the murder by explaining much more than was needful and if mrs pansey should hear that captain pendle was on southbury heath on sunday night she continued i trust that she will not accuse him of shooting the man although as i know and you know also mr cargrim she is quite capable of doing so was captain pendle on southbury heath asked cargrim who was already acquainted with this fact although he did not think it necessary to tell miss whichello so you don't say so yes he was he rode over to the gipsy camp to purchase an engagement ring for miss arden from mother jail that ring is now on her finger so miss arden is engaged to captain pendle cried cargrim in a gushing manner i congratulate you and her and him thank you mr cargrim said miss whichello stiffly i suppose captain pendle saw nothing of jentham at the gipsy camp no he never saw the man at all that evening did he hear the shot fired of course he did not cried miss whichello wrathfully how could he hear with the noise of the storm you might as well ask if the bishop did he was on southbury heath on that night oh yes but he heard nothing dear lady he told me so you seem to be very interested in this murder mr cargrim said the little lady with a keen look oh, naturally every one in beorminster is interested in it i hope the criminal will be captured i hope so too do you know who he is i my dear lady how should i know i thought mrs pansey might have told you said miss whichello coolly she knows all that goes on and a good deal that doesn't but you can tell her that both i and captain pendle are innocent although i did visit the dead house and although he was on southbury heath when the crime was committed you are very severe dear lady said cargrim rising to take his leave for he was anxious to extricate himself from his very uncomfortable and undignified position solomon was even more severe mr cargrim he said burning lips and a wicked heart are like a potsherd covered with silver dross i fancy there were mrs pansies in those days mr cargrim in the face of this choice proverb mr cargrim beat a hasty retreat altogether miss whichello was too much for him and for once in his life he was at a loss how to gloss over his defeat not until he was in tinkler's office did he recover his feeling of superiority 
with a man especially with a social inferior he felt that he could deal but who can contend with a woman's tongue it is her sword and shield her mouth is her bow her words are the arrows and the man who hopes to withstand such an armoury of deadly weapons is a superfine idiot cargrim not being one had run away but in his rage at being compelled to take flight he almost exceeded mrs pansey in hating the cause of it miss whichello had certainly gained a victory but she had also made an enemy so the inquest is over mr inspector said the ruffled cargrim smoothing his plumes over and done with sir and the corpse is now six feet under earth a sad end mr inspector and a sad life to be a wanderer on the face of the earth to be violently removed when sinning to be buried at the expense of an alien parish what a fate for a baptized christian don't you take on so mr cargrim sir said tinkler grimly there was precious little religion about jentham and he was buried in a much better fashion than he deserved and not by the parish either cargrim looked up suddenly who paid for his funeral then a charitable lay uh, person sir whose name i am not at liberty to tell any one at her own request at her own request said the chaplain noting tinkler's slips and putting two and two together with a wondrous rapidity ah miss whichello is indeed a good lady uh, did you do you know are you aware that miss whichello buried him sir stammered the inspector considerably astonished i have just come from her house replied cargrim answering the question in the affirmative by implication well she asked me not to tell any one sir but as she told you i suppose as i can say as she buried that corpse with a good deal of expense it is not to be wondered at seeing that she took an interest in the wretched creature said cargrim delicately feeling his way i trust that the sight of his body in the dead house didn't shock her nerves did she tell you that she visited the dead house asked tinkler his eyes growing larger at the extent of the chaplain's information of course she did replied cargrim and this was truer than most of his remarks tinkler brought down a heavy fist with a bang on his desk then i'm blessed mr cargrim sir if i can understand what she meant by asking me to hold my tongue ah mr inspector the good lady is one of those rare spirits who do good by stealth and blush to find it fame seems a kind of silly to go on like that sir we are not all rare spirits tinkler i don't know what the world would be if we were mr cargrim sir but miss whichello seemed so anxious that i should hold my tongue about the visit and the burial that i can't make out why she talked about them to you or to anybody i cannot myself fathom her reason for such unnecessary secrecy mr inspector unless it is that she wishes the murderer to be discovered well she can't spot him said tinkler emphatically for all she knows about jentham is thirty years old cargrim could scarcely suppress a start at this unexpected information so miss whichello did know something about the dead man after all and doubtless her connection with jentham had to do with the secret of the bishop cargrim felt that he was on the eve of an important discovery for tinkler thinking that miss whichello had made a confidant of the chaplain babbled on innocently without guessing that his attentive listener was making a base use of him the shrug of the shoulders with which cargrim commented on his last remark made tinkler talk further besides said he expansively what does miss whichello know only that the man was a violinist thirty years ago and that he called himself amaru those details don't throw any light on the murder mr cargrim sir the chaplain mentally noted the former name and former profession of jentham and shook his head such information is utterly useless he said gravely and the people with whom amaru alias jentham associated then are doubtless all dead by this time well miss whichello didn't mention any of his friends sir but i dare say it wouldn't be much use if she did beyond the man's former name and business as a fiddler she told me nothing i suppose sir she didn't tell you anything likely to help us no i don't think the past can help the present mr tinkler but what is your candid opinion about this case i think it is a mystery mr cargrim sir and is likely to remain one you don't anticipate that the murderer will be found no replied mr inspector gruffly i don't cannot mosk with whom jentham was lodging enlighten you 
tinkler shook his head mosk said that jentham owed him money and promised to pay him this week but that i believe was all moonshine but jentham might have expected to receive money mr inspector not he mr cargram sir he knew no one here who would lend or give him a farthing he had no money on him when his corpse was found yet the body had been robbed oh yes the body was robbed sure enough for we found the pockets turned inside out but the murderer only took the rubbish a vagabond was likely to have on him were any papers taken do you think mr inspector papers echoed tinkler scratching his head what papers well said cargram shirking a true explanation papers likely to reveal his real name and uh, the reason of his haunting Burminster. i don't think there could have been any papers mr cargram sir if there had been we'd have found em the murderer wouldn't have taken rubbish like that but why was the man killed persisted the chaplain he was killed in a row said tinkler decisively that's my theory mother jael says that he was half seas over when he left the camp so i dare say he met some labourer who quarrelled with him and used his pistol but is it likely that the labourer would have a pistol why not those harvesters don't trust one another and it's just as likely as not that one of them would keep a pistol to protect his property from the other was search made for the pistol yes it was and no pistol was found i tell you what mr cargram said tinkler rising in rigid military fashion it's my opinion that there is too much tall talk about this case jentham was shot in a drunken row and the murderer has cleared out of the district that is the whole explanation of the matter oh i dare say you are right mr inspector sighed cargram putting on his hat we are all apt to elevate the commonplace into the romantic or make a mountain out of a molehill which is plain english said tinkler uh, good day mr cargram good day tinkler and many thanks for your lucid statement of the case i have no doubt that his lordship the bishop will take your very sensible view of the matter as it was now late mr cargram returned to the palace not ill pleased with his afternoon's work he had learned that miss whichello had visited the dead house that she had known the dead man as a violinist under the name of amaru and had buried him for old acquaintance sake at her own expense also he had been informed that captain pendle and his brother gabriel had been on southbury heath on the very night and about the very time when the man had been shot so with all these materials mr cargram hoped sooner or later to build up a very pretty case against the bishop if miss whichello was mixing up with the matter so much the better at this moment mr cargram's meditation was broken in upon by the voice of dr graham you are the very man i want cargram the bishop has written asking me to call to-night and see him just tell him that i am engaged this evening but that i will attend on him to-morrow morning at ten o'clock oh soliloquized cargram when the doctor evidently in a great hurry went off so his lordship wants to see dr graham i wonder what that is for End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the bishop's secret by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen the bishop's request whatever dr pendle may have thought of the southbury murder he kept his opinion very much to himself it is true that he expressed himself horrified at the occurrence of so barbarous a crime in his diocese that he spoke pityingly of the wretched victim that he was interested in hearing the result of the inquest but in each case he was guarded in his remarks at first on hearing of the crime his face had betrayed at all events to cargram's jealous scrutiny an expression of relief but shortly afterwards on second thoughts as one might say there came into his eyes a look of apprehension that look which seemed to expect the drawing near of evil days never left them again and daily his face grew thinner and whiter his manner more restless and ill at ease he seemed as uncomfortable as was damocles under the hair suspended sword other people besides the chaplain noticed the change but unlike cargram they did not ascribe it to a consciousness of guilt but to ill health mrs pendle who was extremely fond of her husband and was well informed with regard to the newest treatment and the latest fashionable medicine 
insisted that the bishop suffered from nerves brought on by overwork and plaintively suggested that he should take the cure for them at some german bod but the bishop sturdy old briton that he was insisted that so long as he could keep on his feet there was no necessity for his women-folk to make a fuss over him and declared that it was merely the change in the weather which caused him as he phrased it to feel a trifle out of sorts it is hot one day and cold the next my dear he said in answer to his wife's remonstrances as if the clerk of the weather didn't know his own mind how can you expect the liver of a fat lazy old man like me not to respond to these sudden changes of temperature fat bishop cried mrs pendle in vexed tones you are not fat you have a fine figure for a man of your age and as to lazy there is no one in the church who works harder than you do no one can deny that oh you flatter me my love you underrate yourself my dear but if it is liver why not try widow's spa i believe the treatment there is very drastic and beneficial why not go there bishop i'm sure a holiday would do you no harm i haven't time for a holiday amy my liver must get well as best it can while i go about my daily duties that is if it is my liver i don't believe it is remarked mrs pendle it is nerves my dear nothing else you hardly eat anything you start at your own shadow and at times you are too irritable for words go to droidich for those unruly nerves of yours and try brine baths i rather think you should go to nauheim for that weak heart of yours my love replied dr pendle arranging his wife's pillows in fact i want you and lucy to go there next month indeed bishop i shall do no such thing you are not fit to look after yourself then graham shall look after me dr graham echoed mrs pendle with contempt he is old-fashioned and quite ignorant of the new medicines no bishop you must go to droidich and you my dear to nauheim at this point matters came to an issue between them for mrs pendle who like most people possessed a fund of what may be called nervous obstinacy positively refused to leave england on his side the bishop insisted more eagerly than was his custom that mrs pendle should undergo the shot treatment at nauheim for some time the argument was maintained with equal determination on both sides until mrs pendle concluded it by bursting into tears and protesting that her husband did not understand her in the least whereupon as the only way to soothe her the bishop admitted that he was in the wrong and apologized all the same he was determined that his wife should go abroad and thinking she might yield to professional persuasions he sent for dr graham by cargram a message was brought that the doctor would be with the bishop next morning so pendle not to provoke further argument said nothing more on the subject to his wife but here lucy came on the scene and seemed equally as averse as her mother to continental travel she immediately entered her protest against the proposed journey mamma is better now than ever she was said lucy and if she goes to nauheim the treatment will only weaken her it will strengthen her in the long run lucy i hear wonderful accounts of the nauheim cures oh papa every bod says that it cures more patients than any other just as every bod advertises that its waters have so much per cent more salt or sodium or iodine or whatever they call it than the rest besides if you really think mamma should try this cure she can have it at bath or in london they say it is just as good in either place as at nauheim oh, i think not lucy and i wish you and your mother would go abroad for a month or two my mind is made up on the subject why papa cried lucy playfully one would think you wanted to get rid of us the bishop winced and turned a shade paler oh you are talking at random my dear he said gravely if it were not for your mother's good i should not deprive myself of your society poor mother sighed lucy and poor harry she added as an afterthought there need be no poor harry about the matter said dr pendle rather sharply if that is what is troubling you i dare say harry will be glad to escort you and your mother over to germany lucy became a rosy red with pleasure do you really think harry would like to come she asked in a fluttering voice he is no true lover if he doesn't replied her father with a wan smile now run away my love i am busy to-morrow we shall settle the question of your going 
when to-morrow came cargram all on fire with curiosity tried his hardest to stay in the library when dr graham came but as the bishop wished his interview to be private he intimated the fact pretty plainly to his obsequious chaplain in fact he spoke so sharply that cargram felt distinctly aggrieved and but for the trained control he kept of his temper might have said something to show dr pendle the suspicions he entertained however the time was not yet ripe for him to place all his cards on the table for he had not yet conceived a plausible case against the bishop he was on the point of pronouncing the name amaru to see if it would startle dr pendle but remembering his former failures when he had introduced the name of jentham to the bishop's notice he was wise enough to hold his tongue it would not do to arouse dr pendle's suspicions until he could accuse him plainly of murdering the man and could produce evidence to substantiate his accusation the evidence cargram wished to obtain was that of the cheque-butt and the pistol but as yet he did not see his way how to become possessed of either pending doing so he hid himself in the grass like the snake he was ready to strike his unsuspecting benefactor when he could do so with safety and effect in accordance with his resolution on this point mr cargram was meek and truckling while he was with the bishop and when dr graham was announced he sidled out of the library with a bland smile dr graham gave him a curt nod in response to his gracious greeting and closed the door himself before he advanced to meet the bishop nay more so violent was his dislike to good mr cargram that he made a few remarks about that apostle before coming to the object of his visit if you were a student of lavater bishop said he rubbing his hands you would not tolerate that jesuitical rodin near you for one moment jesuitical rodin doctor i do not understand ah that comes of not reading french novels my lord i do not approve of the moral tone of french fiction said the bishop stiffly few of our english pharisees do replied graham dryly not that i rank you among the hypocrites bishop so do not take my remark in too literal a sense i am not so thin-skinned or self-conscious as to do so graham but your meaning of a jesuitical rodin it is explained in the wandering jew of eugene sue bishop you should read that novel if only to arrive by analogy at the true character of your chaplain rodin is one of the personages in the book and rodin said the doctor decisively is cargram you are severe doctor michael is an estimable young man michael and the dragon said graham playing upon the name hm, he is more like the latter than the former mr michael cargram is the young serpent as satan is the old one i always understood that you considered satan a myth doctor so i do so he is a bogey of the middle and classical ages constructed out of pluto and pan but he serves excellently well for an illustration of your pet parson cargram is not a pet of mine rejoined the bishop coldly and i do not say that he is a perfect character still he is not bad enough to be compared to satan you speak too hurriedly doctor and if you will pardon my saying so too irreligiously oh, i beg your pardon i forgot that i was addressing a bishop but as to that young man he is a bad and dangerous character doctor doctor protested the bishop raising a deprecating hand yes he is insisted graham his goodness and meekness are all on the surface i am convinced that he is a kind of human mole who works underground and makes mischief in secret ways if you have a cupboard with a skeleton bishop take care mr cargram doesn't steal the key graham spoke with some meaning for since the illness of dr pendle after jentham's visit he had suspected that the bishop was worried in his mind and that he possessed a secret which was wearing him out had he known that the strange visitor was one and the same with the murdered man he might have spoken still more to the point but the doctor was ignorant of this and consequently conceived the bishop's secret to be much more harmless than it really was however his words touched his host nearly for dr pendle started and grew nervous and looked so haggard and worried that graham continued his speech without giving him time to make a remark however i did not come here to discuss cargram he said cheerfully but because you sent for me it is about time said graham grimly surveying the bishop's wasted face and embarrassed manner you are looking about as ill as a man can look what is the matter with you 
nothing is the matter with me i am in my usual health you look it said the doctor ironically good lord man with sudden wrath why in the name of the thirty-nine articles can't you tell me the truth the truth echoed the bishop faintly yes my lord i said the truth and i mean the truth if you are not wrong in body you are in mind a man doesn't lose flesh and colour and appetite and self-control for nothing you want me to cure you well i can't unless you show me the root of your trouble i am worried over a private affair confessed pendle driven into a corner something wrong asked graham raising his eyebrows yes something is very wrong can't it be put right i fear not said the bishop in hopeless tones it is one of those things beyond the power of mortal man to put right your trouble must be serious said graham with a grave face it is very serious you can't help me i can't help myself i must endure my sorrow as best i may after all god strengthens the back for the burden oh lord groaned graham to himself that make the best of it view seems to be the gist of christianity what the deuce is the good of laying a too weighty burden on any back when you've got to strengthen it to bear it well bishop he added aloud i have no right to ask for a glimpse of your skeleton but can i help you in any way yes cried the bishop eagerly i sent for you to request your aid you can help me graham and very materially i'm willing to do so what shall i do send my wife and daughter over to nauheim on the pretext that mrs pendle requires the baths and keep them there for two months dr graham looked puzzled for he could by no means conceive the meaning of so odd a request in common with other people he was accustomed to consider bishop and mrs pendle a model couple who would be as miserable as two separated love-birds if parted yet here was the husband asking his aid to send away the wife on what he admitted was a transparent pretext for the moment he was nonplussed pardon me bishop he said delicately but have you had words with your wife oh no no god forbid graham she is as good and tender as she always is as dear to me as she ever was but i wish her to go away for a time and i desire lucy to accompany her yesterday i suggested that they should take a trip to nauheim but both of them seemed unwilling to go yet they must go cried the bishop vehemently and you must help me in my trouble by insisting upon their immediate departure graham was more perplexed than ever has your secret trouble anything to do with mrs pendle he demanded hardly knowing what to say it has everything to do with her does she know that it has no she knows nothing not even that i am keeping a secret from her doctor said pendle rising if i could tell you my trouble i would but i cannot i dare not if you help me you must do so with implicit confidence in me knowing that i am acting for the best well bishop you place me rather in a cleft stick said the doctor looking at the agitated face of the man with his shrewd little eyes i don't like acting in the dark one should always look before he leaps you know but good heavens man i am not asking you to do anything wrong my request is a perfectly reasonable one i want my wife and daughter to leave england for a time and you can induce them to take the journey well said graham calmly i shall do so thank you graham it is good of you to accede to my request i wouldn't do it for every one said graham sharply and although i do not like being shut out from your confidence i know you well enough to trust you thoroughly a couple of months at nauheim may do your wife good and as you tell me will relieve your mind it certainly will relieve my mind said the bishop very emphatically very good my lord i'll do my very best to persuade mrs pendle and your daughter to undertake the journey of course said pendle anxiously you won't tell them all i have told you i do not wish to explain myself too minutely to them i am not quite so indiscreet as you think my lord replied graham with some dryness your wife shall leave Berminster for nauheim thinking that your desire for her departure is entirely on account of her health oh, thank you again doctor and the bishop held out his hand come said graham to himself as he took it this secret can't be anything very dreadful if he gives me his hand my lord he added aloud i shall see mrs pendle at once but before closing this conversation i would give you a warning 
a warning stammered the bishop starting back a very necessary warning said the doctor solemnly if you have a secret beware of cargram End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 of The Bishop's Secret by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20 Mother Jail. Dr. Graham was not the man to fail in carrying through successfully any scheme he undertook, and what he had promised the bishop he duly fulfilled. After a rather lengthy interview with Mrs. Pendle and her daughter, he succeeded in arousing their interest in Nauheim and its baths so much so that before he left the palace they were as eager to go as formerly they had been to stay this seeming miracle was accomplished mainly by a skilful appeal to mrs pendle's love for experimenting with new medical discoveries in connection with her health she had never tried the shot treatment for heart dilation and indeed had heard very little about it but when fully informed on the subject her interest in it was soon awakened she soon came to look on the carbolic spring of nauheim as the true fountain of youth and was sanguine that by bathing for a few weeks in its life-giving waters she would return to Berminster hale and hearty and full of vitality if ever hope told a flattering tale she did to mrs pendle through the lips of cunning dr graham i thought you knew nothing about new medicine or treatments she observed graciously or if you did that you were too conservative to prescribe them i see i was wrong you were decidedly wrong mrs pendle it is only a fool who ceases to acquire knowledge and benefit by it i am not a cabbage although i do live in a vegetable garden lucy's consent was gained through the glowing description of the benefit her mother would receive from the nauheim waters and the opportune arrival of sir harry brace contributed to the wished-for result the ardent lover immediately declared his willingness to escort lucy to the world's end wherever lucy was the garden of eden blossomed and while mrs pendle was being pickled and massaged and put to bed for recuperative slumbers he hoped to have his future wife all to himself in her sweet company even the dull little german watering-place would prove a paradise cupid is the sole miracle worker in these days of scepticism it is all right bishop said the victorious doctor the ladies will be off with brace in attendance as soon as they can pack up a wagon load of feminine frippery i am sincerely glad to hear it said dr pendle and heaved a sigh of relief which made graham wag his head and put in a word of advice you must take a trip yourself my lord he said decisively nothing like change for mental worry go to bath or putney or jericho bishop travel is your anodyne i cannot leave Berminster just now graham when i can i shall take your advice the doctor shrugged his shoulders and walked towards the door there he paused and looked back at the unhappy face of the bishop a thought struck him and he returned pendle he said gently i am your oldest friend and one who honours and respects you above all men why not tell me your trouble and let me help you i shall keep your secret whatever it may be i have no fears on that score graham if i could trust any one i should trust you but i cannot tell you what is in my mind no useful result would come of such candour for only the one above can help me out of my difficulties is it money worries bishop no my worldly affairs are most prosperous it is not this murder that is troubling you i suppose the bishop became as pale as the paper on the desk before him and convulsively clutched the arms of his chair the the murder he stammered the murder graham why should that trouble me cargram told me that you were greatly upset that such a thing should have occurred in your diocese i am annoyed about it replied pendle in a low voice but it is not the untimely death of that unhappy man which worries me then i give up said the doctor with another shrug graham yes what is it do you think that there is any chance of the murder of this man being discovered if the case had been handled by a london detective while the clues were fresh i dare say there might have been a chance replied the doctor but that mutton-headed tinkler has made such a muddle of the affair that i am certain the murderer will never be captured has anything new been discovered since the inquest nothing so far as i know tinkler is satisfied and the matter is at an end 
whosoever killed jentham has only his own conscience to fear and god said the bishop softly i always understand that what you churchmen call conscience was the still small voice of the deity replied graham dryly there is no use in being tautological bishop well good day my lord good day doctor and many many thanks for your kindly help not at all i only wish that you would let me help you to some purpose by treating me as your friend and unburdening your mind there is one great truth that you should become a convert to bishop ah uh, what is that said pendle listlessly that medical men are the father confessors of protestantism good day outside the library cargram was idling about in the hope of picking up some crumbs of information when graham took his departure but the little doctor who was not in the best of tempers for another conversation shot past the chaplain like a bolt from the bow and by the time cargram recovered from such brusque treatment was halfway down the avenue fuming and fretting at his inability to understand the attitude of bishop pendle dr graham loved a secret as a magpie does a piece of stolen money and he was simply frantic to find out what vexed his friend the more so as he believed that he could help him to bear his trouble by sympathy and perhaps by advice do away with it altogether he could not even make a guess at the bishop's hidden trouble and ran over all known crimes in his mind from murder to arson without coming to any conclusion yet something extraordinary must be the matter to move so easy-going healthy a man as dr pendle i know more of his life than most people thought graham as he trotted briskly along and there is nothing in it that i can see to upset him so he hasn't forged or coined or murdered or sold himself to pluto pan satan so far as i know and he is too clear-headed and sane to have a monomania about a non-existent trouble dear dear the doctor shook his head sadly i shall never understand human nature there is always an abyss below an abyss and the firmest seeming ground is usually quagmire when you come to step on it george pendle is a riddle which would puzzle the sphinx hm hm another fabulous beast well well i can only wait and watch until i discover the truth and then well what then why nothing and graham having talked himself into a cul-de-sac of thought shook his head furiously and strove to dismiss the matter from his too inquisitive mind but not all his philosophy and will could accomplish the impossible we are a finite lot of fools said he and when we think we know most we know least how that nameless unseen power must smile at our attempts to scale the stars by which remark it will be seen that dr graham was not the atheist Burminster believed him to be and here may end his speculations for the present shortly mrs pendle and lucy began to pack a vast number of boxes with garments needful and ornamental and sufficient in quantity to last them for at least twelve months it is true that they intended to remain away only eight weeks but the preparations for departure were worthy of the starting out of a crusade they must take this they could certainly not leave that warm dresses were needed for possible cold weather cool frocks were requisite for probable hot days they must have smart dresses as they would no doubt go out a great deal and three or four tea-gowns each as they might stay indoors altogether in short their stock of millinery would have clothed at least half a dozen women although both ladies protested plaintively that they had absolutely nothing to wear and that it would be necessary to go shopping in london for a few days if only to make themselves look presentable harry brace the thoughtless bachelor was struck dumb when he saw the immense quantity of luggage which went off in and on a bus to the railway station in the charge of a nurse and a lady's maid oh lord said he aghast are we starting out on an african expedition lucy well i'm sure harry mamma and i are only taking what is absolutely necessary other women would take twice as much wait until you and lucy leave for your honeymoon brace said the bishop with a smile at his prospective son-in-law's long face she will be one of the other women then in that case said harry a trifle grimly lucy will have to decide if i am to go as a bridegroom or a luggage agent of course all Burminster knew that mrs pendle was going to nauheim for the treatment and of course all Burminster, that is the feminine portion of it 
came to take tender farewells of the travellers every day up to the moment of departure mrs pendle's drawing-room was crowded with ladies all relating their experiences of english and continental travelling lucy took leave of at least a dozen dear friends and from the way in which mrs pendle was lamented over and blessed and warned and advised by the wives of the inferior clergy one would have thought that her destination was the moon and that she would never get back again altogether the palace was no home for a quiet prelate in those days at the last moment mrs pendle found that she would be wretched if her bishop did not accompany her some way on the journey so dr pendle went with the travellers to london and spent a pleasant day or so being hurried about from shop to shop if he had not been the most angelic bishop in england he would have revolted but as he was anxious that his wife should have no cause of complaint he exhausted himself with the utmost amiability but the longest lane has a turning and the day came when mrs pendle and lucy attended by the dazed harry left for nauheim via queensborough flushing and cologne mrs pendle declared as the train moved away that she was thoroughly exhausted which statement the bishop quite believed his wonder was that she and lucy were not dead and buried on returning to the empty palace bishop pendle settled himself down for a long rest remembering graham's hint he saw as little of cargrim as was compatible with the relationship of business the chaplain noted that he was being avoided and guessing that some one had placed dr pendle on his guard against him became more secretive and watchful than ever but in spite of all his spying he met with little success for although the bishop still continued weary-eyed and worried-looking he went about his work with more zest than usual indeed he attended so closely to the duties of his position that cargrim fancied he was trying to forget his wickedness by distracting his mind but as usual the chaplain had no tangible reason for this belief and about this time when most industrious the bishop began to be haunted not by a ghost which would have been bearable as ghosts appear usually only in the night time but by a queer little old woman in a red cloak who supported herself with a crutch and looked like a wicked fairy this as the bishop ascertained by a casual question was mother jael the gypsy friend of jentham and the knowledge of her identity did not make him the easier in his mind he could not conceive what she meant by her constant attendance on him and but that he believed in the wisdom of letting sleeping dogs lie he would have resented her pertinacity the sight of her became almost insupportable whether mother jael intended to terrify the bishop or not it is hard to say but the way in which she followed him tormented him beyond measure when he left the palace she was there on the road when he preached in the cathedral she lurked among the congregation when he strolled about Berminster, she watched him round corners but she never approached him she never spoke to him and frequently vanished as mysteriously and unexpectedly as she appeared wherever he went wherever he looked that crimson cloak was sure to meet his eye mother jael was old and bent and witch-like with elf locks of white hair and a yellow wrinkled face but her eyes burned like two fiery stars under her frosted brows and with these she stared hard at bishop pendle until he felt almost mesmerized by the intensity of her gaze she became a perfect nightmare to the man much the same as the little old woman of the coffer was to abuda the merchant in the fantastic eastern tale but unlike that pertinacious beldam she apparently had no message to deliver she only stared and stared with her glittering evil eyes until the bishop his nerves not being under control with this constant persecution almost fancied that the powers of darkness had leagued themselves against him and had sent this hell hag to haunt and torment him several times he strove to speak to her for he thought that even the proverb of sleeping dogs might be acted upon too literally but mother jael always managed to shuffle out of the way she appeared to have the power of disintegrating her body for where she disappeared to on these occasions the bishop never could find out one minute he would see her in a red cloak leaning on her crutch and staring at him steadily but let him take one step in her direction and she would vanish like a ghost no wonder the bishop's nerves began to give way the constant sight of that silent figure with its menacing gaze would have driven many a man out of his mind 
but dr pendle resisted the panic which seized him at times and strove to face the apparition for mother jael's flittings deserved such a name with control and calmness but the effort was beyond his strength at times as the weeks went by cargrim also began to notice the persecution of mother jael and connecting her with jentham and jentham with the bishop he began to wonder if she knew the truth about the murder it was not improbable he thought that she might be possessed of more important knowledge than she had imparted to the police and a single word from her might bring home the crime to the bishop if he was innocent why did she haunt him but again if he was guilty why did she avoid him to gain an answer to this riddle cargrim attempted when possible to seize the elusive phantom of mother jael but three or four times she managed to vanish in her witch-like way at length one day when she was watching the bishop talking to the dean at the northern door of the cathedral cargrim came softly behind her and seized her arm mother jael turned with a squeak like a trapped rabbit why do you watch the bishop asked cargrim sharply bless you lovey i don't watch him whined mother jael cringing nonsense i've seen you look at him several times there ain't no harm in that my lamb they do say as a cat can look at a queen and why not a poor gypsy at a noble bishop i say dearie she added in a hoarse whisper what's his first name the bishop's first name george why do you want to know george pondered mother jael taking no notice of the question i always thought the soldier was george he is george too called after his father answer me why do you want to know the bishop's name and why do you watch him ah my noble gorgio that's tellings no doubt so just tell it to me lord lovey the likes of you don't want to know what the likes of me thinks cargrim lost his temper at these evasions you are a bad character mother jael i shall warn the police about you oh tiny jesus hear me i ain't done nothing wrong i'm a poor old gypsy strike me dead if i ain't if you tell me something said cargrim changing his tactics you shall have this and he produced a coin mother jael eyed the bright half-sovereign he held between finger and thumb and her old eyes glistened yes yeah, dearie yes yeah. Wh what is it tell me the truth about the murder whispered cargrim with a glance in the direction of the bishop mother jael gave a shrill screech grabbed the half-sovereign and shuffled away so rapidly that she was round the corner before cargrim could recover from his surprise at once he followed but in spite of all his search he could not find the old hag yet she had her eye on him george and george said mother jael who was watching him from an odd angle of the wall into which she had squeezed herself i wonder which of em did it End of chapter 20chapter twenty one of the bishop's secret by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one mrs pansy's festival once a year the archdeacon's widow discharged her social obligations by throwing open the jail in which she dwelt her festival to which all that burmester could boast of in the way of society was invited usually took the form of an out-of-door party as mrs pansey found that she could receive more people and trouble herself less about their entertainment by filling her grounds than by crushing them into the rather small reception rooms of her house besides the gardens were really charming and the wide-spreading green of the lawns surrounded by ample flower-beds now brilliant with rainbow blossoms looked most picturesque when thronged with well-dressed well-bred well-pleased guests nearly all of the invitations had been accepted firstly because mrs pansey made things unpleasant afterwards for such defiant spirits as stayed away secondly for the very attractive reason that the meat and drink provided by the hostess were of the best thus mrs pansey's entertainments were usually the most successful of the burminster season on this auspicious occasion the clerk of the weather had granted the hostess an especially fine day sunshine filled the cloudless arch of the blue sky the air was warm but tempered by a softly blowing breeze and the guests to do honour at once to mrs pansey and the delightful weather wore their most becoming and coolest costumes pretty girls laughed in the sunshine 
matrons gossiped beneath the rustling trees and the sober black coats of the clerical element subdued the too vivid tints of the feminine frippery the scene was animated and full of colour and movement so that even mrs pansey's grim countenance expanded into an unusual smile when greeting fresh arrivals at intervals a band played lively dance music there was croquet and lawn tennis for the young iced coffee and scandal for the old altogether the company being mostly youthful and unthinking was enjoying itself immensely as the chatter and laughter and smiling and bowing amply testified altogether i may regard it as a distinct success said mrs pansey as attired in her most hamlet-like weeds she received her guests under the shade of a many-coloured japanese umbrella and the gardens really look nice the gardens of paradise observed the complimentary cargram who was smirking at the elbow of his hostess don't distort holy writ if you please snapped mrs pansey who still reserved the right of being disagreeable even at her own entertainment but if you do call this the garden of eden i dare say there are plenty of serpents about and many adams and eves said dr graham surveying the company with his usual cynicism but i don't see lilith mrs pansey lilith doctor what an improper name and what an improper person my dear lady lilith was the other wife of father adam how dare you dr graham the first man a bigamist ridiculous profane only one rib was taken out of adam lilith wasn't manufactured out of a rib mrs pansey the devil created her to deceive adam at least so the rabbinists tell us oh those jewish creatures said the lady with a sniff i don't think much of their opinion what do jews know about the bible as much as authors generally know about their own books i suppose said graham dryly we are becoming theological observed cargram smoothly not to say blasphemous growled mrs pansey at least the doctor is like all sceptics of his infidel profession remember ananias and his lies sir i shall rather remember eve and her curiosity laughed graham and to follow so good an example let me inquire what yonder very pretty tent contains mrs pansey that is a piece of daisy's foolishness doctor it contains a gipsy whom she induced me to hire for some fortune-telling rubbish oh how sweet how jolly cried a mixed chorus of young voices a real gipsy mrs pansey and the good lady was besieged with questions she is cunning and dirty enough to be genuine my dears some of you may know her mother jail a right thee witch cried dr graham that old beldam oh she can pen dunkerum to some purpose i have heard of her so have the police what language is that asked miss whichello who came up at this moment with a smile and a word for all it sounds like swearing i'd like to see any one swear here said mrs pansey grimly set your mind at rest dear lady i was speaking romany the black language the callow jib which the gipsies brought from the east when they came to plunder the hencoops of europe do you mean to tell me that those creatures have a language of their own asked miss whichello disbelievingly why not i dare say their ancestors made bricks on the plain of shinar and were lucky enough to gain a language without the trouble of learning it you allude to the tower of babel sir said mrs pansey with a scowl rather to the tower of fable dear lady since the whole story is a myth not caring to hear this duel of words and rather surprised to learn that mother jael was present cargram slipped away at the first opportunity to ponder over the information and consider what use he could make of it so the old woman still followed the bishop had followed him even into society and had made herself mrs pansey's professional fortune-teller so that she might still continue to vex the eyes of her victim with the sight of her eternal red cloak dr pendle was at that very moment walking amongst the guests with his youngest son by his side and appeared to be more cheerful and more like his former self than he had been for some time apparently he was as yet ignorant that mother jael was in his immediate vicinity but cargram determined that he should be warned of her presence as speedily as possible and be lured into having an interview with her so that his scheming chaplain might see what would come of the meeting 
Also, Cargrim resolved to see the old gipsy himself and renew the conversation which she had broken off when she had thieved his gold. In one way or another he foresaw that it would be absolutely necessary to force the woman into making some definite statement, either inculpating or exonerating the bishop in respect of Jentham's death. Therefore, having come to this conclusion, Cargrim strolled watchfully through the merry crowd. It was his purpose to inform Dr. Pendle that Mother Jael was telling fortunes in the gaily striped tent, and his determination to bring, if possible, the prelate into contact with the old hag. From such a meeting, artful Mr. Cargrim hoped to gather some useful information from the conversation and behaviour of the pair. Unfortunately, Cargrim was impeded in the execution of the scheme from the fact of his remarkable popularity. He could not take two steps without being addressed by one or more of his lady admirers, and although he saw the bishop no great distance away, he could not reach him by reason of the detaining sirens as gracefully as possible he eluded their snares but when confronted by daisy norsham hanging on the arm of dean alder he almost gave up hope of reaching his goal there was but little chance of escape from daisy and her small talk moreover she was rather bored by the instructive conversation of the ancient parson and wanted to attach herself to some younger and more frivolous man Cupid in cap and gown and spectacles is a decidedly prosy divinity. "'Oh, dear Mr. Cargrim,' cried the gushing Daisy, "'is it really you? Oh, how very sweet of you to come to-day! And what is the very latest news of poor dear Mrs. Pendle? I believe the Nauheim baths are doing her a great deal of good, Miss Norsham. Uh, if you will excuse Nauheim, croaked the dean with a dry cough, is unknown to me, save as a geographical expression, but the town of Baden-Baden, formerly called Aurelia Aquinsus, was much frequented by the Romans on account of its salubrious and health-giving springs. I may also instance Aachen, vulgarly termed Aix la Chapelle, but known to the Latins as Aquisgranum, or— How interesting, interrupted Daisy, cutting short this stream of information. You do seem to know everything, Mr. Dean. The only German watering place I have been to is at Wiesbaden, where the doctors made me get up at five o'clock to drink the waters. And fancy, Mr. Cargrim, a band played at the Kochbrunnen at seven in the morning. Did you ever hear anything so horrid? Music at so early an hour would be trying, Miss Norsham. Aquamaticae was the Roman appellation of Wiesbaden, murmured Dr. Alder, twiddling his eyeglass. I hear on good medical authority that the waters are most beneficial to renovate health and arrest decay. I should advise his lordship the bishop to visit the springs, for of late I have noticed that he appears to be sadly out of sorts. He is looking much better to-day, observed the chaplain with a glance at the bishop, who was now conversing with Miss Whichello. Oh, the poor dear bishop should have his fortune told by Mother Jael. That would hardly be in keeping with his exalted position, Miss Norsham. Oh, really, I don't see that it is so very dreadful, cried Daisy, with one of her silvery peals of artificial laughter, and it's only fun. Mother Jael might tell him if he was going to be ill or not, you know, and he might take medicine if he was. Besides, she does tell the truth. Oh, really, it's too awful what she knew about me. But I'm glad to say she prophesied a lovely future. A marriage and money, I presume? Well, you are clever, Mr. Cargrim. That is just the fortune she told me. How did you guess? I'm to meet my future husband here. He is to be rich and adore me, and I'm to be very, very happy. Oh, I'm sure so charming a young lady deserves to be, said Cargrim, bowing. Siderum Regina, be cornis audi, luna puellas, quoted Mr. Dean with a side glance at the radiant daisy, and if that confident lady had understood Latin, she would have judged from his satirical quotation that Dr. Alder was not so subjugated by her charms as to contemplate matrimony but being ignorant she was in accordance with the proverb blissful and babbled on with a never-failing stream of small talk which was at times momentarily obstructed by the heavy masses of information cast into it by the dean 
leaving this would-be may and wary old december to their unequal flirtation cargrim again attempted to reach the bishop but was captured by miss tancred much to his disgust she entertained him with a long and minute account of her rheumatic pains and the means by which she hoped to cure them held thus as firmly as the wedding guest was by the ancient mariner cargrim lost the chance of hearing a very interesting conversation between miss whichello and the bishop but from the clouded brow of dr pendle he saw that something was wrong and chaffed at his enforced detention nevertheless miss tancred kept him beside her until she exhausted her trickle of small talk it took all cargrim's tact and politeness and christianity to endure patiently her gabble yes bishop miss whichello was saying with some annoyance your son has admired my niece for some considerable time lately they became engaged but i refused to give my consent until your sanction and approval had been obtained george has said nothing to me on the subject replied dr pendle in a vexed tone yet he should certainly have done so before speaking to your niece oh no doubt but unfortunately young men's heads do not always guide their hearts still captain pendle promised me to tell you all during his present visit to beorminster and of course both mrs pendle and your daughter lucy know of his love for mab it would appear that i am the sole person ignorant of the engagement miss whichello it was not with my consent that you were kept in ignorance bishop but i really do not see why you should discourage the match you can see for yourself that they make a handsome pair dr pendle cast an angry look towards the end of the lawn where george and mab were talking earnestly together i don't deny their physical suitability he said severely but more than good looks are needed to make a happy marriage am i to understand that you disapprove of my niece cried the little old lady drawing herself up oh by no means by no means how can you think me so wanting in courtesy but i must confess that i desire my son to make a good match you should rather wish him to get a good wife retorted miss whichello who was becoming annoyed but if it is fortune you desire i can set your mind at rest on that point mab will inherit my money when i die and should she marry captain pendle during my lifetime i shall allow the young couple a thousand a year a thousand a year miss whichello yes and more if necessary let me tell you bishop i am much better off than people think the bishop rather nonplussed looked down at his neat boots and very becoming gaiters i am not so worldly minded as you infer miss whichello said he mildly and did george desire to marry a poor girl i have enough money of my own to humour his whim but if his heart is set on making miss arden his wife i should like if you will pardon my candour to know more about the young lady mab is the best and most charming girl in the world said the little jenny wren pale and a trifle nervous i can see that for myself you misunderstand me miss whichello so i must speak more explicitly who is miss arden she is my niece replied miss whichello with trembling dignity the only child of my poor sister who died when mab was an infant in arms quite so assented the bishop with a nod i have always understood such to be the case but uh, mr arden mr arden faltered the old lady turning her face from the company that its pallor and anxiety might not be seen her father is he alive uh, no cried miss whichello shaking her head he died long long ago who was he um, um a gentleman a gentleman of independent fortune dr pendle bit his nether lip and looked embarrassed miss whichello he said at length in a hesitating tone your niece is a charming young lady and so far as she herself is concerned is quite fit to become the wife of my son george i should think so indeed cried the little lady with buckram civility but continued the bishop with emphasis i have heard rumours about her parentage which do not satisfy me whether those are true or not is best known to yourself miss whichello but before consenting to the engagement you speak of i should like to be fully informed on the point to what rumours does your lordship refer 
asked miss whichello very pale-faced but very quiet this is neither the time nor place to inform you said the bishop hastily i see mr cargrim advancing on another occasion miss whichello we shall talk about the matter as the chaplain with three or four young ladies including miss norsham was bearing down on the bishop miss whichello recognized the justice of his speech and not feeling equal to talk frivolity she hastily retreated and ran into the house to fight down her emotion what the poor little woman felt was known only to herself but she foresaw that the course of true love so far as it concerned george and mab was not likely to run smooth still she put a brave face on it and hoped for the best in the meantime bishop pendle was enveloped in a whirl of petticoats as cargrim's amazonian escort prompted by the chaplain was insisting that he should have his fortune told by mother jael the bishop looked perturbed on hearing that his red-cloaked phantom was so close at hand but he managed to keep his countenance and laughingly refused to comply with the demand of the ladies think of what the newspapers would say he urged if a bishop were to consult this witch of indoor ah but really it is only a joke a dignitary of the church shouldn't joke miss norsham why not your lordship put in cargrim amiably i have heard that richelieu played with a kitten i am not richelieu replied dr pendle dryly nor is mother jael a kitten it's for a charity bishop said daisy imploringly i pay mother jael for the day and give the rest to mrs pansy's home for servants out of work oh for a charity repeated dr pendle smiling that puts quite a different complexion on the question what do you say mr cargrim oh, i don't think that your lordship can refuse the prayer of these charming young ladies replied the chaplain obsequiously now the bishop really wished to see mother jael in order to learn why she haunted him so persistently and as she had always vanished heretofore he thought that the present would be a very good time to catch her he therefore humoured the joke of fortune-telling for his own satisfaction and explained as much to the expectant company well well young ladies said he good-naturedly i suppose i must consent to be victimised if only to further the charitable purposes of mrs pansey where dwells the sibyl in this tent this way your lordship dr pendle advanced towards the gaily striped tent smiling broadly and with a playful shake of the head at the laughing nymphs around he invaded the privacy of mother jael with a sigh of relief at having accomplished his purpose cargrim let fall the flap which he had held up for the bishop's entry and turned away rubbing his hands his aim was attained it now remained to be seen what would come of the meeting between bishop and gypsy and of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of the bishop's secret by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty two mr mosk is indiscreet while the bishop was conversing with miss whichello about the engagement of george and mab the young people themselves were discussing the self-same subject with much ardour captain pendle had placed two chairs near a quick-set hedge beyond the hearing of other guests and on these he and mab were seated as closely as was possible without attracting the eyes of onlookers their attitude and actions were guarded and indifferent for the misleading of the company but their conversation not being likely to be overheard was confidential and lover-like enough no spectator from casual observation could have guessed their secret you must tell your father about our engagement at once said mab with decision he should have known of it before i consented to wear this ring i'll tell him to-morrow dearest although i am sorry that lucy and the mater are not here to support me but you don't think that he will object to me george i should think not replied captain pendle smiling at the very idea object to having the prettiest daughter-in-law in the county you don't know what an eye for beauty the bishop has if you are so sure of his consent i wonder you did not tell him before pouted mab auntie has been very angry at my keeping our engagement secret darling you know it isn't a secret we told cargrim and when he is aware of it the whole town is i didn't want to tell my father until i was sure you would marry me you have been sure of that for a long time 
in a sort of way asserted captain pendle but i was not absolutely certain until i placed a ring on that pretty hand now i'll tell my father get his episcopalian benediction and wire the news to lucy and the mater we shall be married in spring miss whichello will be the bridesmaid and all will be hay and sunshine oh what nonsense you talk george i'd do more than talk nonsense if the eyes of europe were not on us mother jael is telling fortunes in that tent my fairy queen so let us go in and question her about the future besides added george with an insinuating smile i don't suppose she would mind if i gave you one kiss mab laughed and shook her head you will have to dispense with both kiss and fortune for the present said she for your father has this moment gone into the tent what is saul also among the prophets cried george with uplifted eyebrows won't there be a shine in the tents of shem when it is published abroad that bishop pendle has patronized the witch of endor i wonder what he wants to know surely the scroll of his fortune is made up george said mab gravely your father has been much worried lately about what by whom i don't know but he looks worried oh he is fidgeting because my mother is away he always fusses about her health like a hen with one chick be more respectful my dear corrected mab demurely i'll be anything you like sweet prude if you'll only fly with me far from this madding crowd hang it here is someone coming to disturb us it is your brother so it is hello gabriel why that solemn brow i have just heard bad news said gabriel pausing before them old mr lee is dying what the rector of heathcroft i don't call that bad news old boy seeing that his death gives you your step george cried mab and gabriel in a breath how can you well lee is old and ripe enough to die isn't he said the incorrigible george remember what the old scotch sexton said to the weeping mourners what are ye greeting aboot if ye dinna bring em at eighty when will ye bring em my scotch accent is bad added captain pendle but the story itself is a thing of beauty i want to tell my father the news said gabriel indignantly turning away from george's wink where is he with mother oh there he is cried mab as the bishop issued from the sibyl's tent oh george how ill he looks by jove yes he is as pale as a ghost come and see what is wrong gabriel excuse me a moment mab the two brothers walked forward but before they could reach their father he was already taking his leave and shaking hands with mrs pansey his face was white his eyes were anxious and it was only by sheer force of will that he could excuse himself to his hostess in his ordinary voice i am afraid the sun has been too much for me mrs pansey he said in his usual suave tones and the close atmosphere of that tent is rather trying i regret being obliged to leave so charming a scene but i feel sure you will excuse me certainly bishop said mrs pansey graciously enough but won't you have a glass of sherry or oh, nothing thank you nothing good-bye mrs pansey your fete has been most successful ah gabriel catching sight of his youngest son will you be so good as to come with me are you ill sir asked george with solicitude no no a little out of sorts perhaps the sun merely the sun and waving his hand in a hurried manner dr pendle withdrew as quickly as his dignity permitted leaning on gabriel's arm the curate's face was as colourless as that of his father and he seemed equally as nervous in manner captain pendle returned to mab in a state of bewilderment for which there was surely sufficient cause i never saw the bishop so put out before said he with a puzzled look old mother jael must have prophesied blue ruin and murder murder the ominous word struck on the ears of cargrim who was passing at the moment and he smiled cruelly as he heard the half-joking tone in which it was spoken captain george pendle little thought that the chaplain took his jesting speech in earnest and was more convinced than ever that the bishop had killed jentham and had just been warned by mother jael that she knew the truth this then as cargrim considered was her reason for haunting the bishop in his incomings and outgoings of course it was impossible that the bishop's agitation could have escaped the attention of the assembled guests and many remarks were made as to its probable cause 
his sudden illness at his own reception was recalled and taken in conjunction with this seizure it was observed that dr pendle was working too hard that his constitution was breaking up and that he sadly needed a rest the opinion on this last point was unanimous for i will say remarked mrs pansey who was an adept at damning with faint praise that the bishop works as hard as his capacity of brain will let him and that is a great deal said dr graham tartly bishop pendle is one of the cleverest men in england that is right doctor replied the undaunted mrs pansey always speak well of your patients altogether so high stood the bishop's reputation as a transparently honest man that no one suspected anything was wrong save graham and mr cargrim the former remembered dr pendle's unacknowledged secret and wondered if the gipsy was in possession of it while the latter was satisfied that the bishop had been driven away by the fears roused by mother jael's communication whatever that might be but the general opinion was that too much work and too much sun had occasioned the bishop's illness and it was spoken of very lightly as a mere temporary ailment soon to be set right by complete change and complete rest thus dr pendle's reputation of the past stood him in good stead and saved his character thoroughly in the present now said cargrim to himself i know for certain that mother jael is aware of the truth also that the truth implicates the bishop in jentham's death i shall just go in and question her at once she can't escape from that tent so easily as she vanished the other day but cargrim quite underrated mother jael's power of making herself scarce for when he entered the tent he found it tenanted only by daisy norsham who was looking in some bewilderment at an empty chair the cunning old gipsy had once more melted into thin air where is she demanded cargrim regretting that his clerical garb prevented him from using appropriate language oh really dear mr cargrim i don't know after the dear bishop came out so upset with the heat we all ran to look after him so i suppose mother jael felt the heat also and left while our backs were turned it is really very vexing sighed daisy for lots of girls are simply dying to have their fortunes told and oh making a sudden discovery how very very dreadful what is it asked the chaplain staring at her tragic face that wicked old woman has taken all the money oh poor mrs pansy's home she has no doubt run off with the money said cargrim in what was for him a savage tone i must question the servants about her departure miss norsham i am afraid that your beautiful nature has been imposed upon by this deceitful vagrant whether this was so or not one thing was clear that mother jael had gone off with a considerable amount of loose silver in her pocket the servants knew nothing of her departure so there was no doubt that the old crone used to dodging and hiding had slipped out of the garden by some back way while the guests had been commiserating the bishop's slight illness as cargrim wanted to see the gipsy at once and hoped to force her into confessing the truth by threatening to have her arrested with the stolen money in her pocket he followed on her trail while it was yet fresh certainly mother jael had left no particular track by which she could be traced but cargrim knowing something of her habits judged that she would either strike across southbury heath to the tents of her tribe or take refuge for the time being at the derby winner it was more probable that she would go to the hotel than run the risk of being arrested in the gypsy camp so cargrim adopting this argument took his way down to eastgate he hoped to run mother jael to earth at the tap-room of the hotel on arriving at the derby winner he walked straight into the bar and found it presided over by a grinning pot-boy a noise of singing and shouting came from the little parlour at the back and when the chaplain asked for mr mosk he was informed by the smiling ganymede that the governor was in john as itself going on like one o'clock dear dear said the scandalized chaplain am i to understand that your master has taken more than is good for him yes he's just drunk up to jolliness sir and miss mosk she's a-trying to get him to bed as young missus and old missus is trying upstairs i shall certainly speak about this to the authorities said cargrim in an angry tone you are sober enough to answer my questions i hope yes sir i'm strite 
growled the pot-boy, pulling his forelock. "'Then tell me if that gypsy woman Mother Jael is here.' "'Massa, she ain't. I ain't set eyes on her for, oh, no how long.' The man spoke earnestly enough, and was evidently telling the truth. Much disappointed to find that the old crone was not in the neighbourhood, the chaplain was about to depart when he heard Mosk begin to sing in a husky voice, and also became aware that Belle, as he judged from the raised tones of her voice, was scolding her father thoroughly. His sense of duty got the better of his anxiety to find Mother Jael, and feeling that his presence was required, he passed swiftly to the back of the house and threw open the door of the parlour with fine clerical indignation. "'What is all this noise, Mosk?' he cried sharply. "'Do you wish to lose your license? Mosk, who was seated in an armchair, smiling and singing, with a very red face, was struck dumb by the chaplain's sudden entrance and sharp rebuke. Bell, flushed and angered, was also astonished to see Mr. Cargram, but hailed his arrival with joy as likely to have some moral influence on her riotous father. Personally she detested Cargram, but she respected his cloth, and was glad to see him wield the thunders of his clerical position. "'That is right, Mr. Cargram,' she cried with flashing eyes. "'Tell him he ought to be ashamed of drinking and singing with mother so ill upstairs.' "'I don't mean to do any harm,' said Mosk, rising sheepishly, for the shock of Cargram's appearance sobered him a good deal. "'I was just to have a glass to celebrate a joyful day.' cannot you take your glass without becoming intoxicated said cargrim in disgust i tell you what mosk if you go on in this way i shall make it my business to warn sir harry brace against you i told you how twould be father put in bell reproachfully you unnatural child gone again your parent growled mr mosk wasn't i drinking to your health cos the old un at heathcroft was passing to his long home tell me that what do you mean mosk asked the chaplain starting oh nothing sir interposed bell hurriedly father don't know what he is saying yes i do contradicted her father sulkily old mr lee the passin of heathcroft is dying and when he dies you'll live at heathcroft with father father hold your tongue with my son-in-law gabriel your son-in-law gasped cargrim recoiling is is your daughter the wife of young mr pendle no i am not mr cargram cried bell nervously it's father's nonsense it's bible truth save in your presence said moss striking the table young mr pendle is engaged to marry you ain't he and he's a-going to have the livin at heathcroft ain't he and old lee's a dyin fast ain't he go on father you've done it now said bell resignedly and sat down cargram was almost too surprised to speak the rector of heathcroft dying gabriel engaged to marry this common woman he looked from one to the other in amazement at the triumphant mosk and the blushing girl is this true miss mosk he asked doubtfully yes i am engaged to marry gabriel pendle cried bell with a toss of her head you can tell the whole town so if you like neither he nor i will contradict you it's as true as true growled mosk my daughter's going to be a lady i congratulate you both said cargram gravely this will be a surprise to the bishop and feeling himself unequal to the situation he made his escape well father said bell this is a pretty kettle of fish this is End of chapter twenty two Chapter Twenty Three of *The Bishop's Secret* by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Three, in the library. Certainly, there was little enough to admire in Mister Cargram's character. Still, he was not altogether a bad man. In common with his fellow creatures, he also had his good qualities, but these were somewhat rusty for want of use. As Missus Rodden Crawley, nay Sharp, remarked most people can be good on five thousand a year and if cargram had been high-placed and wealthy he would no doubt have developed his better instincts for lack of reasons to make use of his worser but being only a poor curate he had a long ladder to climb which he thought could be ascended more rapidly by kicking down all those who impeded his progress and by holding on to the skirts of those who were a few rungs higher 
therefore he was not very nice in his distinction between good and evil and did not mind by what means he succeeded so long as he was successful he knew very well that he was not a favourite with the bishop and that dr pendle would not give him more of the levitical loaves and fishes than he could help but as the holder of the Burminster see was the sole dispenser of these viands with whom cargrim was acquainted it behoved him at all risks to compel the bestowal of gifts which were not likely to be given of free will therefore cargrim plotted and planned and schemed to learn the bishop's secret and set him under his thumb but with all the will in the world the schemer was not clever enough to deal with the evidence he had accumulated the bishop had had an understanding with jentham he had attempted to secure his silence as was proved by the torn-out butt of the cheque-book he had as cargrim suspected killed the blackmailer to bury his secret in the grave and he had been warned by mother jael that she knew of his wicked act this was the evidence but cargrim did not know how to place it shipshape in order to prove to bishop pendle that he had him in his power it needed a trained mind to grapple with these confused facts to follow out clues to arrange details and cargrim recognized that it was needful to hire a helper with this idea he resolved to visit london and there engage the services of a private inquiry agent and as there was no time to be lost he decided to ask the bishop for leave of absence on that very night there is nothing so excellent as prompt attention to business even when it consists of the dirtiest kind nevertheless to allow his better nature some small opportunity of exercise cargrim determined to afford the bishop one chance of escape the visit to the derby winner had given him at once a weapon and a piece of information the rector of heathcroft was dying so in the nature of things it was probable that the living would soon be vacant from various hints cargrim was aware that the bishop destined this snug post for his younger son but gabriel pendle was engaged to marry bell mosk and when the bishop was informed of that fact cargrim had little doubt but that he would refuse to consecrate his son to the living then failing gabriel the chaplain hoped that dr pendle might give it to him and if he did so mr cargrim was quite willing to let bygones be bygones he would not search out the bishop's secret at all events for the present although if dean alder died he might make a later use of his knowledge to get himself elected to the vacant post however the immediate business in hand was to secure heathcroft rectory at the expense of gabriel so mr cargrim walked rapidly to the palace with the intention of informing the bishop without delay of the young man's disgraceful conduct only at the conclusion of the interview could he determine his future course if angered at gabriel the bishop gave him the living he would let the bishop settle his account with his conscience but if dr pendle refused he would then go up to london and hire a bloodhound to follow the trail of dr pendle's crime even to his very doorstep in thus giving his patron an alternative cargrim thought himself a very virtuous person indeed yet so far as he knew he might be compounding a felony but that knowledge did not trouble him in the least with this pretty little scheme in his head the chaplain entered the library in which dr pendle was usually to be found and sure enough the bishop was there sitting all alone and looking as wretched as a man could his face was grey and drawn he had aged so markedly since mrs pendle's garden party that mr cargrim was quite shocked and he started nervously when his chaplain glided into the room a nerve storm consequent on his interview with mother jael had exhausted the bishop's vitality and he seemed hardly able to lift his head the utter prostration of the man would have appealed to any one save cargrim but that astute young parson had an end to gain and was not to be turned from it by any display of mental misery he put his victim on the rack and tortured him as delicately and scientifically as any inquisition of the good old days when mother church anticipating the saying of the french revolution said to the backsliders of her flock be my child lest i kill thee so cargrim like a modern torquemada racked the soul instead of the body and devoted himself very earnestly to this congenial talk i beg your pardon my lord said he making a feint of retiring i did not know that your lordship was engaged 
i am not engaged replied the bishop seemingly glad to escape from his own sad thoughts come in come in you have left mrs pansey's fetch rather early but not so early as you sir said the chaplain taking a chair where he could command an uninterrupted view of the bishop's face i fear you are not well my lord no gargram i am not well in spite of my desire to continue my duties i am afraid that i shall be forced to take a holiday for my health's sake your lordship cannot do better than join mrs pendle at nauheim i was thinking of doing so said the bishop glancing at a letter at his elbow especially as sir harry brace is coming back on business to Bermondster. i do not wish my wife to be alone in her present uncertain state of health as to my own i am afraid no springs will cure it my disease is of the mind not of the body ah sighed cargrim sagely the very worst kind of disease may i ask what you are troubled about in your mind about many things cargrim many things amongst them the fact of this disgraceful murder it is a reflection on the diocese that the criminal is not caught and punished does your lordship wish the assassin to be captured asked the chaplain in his softest tone and with much apparent simplicity dr pendle raised his head and darted a keen look at his questioner of course i do he answered sharply and i am much annoyed that our local police have not been clever enough to hunt him down have you heard whether any more evidence has been found none likely to indicate the assassin my lord but i believe that the police have gathered some information about the victim's past the bishop's hand clenched itself so tightly that the knuckles whitened about jentham he muttered in a low voice and not looking at the chaplain ay, ay, what about him it seems my lord said cargrim watchful of his companion's face that thirty years ago the man was a violinist in london and his professional name was amaru a violinist amaru repeated dr pendle and looked so relieved that cargrim saw that he had not received the answer he expected a professional name you say yes your lordship replied the chaplain trying hard to conceal his disappointment no doubt the man's real name was jentham oh no doubt assented the bishop indifferently although i dare say so notorious a vagrant must have possessed at least half a dozen names it was on the tip of cargrim's tongue to ask by what name jentham had been known to his superior but restrained by the knowledge of his incapacity to follow up the question he was wise enough not to put it also as he wished to come to an understanding with the bishop on the subject of the heathcroft living he turned the conversation in that direction by remarking that mr ley was reported as dying so gabriel informed me said dr pendle with a nod i am truly sorry to hear it mr lee has been rector of heathcroft parish for many years for twenty-five years your lordship but latterly he has been rather lax in his rule what is needed in heathcroft is a young and earnest man with a capacity for organization one who by words and deeds may be able to move the sluggish souls of the parishioners who can contrive and direct and guide you describe an ideal rector cargrim remarked dr pendle rather dryly a kind of bishop in embryo but where is such a paragon to be found the chaplain coloured and looked conscious i do not describe myself as a paragon said he in a low voice nevertheless should your lordship think fit to present me with the heathcroft cure of souls i should strive to approach in some degree the ideal i have described the bishop was no stranger to cargrim's ambition as it was not the first time that the chaplain had hinted that he would make a good rector of heathcroft therefore he did not feel surprised at being approached so crudely on the subject with a testy gesture he pushed back his chair and looked rather frowningly on the presumptuous parson but cargrim was too sure of his ability to deal with the bishop to be daunted by looks and with his sleek head on one side and a suave smile on his pale lips he waited for the thunders from the episcopalian throne however the bishop was just as diplomatic as his chaplain and too wise to give way to the temper he felt at so downright a request approached the matter in an outwardly mild spirit heathcroft is a large parish said his lordship meditatively and therefore needs a hard-working young rector replied cargrim i am of course aware of my own deficiencies but these may be remedied by prayer and by a humble spirit 
mr cargrim said the bishop with a smile do you remember the rather heterodox story of the farmer's comment on prayer being offered up for rain what is the use of praying for rain said he when the wind is in this quarter i am inclined added dr pendle looking very intently at cargrim to agree with the farmer does that mean that your lordship will not give me the living we will come to that later mr cargrim at present i mean that no prayers will remedy our deficiencies unless the desire to do so begins in our own breasts will your lordship indicate the particular deficiencies i should remedy asked the chaplain outwardly calm but inwardly raging i think mr cargrim said the bishop gently that your ambition is apt to take precedence of your religious feelings else you would hardly adopt so extreme a course as to ask me so bluntly for a living if i deemed it advisable that you should be rector of heathcroft i should bestow it on you without the necessity of your asking me to give it to you but to be plain with you mr cargrim i have other designs when the living becomes vacant in that case we need say no more your lordship pardon me you must permit me to say this much said dr pendle in his most stately manner that i desire you to continue in your present position until you have more experience in diocesan work it is not every young man mr cargrim who has so excellent an opportunity of acquainting himself with the internal management of the catholic church your father was a dear friend of mine continued the bishop with emotion and in my younger days i owed him much for his sake and for your own i wish to help you as much as i can but you must permit me to be the best judge of when and how to advance your interests these ambitions of yours michael which i have observed on several occasions are dangerous to your better qualities a clergyman of our church is a man and being a priest something more than a man therefore it behooves him to be humble and religious and intent upon his immediate work for the glory of god should he rise it must be by such qualities that he attains a higher post in the church but should he remain all his days in a humble position he can die content knowing he has thought not of himself but of his god believe me my dear young friend i speak from experience and it is better for you to leave your future in my hands these sentiments being the antithesis to those of cargrim were of course extremely unpalatable to one of his nature he knew that he was more ambitious than religious but it was galling to think that dr pendle should have been clever enough to gauge his character so truly his mask of humility and deference had been torn off and he was better known to the bishop than was at all agreeable to his cunning nature he saw that so far as the heathcroft living was concerned he would never obtain it as a free gift from dr pendle therefore it only remained to adopt the worser course and force the prelate to accede to his request having thus decided mr cargrim with great self-control smoothed his face to a meek smile and even displayed a little emotion in order to show the bishop how touched he was by the kindly speech which had crushed his ambition i am quite content to leave my future in your hands he said with all possible suavity and indeed my lord i know that you are my best my only friend the deficiency to which you allude shall be conquered by me if possible and i trust that shortly i shall merit your lordship's more unreserved approbation why said the bishop shaking him heartily by the hand that is a very worthy speech michael and i shall bear it in mind we are still friends i trust in spite of what i consider it was my duty to say certainly we are friends sir i am honoured by the interest you take in me and now my lord added cargrim with a sweet smile may i prefer a little request which was in my mind when i came to see you of course of course michael what is it i have some business to transact in london my lord and i should like with your permission to be absent from my duties for a few days with pleasure assented the bishop go when you like cargrim i am only too pleased that you should ask me for a holiday many thanks your lordship said cargrim rising then i shall leave the palace to-morrow morning and will return towards the end of the week as there is nothing of particular importance to attend to i trust your lordship will be able to dispense with my services during my few days absence without trouble to yourself set your mind at rest cargrim you can take your holiday 
i again thank your lordship it only remains for me to say that if as i have heard your lordship intends to make mr gabriel rector of heathcroft i trust he will be as earnest and devout there as he has been in Beorminster. i have not yet decided how to fill up the vacancy said the bishop coldly and let me remind you mr cargrim that as yet the present rector of heathcroft still holds the living i do but anticipate the inevitable my lord said cargrim preparing to drive his sting into the bishop and certainly the sooner mr gabriel is advanced to the living the better it will be for his matrimonial prospects dr pendle stared i don't understand you he said stiffly what mr cargrim threw up his hands in astonishment has not mr gabriel informed your lordship of his engagement engagement echoed the bishop half rising do you mean to tell me that gabriel is engaged and without my knowledge oh your lordship i thought you knew most indiscreet of me murmured cargrim in pretended confusion to whom is my son engaged asked the bishop sharply to to really i i feel most embarrassed said the chaplain i, I should not have taken answer at once sir cried the bishop irritably to whom is my son gabriel engaged i insist upon knowing well, in that case i must tell your lordship that mr gabriel is engaged to marry miss bell mosk the bishop bounded out of his chair bell mosk the daughter of the landlord of the derby winner yes your lordship the 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 barmaid my son oh it is it is impossible i had it from the lips of the young lady herself said cargrim delighted at the bishop's annoyance certainly miss mosk is hardly fitted to be the wife of a future rector still she is a handsome stop sir cried the bishop imperiously don't dare to couple my son's name with that of a of, of a barmaid i cannot i will not i dare not believe it nevertheless it is true impossible incredible the boy must be mad he is in love which is much the same thing said cargrim with more boldness than he usually displayed before dr pendle but to assure yourself of its truth let me suggest that your lordship should question mr gabriel yourself i believe he is in the palace thank you mr cargrim said the bishop recovering from his first surprise i thank you for the information but i am afraid you have been misled my son would never choose a wife out of a bar it is to be hoped he will see the folly of doing so my lord replied the chaplain backing towards the door and now i shall take my leave assuring your lordship that i should never have spoken of mr gabriel's engagement had i not believed that you were informed on the point the bishop made no reply but sank into a chair looking the picture of misery after a glance at him cargrim left the room rubbing his hands i think i have given you a very good roland for your oliver my lord he murmured End of chapter twenty three Chapter twenty four of the Bishop's Secret by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty four The Bishop Asserts Himself. On being left alone, the Bishop sat motionless in his chair for some considerable time. The information conveyed by Cargrim struck at his pride, but in his heart he knew well that he had as little right to be proud as to resent the blow. Casting a look over the past, he saw that dr graham had been right in his reference to the ring of polycrates for although he was outwardly still prosperous and high placed shame had come upon him and evil was about to befall from the moment of jentham's secret visit a blight had fallen on his fortunes a curse had come upon his house and in a thousand hidden ways he had been tortured although for no fault of his own there was his secret which he did not dare even to think of there was the enforced absence of his wife and daughter whom he had been compelled to send away there was the hidden enmity of cargrim which he did not know how to baffle and now there was the shame of gabriel's engagement to a barmaid of george's choice of a wife 
who if rumour could be believed was the daughter of a scoundrel with these ills heaped upon his head the bishop did not know how he could ever raise it again still all these woes were locked up in his own breast and to the world he was yet the popular prosperous bishop of Bermonster. this impression and position he was resolved to maintain at all costs therefore to put an end to his last trouble he concluded to speak seriously to his sons on the subject of unequal marriages a pressure of the electric button summoned the servant who was instructed to request captain pendle and mr gabriel to see their father at once in the library it would seem as though they almost expected the message for in a few minutes they were both in the room george with his usual jaunty confident air but gabriel with an anxious look yet neither of the young men guessed why the bishop had sent for them least of all george who never dreamed for a moment that his father would oppose his engagement with mab arden sit down both of you said dr pendle in grave tones i have something serious to say and the bishop took up an imposing position on the hearthrug the two sons looked at one another there is no bad news from nauheim i hope sir said george quite ignorant of the meaning of this exordium no lucy's last letter about your mother was very cheerful indeed i wish to speak seriously to both of you as you are the elder george i shall begin with you gabriel i shall reason with later reason with me wondered the curate have i been doing anything which requires me to be reasoned with and he gave a half smile never thinking how soon his jest would be turned into bitter earnest i think a word in season will do you no harm answered his father austerely but i shall address myself to george first i am all attention sir said the captain rather weary of this solemnity what have i done you have concealed from me the fact of your engagement to miss arden oh cried george smiling so miss whichello has been speaking yes she spoke to me to-day and told me that you had formally engaged yourself to her niece without my knowledge or sanction may i inquire your reason for so singular a course is it singular sir asked george in a half-joking tone i always understood that it was first necessary to obtain the lady's consent before making the matter public i asked mab to be my wife when i last visited Bermonster, and i intended to tell you of it this time but i find that miss whichello has saved me the trouble however now that you know the truth sir said captain pendle with his sunny smile may i ask for your approval and blessing you may ask said the bishop coldly but you shall have neither father the answer was so unexpected that george jumped up from his chair with a cry of surprise and even gabriel who was in the secret of his brother's love for mab looked astonished and pained i do not approve of the engagement went on the bishop imperturbably you do not approve of mab said captain pendle slowly and his face became pale with anger i said nothing about the lady corrected the bishop haughtily you will be pleased sir to take my words as i speak them i do not approve of the engagement on what grounds asked george quietly enough i know nothing about miss arden's parents she is the daughter of miss whichello's sister i am aware of that but what about her father her father repeated george rather perplexed i never inquired about her father i do not know anything about him indeed said the bishop it is just as well that you do not captain pendle looked disturbed is there anything wrong with him he asked nervously i thought he was dead and buried ages ago i believe he is dead but from all accounts he was a scoundrel from whose account bishop mrs pansy's for one father cried gabriel surely you know that mrs pansy's gossip is most unreliable not in this instance replied the bishop promptly mrs pansy told me some twenty-six years ago when miss whichello brought her niece to this city that the child's father was little better than a jailbird did she know him asked george sharply that i cannot say but she assured me that she spoke the truth i paid no attention to her talk 
nor did i question miss whichello on the subject in those days it had no interest for me but now that i find my son desires to marry the girl i must refuse my consent until i learn all about her birth and parentage miss whichello will tell us about that said george hopefully let us trust that miss whichello dare tell us dare sir cried captain pendle gnawing his moustache i used the word advisedly george if what mrs pansey asserts is true miss whichello will feel a natural reluctance to confess the truth about miss arden's father admitting as much urged gabriel seeing that george kept silent surely you will not visit the sins of the father on the innocent child it is scriptural law my son it is not the law of christ replied the curate law or no law said captain pendle determinedly i shall not give mab up her father may have been a nero for all i care i marry his daughter all the same she is a good pure sweet woman i admit that she is all that said the bishop and i do not want you to give her up without due inquiry into the matter of which i speak but it is my desire that you should return to your regiment until the affair can be sifted who should sift it but i inquired george hotly if you place it in my hands all will i trust be well my son i shall see miss whichello and mrs pansey and learn the truth and if the truth be as cruel as you suspect in that case said the bishop slowly i shall consider the matter you must not think that i wish you to break off your engagement altogether george but i desire you to suspend it so to speak for the reasons i have stated i disapprove of your marrying miss arden but it may be that should i be informed fully about her father i may change my mind in the meantime i wish you to rejoin your regiment and remain with it until i send for you and if i refuse in that case said the bishop sternly i shall refuse my consent altogether should you refuse to acknowledge my authority i shall treat you as a stranger but i have been a good father to you george and i trust that you will see fit to obey me i am not a child said captain pendle sullenly you are a man of the world replied his father skilfully and as such must see that i am speaking for your own good i ask merely for delay so that the truth may be known before you engage yourself irrevocably to this young lady i look upon my engagement as irrevocable i have asked mab to be my wife i have given her a ring i have won her heart i should be a mean hound cried george lashing himself into a rage if i gave her up for the lying gossip of an old she-devil like mrs pansey your language is not decorous sir i i beg your pardon father but don't be too hard on me your own good sense should tell you that i am not hard on you indeed put in gabriel I think that my father has reason on his side george you are not in love growled the captain unconvinced a pale smile flitted over gabriel's lips not unnoticed by the bishop but as he purposed speaking to him later he made no remark on it at the moment what do you wish me to do sir said george after a pause i have told you rejoined the bishop mildly i desire you to rejoin your regiment and not to come back to Berminster until i send for you do you object to my seeing mab before i go by no means see both miss arden and miss whichello if you like and tell them both that it is my desire you go away well sir said captain pendle slowly i am willing to obey you and return to my work but i refuse to give up mab and not trusting himself to speak further lest he should lose his temper altogether he abruptly left the room the bishop saw him retire with a sigh and shook his head immediately afterwards he addressed himself to gabriel who with some apprehension was waiting for him to speak gabriel said dr pendle picking up a letter harry has written to me from nauheim saying that he is compelled to return home on business as i do not wish your mother and lucy to be alone it is my desire that you should join them at once the curate was rather amazed at the peremptory tone of this speech but hastened to assure his father that he was quite willing to go 
the reason given for the journey seemed to him a sufficient one and he had no suspicion that his father's real motive was to separate him from bell the bishop saw that this was the case and forthwith came to the principal point of the interview do you know why i wish you to go abroad he asked sharply to join my mother and lucy you told me so that is one reason gabriel but there is another and more important one a remembrance of his secret engagement turned the curate's face crimson but he faltered out that he did not understand what his father meant i think you understand well enough said dr pendle sternly i allude to your disgraceful conduct in connection with that woman at the derby winner if you allude to my engagement to miss mosk sir cried gabriel with spirit there is no need to use the word disgraceful my conduct towards that young lady has been honourable throughout and what about your conduct towards your father asked the bishop gabriel hung his head i intended to tell you he stammered when when you could summon up courage to do so interrupted dr pendle in cutting tones unfortunately your candour was not equal to your capability for deception so i was obliged to learn the truth from a stranger cargram cried gabriel his instinct telling him the name of his betrayer yes from mr cargram he heard the truth from the lips of this girl herself she informed him that she was engaged to marry you you my son it is true said gabriel in a low voice i wish to make her my wife make her your wife cried dr pendle angrily this common girl this this barmaid this i shall not listen to bell being called names even by you father said gabriel proudly she is a good girl a respectable girl a beautiful girl and a barmaid said the bishop dryly i congratulate you on the daughter-in-law you have selected for your mother gabriel winced much as he loved bell the idea of her being in the society of his delicate refined mother was not a pleasant one he could not conceal from himself that although the jewel he wished to pick out of the gutter might shine brilliantly there it might not glitter so much when translated to a higher sphere and placed beside more polished gems therefore he could find no answer to his father's speech and wisely kept silence certainly my sons are a comfort to me continued the bishop sarcastically i have brought them up in what i judged to be a wise and judicious manner but it seems i am mistaken since the first use they make of their training is to deceive the father who has never deceived them i admit that i have behaved badly father no one can deny that sir the question is do you intend to continue behaving badly i love bell dearly very dearly the bishop groaned and sat down helplessly in his chair it is incredible he said how can you with your refined tastes and upbringing love this this well i shall not call her names no doubt miss mosk is well enough in her way but she is not a proper wife for my son our hearts are not always under control father they should be gabriel the head should always guide the heart that is only common sense besides you are too young to know your own mind this girl is handsome and scheming and has infatuated you in your innocence i should be a bad father to you if i did not rescue you from her wiles to do so it is my intention that you shall go abroad for a time i am willing to go abroad father but i shall never never forget bell you speak with all the confidence of a young man in love for the first time gabriel i am glad that you are still sufficiently obedient to obey me of course you know that i cannot consent to your making this girl your wife i thought that you might be angry faltered gabriel i am more hurt than angry replied the bishop have you given this young woman a promise of marriage yes father i gave her an engagement ring i congratulate you sir on your methodical behaviour however it is no use arguing with one so infatuated as you are all i can do is to test your affection by parting you from miss mosk when you return from nauheim we shall speak further on the subject when do you wish me to go father asked gabriel rising submissively to-morrow said the bishop coldly you can leave me now i am sorry sorry cried dr pendle with a frown what is the use of words without deeds 
both you and george have given me a sore heart this day i thought that i could trust my sons i find that i cannot if oh, but it is useless to talk further i shall see what absence can do in both cases now leave me if you please the bishop turned to his desk and busied himself with some papers while gabriel after a moment's hesitation left the room with a deep sigh dr pendle finding himself alone leaned back in his chair and groaned aloud i have averted the danger for the time being he said sadly but the future ah me what of the future end of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of the bishop's secret by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty five mr baltic missionary about this time there appeared in beorminster an elderly weather-beaten man with a persuasive tongue and the quick alert eye of a fowl he looked like a sailor and as such was an object of curiosity to inland folk but he called himself a missionary saying that he had laboured these many years in the lord's vineyard of the south seas and had returned to england for a sight of white faces and a smack of civilization this hybrid individual was named ben baltic and had the hoarse voice of a mariner accustomed to outroar storms but his conversation was free from nautical oaths and remarkably entertaining by reason of his adventurous life he could not be said to be obtrusively religious yet he gave every one the impression of being a good and earnest worker and one who practised what he preached for he neither smoked nor gambled nor drank strong waters yet there was nothing pharisaic about his speech or bearing in a pilot's suit of rough blue cloth with a red bandana handkerchief and a wide-brimmed hat of panama straw mr baltic took up his residence at the derby winner and rolling about beorminster in the true style of jack ashore speedily made friends with people high and low the low he became acquainted with on his own account as a word and a smile in his good-humoured way was sufficient to establish at least a temporary friendship but he owed his familiarity with the high to the good offices of mr cargrim that gentleman returned from his holiday with much apparent satisfaction and declared himself greatly benefited by the change shortly after his resumption of his duties he received a visit from baltic the missionary who presented him with a letter of introduction from a prominent london vicar from this epistle the chaplain learned that baltic was a rough diamond with a gift of untutored eloquence that he desired to rest for a week or two in beorminster and that any little attention shown to him would be grateful to the writer it said much for mr cargrim's good will and charity that on learning all this he at once opened his arms and heart to the missionary mariner he declared his willingness to make baltic stay as pleasant as he could but was shocked to learn that the newcomer had taken up his abode at the derby winner his feelings extended even so far as remonstrance for said cargrim shaking his head i assure you mr baltic that the place is anything but respectable and for such reason i stay there sir if you want to do good begin with the worst that's my motto the christian heathen can't be worse than the pagan heathen i take it mr cargrim i don't know so much about that sighed cargrim refined vice is always the most terrible witness the iniquities of babylon and rome there ain't much refinement about that blackguard public answered the missionary without the shadow of a smile and if i can stop all the swearing and drinking and shuffling of the devil's picture books which goes on there i'll be busy at the lord's work i reckon from this position baltic refused to budge so in the end cargrim left off trying to dissuade him and the conversation became of a more confidential character evidently the man's qualities were not overpraised in the letter of introduction for on meeting him once or twice and knowing him better cargrim found occasion to present him to the bishop baltic's descriptions of his south sea labours fascinated dr pendle by their colour and wildness and he suggested that the missionary should deliver a discourse of the same quality to the public a hall was hired 
the lecture was advertised as being under the patronage of the bishop and so many tickets were sold that the building was crowded with the best Burminster society led by mrs pansey the missionary after introducing himself as a plain and unlettered man launched out into a wonderfully vigorous and picturesque description of those islands of paradise which bloom like gardens amid the blue waters of the pacific ocean he described the fecundity and luxuriance of nature drew word portraits of the mild brown-skinned polynesians wept over their enthrallment by a debased system of idolatry and painted the blessings which would befall them when converted to the gentle religion of christ baltic had the gift of enchaining his hearers and the audience hung upon his speech with breathless attention the natural genius of the man poured forth in burning words and eloquent apostrophes the subject was picturesque the language was inspiriting the man a born orator and when the audience dispersed every one from the bishop downward agreed that Burminster was entertaining an untutored demosthenes dr pendle sighed as he thought of the many dull sermons he had been compelled to endure and wondered why the majority of his educated clergy should fall so far behind the untaught unconsecrated rough-mannered missionary from the time of that lecture ben baltic for all his lowly birth and uncouth ways became the lion of Burminster. he was invited by mrs pansey to afternoon tea he was in request at garden parties he gave lectures in surrounding parishes and on the whole created an undeniable sensation in the sober cathedral city baltic observed much and said little his eyes were alert his tongue was discreet and even when borne on the highest tide of popularity he lost none of his modesty and good humour he still continued to dwell at the derby winner where his influence was salutary for the customers there drank less and swore less when he was known to be present certainly such reformation did not please mr mosk overmuch and he frequently grumbled that it was hard a man should have his trade spoilt by a psalm-singing missionary but a wholesome fear of cargrim's threat to inform sir harry checked him from asking baltic to leave moreover the man was greatly liked by mrs mosk on account of his religious spirit and approved of by bell from the order he kept in the hotel therefore mosk being in the minority could only stand on one side and grumble which he did with true english zeal it was while baltic was thus exciting Burminster that sir harry brace came back gabriel in pursuance of his father's wish had gone over to nauheim after a short interview with bell in which he had told her of his father's opposition to the match bell was cast down but did not despair as she thought that the bishop might soften towards gabriel during his absence so she sent him abroad with a promise that she would remain true to him until he returned when the curate joined mrs pendle and lucy sir harry with much regret had to relinquish his prenuptial honeymoon and returned to Burminster in the lowest of spirits the bishop did not tell him about gabriel's infatuation for bell nor did he explain that george had engaged himself secretly to mab arden so harry was quite in the dark as regards the domestic dissensions and ascribing the bishop's gloom to the absence of his family visited him frequently in order to cheer him up but the dark hour was on bishop pendle and notwithstanding the harping of this david the evil spirit would not depart what is the matter with the bishop asked harry one evening of cargrim he is as glum as an owl i do not know what ails him replied the chaplain who for reasons of his own was resolved to hold his tongue unless it is that he has been working too hard of late it isn't that cargrim all the years i have known him he has never been so down in the mouth before i fancy he has something on his mind if you think so sir harry why not ask him brace shook his head that would never do he answered the bishop doesn't like to be asked questions i wish i could see him livelier is there nothing you can suggest to cheer him up oh baltic might deliver another lecture on the south sea said cargrim blandly his lordship was pleased with the last one baltic repeated sir harry giving a meditative twist to his black moustache that missionary fellow i was going to ask you something about him 
cargrim looked surprised and slightly nervous beyond that he is a missionary and is down here for his health's sake i know nothing about him he said hastily you introduced him to the bishop didn't you yes he brought a letter of introduction to me from the vicar of st anne's in kensington but his biography was not given me he's been in the south seas hasn't he i believe that his labours lay amongst the natives of the islands well i know him said brace with a nod you know him repeated the chaplain anxiously yes met him five years ago in samoya he was more of a beachcomber than a missionary in those days ben baltic he calls himself doesn't he i thought so it's the same man he is a very worthy person sir harry so you say i suppose people improve when they get older but he wasn't a saint when i knew him he racketed about a good deal hm. perhaps he repented when i saved his life did you save his life well yes baltic was raising cain in some drunken row along with a set of kanakas and one of em got him under to slip a knife into him and i caught the nigger up a clip on the jaw and sent him flying there wasn't much fight in old ben when i straightened him out after that so he's turned devil dodger i must have a look at him in his new capacity whatever he has been said cargrim who appeared uneasy during the recital of this little story i am sure that he has repented of his past errors and is now quite sincere in his religious convictions i'll judge of that for myself if you don't mind drawled the baronet with a twinkle in his dark eyes and nodding to cargrim he strolled off leaving that gentleman very uncomfortable sir harry saw that he was so and wondered why any story affecting baltic should render the chaplain uneasy he received an explanation some days later from the missionary himself brace possessed a handsome family seat embosomed in a leafy park some five miles from the city at present it was undergoing alterations and repairs so that it might be a more perfect residence when the future lady brace crossed its threshold as a bride consequently the greater part of the house was in confusion and given over to painters plasterers and such like upsetting people harry however had decided to live in his own particular rooms so that he might see that everything was carried out in accordance with lucy's wish and the wing he inhabited was in fairly good order still sir harry being a bachelor and extremely untidy his den as he called it was in a state of pleasing muddle which oftentimes drew forth rebukes from lucy she was resolved to train her harry into better ways when she had the wifely right to correct him but as she frequently remarked it would be the thirteenth labour of hercules to cleanse this modern augean stable harry himself with male obstinacy always asserted that the room was tidy enough and that he hated to live in a prim apartment he said that he could lay his hand on anything he wanted and that the seeming confusion was perfect order to him lucy gave up arguing on these grounds but privately determined that when the honeymoon was over she would have a grand clarin up time like dinah in uncle tom's cabin in the meantime harry continued to dwell amongst his confused household gods like marius amid the ruins of carthage and after all the den if untidy was a very pleasant apartment decorated extensively with evidences of harry's athletic tastes there were boxing gloves fencing foils dumbbells and other aids to muscular exertion silver cups won at college sports were ranged on the mantelpiece and on one wall hung a selection of savage weapons which harry had brought from africa and the south seas on the other a hunting trophy of whip spurs cap and fox's brush was arranged and pictures of celebrated horses and famous jockeys were placed here there and everywhere the writing-table pushed up close to the window was littered with papers and letters and plans and before this harry was seated one morning writing a letter to lucy when the servant informed him that mr baltic was waiting without harry gave orders for his instant admittance as he was curious to see again the sinner turned saint and anxious to learn what tide from the far south seas had stranded him in respectable unromantic Burminster. when the visitor entered with his burly figure and bright observant eyes harry gave him a friendly nod but knowing more about baltic than the rest of Burminster, did not offer him his hand from his height of six feet 
he looked down on the thick-set little missionary and telling him to be seated made him welcome in a sufficiently genial fashion nevertheless with a certain reserve he was not quite certain if baltic's conversion was genuine and if he found proof of hypocrisy was prepared to fall foul of him forthwith sir harry was not particularly religious but he was honest and hated cant with all his soul well ben said he looking sharply at his visitor's solemn red face who would have thought of seeing you in these latitudes we never know what is before us sir replied baltic in his deep rough voice it was no more in my mind that i should meet you under your own fig-tree than it was that i should receive a call through you receive a call man what do you mean asked harry negligently by the way will you have a cigar uh, no thank you sir i don't smoke now a whisky and soda then i have given up strong water sir here is repentance indeed observed the baronet with some sarcasm you have changed since the samoan days baltic thanks be to christ sir i have said the man reverently and my call was through you sir when you saved my life i resolved to lead a new one and i sought out mr eva the missionary who gave me hope of being a better man i listened to his preaching sir harry i read the gospels i wrestled with my sinful self and after a long fight i was made strong my doubts were set at rest my sins were washed in the blood of the lamb and since he took me into his holy keeping i have striven to be worthy of his great love baltic spoke so simply and with such nobility that brace could not but believe that he was in earnest there was no spurious affectation no cant about the man his words were grave his manner was earnest and his speech came from the fullness of his heart if there had been a false note a false look harry would have detected both and great would have been his disgust and wrath but the dignity of the speech the simplicity of the description impressed him with the belief that baltic was speaking truly the man was a rough sailor and therefore not cunning enough to feign an emotion he did not feel so almost against his will brace was obliged to believe that he saw before him a saul converted into a paul the change of pagan ben into christian baltic was little else than miraculous and are you now a missionary said brace after a reflective pause no sir harry answered the man calmly and with dignity i am a private inquiry agent End of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six of the bishop's secret by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty six the amazement of sir harry brace a private inquiry agent sir harry jumped up from his chair with an angry look and a sharp ejaculation neither of which disturbed his visitor with his red bandana handkerchief spread on his knees and his straw hat resting on the handkerchief baltic looked at his flushed host calmly and solemnly without moving a muscle or even winking an eye brace did not know whether to treat the ex-sailor as a madman or as an impudent impostor the situation was almost embarrassing what do you mean sir he asked angrily by coming to me with a cock-and-bull story about your conversion and then telling me that you are a private inquiry agent which is little less than a spy is it impossible for such a one to be a christian sir harry i should think so one who earns his living by sneaking can scarcely act up to the ethics of the gospels i don't earn my living by sneaking replied baltic coolly if i did i shouldn't explain my business to you as i have done as i am doing my work is honourable enough sir for i am ranged against evil-doers and it is my duty to bring their works to naught there is no need for me to defend my profession to any one but you sir harry as no one but yourself and perhaps two other people know what i really am they shall know it spoke sir harry hastily all Berminster shall know of it. We don't care for wolves in sheep's clothing here. Better be sure that I am a wolf before you talk rashly, said Baltic, in no wise disturbed. I came here to speak to you openly, because you saved my life, and that debt I wish to square. And let me tell you, sir, that it isn't Christianity, or even justice, to hear one side of the question and not the other. Harry looked puzzled. 
you are an enigma to me baltic i am here to explain myself sir as your hand dashed aside the knife of that kanaka you have a claim on my confidence you'll be a sad man and a glad man when you hear my story sir harry resumed his seat shrugged his shoulders and took a leisurely look at his self-possessed visitor sad and glad are contradictory terms my friend said he carelessly i would rather you explained riddles than propounded them sir harry sir harry it is the riddle of man's life upon this earth that i am trying to explain you have set yourself a hard task baltic for so far as i can see there is no reading of that riddle save by the light of the gospel sir which makes all things plain baltic said brace bluntly there is that about you which would make me sorry to find you a pharisee or a hypocrite therefore if you please we will stop religion and allegory and come to plain matter of fact when i knew you in samoa you were a sailor without a ship add a castaway and a child of the devil sir and you will describe me as i was then burst out baltic in his deep voice hear me sir harry and gauge me as i should be gauged i was as you know a drunken godless swearing dog in the grip of satan as fuel for hell but when you saved my worthless life i saw that it behooved me as it does all men to repent i sought out a missionary who heard my story and set my feet in the right path i listened to his preaching i read the good book and so i learned how i could be saved the missionary made me his fellow labourer in the islands and i strove to bring the poor heathen to the foot of the cross for three years i laboured there until it was borne in upon me that i was called upon by the spirit to labour in the greater vineyard of london therefore i came to england and looked round to see what task was fittest for my hand on every side i saw evil prosper the wicked as i noted flourished like a green bay tree so to bring them to repentance and punishment i became a private inquiry agent hm that is a novel kind of missionary enterprise baltic it is a righteous one sir harry i search out iniquities i snare the wicked man in his own nets i make void the devices of his evil heart if i cannot prevent crimes i can at least punish them by bringing their doers within the grip of the law then when punished by man they repent and turn to god and thereby are saved through their own lusts not in many cases i am afraid so you regard yourself as a kind of scourge for the wicked yes when i state that i am a missionary i regard myself as one who works in a new way a kind of fin de siècle apostle in fact said brace dryly but isn't the term missionary rather a misnomer no replied baltic earnestly i do my work in a different way that is all i baffle the wicked and by showing them the futility of sin induce them to lead a new life i make them fall only to aid them to rise for when all is lost their hearts soften you give them a kind of hobson's choice i see commented sir harry who was puzzled by the man's conception of his work but saw that he spoke in all seriousness well baltic it is a queer way of calling sinners to repentance and i can't understand it myself my method of conversion is certainly open to misconstruction sir that is why i term myself rather a missionary than a private inquiry agent i see you don't wish to scare your promising flock of criminals does any one here know that you are a private inquiry agent mr cargrim does said the ex-sailor calmly and one other harry leaned forward with an incredulous look cargrim knows he said in utter amazement i should think he would be the last man to approve of your ideas with his narrow views and clerical red tapism perhaps so sir but in this case my views happen to fall in with his own i came to see you sir harry in order to ease my mind on that point in order to ease your mind repeated brace with a keen look go on sir harry i speak to you in confidence about mr cargrim i do not like that man sir you belong to the majority then baltic few people like cargrim or trust him but what is he to you my employer yes sir you may well look astonished mr cargrim asked me down to Bermondster for a certain purpose 
connected with his self-aggrandizement no doubt that i cannot tell you sir harry as mr cargrim has not told me his motive for engaging me in my business capacity all i know is that he wishes me to discover who killed a man called jentham the deuce harry jumped up with an excited look why is he taking the trouble to do that i can't say sir unless it is that he dislikes bishop pendle dislikes bishop pendle man and what has all this to do with the murder of jentham sir said baltic with a cautious glance around and sinking his voice to a whisper mr cargrim suspects dr pendle of the crime what sir harry turned the colour of chalk and sprang back until he almost touched the wall you hound said he speaking with unnatural calmness do you dare to sit there and tell me that you have come here to watch the bishop yes sir harry was baltic's stolid rejoinder and calling me names won't do away with the fact does cargrim believe that the bishop killed this man yes sir he does and wishes me to bring the crime home to him curse you roared harry striding across the room and towering over the unmoved baltic i'll wring your neck sir if you dare to hint at such a thing i am merely stating facts sir harry facts he added pointedly which i wish you to know for what purpose that you may assist me to hunt down the bishop i suppose said sir harry quivering with rage no sir to save the bishop from mr cargrim then you do not believe that the bishop is guilty sir said baltic with dignity in london and in Bermondster, i have collected certain evidence which on the face of it incriminates the bishop but since knowing dr pendle i have been observant of his looks and demeanour and after much thought i have come to the conclusion that he is innocent of this crime which mr cargrim lays to his charge it is because of this belief that i tell you my mind and seek your assistance we must work together sir and discover the real criminal so as to baffle mr cargrim 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 repeated brace angrily he is a bad lot that is what i say sir harry he is one who spreads a snare and i wish him to be taken in it himself yet cargrim is your employer and pays you sneered sir harry you are wrong replied baltic quietly i do not take payment for my work how do you live then you were not independent when i knew you that is true sir harry but when i arrived in england i found that my father was dead and had left me sufficient to live upon therefore i take no fee for my work but labour to punish the wicked for religion's sake brace muttered something about the heat and wiped his forehead as he resumed his seat the peculiar views held by baltic perplexed him greatly and he could not reconcile the man's desire to capture criminals with his belief in a religion the keynote of which is god is love evidently baltic wished to convert sinners by playing on their fears rather than by appealing to their religious feelings although it was certainly true that those rascals with whom he had to deal probably had no elements of belief whatsoever in their seared minds but be this as it may baltic's mission was both novel and strange and might in some degree prove successful from its very originality torquemada burned bodies to save souls but this man exposed vices so that those who committed them being banned by the law and made outcasts from civilization should find no friend but the deity harry was not clever enough to understand the ethics of this conception therefore he abandoned any attempt to do so and treating baltic purely as an ordinary detective addressed himself to the task of arriving at the evidence which was said to inculpate dr pendle in the murder of jentham the ex-sailor accepted the common ground of argument and in his turn abandoned theology for the business of everyday life common sense was needed to expose and abase and overturn those criminals whose talents enabled them to conceal their wickedness proselytism could follow in due course there was the germ of a new sect in baltic's conception of christianity as a terrorizing religion let me hear your evidence against the bishop said sir harry calm and businesslike baltic complied with this request and gave the outlines of the case in barren detail sir said he gravely some weeks ago while there was a reception at the palace 
this man jentham called to see the bishop and evidently attempted to blackmail him on account of some secret afterwards jentham not being able to pay for his board and lodging at the derby winner promised mosk the landlord that he would discharge his bill shortly as he expected the next week to receive much money from whom he did not say but while drunk he boasted that southberry heath was tom tiddler's ground on which he could pick up gold and silver in the meantime bishop pendle went up to london and drew out of the ophir bank a sum of two hundred pounds in twenty ten-pound notes with this money he returned to Beorminster and kept an appointment on the common with Jentham, when returning on Sunday night from Southbury. Whether he paid him the blackmail I cannot say. Whether he killed the man no one can declare honestly. But it is undoubtedly true that the next morning Jentham, whom the bishop regarded as his enemy, was found dead. These, sir, are the bare facts of the case, and as you can see, they certainly appear to inculpate Dr. Pendle in the crime. This calm and pitiless statement chilled Sir Harry's blood. Although he could not bring himself to believe that the bishop was guilty, yet he saw plainly enough that the evidence tended almost beyond all doubt to incriminate the prelate. Yet there might be flaws even in so complete an indictment, and Harry, seeking for them, began eagerly to question Baltic. "'Who told you all this?' he demanded with some apprehension. "'Mr. Cargram told me some parts, and I found out others for myself, sir.' "'Does Cargram know the nature of Dr. Pendle's secret?' "'Not that I know of, Sir Harry. Is he certain that there is one?' "'Quite certain,' replied Baltic emphatically, "'if only on account of Jentham's boast about being able to get money.' and the fact that bishop pendle went up to london to procure the blackmail how does he know how does any one know that the bishop did so because a butt was torn out of dr pendle's london cheque-book said baltic and i made inquiries at the ophir bank which resulted in my discovery that a cheque for two hundred had been drawn on the day the bishop was in town come now baltic it is not likely that any bank would give you that information without a warrant but I don't suppose you dared to procure one against his lordship. Sir, said Baltic, rolling up his red handkerchief, I had not sufficient evidence to procure a warrant. Also, I am not in the service of the government. Nevertheless, I have my own ways of procuring information, which I decline to explain. These served me so well in this instance that I know Bishop Pendle drew a check for two hundred pounds, and, moreover, I have the numbers of the notes if the money was paid to jentham and afterwards was taken from his dead body by the assassin i hope to trace these notes in which case i may capture the murderer in your character of a private inquiry agent no sir harry i cannot take that much upon myself i mentioned that one other person knew of my profession that person is inspector tinkler man cried brace with a start you have not dared to accuse the bishop to tinkler oh no sir rejoined the ex-sailor composedly all i have done is to tell tinkler that i wish to hunt down the murderer of jentham and to induce him to obtain for me a warrant of arrest against mother jail mother jail the gipsy hag you don't suspect her surely not of the murder but i suspect her of knowing the truth tinkler got me a warrant on the ground of her being concerned in the crime say as an accessory after the fact to-morrow sir harry i ride over to the gipsy camp and then with this warrant i intend to frighten mother jail into confessing what she knows harry smiled grimly if you get the truth out of her you will be a clever man baltic does the bishop know that you suspect him i don't suspect him sir replied baltic rising and the bishop knows nothing as he believes that i am a missionary well you are in your own peculiar way thank you sir harry only you and mr cargram and mr tinkler are aware of the truth and i tell you all this sir as i neither approve of nor believe in mr cargram i am certain that dr pendle is innocent mr cargram is equally certain that he is guilty so i am working to prove the truth and that concluded the solemn baltic will not be what mr cargram desires good god the man must hate the bishop baiting your taking the name of god in vain sir i believe he does 
well baltic i am greatly obliged to you for your confidence and feel thankful that you are on our side you can command my services in any way you like but keep me posted up in all you do sir said baltic gravely shaking hands with his host you can look upon me as your friend and well-wisher end of chapter twenty six chapter twenty seven of the bishop's secret by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty seven what mother jael knew now when baltic and his grizzled head had vanished sir harry must needs betake himself to dr graham for the easing of his mind the doctor had known the young man since he was a little lad and on more than one occasion had given him that practical kind of advice which results from experience therefore when harry was perplexed over matters too deep for him as he was now he invariably sought counsel of his old friend in the present instance for his own sake for the sake of lucy and lucy's father he told graham the whole story of bishop pendle's presumed guilt of baltic's mission to disprove it and of cargrim's underhanded doings graham listened to the details in silence and contented himself with a grim smile or two when cargrim's treachery was touched upon when in possession of the facts he commented firstly on the behaviour of the chaplain i always thought that the fellow was a cur said he contemptuously and now i am certain of it curs bite sir said brace sententiously and we must muzzle this one else there will be the devil to pay no doubt when cargrim receives his wages well lad and what do you propose doing i came to ask your advice doctor here it is then hold your tongue and do nothing what and leave that hound to plot against the bishop a cleverer head than yours is counterplotting him brace warned the doctor while cargrim having faith in baltic leaves the matter of the murder in his hands there can be no open scandal harry stared and moodily tugged at his moustache i never thought to hear you hint that the bishop was guilty he grumbled and i retorted graham never thought to hear a man of your sense make so silly a speech the bishop is innocent i'll stake my life on that nevertheless he has a secret and if there is a scandal about this murder the secret whatever it is may become public property hm, that is to be avoided certainly but the secret can be nothing harmful if it were not replied graham dryly pendle would not take such pains to conceal it people don't pay two hundred pounds for nothing harmful my lad do you believe that the money was paid yes on southbury heath shortly before the murder and what is more added graham warmly i believe that the assassin knew that jentham had received the money and shot him to obtain it if that is so argued harry the assassin would no doubt wish to take the benefit of his crime and use the money if he did the numbers of the notes being known they would be traced whereas whereas baltic who got the numbers from the bank has not yet had time to trace them wait brace wait time in this matter may work wonders but doctor do you trust baltic yes my friend i always trust fanatics in their own particular line of monomania besides for all his religious craze baltic appears to be a shrewd man also he is a silent one so if any one can carry the matter through judiciously he is the person what about cargrim leave him alone lad with sufficient rope he'll surely hang himself shouldn't the bishop be warned doctor i think not if we watch cargrim and trust baltic we shall be able to protect pendle from the consequences of his folly folly what folly the folly of having a secret only women should have secrets for they alone know how to keep them every one is of the opposite opinion said brace with a grin and as usual every one is wrong retorted graham do you think i have been a doctor all these years and don't know the sex that is so far as man may know them you take my word for it brace that a woman knows how to hold her tongue it is a popular fallacy to suppose that she doesn't you try and get a secret out of a woman which she thinks is worth keeping and see how you'll fare she will laugh and talk and lie and tell you everything except what you want to know what strength is to a man cunning is to a woman they are the potters we are the clay and 
and and my discourse is as discursive as that of praed's vicar finished the doctor with a dry chuckle it has led us a long way from the main point agreed harry and that is what is dr pendle's secret graham shook his head and shrugged his shoulders you ask more than i can tell you he said sadly whatever it is pendle intends to keep it to himself all we can do is to trust baltic well doctor said harry taking a reluctant leave for he wished to thresh out the matter into absolute chaff you know best so i shall follow your advice i'm glad of that was graham's reply my time is too valuable to be wasted while this conversation was taking place baltic was walking briskly across the brown heath in the full blaze of the noonday a merciless sun flamed like a furnace in the cloudless sky and over the vast expanse of dry burnt herbage lay a veil of misty tremulous heat every pool of water flashed like a mirror in the sun's rays the drone of myriad insects rose from the ground the lark's clear music rained down from the sky and the ex-sailor trudging along the white and dusty highway almost persuaded himself that he was back in some tropical land less gorgeous but quite as sultry as the one he had left the day was fitter for mid-june rather than late september baltic made so much concession to the unusual weather as to drape his red handkerchief over his head and place his panama hat on top of it but he still wore the thick pilot suit buttoned up tightly and stepped out smartly as though he were a salamander impervious to heat with his long arms swinging by his side his steady grey eyes observant of all around him he rolled on in true nautical style towards the gipsy camp this was not hard to discover for it lay only a mile or so from southbury junction some little distance off the main road the missionary saw a huddle of caravans a few straying horses a cluster of tawny half-clad children rioting in the sunshine and knowing that this was his port of call he stepped off the road on to the grass and made directly for the encampment he had a warrant for mother jael's arrest in his pocket but save himself there was no one to execute it and it might be difficult to take the old woman in charge when she was so to speak safe in the heart of her kingdom however baltic regarded the warrant only as a means to an end and did not intend to use it other than as a bogey to terrify mother jael into confession he trusted more to his religiosity and persuasive capabilities than to the power of the law nevertheless being practical as well as sentimental he was glad to have the warrant in case of need for it was possible that a heathenish witch like mother jael might fear man more than god finally baltic had some experience of casting religious pearls before pagan swine and therefore was discreet in his use of spiritual remedies dogs barked and children screeched when baltic stepped into the circle formed by caravans and tents and several swarthy sinewy gypsy men darted threatening glances at him as an intrusive stranger there burned a fire near one of the caravans over which was slung a kettle swinging from a tripod of iron and this was filled with some savoury stew which sent forth appetising odours a dark handsome girl with golden earrings and a yellow handkerchief twisted picturesquely round her black hair was the cook and she turned to face baltic with a scowl when he inquired for mother jael evidently the gentiles were no favourite in the camp of these outcasts for the men lounging about murmured the women tittered and sneered and the very children spat out evil words in the romany language but baltic used to black skins and black looks was not daunted by this inhospitable reception and in grave tones repeated his inquiry for the sibyl who are you jugglemush asked a sinister-looking hercules i am one who wishes to see mother jael replied baltic in his deep voice aramali sneered the cleopatra like cook she has more to do than to see every cheating choring gentile give me money my royal master croaked a frightful cripple my own little purse is empty oh what a handsome gorgio whined a hag interspersing her speech with curses may evil befall him good luck for gold dearie i spit on your corpse gentile charity charity a girl seated on the steps of a caravan cracked her fingers and spitting three times for the evil eye burst into song 
with my kissings and caressings i can gain gold from the gentiles but to evil change my blessings all this clatter and clamour of harsh voices mouthing the wild gipsy's jargon had no effect on baltic seeing that he could gain nothing from the mocking crowd he pushed back one or two who seemed disposed to be affectionate with a view to robbing his pockets and shouted loudly mother jail mother jail till the place rang with his roaring before the gipsies could recover from their astonishment at this sudden change of front a dishevelled grey head was poked out from one of the black tents and a thin high voice piped deary lovey mother jail be here i thought i would bring you out of your burrow said baltic grimly as he strode towards her in with you again old witch of endor and let me follow yet it be much growled one or two but the appearance of mother jail and a few words from her sent the whole gang back to their idling and working while baltic quite undisturbed dropped on all fours and crawled into the black tent at the tail of the hag she croaked out a welcome to her visitor and squatting on a tumbled mattress leered at him like a foul old toad baltic sat down near the opening of the tent so as to get as much fresh air as possible and also to watch mother jail's face by the glimmer of light which crept in spreading his handsome handkerchief on his knee according to custom and placing his hat thereon he looked straightly at the old hag and spoke slowly do you know why i am here old woman he demanded yes dearie yes ain't it for your fortunes as you always told oh my pretty one you ask old mother for a fair future i knows i knows you know wrong then retorted baltic coolly i am one who has no dealings with witches and familiar spirits i ask you to tell me not my fortune which lies in the hand of the almighty but the name of the man who murdered the creature jentham mother jael made an odd whistling sound and her cunning old face became as expressionless as a mask in a second save for her wicked black eyes which smouldered like two sparks of fire under her drooping lids she became a picture of stupidity and senility bless ye my pretty master i knows not all i knows i told the gentiles yonder and the hag pointed a crooked finger in the direction of Burminster mother of the witches you lie cried baltic in very good romany the eyes of mother jael blazed up like torches at the sound of the familiar tongue and she eyed the weather-beaten face of baltic with an amazement too genuine to be feigned do well said she in a high key of astonishment who is this gorgio who patters with the gab of a gentle romany i am a brother of the tribe my sister no gypsy though said the hag in the black language you have not the glassy eye of the true roman no roman am i my sister save by adoption as a lad i left the gentiles route for the merry tent of egypt and for many years i called lovells and stanleys my blood brothers then why come you with a double face little child croaked the beldam who knew that baltic was speaking the truth from his knowledge of the gypsy tongue as a gentile i would speak no word but my brother you are and as my brother you shall know know who killed jentham said baltic hastily of a truth brother but call him not jentham for he was of pharaoh's blood a gypsy mother or only a romany rye of the old blood of the true blood of our religion verily my brother one of the lovells he was who left our merry life to eat with gorgios and fiddle gold out of their pockets he called himself amaru then did he not said baltic who had heard this much from cargram to whom it had filtered from miss whichello through tinkler it is so brother amaru he called himself and jentham and greek and a dozen other names when cheating and charring the gentiles but a boseville he was born and a boseville he died that is just it said baltic in english for he grew weary of using the gypsy tongue in which from disuse he was no great proficient how did he die he was shot lovey replied mother jael relapsing also into the vulgar tongue shot dearie on this blessed common who shot him job my noble rye i can't say jentham he come here to patter the calo jib and drink with us he said as he had to see some gentile on that night la 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 she piped thinly an evil night for him 
on sunday night the night he was killed yes pretty one the gorgio was to give him money for something he knowed who was the gorgio i don't know lovey i don't know what was the secret then asked the baltic casting round for information bless ye my tiny gentleman never told me and i was curious to know my dove so when he walks away half seas over i goes too i follows lovey i follow but i never did catch him up for rain and storm come most dreadful did you not see him on that night then sight of my eyes i saw him dead i heard a shot and i run and run dearie for i knows that as had no pistol but i lose my way my royal right and it was only when the storm rolled off as i found him it was lying in a ditch such was his grave continued mother jael speaking in her own tongue water and grass and storm clouds above brother i was afraid to touch him afraid to wait as these gentiles might think i had slain the man i got back into the road i did and there i picked up this which i brought to the camp with me but i never showed it to the police brother for i feared the gentile jails this proved to be a neat little silver-mounted pistol which mother jael fished from the interior of the mattress baltic balanced it in his hand and believing as was surely natural that jentham had been killed with this weapon he examined it carefully g p said he reading the initials graven on the silver shield of the butt ah chuckled mother jael hugging herself george pendle that is lovey by which of em my tender dove the father or the son hm remarked baltic meditatively they are both called george but they ain't both called murder my brother george pendle shot that bowsville sure enough and if you ask me dearie it was the son the captain the sodger ah that it was End of chapter twenty seven Chapter twenty eight of The Bishop's Secret by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty eight The Return of Gabriel. My dear Daisy, I am sorry you are going away, as it has been a great pleasure for me to have you in my house. I hope you will visit me again next year, and then you may be more fortunate. Mrs. Pansy made this amiable little speech which nevertheless like a scorpion had a sting in its tail to miss norsham on the platform of the Berminster railway station after a stay of two months the town mouse was departing as she had come a single young woman and mrs pansy's last word was meant to remind her of failure daisy was quick enough to guess this but displeased at the taunt chose to understand it in another and more gracious sense so as to disconcert her spiteful friend fortunate oh dear mrs pansy i have been very fortunate this time really you have been most kind you have given me everything i wanted excepting a husband my dear rejoined the archdeacon's widow determined that there should be no misunderstanding this time ah it was out of your power to give me a husband murmured daisy wincing ah, quite true my dear just as it was out of your power to gain one for yourself still i am sorry that dr alder did not propose indeed daisy tossed her head i should certainly have refused him had he done so a woman may not marry her grandfather a woman may not but a woman would rather than remain single snapped mrs pansy with considerable spite miss norsham carefully inserted a corner of a foolish little handkerchief into one eye oh dear i do call it nasty of you to speak to me so said she cheerfully you needn't think like all men do that every woman wants to be married i'm sure i don't the old lady smiled grimly at this appalling lie but thinking that she had been a little hard on her departing guest hastened to apologize i'm sure you don't dear and very sensible it is of you to say so judging from my own experience with the archdeacon i should certainly advise no one to marry you are wise after the event muttered daisy with some anger but here is my train mrs pansy thank you and she slipped into a first-class carriage looking decidedly cross and very defiant to fail in husband hunting was bad enough but to be taunted with the failure was unbearable daisy no longer wondered that mrs pansy was hated in Berminster. Her own feelings at the moment urged her to thrust the good lady under the wheels of the engine. 
well dear i'll say good-bye said mrs pansey screwing her grim face into an amiable smile be sure you give my love to your mother dear and the two kissed with that show of affection to be seen existing between ladies who do not love one another overmuch horrid old cat said daisy to herself as she waved her handkerchief from the now moving train dear me how i dislike that girl soliloquized mrs pansey shaking her reticule at the departing daisy well well no one can say that i have not done my duty by her and much pleased with herself the good lady stalked majestically out of the station on the lookout to seize upon and worry any of her friends who might be in the vicinity for his sins providence sent gabriel into her clutches and mrs pansey was transfixed with astonishment at the sight of him issuing from the station mr pendle she said placing herself directly in his way i thought you were at nauheim what is wrong is your mother ill is she coming back are you in trouble gabriel could not answer all or even one of these questions on the instant for the sudden appearance and speech of the Berminster busybody had taken him by surprise he looked haggard and white and there were dark circles under his eyes as though he suffered from want of sleep still the journey from nauheim might account for his weary looks and would have done so to any one less suspicious than mrs pansey but that good lady scented a mystery and wanted an explanation this gabriel with less than his usual courtesy declined to furnish however to give her some food for her mind he answered her questions categorically i have just returned from nauheim mrs pansey he said hurriedly there is nothing wrong so far as i am aware my mother is much better and is benefiting greatly by the baths she is coming back within the month and i am not in trouble is there anything else you wish to know yes mr pendle there is said mrs pansey in no wise abashed why do you look so ill i am not ill but i have had a long sea passage a weary railway journey and i feel hot and dirty and worn out naturally under the circumstances i don't look the picture of health hm trips abroad don't do you much good gabriel bowed and turned away to direct the porter to place his portmanteau in a fly offended by his silence mrs pansey shook out her skirts and tossed her sable plumes you have not brought back french politeness young man said mrs pansey acridly i have been in germany retorted gabriel as though that fact accounted for his lack of courtesy good-bye for the present mrs pansey i'll apologize for my shortcomings when i recover from my journey oh you will will you growled the archdeacon's widow as gabriel lifted his hat and drove off you'll do more than apologize young man you'll explain hoity-toity here's brazen assurance and mrs pansey with her roman beak in the air marched off wondering in her own curious mind what could be the reason of gabriel's sudden return her curiosity would have been gratified had she been present in dr graham's consulting-room an hour later for after gabriel had bathed and brushed up at his lodgings he paid an immediate visit to the little doctor graham happened to be at home as he had not yet set out on his round of professional visits and he was as much astonished as mrs pansey when the curate made his appearance also like mrs pansey he was struck by the young man's worn looks what gabriel he cried when the curate entered this is an unexpected pleasure you look ill lad i am ill replied gabriel dropping into a chair with an air of fatigue i feel very much worried and i have come to ask for your advice very pleased to give it to you my boy but why not consult the bishop my father is the last man in the world i would consult doctor that is a strange speech gabriel said graham with a keen look it is the prelude to a stranger story i have come to confide in you because you have known me all my life doctor and because you are the most intimate friend my father has have you been getting into trouble no my story concerns my father more than it does me concerns your father repeated the doctor with a sudden recollection of the bishop's secret are you sure that i am the proper person to consult i am certain of it i know i know well what i do know is something i have not the courage to speak to my father about 
for god's sake doctor let me tell you my suspicions and hear your advice your suspicions said graham starting from his chair with a chill in his blood about about that that murder oh god forbid doctor no not about the murder but about the man who was murdered jentham yes about the man who called himself jentham are you sure we are quite private here doctor graham nodded and walking to the door turned the key then he came back to his seat and fixed his eyes on the perturbed face of the young man does your father know that you are back he asked no one knows that i am here save mrs pansey then it won't be a secret long said graham dryly that old magpie is as good as the town crier you left your mother well quite well and lucy also i made an excuse to come back then your mother and sister do not know what you are about to tell me gabriel made a gesture of horror god forbid said he again then clasped his hands over his white face and burst into half hysterical speech oh the horror of it the horror of it he wailed if what i know is true then all our lives are ruined is it so very terrible my boy so terrible that i dare not question my father i must tell you for only you can advise and help us all oh doctor doctor the very thought drives me mad indeed i feel half mad already you are worn out gabriel wait one moment the doctor saw that his visitor's nerves were overstrained and that unless the tension were relaxed he would probably end in having a fit of hysteria the poor young fellow born of a weakly mother was neurotic in the extreme and had in him a feminine strain which made him unequal to facing trouble or anxiety even as he sat there shaking and white-faced the nerve storm came on and racked and knotted and tortured every fibre of his being until a burst of tears came to his relief and almost in a swoon he lay back limply in his chair graham fixed him a strong dose of valerian felt his pulse and made him lie down on the sofa also he darkened the room and placed a wet handkerchief on the curate's forehead gabriel closed his eyes and lay on the couch as still as any corpse while the doctor who knew what he suffered watched him with infinite pity poor lad he murmured holding gabriel's hand in his firm warm clasp nature is indeed a harsh stepmother to you with your nerves the pin-prickles of life are as many dagger thrusts do you feel better now he asked as gabriel opened his eyes with a languid sigh much better and more composed replied the wan curate sitting up you have given me a magical drug well, you may well call it that this particular preparation of valerian is nepenthe for the nerves but you are not quite recovered yet the swell remains after the storm you know why not postpone your story i cannot i dare not said gabriel earnestly i must ease my mind by telling it to you doctor do you know that the visitor who made my father ill on the night of the reception was jentham no my boy i did not know that who told you john our old servant who admitted him he told me about jentham just before i went to nauheim did jentham give his name no but john like many other people saw the body in the dead house he there recognized jentham by his gypsy looks and the scar on his face well doctor i wondered what the man could have said to upset the bishop but of course i did not dare to ask him by the time i got to germany the episode passed out of my mind and what recalled it something my mother said we were in the kurgarten listening to the band when a heidelberg student with his face all seamed and slashed walked past us i know students in germany are proud of those dueling scars well gabriel and what then the curate quivered all over and instead of replying directly asked what seemed to be an irrelevant question did you know that my mother was a widow when my father married her he demanded in low tones of course i did replied graham cheerily i was practising in marylebone then and your father was vicar at st benedict's why i was at his wedding gabriel and very pretty your mother looked she was a mrs krant whose husband had been killed while serving as a volunteer in the franco-prussian war did you ever see her husband no she did not come to marylebone until he had left her 
the rascal deserted the poor young thing and went abroad to fight but why do you ask all these questions they cannot but be painful because the sight of that student's face recalled her first husband to my mother she said that krant had a long scar on the right cheek i immediately thought of jentham good god cried graham pushing back his chair what do you mean lad wait wait said gabriel feverishly i asked my mother to describe the features of her first husband not suspecting my reason for asking she did so krant she said was tall lean swart and black-eyed with a scar on the right cheek running from the ear to the mouth doctor cried gabriel clutching graham's hand that is the very portrait of the man jentham gabriel whispered the little doctor hoarsely do you mean to say i mean to say that krant did not die that jentham was krant and that when he called on my father he appeared as one from the dead he is dead now but he was alive when my mother became my father's wife impossible impossible repeated graham who was ashy pale and shaken out of his ordinary self krant died died at sedan your father went over and saw his grave he did not see the corpse though i tell you i am right doctor krant did not die my mother is not my father's wife and we we george lucy and myself are in the eyes of the law nobody's children the curate uttered these last words almost in a shriek and fell back on the couch covering his face with two trembling hands graham sat staring straight before him with an expression of absolute horror on his withered brown face he recalled pendle's sudden illness after jentham had paid that fatal visit his refusal to confess the real cause of his attack his admission that he had a secret which he did not dare to reveal even to his oldest friend and his strange act in sending away his wife and daughter to nauheim all these things gave colour to gabriel's supposition that jentham was krant returned from the dead but after all it was a supposition merely and quite unsupported by fact there is no proof of it said graham hoarsely no proof ask my father for the proof murmured gabriel i dare not the doctor could understand that speech very well and now saw the reason why gabriel had chosen to speak to him rather than to the bishop it might be true after all this frightful fact he thought and as in a flash he saw ruin disaster shame terror following in the train of its becoming known this then was the bishop's secret and graham in his quick way decided that at all costs it must be preserved if only for the sake of mrs pendle and her children the first step towards attaining this end was to see the bishop and hear confirmation or denial from his own lips once graham knew all the facts he fancied that he might in some way at present he knew not how help his wretched friend with characteristic promptitude he decided on the spot how to act gabriel he said bending over the unhappy young man i shall see your father about this at once i cannot i dare not believe it to be true unless with his own lips he confirms the identity of krant with jentham you wait here until i return and sleep if you can sleep groaned gabriel oh god shall i ever sleep again my friend said the little doctor solemnly you have no right to doubt your father's honour until you hear what he has to say jentham may not be krant as you suspect it may be a chance likeness of gabriel shook his head you can't argue away what i know to be true he muttered looking at the floor with dry wild eyes see my father and tell him what i have told you he will not be able to deny his shame and the disgrace of his children that we shall see said graham with a cheerfulness he was far from feeling i shall see him at once gabriel my boy hope for the best again the curate shook his head and with a groan flung himself down on the couch with his face to the wall seeing that words were vain the doctor threw one glance of pity on his prostrate form and with a sigh passed out of the room end of chapter twenty eight chapter twenty nine of the bishop's secret by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain 
chapter twenty nine the confession of bishop pendle mr cargrim was very much out of temper and baltic was the cause of his unchristian state of mind as the employer of the so-called missionary and actual inquiry agent the chaplain expected to be informed of every fresh discovery but with this view baltic did not concur in his solemn way he informed cargrim that he preferred keeping his information and methods and suspicions to himself until he was sure of capturing the actual criminal when the man was lodged in Burminster jail when his complicity in the crime was proved beyond all doubt then baltic promised to write out for the edification of his employer a detailed account of the steps taken to bring about so satisfactory a result and from this stern determination all cargrim's arguments failed to move him this state of things was the more vexatious as cargrim knew that the ex-sailor had seen mother jail and shrewdly suspected that he had obtained from the beldam valuable information likely to incriminate the bishop whether his newly found evidence did so or not baltic gravely declined to say and cargrim was furious at being left in ignorance he was particularly anxious that dr pendle's guilt should be proved without loss of time as mr lee of heathcroft was sinking rapidly and on any day a new rector might be needed for that very desirable parish certainly cargrim as he fondly imagined had thwarted gabriel's candidature by revealing the young man's love for bell mosk to the bishop still even if gabriel were not nominated dr pendle had plainly informed cargrim that he need not expect the appointment so the chaplain foresaw that unless he obtained power over the bishop before lee's death the benefice would be given to some stranger it was no wonder then that he resented the silence of baltic and felt enraged at his own impotence he almost regretted having sought the assistance of a man who appeared more likely to be a hindrance than a help for once cargrim's scheming brain could devise no remedy lurking about the library as usual mr cargrim was much astonished to receive a visit from dr graham of course the visit was to the bishop but cargrim being alone in the library came forward in his silky obsequious way to receive the newcomer and politely asked what he could do for him you can inform the bishop that i wish to see him if you please said graham with a perfectly expressionless face his lordship is at present taking a short rest replied cargrim blandly but anything i can do you can do nothing mr cargrim i wish for a private interview with dr pendle your business must be important it is reported graham abruptly so important that i must see the bishop at once oh certainly doctor i am sorry to see that you do not look well thank you i am as well as can be expected really considering what dr graham considering the way i am kept waiting here mr cargrim after which pointed speech there was nothing left for the defeated chaplain but to retreat as gracefully as he could yet cargrim might have known from past experience that a duel of words with sharp-tongued dr graham could only end in his discomfiture but in spite of all his cunning he usually burnt his fingers at a twice-touched flame extremely curious to know the reason of graham's unexpected visit and haggard looks cargrim having informed the bishop that the doctor was waiting for him attempted to make a third in the interview by gliding in behind his superior graham however was too sharp for him and after a few words with the bishop intimated to the chaplain that his presence was not necessary so cargrim like the peri at the gates of paradise was forced to lurk as near the library door as he dared and he strained his ears in vain to overhear what the pair was talking about had he known that the revelation of bishop pendle's secret formed the gist of the interview he would have been even more enraged than he was but for the time being fate was against the wily chaplain and in the end he was compelled to betake himself to a solitary and sulky walk during which his reflections concerning graham and baltic were the reverse of amiable as a defeated sneak mr cargrim was not a credit to his cloth dr pendle had the bewildered air of a man suddenly roused from sleep and was inclined to be peevish with graham for calling at so untoward a time yet it was five o'clock in the afternoon which was scarcely a suitable hour for slumber as the doctor bluntly remarked 
i was not asleep said the bishop settling himself at his writing-table i simply lay down for half an hour or so worn out with worry i suppose yes dr pendle sighed my burden is almost greater than i can bear i quite agree with you replied graham therefore i have come to help you to bear it that is impossible to do so you must know the truth and god help me i dare not tell it even to you there is no need for you to do so pendle i know your secret the bishop twisted his chair round with a rapid movement and stared at the sympathetic face of graham with an expression of blended terror and amazement hardly could his tongue frame itself to speech you know my secret stuttered pendle with pale lips yes i know that krant did not die at sedan as we supposed i know that he returned to life to Berminster, to you under the name of jentham hold up man don't give way for the bishop with a heavy sigh had fallen forward on his desk and with his grey head buried in his arms lay there silent and broken down in an agony of doubt and fear and shame play the man george pendle said graham who knew that the father was more virile than the son and therefore needed the tonic of words rather than the soothing anodyne of medicine if you believe in what you preach if you are a true servant of your god call upon religion upon your deity for help to bear your troubles stand up manfully my friend and face the worst alas alas many waters have gone over me graham can you expect anything else if you permit yourself to sink without an effort said the doctor rather cynically but if you cannot gain strength from christianity then be a stoic and independent of supernatural aid the bishop lifted his head and suddenly rose to his full height until he towered above the little doctor his pale face took upon itself a calmer expression and stretching out his arm he rolled forth a text from the psalms in his deepest voice in his most stately manner in god is my salvation and my glory the rock of my strength and my refuge is in god good said graham with a satisfied nod that is the proper spirit in which to meet trouble and now pendle with your leave we will approach the subject with more particularity it will be as well replied the bishop and he spoke collectedly and gravely with no trace of his late excitement when he most needed it strength had come to him from above and he was able to discuss the sore matter of his domestic troubles with courage and with judgment how did you learn my secret graham he asked after a pause indirectly from gabriel gabriel said the bishop trembling is at nauheim you are mistaken pendle he returned to Berminster this morning and as he was afraid to speak to you on the subject of jentham he came to ask my advice the poor lad is broken down and ill and is now lying in my consulting room until i return how did gabriel learn the truth asked pendle with a look of pain from something his mother said the bishop in spite of his enforced calmness groaned aloud ah does she know of it he murmured while drops of perspiration beaded his forehead and betrayed his inward agony could not that shame be spared me do not be hasty pendle your wife knows nothing ah oh, thank god said the bishop fervently then added almost immediately you say my wife alas alas that i dare not call her so it is true then asked graham becoming very pale perfectly true krant was not killed krant returned here under the name of jentham my wife is not my wife my children are illegitimate they have no name outcasts they are oh the shame oh the disgrace and dr pendle groaned aloud graham sympathized with the man's distress which was surely natural under the terrible calamity which had befallen him and his george pendle was a priest a prelate but he was also a son of adam and liable like all mortals the strongest as the weakest to moments of doubt of fear of trembling of utter dismay had the evil come upon him alone he might have borne it with more patience but when it parted him from his dearly beloved wife when it made outcasts of the children he was so proud of who can wonder that he should feel inclined to cry with job 
is it good unto thee that thou shouldst oppress nevertheless like job the bishop held fast his integrity yet that he might have some comfort in his affliction that one pang might be spared to him graham assured him that mrs pendle was ignorant of the truth and related in full the story of how gabriel had come to connect jentham with krant pendle listened in silence and inwardly thanked god that at least so much mercy had been about saved him then in his turn he made a confidant of his old friend recalled the early days of his courtship and marriage spoke of the long interval of peace and quiet happiness which he and his wife had enjoyed and ended with a detailed account of the disguised Krant's visits and threats and the anguish his reappearance had caused you remember graham he said with a wonderful self-control how almost thirty years ago i was the vicar of st benedict's in marylebone and how you my old college friend practised medicine in the same parish i remember pendle there is no need for you to make your heart ache by recalling the past i must my friend said the bishop firmly in order that you may fully understand my position as you know my dear wife for i still must call her so came to reside there under her married name of mrs krant she was poor and unhappy and when i called upon her as the vicar of the parish she told me her miserable story how she had left her home and family for the sake of that wretch who had attracted her weak girlish affections by his physical beauty and fascinating manners how he treated her ill spent the most of her money and finally left her within a year of the marriage with just enough remaining out of her fortune to save her from starvation she told me that krant had gone to paris and was serving as a volunteer in the french army while she broken down and unhappy had come to my parish to give herself to god and labour amongst the poor she was a charming woman and she is so now said graham with a sigh i do not wonder that you loved her loved sir why speak in the past tense i love her still i shall always love that sweet companion of these many happy years from the time i saw her in those poor london lodgings i loved her with all the strength of my manhood but you know that being already married she could not be my wife then shortly after the surrender of sedan that letter came to tell her that her husband was dead and dying had asked her pardon for his wicked ways alas alas that letter was false we both of us believed it to be genuine at the time pendle and you went over to france after the war to see the man's grave i did and i saw the grave saw it with its tombstone in a little alsace graveyard with the name stephen krant painted thereon in black german letters i never doubted but that he lay below and i looked far and wide for the man leon durand who had written that letter at the request of his dying comrade i ask you graham who would have disbelieved the evidence of letter and tombstone no one certainly replied graham gravely but it was a pity that you could not find leon durand so as to put the matter beyond all doubt find him echoed the bishop passionately no one on earth could have found the man he did not exist then who wrote the letter krant himself as he told me in this very room the wicked plotter but his handwriting would not his wife have no cried pendle rising and pacing to and fro greatly agitated the man disguised his hand so that his wife should not recognize it he did not wish to be bound to her but to wander far and wide and live his own sinful life that was why he sent the forged letter to make amy believe that he was dead and she did believe the more especially after i returned to tell how i had seen his grave i thought also that he was dead so did you graham certainly assented graham there was no reason to doubt the fact who would have believed that krant was such a scoundrel i called him that when he came to see me here said dr pendle with a passionate gesture old man and priest as i am i could have killed him as he sat in yonder chair smiling at my misery and taunting me with my position how did he find out that you had married mrs krant by going back to the marylebone parish 
he had been wandering all over the face of the earth like the cain he was but meeting with no good fortune he came back to england to find out amy and i suppose rob her of the little money he had permitted her to keep he knew of her address in marylebone as she had told him where she was going before he deserted her but how did he learn about the marriage asked graham again i cannot tell but he knew that his wife after his desertion devoted herself to good works so no doubt he went to the church and asked about her the old verger who saw us married is still alive so i suppose he told krant that amy was my wife and that i was the bishop of Burminster. but however he learned the truth he found his way here and when i came into this room during the reception i found him waiting for me how did you recognize a man you had not seen by a portrait amy had shown me and by the description she gave me of his gypsy looks and the scar on his cheek he had not altered at all and i beheld before me the same wicked face i had seen in the portrait i was confused at first as i knew the face but not the name when he told me that he was stephen krant that my wife was really his wife that my children had no name i i oh god cried pendle covering his face with his hands it was terrible terrible oh my poor friend the bishop threw himself into a chair after close on thirty years he moaned think of it graham the shame the horror oh god end of chapter twenty nine chapter thirty of the bishop's secret by fergus hume this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 30. Blackmail For some moments Graham did not speak, but looked with pity on the grief-shaken frame and bowed shoulders of his sorely tried friend. Indeed, the position of the man was such that he did not see what comfort he could administer, and so, very wisely, held his peace. However, when the bishop, growing more composed, remained still silent, he could not forbear offering him a trifle of consolation. "'Don't grieve so, Pendle,' he said, laying his hand on the other's shoulder. "'It is not your fault that you are in this position.' The bishop sighed and murmured with a shake of his head, "'Omnis qui facet peccatum, servus est peccate.' "'But you have not done sin,' cried Graham, dissenting from the text you your wife myself every one thought that krant was dead and buried the man fled and lied and forged to gain his freedom to shake off the marriage bonds which galled him he was the sinner not you my poor innocent friend true enough doctor but i am the sufferer had god in his mercy not sustained me in my hour of trial i do not know how i should have borne my misery weak erring mortal that i am that speech is one befitting your age and office said the doctor gravely and i quite approve of it all the same there is another religious saying i don't know if it can be called a text god helps those who help themselves you will do well pendle to lay that to heart how can i help myself said the bishop hopelessly the man is dead now without doubt but he was alive when i married his supposed widow therefore the ceremony is null and void there is no getting behind that fact have you consulted a lawyer on your position no the law cannot sanction a union at least in my eyes which i know to be against the tenets of the church so far as i know if a husband deserts his wife and is not heard of for seven years she can marry again after that period without being liable to prosecution as a bigamist but in any case the second ceremony is not legal mrs krant became your wife before the expiration of seven years i know said graham wrinkling his brow certainly and therefore she is in the eyes of the law a bigamist the bishop shuddered although god knows she fully believed her husband to be dead but the religious point of view is the one i take doctor as a churchman i cannot live with a woman whom i know is not my wife it was for that reason that i sent her away but you cannot keep her away forever bishop at all events unless you explain the position to her i dare not do that in her present state of health the shock would kill her no graham i see that sooner or later she must know but i wished for her absence that i might gain time to consider my terrible position i have considered it in every way but god help me i can see no hope 
no escape. Alas, alas, I am sorely, sorely tried. Graham reflected. Are you perfectly certain that Jentham and Krant are one and the same man? he asked doubtfully. I am certain of it, replied Pendle decisively. I could not be deceived in the dark gypsy face, in the peculiar cicatrice on the right cheek. And he knew all about my wife, Graham, about her family, her maiden name, the amount of her fortune, her taking up parish work in Marylebone. Above all, he showed me the certificate of his marriage and a number of letters written to him by Amy, reproaching him with his cruel desertion. Oh, there can be no doubt that this Jentham is, or rather was, Stephen Krant. It would seem so, sighed Graham heavily. Evidently there is no hope of proving him to be an impostor in the face of such evidence. He came to extort money, I suppose? Need you ask, said the bishop bitterly. Yes, his sole object was blackmail. He was content to let things remain as they are, provided his silence was purchased at his own price. He told me that if I paid him two hundred pounds, he would hand over certificate and letters and disappear, never to trouble me again. I doubt if such a blackguard could keep his word, Pendle. Moreover, although novelists and dramatists attach such a value to marriage certificates, they are really not worth the paper they are written on, save perhaps as immediate evidence. The register of the church in which the ceremony took place is the important document, and that can neither be handed over nor destroyed. Krant was giving you withered leaves for your good gold, Pendle. Still, needs must when Sir Urian drives, so I suppose you agreed to the bribe. The bishop's grey head drooped on his breast, his eyes sought the carpet, and he looked like a man overwhelmed with shame. Yes, he replied in low tones of pain, I had not the courage to face the consequences. Indeed, what else could I do? I could not have the man denounce my marriage as a false one, force himself into the presence of my delicate wife, and tell my children that they are nameless. The shock would have killed Amy, it would have broken my children's hearts, it would have shamed me in my high position before the eyes of all England. I was innocent, I am innocent, yes, but the fact remained, as it remains now, that I am not married to Amy, that my children are not entitled to bear my name. I ask you, Graham, I ask you, what else could I do than pay the money in the face of such shame and disgrace? There is no need to excuse yourself to me, Pendle. I do not blame you in the least. But I blame myself, in part, replied the bishop sadly. As an honest man, I knew that my marriage was illegal. As a priest, I was bound to put away the woman who was not, who is not, my wife. But think of the shame to her, of the disgrace to my innocent children. I could not do it, Graham, I could not do it. Satan came to me in such a guise that I yielded to his tempting without a struggle. I agreed to buy Jentham's silence at his own price, and as I did not wish him to come here again lest Amy should see him, I made an appointment to meet him on Southbury Heath on Sunday night, and there pay him his two hundred pounds blackmail. "'Did you speak with him on the spot where his corpse was afterwards found?' said Graham in a low voice, not daring to look at his friend. No, answered the bishop simply, not suspecting that the doctor hinted at the murder. I met him at the crossroads. You had the money with you, I suppose? I had the money in notes of tens, as I was unwilling to draw so large a sum from the Burminster Bank, lest my doing so should provoke comment, I made a special journey to London and obtained the money there. I think you were over careful, bishop. Graham, I tell you, I was overcome with fear, not so much for myself as for those dear to me. You know how the most secret things become known in this city, and I dreaded lest my action should become public property and should be connected in some way with Jentham. Why, I even tore the butt of the check I drew out of the book, lest any record should remain likely to excite suspicion. I took the most elaborate precautions to guard against discoveries and rather unnecessary ones rejoined graham dryly well and you met the scamp i did on sunday night that sunday i was at southbury holding a confirmation service and as i rode back shortly after eight in the evening i met jentham by appointment at the crossroads it was a stormy and wet night graham and i half thought that he would not come to the rendezvous but he was there sure enough and in no very good temper at his wedding 
i did not get off my horse but handed down the packet of notes and asked him for the certificate and letters which no doubt he declined to part with at the last moment you are right said the bishop mournfully he declared that he would keep the certificate until he received another hundred pounds the scoundrel what did you say what could i say but yes i was in the man's power at any cost if i wanted to save myself and those dear to me i had to secure the written evidence he possessed i told him that i had not the extra money with me but that if he met me in the same place a week later he should have it i then rode away downcast and wretched the next day concluded the bishop quietly i heard that my enemy was dead murdered said graham explicitly murdered as you say rejoined pendle tremulously and oh my friend i fear that the cain who slew him now has the certificate in his possession and holds my secret what i have suffered with that knowledge god alone knows every day every hour i have been expecting a call from the assassin the deuce you have said the doctor surprised into unbecoming language yes he may come and blackmail me also graham not when he runs the risk of being hanged my friend but you forget said the bishop with a sigh he may trust to his knowledge of my secret to force me to conceal his sin would you be coerced in that way dr pendle threw back his noble head and looking intently at his friend replied in a firm and unfaltering tone no said he gravely even at the cost of my secret becoming known i should have the man arrested well said graham with a shrug you are more of a hero than i am bishop the cost of exposing the wretch seems too great graham graham i must do what is right at all hazards fiat justitia ruat calium muttered the doctor there is a morsel of dictionary latin for you the heavens above your family will certainly fall if you speak out the bishop winced and whitened it is a heavy burden graham a heavy heavy burden but god will give me strength to bear it he will save me according to his mercy the little doctor looked meditatively at his boots he wished to tell pendle that the chaplain suspected him of the murder and that baltic the missionary had been brought to beorminster to prove such suspicions but at the present moment he did not see how he could conveniently introduce the information moreover the bishop seemed to be so utterly unconscious that any one could accuse him of the crime that graham shrank from being the busybody to enlighten him yet it was necessary that he should be informed if only that he might be placed on his guard against the machinations of cargram of course the doctor never for one moment thought of his respected friend as the author of a deed of violence and quite believed his account of the meeting with jentham the bishop's simple way of relating the episode would have convinced any liberal-minded man of his innocence and rectitude his accents and looks and candour all carried conviction finally graham hit upon a method of leading up to the subject of cargram's treachery by referring to the old gipsy and her fortune-telling at mrs pansey's garden party what does mother jael know of your secret he asked with some hesitation nothing replied the bishop promptly it is impossible that she can know anything unless here he paused unless she is aware of who killed jentham and has seen the certificate and letters do you think she knows who murdered the man i cannot say at that garden party i went into the tent to humour some ladies who wished me to have my fortune told i saw you go in bishop and you came out looking disturbed no wonder graham for mother jael under the pretence of reading my hand hinted at my secret i fancied from what she said that she knew what it was and i accused her of having gained the information from jentham's assassin however she would not speak plainly but warned me of coming trouble and talked about blood and the grave until i really believe she fancied i had killed the man i could make nothing of her so i left the tent considerably discomposed as you may guess i intended to see her on another occasion but as yet i have not done so is it your belief that the woman knows your secret asked graham no on consideration i concluded that she knew a little but not much at all events not sufficient to hurt me in any way krant 
that is jentham was of gipsy blood and i fancied that he had seen mother jael and perhaps in his boastful way had hinted at his power over me still i am quite certain that for his own sake he did not reveal my secret and after all graham the allusions of mother jael were vague and unsatisfactory although they disturbed me sufficiently to make me anxious for the moment well bishop i agree with you mother jael cannot know much or she would have spoken plainer so far as she is concerned i fancy your secret is pretty safe but added graham with a glance at the door what about cargram he knows nothing graham perhaps not but he suspects much suspects echoed the bishop in scared tones what can he suspect that you killed jentham said graham quietly dr pendle looked incredulously at his friend i i murder i kill what cargram says he stammered then asked him with a sharp rush of speech is the man mad no but he is a scoundrel as i told you listen bishop and in his rapid way graham reported to dr pendle all that harry brace had told him regarding cargram and his schemes the bishop listened in incredulous silence but almost against his will he was obliged to believe in graham's story that a man whom he trusted whom he had treated with such kindness should have dug this pit for him to fall into was almost beyond belief and when the truth of the accusation was forced upon him he hardly knew what to say about so great a traitor but he made up his mind to one thing i shall dismiss him at once he said determinedly no bishop it is unwise to drive a rat into a corner and cargram may prove himself dangerous if sharply treated better tolerate his presence until baltic discovers the real criminal i don't like the position said the bishop frowning no man would however it is better to temporize than to risk all and lose all better let him remain pendle very well graham i shall take your advice good graham rose to depart and gabriel he asked with his hand on the door send him to me doctor i must speak to him you won't scold him for seeing me first i hope scold him said the bishop with a melancholy smile alas my friend the situation is too serious for scolding End of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of the bishop's secret by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty one mr baltic on the trail what took place at the interview between gabriel and his father dr graham never knew and indeed never sought to know he was a discreet man even for a doctor and meddled with no one's business unless as in the present instance forced to do so but even then his discretion showed itself for after advising the bishop to tolerate the presence of cargram until baltic had solved the riddle he was set to guess and after sending gabriel to the palace he abstained from further inquiries and discussions in connection with murder and secret he had every faith in baltic and quite believed that in time the missionary would lay his hand on the actual murderer when this was accomplished and cargram's attempt to gain illegal power over pendle was thwarted then all chance of a public scandal being at an end would be the moment to consider how the bishop should act in reference to his false marriage indeed there was the possible danger that the criminal might learn the secret from the certificate and papers and might reveal it when captured but graham thought it best to ignore this difficulty until it should actually arise for after all such a contingency might not occur the certificate of marriage between krant and his wife will reveal nothing to a man unacquainted with mrs pendle's previous name and without such knowledge he cannot know that she married the bishop while her first husband was alive certainly she might have mentioned pendle's name in the letters but she would not write of him as a lover or as a possible husband therefore unless the assassin knows something of the story which is improbable and unless he can connect the name of mrs krant with mrs pendle which on the face of it is impossible i do not see how he is to learn the truth he may guess or he may know for certain that jentham received the two hundred pounds from the bishop 
but he cannot guess that the price was paid for certificate and letters especially as he found them on the body and knows that they were not handed over for the money no on the whole i think pendle is mistaken in my opinion there is no danger to be feared from the assassin whomsoever he may be in this way graham argued with himself and shortly came to the comfortable conclusion that dr pendle's secret would never become a public scandal now that jentham alias Krant, was dead the secret was known to three people only namely to the bishop to himself and to gabriel if none of the three betrayed it and they had the strongest reason for silence no one else would or could the question of the murder was the immediate matter for consideration and once dr pendle's innocence was proved by the capture of the real assassin cargrim could be dismissed in well-merited disgrace with all the will in the world he could not then harm the bishop seeing that he was ignorant of the dead man's relation to mrs pendle other danger there was none of that the little doctor was absolutely assured perhaps the bishop argued in this way also or it may be he found a certain amount of relief in sharing his troubles with gabriel and graham but he certainly appeared more cheerful and less worried than formerly and even tolerated the society of cargrim with equanimity although he detested playing a part so foreign to his frank and honourable nature however he saw the necessity of masking his dislike until the sting of his domestic viper could be rendered innocuous and was sufficiently gracious on such occasions as he came into contact with him gabriel was less called upon to be courteous to the schemer as having come to a complete understanding with his father he rarely visited the palace but when he did so his demeanour towards mr cargrim was much the same as of yore for the good of their domestic peace both father and son concealed their real feelings and succeeded as creditably as was possible with men of their honourable natures but they were not cunning enough or perhaps sufficiently guarded to deceive the artful chaplain evil himself he was always alert to see evil in others i wonder what all this means he ruminated one day after vainly attempting to learn why gabriel had returned so unexpectedly to beorminster the bishop seems unnecessarily polite and young pendle appears to be careful how he speaks they surely can't suspect me of knowing about the murder perhaps baltic has been talking i'll just give him a word of warning this he did and was promptly told by the ex-sailor not to advise on points of which he was ignorant i know my business sir none better observed baltic in his solemn way and there are few men who are more aware of the value of a silent tongue you may be an admirable detective as you say retorted cargrim nettled by the rebuke but i have only your word for it and you will permit me to observe that i have not yet seen a proof of your capabilities all in good time mr cargrim more haste less speed sir i fancy i am on the right track at last can you guess who killed the man asked the chaplain eagerly waiting for the bishop's name to be pronounced i never guess sir i theorize from external evidence and then try with such brains as god has given me to prove my theories you have gained some evidence then if i have mr cargrim you'll hear it when i place the murderer in the dock it is foolish to show half-finished work but if the mur hold hard sir interrupted baltic raising his head i'll so far depart from my rule as to tell you one thing whosoever killed jentham it was not bishop pendle cargrim grew red and angry i tell you it was he almost shouted although this conversation took place in a quiet corner near the cathedral and thereby required prudent speech and demeanour didn't dr pendle meet jentham on the common we presume so sir but as yet we have no proof of the meeting at least you know that he paid jentham two hundred pounds perhaps he did and maybe he didn't returned baltic quietly he certainly drew out that amount from the ophir bank but not having traced the notes i can't say if he paid it to the man but i am sure he did insisted cargrim still angry in that case sir why ask me for my opinion replied the imperturbable baltic if mr cargrim had not been a clergyman he would have sworn at the complacent demeanour of the agent and even as it was he felt inclined to risk a relieving oath or two 
but knowing baltic's religious temperament he was wise enough not to lay himself open to further rebuke so he turned the matter off with a laugh and observed that no doubt mr baltic knew his own business best i think i can safely say so sir rejoined baltic gravely by the way did you not tell me that captain george pendle was on the common when the murder took place yes george was there and so was gabriel mrs pansey's page saw them both and uh, where is captain pendle now sir at winchester with his regiment but the bishop has sent for him to come to Bermondster, so i expect he will be here within the week i am glad of that mr cargram as i wish to ask captain pendle a few questions do you suspect him i can't rightly say sir answered baltic wiping his face with a red bandana later on i may form an opinion mr gabriel pendle comes to the derby winner sometimes i see yes he is in love with the barmaid there baltic looked up sharply mosk's daughter sir the same he wants to marry bell mosk does he indeed drawled the agent flicking his thumbnail against his teeth well mr cargram he might do worse there is a lot of good in that young woman sir mr gabriel pendle has lately returned from abroad i hear yes from nauheim that is in germany i take it sir did he travel on a cook's ticket do you know i believe he did oh i'll say good-bye then mr cargram for the present i shall see you when i return from london are you going to ask about gabriel's ticket at cook's there's no telling sir i may look in do you think that gave i think nothing as yet mr cargram when i do i'll tell you my thoughts good day sir god bless you and baltic with a satisfied expression on his face rolled away in a nautical manner god bless me indeed muttered cargram in much displeasure for neither the speech nor the manner of the man pleased him ah i wish baltic would stick to either religion or business at present he's a kind of moral hermaphrodite good for neither one thing nor another i wonder if he suspects the bishop or his two sons i don't believe dr pendle is innocent but if he is either george or gabriel is guilty well if that is so i'll still be able to make the bishop give me heathcroft he will rather do that than see one of his sons hanged and the name disgraced still i hope baltic will bring home the crime to his lordship with this amiable wish mr cargram quickened his pace to catch up with miss whichello whom he saw tripping across the square towards the jenny wren house the little old lady looked rosy and complacent at peace with herself and the whole of Bermondster. nevertheless her expression changed when she saw mr cargram sliding gracefully towards her and she received him with marked coldness as yet she had not forgiven him for his unauthorized interference on behalf of mrs pansey cargram was quick to observe her buckram civility but diplomatically took no notice of its frigidity on the contrary he was more gushing and more expansive than ever a happy meeting my dear lady he said with a beaming glance had i not met you i should have called to see you as the bearer of good news really replied miss whichello dryly that will be a relief from hearing bad news mr cargram i have had sufficient trouble of late ah sighed the chaplain falling into his professional drawl how true is the saying of job man is born i don't want to hear about job interrupted miss whichello crossly he is the greatest bore of all the patriarchs job dear lady was not a patriarch nevertheless he is a bore mr cargram what is your good news captain pendle is coming to Bermondster this week miss whichello oh said the little old lady with a satirical smile you are a day after the fair mr cargram i heard that news this morning indeed but the bishop only sent for captain pendle yesterday quite so and miss arden received a telegram from captain pendle this morning oh miss whichello young love young love the little lady could have shaken cargram for the smirk with which he made this remark however she restrained her very natural impulse and merely remarked rather irrelevantly it must be confessed that if two young and handsome people in love with one another were not happy in their first blush of passion they never would be oh no doubt dear lady i only trust that such happiness may last but there is no sky without a cloud 
and there is no bee without a sting and no rose without a thorn i know all those consoling proverbs mr cargrim but they don't apply to my turtle doves cargrim rubbed his hands softly together long may you continue to think so my dear lady said he with a sad look what do you mean sir asked miss whichello sharply i mean that it is as well to be prepared for the worst said cargrim in his blandest manner the course of true love but you are weary of such trite sayings good day miss whichello he raised his hat and turned away uh, one last proverb joy in the morning means grief at night when mr cargrim walked away briskly after delivering this parthian shaft miss whichello stood looking after him with an expression of nervous worry on her rosy face she had her own reasons to apprehend trouble in connection with the engagement and although these were unknown to the chaplain his chance arrow had hit the mark the thoughts of the little old lady at once reverted to the conversation with the bishop at the garden party mrs pansy again thought miss whichello resuming her walk at a slower pace i shall have to call on her and appeal either to her fears or her charity otherwise she may cause trouble in the meantime mr baltic proceeding in his grave way towards eastgate had fallen in with gabriel coming from the derby winner as yet the two had never met and save the name young pendle knew nothing about the ex-sailor nevertheless when face to face with him he recognized the man at once as a private inquiry agent whom he had once spoken to in whitechapel the knowledge of his father's secret of jentham's murder and of this stranger's profession mingled confusedly in gabriel's head and his heart knocked at his ribs for very fear i met you in london some years ago he said nervously ah, yes mr pendle but then i did not know your name nor did you know mine how did you recognize me asked gabriel i have a good memory for faces sir returned baltic but as a matter of fact sir harry brace pointed you out to me sir harry oh then you are baltic at your service mr pendle i am down here on business i know all about it replied gabriel recovering his nerve with the knowledge of the man's name and inclination to side with the bishop indeed sir and who told you about it sir harry told dr graham who informed my father who spoke to me oh baltic looked seriously at the curate's pale face then the bishop knows that i am an inquiry agent he does mr baltic and to tell you the truth he is not at all pleased that you presented yourself in our city as a missionary i am a missionary answered the ex-sailor quietly i explained as much to sir harry but it would seem that he has told the worst and kept back the best i don't understand said the curate much bewildered sir it would take too long for me to explain why i call myself a missionary but you can rest assured that i am not sailing under false colours as it is you know me as an agent and you know also my purpose in coming here yes i know that you are investigating the mur we are in the street sir interrupted baltic with a glance at passers-by it is well to be discreet one moment he led gabriel into a quiet alley comparatively free from listeners this is a rather rough sort of neighbourhood sir rough certainly but not dangerous replied gabriel puzzled by the remark don't you carry a pistol mr pendle no why should i why indeed if the gospel is not a protection enough no earthly arms will prevail your name is gabriel i think sir yes gabriel pendle but i don't see i'm coming to an explanation sir g p mused baltic same initials as those of your father and brother eh, mr pendle certainly both the bishop and my brother are named george g p all three said baltic with a nod uh, do you travel abroad with a cook's ticket sir oh, usually why do you a uh, through ticket to say nauheim is about three pounds i believe i paid that for mine mr baltic may i ask why you question me in this manner demanded gabriel irritably baltic tapped gabriel's chest three times with his forefinger for your own safety mr pendle good day sir End of chapter 31 Chapter 32 of The Bishop's Secret by Fergus Hume 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty two The Initials. As has before been stated, Dr. Graham had another conversation with his persecuted friend, in which he advised him to tolerate the presence of Cargram until Baltic captured the actual criminal. It was also at this second interview that the bishop asked Graham if he should tell George the truth. This question the little doctor answered promptly in the negative. "'For what is the use of telling him?' said he argumentatively. "'Doing so will make you uncomfortable, and George very unhappy.' but George must learn the truth sooner or later. I don't see that it is necessary to inform him of it at all, retorted Graham obstinately, and at all events you need not explain until forced to do so. One thing at a time, Bishop. At present your task is to baffle Cargram and kick the scoundrel out of the house when the murderer is found. Then we can discuss the matter of the marriage with Mrs. Pendle. Graham! the bishop's utterance of the name was like a cry of pain i cannot i dare not tell amy you must pendle since she is the principal person concerned in the matter you know how gabriel learned the truth from her casual description of her first husband well when mrs pendle returns to Berminster, she may i don't say that she will mind you but she may speak of krant again since so far as she is concerned there is no need for her to keep the fact of her first marriage secret except that she may not wish to recall unhappy days put in the bishop softly indeed i wonder that amy could bring herself to speak of krant to her son and mine women my friend do and say things at which they wonder themselves said the misogynist cynically probably mrs pendle acted on the impulse of the moment and regretted it immediately the words were out of her mouth still she may describe krant again when she comes back and her listener may be as clever as Gabriel was in putting two and two together and connecting your wife's first husband with Krant. Should such a thing occur, and it might occur, your secret would become the common property of this scandal-mongering place, and your last condition would be worse than your first. Also, continued Graham, with the air of a person clinching an argument, if you and Mrs. Pendle are to part, my poor friend she must be told the reason for such separation part echoed the bishop indignantly my dear amy and i shall never part doctor i wonder that you can suggest such a thing now that krant is dead and beyond all doubt i shall marry his widow at once quite so and quite right assented graham emphatically but in that case as you can see for yourself you must tell her that the first marriage is null and void so as to account for the necessity of the second ceremony the doctor paused and reflected old scatterbrain that i am said he with a shrug i quite forgot that way out of the difficulty a second marriage of course and there is your riddle solved no doubt so far as amy and i are concerned said pendle gloomily but so late a ceremony will not make my children legitimate in england marriage is not a retrospective act they manage these things better in france opined graham in the manner of stern there a man can legitimize his children born out of wedlock if he so chooses there was a talk of modifying the english act in the same way but of course the very nice people with nasty ideas shrieked out in their usual pig-headed style about legalized immorality however pursued the doctor in a more cheerful tone i do not see that you need worry yourself on that point bishop you can depend upon gabriel and me holding our tongues you need not tell lucy or george and when you marry your wife for the second time all things can go on as before what the eye does not see the heart does not grieve at you know but my eyes see and my heart grieves groaned the bishop pish don't make an inquisition of your conscience pendle you have done no wrong like greatness evil has been thrust upon you i am certainly an innocent sinner graham of course you are but now that we have found the remedy that is all over and done with wait till jentham's murderer is found then turn cargram out of doors marry mrs krant in some out-of-the-way parish and make a fresh will in favour of your children there you are bishop don't worry any more about the matter you don't think that i should tell brace that i certainly don't think that you should disgrace your daughter in the eyes of her future husband retorted the doctor hotly marry your wife and hold your tongue 
even the recording angel can take no note of so obviously just a course i think you are right graham said the bishop shaking his friend's hand with an expression of relief in justice to my children i must be silent i shall act as you suggest then that being so you are a man again said graham jocularly and now you can send for george to pay you a visit do you think there is any necessity graham the sight of him will do you good pendle don't martyrize yourself and look on your children as so many visible evidences of sin bosh i tell you bosh cried the doctor vigorously if ungallantly send for george send for mrs pendle and lucy and throw all these morbid ideas to the wind if you do not added graham raising a threatening finger i shall write out a certificate for the transfer of the cleverest bishop in england to a lunatic asylum well well i won't risk that said the bishop smiling george shall come back at once and all will be gas and gaiters to quote the immortal laws good day bishop i have prescribed your medicine see that you take it you are a tonic in yourself graham all men of sense are pendle they are the salt of the earth the oxygen in the moral atmosphere if it wasn't for my common sense bishop said the doctor with a twinkle i believe i should be weak enough to come and hear you preach dr pendle laughed i am afraid the age of miracles is past my friend as a bishop i should reprove but but as a good sensible fellow you'll take my advice well well bishop i have had more obstinate patience than my college chum good day good day and the little doctor skipped out of the library with a gay look and a merry nod leaving the bishop relieved and smiling and devoutly thankful for the solution of his life's riddle at that moment the noble verse of the psalmist was in his mind and upon his lips god is our refuge and our strength a very present help in trouble bishop pendle was proving the truth of that text so the exiled lover was permitted to return to Berminster, and very pleased he was to find himself once more in the vicinity of his beloved after congratulating the bishop on his recovered cheerfulness and placidity george brought forward the name of mab and was pleased to find that his father was by no means so opposed to the match as formerly dr pendle admitted again that mab was a singularly charming young lady and that his son might do worse than marry her late events had humbled the bishop's pride considerably and the knowledge that george was nameless induced him to consider miss arden more favourably as a wife for the young man she was at least a lady and not a barmaid like bell mosk so the painful fact of gabriel settling his heart so low made george's superior choice quite a brilliant match in comparison on these grounds the bishop intimated to captain pendle that on consideration he was disposed to overlook the rumours about miss arden's disreputable father and accept her as a daughter-in-law it was with this joyful news that george glowing and eager as a lover should be made his appearance the next morning at the jenny wren house thank god the bishop is reasonable cried miss whichello when george explained the new position i knew that mab would gain his heart in the end she gained mine in the beginning said captain george fondly and that after all is the principal thing what your own heart egotist does mine then count for nothing oh said george slipping his arm around her waist if we begin on that subject my litany will be as long as the athanasian creed and quite as devout captain pendle exclaimed miss whichello scandalized both by embrace and speech both rather trying to a religious spinster miss whichello mimicked the gay lover am i not to be received into the family under the name of george that depends on your behaviour captain pendle but i am both pleased and relieved that the bishop consents to the marriage auntie cried mab reddening a trifle don't talk as though it were a favour i do not look upon myself as worthless by any means worthless echoed george gaily then is gold mere dross and diamonds but pebbles you are the beauty of the universe my darling and i your lowest slave he threw himself at her feet set your pretty foot on my neck my queen captain pendle said miss whichello striving to stifle a laugh if you don't get up and behave properly i shall leave the room 
if you do auntie he will get worse smiled mab ruffling what the barber had left of her lover's hair get up at once you you mad romeo george rose obediently and dusted his knees juliet i obey said he tragically but no you are not juliet of the garden you are cleopatra semiramis the most imperious and queenly of women where did you get your rich eastern beauty from mab what are you an arabian princess doing in our cold grey west you are like some dark-browed queen a daughter of bohemia a romany sorceress mab laughed but miss whichello heaved a quick impatient sigh as though these eastern comparisons annoyed her george was unconsciously making remarks which cut her to the heart and almost unable to control her feelings she muttered some excuse and glided hastily from the room with the inherent selfishness of love neither george nor mab paid any attention to her emotion or departure but whispered and smiled and caressed one another well pleased at their sweet solitude george spent one golden hour in paradise then unwillingly tore himself away only shakespeare could have done justice to the passion of their parting kisses and sighs last looks final hand clasps and then george in the sunshine of the square with mab waving her handkerchief from the open casement but alas workaday prose always succeeds arcadian rhyme and with the sinking sun dies the glory of the day with his mind hanging betwixt a mental heaven and earth after the similitude of mahomet's coffin george walked slowly down the street until he was brought like a shot eagle to the ground by a touch on the shoulder now as there is nothing more annoying than such a bailiff's salute george wheeled round with some vigorous language on the tip of his tongue but did not use it when he found himself facing sir harry brace oh it's you said captain pendle lamely well with your experience you should know better than to pull up a fellow unawares oh you talk in riddles my good george said harry staring as well he might at this not very coherent speech i have just left miss arden explained george quite unabashed for he did not care if the whole world knew of his love oh, oh i beg your pardon i understand replied brace with a broad smile but you must excuse me old chap i am i am out of practice lately you see my love she is in germany as the old song says i wish to speak with you all right where shall we go to the club i must see you privately the Burminster club was just a short distance down the street so george followed harry into its hospitable portals and finally accepted a comfortable chair in the smoking-room which luckily for the purpose of brace was empty at that hour the two young men each ordered a cool hock and soda and lighted two very excellent cigarettes which came out of the pocket of extravagant george then they began to talk and harry opened the conversation with a question george he said with a serious look on his usually merry face were you on southberry heath on the night that poor devil was murdered oh yes replied captain pendle with some wonder at the question i rode over to the gipsy camp to buy a particular ring from mother jail for miss arden i suppose yes i wished a necromantic symbol of our engagement did you hear or see anything of the murder good lord no cried the startled george sitting up straight i should have been at the inquest had i seen the act or even heard the shot did you carry a pistol with you on that night as i wasn't riding through central africa i did not what is the meaning of these mysterious questions brace answered this question by slipping his hand into his breast pocket and producing therefrom a neat little pistol toy-like but deadly enough in the hand of a good marksman is this yours he asked holding it out for captain pendle's inspection oh, certainly it is said george handling the weapon here are my initials on the butt where did you get this it was found by mother jail near the spot where jentham was murdered captain pendle clapped down the pistol on the table with an ejaculation of amazement was he shot with this harry without doubt replied brace gravely therefore as it is your property i wish to know how it came to be used for that purpose great scott brace you don't think that i killed the blackguard i think nothing so ridiculous protested sir harry testily 
you talk as if you did though retorted george smartly i thrashed that jentham beast for insulting mab but i didn't shoot him but the pistol is yours oh, i admit that but good lord cried captain pendle starting to his feet what now asked brace turning pale and cold on the instant gabriel gabriel i, I gave this pistol to him you gave this pistol to gabriel when where in london explained george rapidly when he was in whitechapel i knew that he went among a lot of roughs and thieves so i insisted that he should carry this pistol for his protection he was unwilling to do so at first but in the end i persuaded him to slip it into his pocket i have not seen it from that day to this and it was found near jentham's corpse said brace with a groan the two young men looked at one another in horrified silence the same thought in the mind of each the pistol had been in the possession of gabriel and gabriel on the night of the murder had been in the vicinity of the crime it oh it's impossible whispered george almost inaudibly gabriel can explain gabriel must explain said brace firmly it is a matter of life and death End of chapter thirty two Chapter thirty three of the Bishop's Secret by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty three Mr. Baltic explains himself. It was Miss Whichello who, on the statement of Mrs. Pansy as reported by Mr. Cargram, had told George of his brother's presence on Southberry Heath at the time of Jentham's murder. She had casually mentioned the fact during an idle conversation but never for one moment had she dreamed of connecting gabriel with so atrocious a crime nor indeed did captain pendle until the fact was rudely and unexpectedly brought home to him by the production of the pistol nevertheless despite this material evidence he vehemently refused to credit that so gentle a being as gabriel had slain a fellow-creature deliberately and in cold blood particularly as on the face of it no reason could be assigned for so hazardous an act the curate in his loyal brother's opinion was neither a vindictive fool nor an aimless murderer with this latter opinion sir harry very heartily agreed he had the highest respect for gabriel as a man and a priest and could not believe that he had wantonly committed a brutal crime so repulsive to his benign nature so contrary to the purity and teachings of his life he was quite pleased that the young man both could and would explain how the pistol had passed out of his possession but he did not seek the explanation himself baltic previous to his departure for london had made brace promise to question captain pendle about the pistol and report to him the result of such conversation now that the pistol was proved to have been in the keeping of gabriel the baronet knew very well that baltic would prefer to question so important a witness himself therefore while waiting for the agent's return he not only himself refrained from seeing gabriel but persuaded george not to do so your questions will only do more harm than good expostulated brace as you have neither the trained capacity nor the experience to examine into the matter baltic returns to-morrow and as i have every faith in his judgment and discretion it will be much better to let him handle it who is this baltic you talk of so much asked the captain impatiently he is a private inquiry agent who is trying to discover the man who killed jentham on behalf of tinkler i suppose he is working with tinkler in the matter replied brace evasively for he did not want to inform george the rash and fiery of his father's peril and cargrim's treachery baltic is a london detective no doubt yes his brains are more equal than tinkler's to the task of solving the riddle he won't arrest gabriel i hope said george anxiously not unless he is absolutely certain that gabriel committed the crime and i am satisfied that he will never arrive at that certainty i should think not cried captain pendle with disdain gabriel poor boy would not kill a fly let alone a man still these legal bloodhounds are coarse and unscrupulous baltic is not george he is quite a new type of detective and works rather from a religious than a judicial point of view i never heard of a religious detective before remarked george scornfully nor i it is a new departure and i am not sure but that it is a good one in congress as it may seem 
is the man a hypocrite by no means he is thoroughly in earnest here in public he calls himself a missionary oh oh the wolf in the skin of a sheep not at all the man is well it is no use my explaining as you will see him shortly and then can judge for yourself but if you will take my advice george you will let baltic figure the matter out on his own slate as the americans say don't mention his name or actual business to any one believe me i know what i am talking about oh, very well grumbled george convinced by harry's earnestness but by no means pleased to be condemned to an interval of ignorance and inactivity i shall hold my tongue and close my eyes but you agree with me that gabriel did not kill the brute of course from the first i never had any doubt on that score here for the time being the conversation ended and george went his way to play the part of a careless onlooker but for his promise he would have warned gabriel of the danger which threatened him and probably have complicated matters by premature anger luckily for all things his faith in brace's good sense was strong enough to deter him from so rash and headlong a course therefore at home and abroad he assumed a gaiety he did not feel so here in the episcopalian palace of Berminster were three people each one masking his real feelings in intercourse with the others the bishop his son and his scheming chaplain were actors in a comedy of life which in the opinion of the last might easily end up as a tragedy no wonder their behaviour was constrained no wonder they avoided one another they were as men living over a powder magazine which the least spark would explode with thunderous noise and damaging effect baltic was the deus ex machina to strike the spark for ignition but he seemed in no hurry to do so punctual to his promise he returned to Berminster and heard sir harry's report about the pistol with grave attention without venturing an opinion for or against the curate he asked sir harry to preserve a strict silence until such time as he gave him leave to speak and afterwards took his way to gabriel's lodgings in the lower part of the town there he was fortunate enough to find young pendle within doors and after a lengthy interview with him on matters connected with the crime he again sought the baronet a detailed explanation to that gentleman resulted in a visit of both to sir harry's bank and an interesting conversation with its manager when brace and baltic finally found themselves on the pavement the face of the first wore an expression of exultation while the latter in his reticent way looked soberly satisfied both had every reason for these signs of triumph for they had touched the highest pinnacle of success i suppose there can be no doubt about it baltic none whatever sir harry every link in the chain of evidence is complete you are a wonderful man baltic you have scored off that fool of a tinkler in a very neat way the inspector is no fool in his own sphere sir reproved the serious ex-sailor but this case happened to be beyond it and beyond him also chuckled the baronet oh, there's no denying that sir harry however the man is useful in his own place and having done my part i shall now ask him to do his what is his task huh to procure a warrant on my evidence the man must be arrested this afternoon and then baltic then sir said the man solemnly i shall be no longer an agent but a missionary and in my own poor way i shall strive to bring him to repentance after bringing him to the gallows a queer way of inducing good baltic whoso loseth all gaineth all quoted baltic in all earnestness my mission is not to destroy souls but to save them huh you destroy the material part for the salvation of the spiritual a man called torquemada conducted his religious crusade in the same way some hundreds of years ago and has been cursed for his system by humanity ever since your morality or rather i should say your religiosity is beyond me baltic magnas veritas et prevalebit misquoted baltic solemnly and touching his hat roughly turned away to finish the work he felt himself called upon by his religious convictions to execute harry looked after him with a satirical smile you filched that morsel of dog latin out of the end of the english dictionary my friend he thought and your untutored mind does not apply it with particular relevancy 
but i see that like all fanatics you distort texts and sayings into fitting your own peculiar views well well the ends you aim at are right enough no doubt but your method of reaching them is as queer a one as ever came under my notice go your ways torquemada baltic there are the germs of a mighty intolerant sect in your kind of teaching i fear and in his turn sir harry went about his own affairs inspector tinkler more purple-faced and important than ever sat in his private office twirling his thumbs and nodding his head for lack of business on which to employ his mighty mind the afternoon by some freak of the sun which had to do with his solar majesty's unusual spotty complexion was exceptionally hot for a late september day and the heat made mr inspector drowsy and indolent he might have fallen into the condition of an official sleeping beauty but that a sharp knock at the door roused him sufficiently to bid the knocker enter whereupon a well-fed policeman presented himself with the information delivered in a sleepy beefy voice that mr baltic wished to see mr tinkler the name acted like a douche of ice-water on the inspector and he sharply ordered the visitor to be admitted at once in another minute baltic was in the office saluting the head of the Burminster police in his usual grave style ha ah, mr baltic sir rasped out tinkler in his parade voice i am glad to see you there is a seat and here am i both at your service thank you mr inspector said baltic and taking a seat carefully covered his knees with the red bandana and adjusted his straw hat on top of it according to custom well sir well grunted mr inspector pompously and how does your little affair get on it has got on so far sir that i have come to ask you for a warrant of arrest by george a what have you found him roared tinkler starting back with an incredulous look i have discovered the man who murdered jentham yes good snapped tinkler trying to conceal his amazement by a reversion to his abrupt military manner his name i'll tell you that when i have related my evidence incriminating him it is as well to be orderly mr inspector certainly mr baltic sir order is at the base of all discipline i should rather say that discipline is the basis of order returned baltic with a dry smile however we can discuss that question later at present i shall detail my evidence against mr inspector leaned eagerly forward against the man who killed jentham mr inspector threw himself back with a disappointed snort ten chun threw out tinkler and arranged pen and ink and paper to take notes now mr baltic sir my knowledge of the man jentham droned baltic in his monotonous voice begins at the moment i was informed by mr cargrim that he called at the palace to see bishop pendle a few days before he met with his violent end it would appear although of this i am not absolutely certain that the bishop knew jentham when he occupied a more respectable position and answered to another name memorandum wrote down tinkler to inquire if his lordship can supply information regarding the past of the so-called jentham the bishop continued the narrator with a covert smile at tinkler's unnecessary scribbling was apparently sorry to see an old friend in a homeless and penniless condition for to help him on in the world he gave him the sum of two hundred pounds that declared tinkler throwing down his pen is charity gone mad if he emphasized the word if mark me it is true if it were not true i should not state it rejoined baltic gravely as a christian i have a great regard for the truth bishop pendle drew that sum out of his london account in twenty ten-pound notes i have the numbers of those notes and i traced several to the possession of the assassin who must have taken them from the corpse on these grounds mr inspector i assert that dr pendle gave jentham two hundred pounds tinkler again took up his pen memo he sat down to ask his lordship if he helped the so-called jentham with money if so how much as you know resumed baltic with deliberation jentham was shot through the heart but the pistol could not be found it is now in my possession and i obtained it from other jail what did she kill the poor devil i have already said that the murderer is a man mr inspector 
Mother Jael knows nothing about the crime, save that she heard the shot and afterwards picked up the pistol near the corpse. I obtained it from her with considerable ease. By threatening her with the warrant I gave you, no doubt. Baltic shook his head. I made no mention of the warrant, nor did I produce it, he replied, but I happen to know something of the Romany tongue, and be what the Spaniards call efficiado to the gypsies. When Mother Jael was convinced that I was a brother of tent and road, she gave me the pistol without ado. It is best to work by kindness, Mr. Inspector. Oh, we can't all be gypsies, Mr. Baltic, sir. Proceed. What about the pistol? The pistol, continued Baltic, passing over the envious sneer, had a silver plate on the butt inscribed with the letters G.P. I did not know if the weapon belonged to Bishop George Pendle, Captain George Pendle, or Mr. Gabriel Pendle. Inspector Tinkler looked up, aghast. By Jupiter, sir, you don't mean to tell me that you suspected the bishop? Damn, Mr. Baltic, how dare you? Now, the missionary was not going to confide in this official thick-head regarding Cargram's suspicions of the bishop, which had led him to connect the pistol with the prelate, so he abated the difficulty by explaining that as the lent money was a link between the bishop and Jentham, and the initials on the pistol were those of his lordship, he naturally fancied that the weapon belonged to Dr. Pendle, although I will not go so far as to say that I suspected him, finished Baltic smoothly. I should think not, growled Tinkler wrathfully. Bishops don't murder tramps in England, whatever they may do in the South Seas. And he made a third note, memo, to ask his lordship if he lost a pistol. As Captain George Pendle is a soldier, Mr. Inspector, I fancied, on the testimony of the initials, that the pistol might belong to him. On putting the question to him, it appeared that the weapon was his property. Of oh, the devil! But that he had lent it to Mr. Gabriel Pendle to protect himself from roughs when that young gentleman was a curate in Whitechapel, London. Well, I'm da blessed, ejaculated Tinkler with staring eyes. So Mr. Gabriel killed Jentham. Don't jump to conclusions, Mr. Inspector. Gabriel Pendle is innocent. I never thought that he was guilty, but I fancied that he might supply links in the chain of evidence to trace the real murderer. Of course, you know that Mr. Gabriel lately went to Germany. Yes, I know that. Very good. As the initials G.P. also stood for Gabriel Pendle, I was not at all sure but what the pistol might be his. For the moment I assumed that it was, that he had shot Jentham, and that the stolen money had been used by him. But you hadn't the shadow of a proof, Mr. Baltic. I had the pistol with the initials, retorted the missionary. But, as I said, I never suspected Mr. Gabriel. I only assumed his guilt, for the moment, to enable me to trace the actual criminal. To make a long story short, Mr. Inspector, I went up to London and called at Cook's office. There I discovered that Mr. Gabriel had paid for his ticket with a ten-pound note. That note, added Baltic impressively, was one of those given by the bishop to Jentham and stolen by the assassin from the body of his victim. I knew it by the number. Tinkler thumped the desk with his hand in a state of uncontrolled excitement. Then Mr. Gabriel must be guilty, he declared in his most stentorian voice. Hush, if you please, said Baltic, with a glance at the door. There is no need to let your subordinates know what is not true. What is not true, sir? Precisely. I questioned Mr. Gabriel on my return, and learned that he had changed a twenty-pound note at the Derby winner prior to his departure for Germany. Mosk, the landlord, gave him the ten I traced to Cook's and two fives. Hush, please. Mr. Gabriel also told me that he had lent the pistol to Mosk to protect himself from tramps when riding to and from Southbury. So— "'I see, I see,' roared Tinkler, purple with excitement. "'Mosk is the guilty man.' "'Quite so,' rejoined Baltic, unmoved. "'You have hit upon the right man at last.' "'So Bill Mosk shot Jentham. "'Oh, Lord! Damn! Why?' "'Don't swear, Mr. Inspector, and I'll tell you. "'Mosk committed the murder to get the two hundred pounds. "'I suspected Mosk almost from the beginning.' 
the man was almost always drunk and frequently in tears i found out while at the derby winner that he could not pay his rent shortly before jentham's murder after the crime i learned from sir harry brace the landlord that mosk had paid his rent when mr gabriel told me about the lending of the pistol and the changing of the note i went to sir harry's bank and there mr inspector i discovered that the bank notes with which he paid his rent were those given by the bishop to jentham on that evidence on the evidence of the pistol on the evidence that mosk was absent at southbury on the night of the murder i ask you to obtain a warrant and arrest the man this afternoon i shall see a magistrate about it at once fussed tinkler tearing up his now useless memoranda bill mosk damn bill mosk i never should have thought a drunken hound like him would have the pluck to do it hang me if i did i don't call it pluck to shoot an unarmed man mr inspector it is rather the act of a coward coward or not he must swing for it growled tinkler mr baltic sir i am proud of you you have done what i could not do myself take my hand and my thanks sir become a detective sir and learn our trade when you know our business you will do wonders sir wonders in the same patronizing way a rushlight might have congratulated the sun on his illuminating powers and have advised him to become a penny candle End of chapter thirty three chapter thirty four of the bishop's secret by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty four the wages of sin while the wickedness and fate of mosk were being discussed and settled in inspector tinkler's office bishop pendle was meditating on a very important subject important both to his domestic circle and to the wider claims of his exalted position this was none other than a consideration of gabriel's engagement to the hotel-keeper's daughter and an argument with himself as to whether or no he should consent to so obvious a mesalliance the bishop was essentially a fair dealer and not the man to do things by halves therefore it occurred to him that as he had consented to george's marriage with mab he was bound in all honour to deliberate on the position of his youngest son with regard to miss mosk to use a homely but forcible proverb it was scarcely just to make beef of one and mutton of the other the more especially as gabriel had behaved extremely well in relation to his knowledge of his parents painful position and his own nameless condition some sons so placed would have regarded themselves as absolved from all filial ties but gabriel with true honour and true affection never dreamed of acting in so heartless a manner on the contrary he clung the closer to his unhappy father and gave him as formerly both obedience and filial love such honourable conduct such tender kindness deserved to be rewarded and as the bishop determined rewarded it should be in the only way left to him having arrived at this liberal conclusion dr pendle decided to make himself personally known to bell and see with his own eyes the reported beauty which had captivated gabriel also he wished to judge for himself as to the girl's clever mind and modesty and common sense all of which natural gifts gabriel had represented her as possessing in no ordinary degree therefore on the very afternoon when trouble was brewing against mosk in the Burminster police office the bishop of the see took his way to the derby winner the sight of dr pendle in the narrow streets of the old town fluttered the slatternly dwellers therein not a little and the majority of the women whisked indoors in mortal terror lest they should be reproved ex cathedra for their untidy looks and unswept doorsteps it was like the descent of an olympian god and awestruck mortals fled swift-footed from the glory of his presence to use a vigorous american phrase they made themselves scarce the good bishop was amused and rather amazed by this universal scattering for it was his wish to be loved rather than feared he was in a decidedly benign frame of mind as on that very morning he had received a letter from his wife stating that she was coming home within a few days much benefited by the nauheim baths 
this latter piece of intelligence particularly pleased the bishop as he judged thereby that his wife would be better able to endure the news of her first husband's untimely reappearance dr pendle was anxious that she should know all at once so that he could marry her again as speedily as possible and thereby put an end to an uncomfortable and dangerous state of things thus reflecting and thus deciding the bishop descended the stony street in his usual stately manner and even patted the heads of one or two stray urchins who smiled in his face with all the confidence of childhood afterwards the mothers of these especial children were offensively proud at this episcopal blessing and had words with less fortunate mothers in consequence out of such slight events can dissensions arise as dr pendle neared the derby winner he was unlucky enough to encounter mrs pansey who was that afternoon harassing the neighbourhood with one of her parochial visitations she carried a black bag stuffed with bundles of badly printed badly written tracts and was distributing this dry fodder as food for christian souls along with a quantity of advice and reproof the men swore the women wept the children scrambled out of the way when mrs pansey swooped down like a black vulture and when the bishop chanced upon her he looked round as though he wished to follow the grateful example of the vanishing population but mrs pansey gave him no chance she blocked the way spread out her hands to signify pleasure and without greeting the bishop bellowed out in pretty loud tones at last at last and not before you are needed dr pendle am i needed asked the mystified bishop mildly the derby winner was all that mrs pansey vouchsafed in the way of an explanation and cast a glance over her shoulder at the public-house the derby winner repeated dr pendle reddening as he wondered if this busybody guessed his errand i am now on my way there i am glad to hear of it bishop said mrs pansey with a toss of her plumed bonnet how often i asked you to personally examine into the drinking and gambling and loose pleasures which make it a jericho of sin oh yes yes i remember you said something about it when you were at the palace said something about it my lord i said everything about it but now that you will see it for yourself i trust you will ask sir harry brace to shut it up dear dear said the bishop nervously that is an extreme measure an extreme necessity rather retorted mrs pansey wagging an admonitory finger do not compound with shameless sin bishop the house is a regular upas tree it makes the men drunkards mrs pansey raised her voice so that the whole neighbourhood might hear the women sluts there was an angry murmur from the houses at this term and the children the children mrs pansey seized a passing brat look at this this image of the creator and she offered the now weeping child as an illustration before dr pendle could say a word the door of a near house was flung violently open and a blousy red-faced young woman pounced out all on fire for a fight she tore the small sinner from the grasp of mrs pansey and began to scold vigorously ho oh, indeed mum ho oh, indeed and would you be pleased to repeat what you're talking of behind ladies backs mrs trumbly the bishop woman no more a woman than yourself mum and beggin his lordship's parting i opes as he'll tell widders as ain't been mothers not to poke their stuck-up noses into what they knows nothin of by this time a crowd was collecting and evinced lively signs of pleasure at the prospect of seeing the bishop of Berminster as umpire in a street row but the bishop had heard quite enough of the affray and without mincing matters fled as quickly as his dignity would permit towards the friendly shelter of the derby winner leaving mesdames pansy and trumbly in the thick of a wordy war the first named lady held her own for some considerable time until routed by her antagonist's superior knowledge of billingsgate then it appeared very plainly that for once she had met with her match and she hastily abandoned the field pursued by a storm of highly coloured abuse from the irate mrs trumbly it was many a long day before mrs pansy ventured into that neighbourhood again and she ever afterwards referred to it in terms which a rigid calvinist usually applies to papal rome as for mrs trumbly herself 
the archdeacon's widow said the whole commination service over her with heartfelt and prayerful earnestness bell flushed and whitened and stammered and trembled when she beheld the imposing figure of the bishop standing in the dark narrow passage to her he was a far-removed deity throned upon inaccessible heights awesome and powerful to be propitiated with humbleness and prayer and the mere sight of him in her immediate neighbourhood brought her heart into her mouth for once she lost her nonchalant demeanour her free and easy speech and stood nervously silent before him with hanging head and reddened cheeks fortunately for her she was dressed that day in a quiet and well-fitting frock of blue serge and wore less than her usual number of jingling brassy ornaments the bishop who had an eye for a comely figure and a pretty face approved of her looks but he was clever enough to see that however painted and shaped she was made of very common clay and would never be able to take her place amongst the porcelain maidens to whom gabriel was accustomed still she seemed modest and shy as a maid should be and dr pendle looked on her kindly and encouragingly you are miss mosk are you not he asked raising his hat uh, yes my my lord faltered bell not daring to raise her eyes above the bishop's gaiters i am bell mosk in that case i should like some conversation with you can you take me to a more private place the little parlour my lord this way please and bell reassured by her visitor's kindly manner conducted him into her father's private snuggery at the back of the bar here she placed a chair for the bishop and waited anxiously to hear if he came to scold or praise dr pendle came to the point at once i presume you know who i am miss mosk he said quietly oh yes sir the bishop of Burminster. quite so but i am here less as the bishop than as gabriel's father yes whispered bell and stole a frightened look at the speaker's face there is no need to be alarmed said dr pendle encouragingly i do not come here to scold you oh i hope not my lord said miss mosk recovering herself a trifle as i have done nothing to be scolded for if i am in love with gabriel and he with me tis only human nature and as such can't be run down that entirely depends upon the point of view which is taken observed the bishop mildly for instance i have a right to be annoyed that my son should engage himself to you without consulting me bell produced a foolish little lace handkerchief of course i know i ain't a lady sir said she tearfully but i do love gabriel and i'm sure i'll do my best to make him happy i do not doubt that miss mosk but are you sure that you are wise in marrying out of your sphere king cofetra loved a beggar-maid my lord and the lord of burley married a village girl said bell who knew her tennyson and i'm sure i'm as good as both lots certainly assented the bishop dryly but if i remember rightly the lord of burley's bride sank under her burden of honours bell tossed her head in spite of the bishop's presence oh she had no backbone not a bit i've got heaps more sense than she had but you mustn't think i want to run after gentlemen sir i have had plenty of offers and i can get more if i want to gabriel has only to say the word and the engagement is off indeed i think that would be the wiser course replied the bishop who wondered more and more what gabriel could see in this commonplace beauty attractive to his refined nature but i know that my son loves you dearly and i wish to see him happy i hope you don't think i want to make him miserable sir cried bell her colour and temper rising oh no no miss mosk but a matter like this requires reflection and consideration we have reflected my lord gabriel and me's going to marry indeed will you not ask my consent i ask it now sir i'm sure said bell again becoming tearful this ain't my idea of love-making to be badgered into saying i'm not good enough for him if he's a man let him marry me if he's a worm he needn't i've no call to go begging no indeed the bishop began to feel somewhat embarrassed for miss mosk applied every word to herself in so personal a way that whatever he said constituted a ground of offence and he scarcely knew upon what lines to conduct so delicate a conversation 
also the girl was crying and her tears made dr pendle fear that he was exercising his superiority in a brutal manner fortunately the conversation was brought abruptly to an end for while the bishop was casting about how to resume it the door opened softly and mr mosk presented himself father cried bell in anything but pleased tones my gal replied mosk with husky tenderness and in tears what have you been saying to her sir he added with a ferocious glance at pendle hush father tis his lordship the bishop i knowed the bishop's looks afore you was born my gal said mosk playfully and it's proud i am to see him under my humble roof law is a happy family meeting i think said the bishop with a glance at mosk to assure himself that the man was sober i think miss mosk that it is advisable your father and myself should have a few words in private i don't want father to interfere began bell when her parent gripped her arm and cutting her short with a scowl conducted her to the door don't you get my back up he whispered savagely or you'll be cussedly sorry for yourself and every one else go to your mother but father i go to your mother i tell ee growled the man whereupon bell seeing that her father was in a soberly brutal state which was much more dangerous than his usual drunken condition hastily left the room and closed the door after her and now my lord continued mosk returning to the bishop just look at me dr pendle did so but it was not a pretty object he contemplated for the man was untidy unwashed and frowsy in looks he was red-eyed and white-faced but perfectly sober although there was every appearance about him of having only lately recovered from a prolonged debauch consequently his temper was morose and uncertain and the bishop having a respect for the dignity of his position and cloth felt uneasy at the prospect of a quarrel with this degraded creature but dr pendle's spirit was not one to fail him in such an emergency and he surveyed mr caliban in a cool and leisurely manner i'm a father i am continued mosk defiantly and as good a father as you my gal's going to marry your son now my lord what have you to say to that moderate your tone my man said the bishop imperiously a conversation conducted in this manner can hardly be productive of good results either to yourself or to your daughter i don't mean any arm replied mosk rather cowed but i mean to have my rights i do your rights what do you mean my rights as a father explained the man sulkily your son's been running arter my girl and lorn of her good name hold your tongue sir mr pendle's intentions with regard to miss mosk are most honourable they better be threatened the other or i'll know how to make em so ah that i shall you talk idly man said the bishop coldly i talk what'll do my lord who's your son anyhow my gal's as good as he and a sight better she's born on the right side of the blanket she is there now a qualm as of a deadly sickness seized dr pendle and he started from his chair with a pale face and a startled eye what do you 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 mean man he asked again mosk laughed scornfully and lugging a packet of papers out of his pocket flung it on the table ah that's what i mean said he certificate letters story your wife ain't your wife gabriel's only gabriel and not pendle at all certificate letters gasped the bishop snatching them up you got these from jentham that i did he left em with me before he went out to meet you 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 murderer murderer how low cried mosk recoiling pale and startled murderer repeated dr pendle jentham showed these to me on the common you must have taken them from his dead body you are the man who shot him it's a lie whispered mosk with pale lips shrinking back and if i did you daren't tell i know your secret secret or not you shall suffer for your crime cried the bishop with a stride towards the door stand back it's a lie i'm desperate i didn't kill ark there was a noise outside which terrified the guilty conscience of the murderer he did not know that the officers of justice were at the door nor did the bishop but the unexpected sound turned their blood to water and made their hearts the innocent and the guilty 
knock at their ribs a sharp knock came at the door help cried the bishop the murderer and he sprang forward to throw himself on the shaking shambling wretch mosk eluded him but uttered a squeaking cry like the shriek of a hunted hare in the jaws of a greyhound the next instant the room seemed to swarm with men and the bishop as in a dream heard the merciless formula of the law pronounced by tinkler in the name of the queen i arrest you william mosk on a charge of murder End of chapter thirty four chapter thirty five of the bishop's secret by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty five the honour of gabriel great as had been the popular excitement over jentham's death it was almost mild compared with that which swept through Berminster when his murderer was discovered and arrested. No one had ever thought of connecting Mosk with the crime, and even on his seizure by warrant many declined to believe in his guilt. Nevertheless, when the man was brought before the magistrates, the evidence adduced against him by Baltic was so strong and clear and irrefutable that, without a dissenting word from the bench, the prisoner was committed to stand his trial at the ensuing assizes mosk made no defence he did not even offer a remark but accepting his fate with sullen apathy sunk into a lethargic unobservant state out of which nothing and no person could arouse him his brain appeared to have been stunned by the suddenness of his calamity many people expressed surprise that bishop pendle should have been present when the man was arrested and some blamed him for having even gone to the derby winner a disreputable pot-house they whispered was not the neighbourhood in which a spiritual lord should be found but mrs pansey for once on the side of right soon put a stop to such talk by informing one and all that the bishop had visited the hotel at her request in order to satisfy himself that the reports and scandals about it were true that mosk should have been arrested while dr pendle was making his inquiries was a pure coincidence and it was greatly to the bishop's credit that he had helped to secure the murderer in fact mrs pansey was not very sure but what he had taken the wretch in charge with his own august hands and the bishop himself he was glad that mrs pansey to foster her own vanity had put this complexion on his visit to the hotel as it did away with any need of a true but uncomfortable explanation also he had carried home with him the packet tossed on the table by mosk therefore so far as actual proof was concerned his secret was still his own but the murderer knew it for not only were the certificate and letters in the bundle but there was also a sheet of memoranda set down by krant alias jentham which proved clearly that the so-called mrs pendle was really his wife if i destroy these papers thought the bishop all immediate evidence likely to reveal the truth will be done away with but mosk knows that amy is not my wife that my marriage is illegal that my children are nameless out of revenge for my share in his arrest he may tell some one the story and reveal the name of the church wherein amy was married to krant then the register there will disclose my secret to any one curious enough to search the books what shall i do what can i do i dare not visit mosk i dare not ask graham to see him there is nothing to be done but to hope for the best if this miserable man speaks out i shall be ruined dr pendle quite expected ruin for he had no hope that a coarse and cruel criminal would be honourable enough to hold his tongue but this belief although natural enough showed how the bishop misjudged the man from the moment of his arrest mosk spoke no ill of dr pendle he hinted at no secret and to all appearances was quite determined to carry it with him to the scaffold on the third day of his arrest however he roused himself from his sullen silence and asked that young mr pendle might be sent for the governor of the prison anticipating a confession to be made in due form to a priest hastily sent for gabriel the young man obeyed the summons at once for his father having informed him of mosk's acquaintance with the secret he was most anxious to learn from the man himself whether he intended to talk or keep silent it was with a beating heart that gabriel was ushered into the prison cell 
by special permission the interview was allowed to be private for mosk positively refused to speak in the presence of a third person he was sitting on his bed when the parson entered but looked up with a gleam of joy in his bloodshot eyes when he was left alone with the young man tis good of you to come and see a poor devil mr pendle he said in a grateful voice you'll be no loser by your kindness i can tell ye to whom should a priest come save to those who need him ah stow that growled mosk in a tone of disgust if i want religion i can get more than enough from that baltic cove he's never done preaching and praying as if i were a bloomin heathen no mr pendle it ain't as a priest as i ask you to see me but as a man as a gentleman his voice broke it's about my poor gal he whispered about bell faltered gabriel nervously clasping his hands together yes i suppose sir you don't think i'm marrying her now mosk mosk who am i that i should visit your sins on her innocent head hold ard cried mosk his face lighting up did that bible speech means as you're to behave honourable how else did you expect me to behave mosk said gabriel laying a slim hand on the man's knee after your arrest i went to the derby winner it is shut up and i was unable to enter as bell refused to see me the shock of your evil deed has made your wife so ill that her life is despaired of bell is by her bedside night and day so this is no time for me to talk of marriage but i give you my word of honour that in spite of the disgrace you have brought upon her bell shall be my wife mosk burst out crying like a child oh god bless you mr pendle he sobbed catching at gabriel's hand you have lifted a weight off my heart i don't care if i do swing now i dare say i deserve to swing but as long as she's all right my poor gal it's a sore disgrace to her and susan too susan's dying you say well it's my fault but if i've sinned i've got to pay a long price for it alas alas the wages of sin is death i don't want religion i tell ee said mosk drying his eyes i've lived bad and i'll die bad mosk mosk e even at the eleventh hour that's all right mr pendle i know all about the eleventh hour and repentance and all the rest of the rot stow it sir and listen you'll keep true to my gal on the honour of a gentleman i love her she is as dear to me now as she ever was that's what i expected you to say sir you always was a gentleman now you are mr pendle i know all about that mare don't speak of it interrupted gabriel with a shudder i ain't going to sir his lordship have the papers i took from him as i did for so no one but yourself and your father knows about em i shan't breathe a word about that cramp marriage to a single solitary soul and when i dies the secret will die with me you're actin square by my poor gal sir so i'm going to act square by you it ain't for me to cover with shame the name as you're going to give my bell thank you gasped gabriel whose emotion at this promise was so great that he could hardly speak Th thank you i don't need no thanks sir you're square and i'm square so now as i've got that orphan mind you're better go i ain't fit company for the likes of you let me say a prayer mosk no sir it's too late to pray for me gabriel raised his hand solemnly as christ liveth it is not too late though your sins be as good-bye interrupted mosk and throwing himself on his bed he turned his face to the wall not another word of confession or repentance could gabriel get him to speak nevertheless the clergyman knelt down on the chill stones and implored god's pardon for this stubborn sinner whose heart was hardened against the divine grace mosk gave no sign of hearing the supplication but when gabriel was passing out of the cell he suddenly rushed forward and kissed his hand god in his mercy pity and pardon you mosk said gabriel and left the wretched man with his frozen heart shivering under the black black shadow of the gallows it was with a sense of relief that the curate found himself once more in the sunshine as he walked swiftly along towards the palace to carry the good news to his father he thanked god in his heart that the shadow of impending disaster had passed away the incriminating papers were in the right hands their secret was known only to himself to graham and to the bishop when the truth was told to his mother and her position had been rectified by a second marriage gabriel felt that all would be safe 
cargram knew nothing of the truth and therefore could do nothing with the discovery of the actual criminal all his wicked plans had come to naught and it only remained for the man he had wronged so deeply to take from him the position of trust which he had so dishonourably abused as for gabriel himself he determined to marry bell mosk as he had promised her miserable father and to sail with his wife for the mission fields of the south seas there they could begin a new life and happy in one another's love would forget the past in assiduous labours amongst the heathen baltic knew the south seas baltic could advise and direct how they should begin to labour in that vineyard of the lord and baltic could start them on a new career for the glory of god and the sowing of the good seed with thoughts like these gabriel walked along wrapped in almost apocalyptic visions and saw with inspired gaze the past sorrows of himself and bell fade and vanish in the glory of a god-guided god-provided future it was not the career he had shadowed forth for himself but he resigned his ambitions for bell's sake and aided by love overcame his preference for civilized ease Binchit qui si binchit. while gabriel was thus battling and thus overcoming baltic was seated beside mosk striving to bring him to a due sense of his wickedness and weakness and need of god's forgiveness he had prayed and reproved and persuaded and besought many times before but had hitherto been baffled by the cynicism and stubborn nature of the man one less enthusiastic than baltic would have been discouraged but braced by fanaticism the man was resolved to conquer this adversary of christ and win back an erring soul from the ranks of satan's evil host with his well-worn bible on his knee he expounded text after text amplified the message of redemption and pardon and with all the eloquence religion had taught his tongue urged mosk to plead for mercy from the god he had so deeply offended but all in vain what's the use of living bad o' these years and then turning good for five minutes growled mosk contemptuously there ain't no sense in it think of the penitent thief my brother he was in the same position as you are now yet he was promised paradise by god's own son mosk shrugged his shoulders it's easy enough promising i dare say but how do i know or do you know as a promise will be kept believe and you shall be saved i can't believe what you say not what i say poor sinner but what christ says there was no possible answer to this last remark so mosk launched out on another topic i like your cheek i do he growled it's you that have got me into this mess and now you wants me to take up with your preaching i want to save your soul man you'd much better have saved my life if you'd left me alone i wouldn't have been caught then you would have gone on living in a state of sin so long as you were safe from the punishment of man you would not have turned to god now you must he is your only friend it's more nor you are i call it friendship to bring a man to the gallows i do when he has committed a crime said baltic gravely you must suffer and repent or god will not forgive you you are cain for you have slain your brother you've got to prove that growled mosk cunningly look mr baltic just drop religion for a bit and tell me how you know as i killed that cove baltic closed his bible and looked mildly at the prisoner the evidence against you is perfectly clear mosk said he deliberately i traced the notes stolen from the dead man to your possession you paid your rent to sir harry brace with the fruits of your sin yes i did said mosk sullenly i know it ain't no good saying as i didn't kill jentham for you're one too many for me but what business had he to go talking a hundreds of pounds to a poor chap like me as hadn't had one copper to rub agin the other if he'd held his tongue i'd have known nothing and he'd have been alive now for you to try your and on in the religious way jentham was a bad un if you like we are all sinners mosk some of us are worse than others with the exception of murderin jentham and friggin his cash i ain't done nothin to no one as i knows of look here mr baltic i've done one bit of business to-day with the parson and now i'm goin to do another bit with you have you pen and paper yes baltic produced his pocket-book and a stylographic pen are you going to confess 
i suppose i may as well said mosk scowling you'll be blaming young mr pendle or the bishop if i don't and as the first of em's going to marry my belle i don't want trouble there won't you confess from a sense of your sin no won't it's my gal and not repentance as makes me tell the truth i want to put her and young mr pendle fair and square well said baltic getting ready to write confession is a sign that your heart is softening it ain't your religion as is doing it then sneered mosk now then fire away old cove the man then went on to state that he was desperately hard up when jentham came to stay at the derby winner and as he was unable to pay his rent he feared lest sir harry should turn him and his sick wife and much-loved daughter into the streets jentham in his cuffs several times boasted that he was about to receive a large sum of money from an unknown friend on southbury heath and on one occasion went so far as to inform mosk of the time and place when he would receive it he was thus confidential when very drunk on mosk reproaching him with not paying for his board and lodging as the landlord was in much need of money his avarice was roused by the largeness of the sum hinted at by jentham and thinking that the man was a tramp who would not be missed he determined to murder and rob him gabriel pendle had given or rather had lent mosk a pistol to protect himself from gypsies and vagrants and harvesters on his frequent night journeys across the lonely heath between Berminster and southbury on the sunday when the money was to be paid at the cross-roads mosk rode over to southbury and late at night about the time of the appointment he went on horseback to the cross-roads a storm came on and detained him so it was after the bishop had given the money to jentham that mosk arrived he saw the bishop departing and recognized his face in the searching glare of the lightning flashes when dr pendle had disappeared mosk rode up to jentham who with the money in his hand stood in the drenching rain under the signpost he looked up as the horse approached but did not run away being rendered pot valiant by the liquor he had drunk earlier in the evening before the man could recognize him mosk had jumped off his horse and at close quarters had shot jentham through the heart he fell in the mud like a heap of clothes said mosk so i just tied up the hoss to the signpost and went through his pockets i got the cash a bundle of notes they was and some other papers as i found then i dragged his corp into a ditch by the road and galloped orf on my horse as quick as i could go back to southbury there i stayed all night then as i had been turned back by the storm from riding over to Berminster, next day i came back to my hotel and a week arter i paid my rent to sir harry with the notes i'd stole i gave a ten um to young mr pendle and two fives of my own as he wanted to change a twenty if i'd knowed as it was dangerous i'd have gone up to london and got other notes but i never thought i'd be found out by the numbers no one thought as i did it but i did how did you think twas me governor you were always drunk answered baltic who had written all this down and i sometimes heard you talking to yourself then sir harry said that you had paid your rent and he did not know where you got the money from afterwards i found out about the pistol and the notes you had paid sir harry i had no proof of your guilt although i suspected you for a long time but it was the pistol which mother jael picked up that put me on the right track ah was it now said mosk with regret the oss knocked that out of my hand when i was tying him up and i ain't no time to look for it in the mud and dark it wouldn't have caught me i suppose if i hadn't been for that bloomin pistol oh yes i would rejoined baltic coolly the notes would have hanged you in any case and i would have got at them somehow i suspected you all along wish you hadn't come to my house muttered mosk discontentedly i was guided there by god to punish your sin ah stuff give me that confession and i'll sign it but baltic wary old fellow as he was would not permit this without due formality he had the governor of the jail brought to the cell and mosk with a laugh signed the confession which condemned him in the presence of two witnesses the governor took it away with him and again left baltic and the murderer alone they eyed one another now that i know all began baltic you don't know all interrupted mosk with a taunting laugh that's not my aunt told you and i ain't going to tell you have confessed your sin that is enough for me god is softening your hard heart grace is coming to your soul my brother my brother let us pray chant leave me alone can't you 
baltic fell on his knees o oh, merciful god have pity upon this most unhappy man sunk in the pit of sin let the redeemer thy only begotten son stretch out his saving mosk began to sing a comic song in a harsh voice his saving hand o god to drag this poor soul from perdition let him call upon thy most holy name out of the low dungeon cut him not off in the stop stop shrieked the unhappy man with his fingers in his ears ah stop his sins are as scarlet but the precious blood of the lamb will bleach them whiter than the fine wool have mercy heavenly father mosk overwrought and worn out began to sob hysterically at the sound of that heavy grief baltic sprang to his feet and laid a heavy hand on the shoulder of the sinner on your knees on your knees my brother he cried in trumpet tones with flashing eyes implore mercy before the great white throne now is the time for repentance god pity you christ save you satan loose you and he forced the man on to his knees down in christ's name a choking strangled cry escaped from the murderer and his body pitched forward heavily on the cold stones baltic continued to pray End of chapter thirty five chapter thirty six of the bishop's secret by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty six the rebellion of mrs pendle thank god said the bishop when he heard from gabriel's lips that the criminal who knew his secret had promised to be silent at last i can breathe freely but what a price to pay for our safety what a price do you mean my marriage to bell asked gabriel steadily yes if she was undesirable before she is more so now so far as i have seen her i do not think she is the wife for you and as the daughter of that blood-stained man oh gabriel my son how can i consent that you should take her to your bosom father replied the curate quietly you seem to forget that i love bell dearly it was not to close mosk's mouth that i consented to marry her in any case i should do so she promised to become my wife in her time of prosperity and i should be the meanest of men did i leave her now that she is in trouble bell was dear to me before she is dearer to me now and i am proud to become her husband but her father is a murderer gabriel would you make her responsible for his sins that is not like you father the bishop groaned god knows i do not wish to thwart you for you have been a good son to me but reflect for one moment how public her father's crime has been everywhere his wickedness is known and should you marry this girl your wife however innocent must bear the stigma of being that man's daughter how would you a sensitive and refined man shrinking from public scandal bear the shame of hearing your wife spoken about as a murderer's daughter i shall take steps to avert that danger yes father when bell becomes my wife we shall leave england forever gabriel gabriel cried the bishop piteously where would you go to the south seas replied the curate his thin face lighting up with excitement there as baltic tells us missionaries are needed for the heathen i shall become a missionary father and bell will work by my side to expiate her father's sin by aiding me to bring light to those lost in darkness my dear boy you dream utopia from what i saw of that girl she is not one to take up such a life you will not find your priscilla in her she is of the world worldly the affliction which has befallen her may turn her thoughts from the world no said the bishop with quiet authority i am as you know a man who does not speak idly or without experience and i tell you gabriel that the girl is not the stuff out of which you can mould an ideal wife she is handsome i grant you and she seems to be gifted with a fair amount of common sense but if you will forgive my plain speaking of one dear to you she is vain of her looks fond of dress and admiration and is not possessed of a refined nature she says that she loves you that may be but you will find that she does not love you sufficiently to merge her life in yours to condemn herself to exile amongst savages for your sake love and single companionship are not enough for such an one 
she wants and she will always want society flattery amusement and excitement my love for you gabriel makes me anxious to think well of her but my fatherly care mistrusts her as a wife for a man of your nature but i love her faltered gabriel i, I wish to marry her believe me you will never marry her my poor lad gabriel's face flushed father would you forbid no interrupted dr pendle i shall not forbid but she will decline if you tell her about your missionary scheme i am confident she will refuse to become your wife ask her by all means keep your word as a gentleman should but prepare yourself for a disappointment ah father you do not know my bell it is on that point we disagree gabriel i do know her you do not my experience tells me that your faith is misplaced we shall see said gabriel standing up very erect you judge her too harshly sir bell will become my wife i am sure of that if she does replied the bishop giving his hand to the young man i shall be the first to welcome her my dear dear father cried gabriel with emotion you are like yourself always kind always generous thank you father and the curate not trusting himself to speak further lest he should break down altogether left the room hurriedly with a weary sigh dr pendle sank into his seat and pressed his hand to his aching head he was greatly relieved to know that his secret was safe with mosk but his troubles were not yet at an end it was imperative that he should reprove and dismiss cargrim for his duplicity and most necessary for the rearrangement of their lives that mrs pendle should be informed of the untimely resurrection of her husband also foreseeing the termination of gabriel's unhappy romance he was profoundly sorry for the young man knowing well how disastrous would be the effect on one so impressionable and highly strung no wonder the bishop sighed no wonder he felt depressed his troubles had come after the manner of their kind not in single spies but in battalions and he needed all his strength of character all his courage all his faith in god to meet and baffle anxieties so overwhelming in his affliction he cried aloud with bitter-mouthed jeremiah thou hast removed my soul far off from peace i forget prosperity in due time mrs pendle reappeared in beorminster wonderfully improved in health and spirits the astringent waters of nauheim had strengthened her heart so that it now beat with regular throbs where formerly it had fluttered feebly they had brought the blood to the surface of the skin and had flushed her anemic complexion with a roseate hue her eyes were bright her nerves steady her step brisk and she began to take some interest in life and in those around her lucy presented her mother to the bishop with an unconcealed pride which was surely pardonable there papa she said proudly while the bishop was lost in wonder at this marvellous transformation what do you think of my patient now my dear it is wonderful the nauheim spring is the true fountain of youth a very prosaic fountain i am afraid laughed mrs pendle the treatment is not poetical it is at least magical my love i must dip in these restorative waters myself lest i should be taken rather for your father than your here mr pendle recollecting the falsity of the unspoken word shut his mouth with a qualm of deadly sickness what the scotch call a grew mrs pendle however observant rather of his looks than his words did not notice the unfinished sentence you look as though you needed a course she said anxiously if i have grown younger you have become older this is just what happens when i am away you never can look after yourself dear not feeling inclined to spoil the first joy of reunion dr pendle turned aside his speech with a laugh and postponed his explanation until a more fitting moment in the meantime george and gabriel and harry were hovering round the returned travellers with attentions and questions and frequent congratulations mr cargrim who had been sulking ever since the arrest of mosk had overthrown his plans was not present to spoil this pleasant family party and the bishop spent a golden hour or so of unalloyed joy but as the night wore on this evanescent pleasure passed away and when alone with mrs pendle in her boudoir he was so gloomy and depressed that she insisted upon learning the cause of his melancholy 
there must be something seriously wrong george she said earnestly if there is you need not hesitate to tell me can you bear to hear the truth amy are you strong enough there is something serious the matter then cried mrs pendle the colour ebbing from her cheeks what is it george tell me at once i can bear anything but this suspense amy the bishop sat down on the couch beside his wife and took her hand in his warm encouraging clasp you shall know all my dearest and may god strengthen you to hear the knowledge george i i am calm i am strong tell me what you mean the bishop clasped her in his arms held her head to his breast and in low rapid tones related all that had taken place since the night of the reception he did not spare himself in the recital he concealed nothing he added nothing but calmly coldly mercilessly told of krant's return of krant's blackmail of krant's terrible end thence he passed on to talk of cargrim's suspicions of baltic's arrival of mosk's arrest and of the latter's promise to keep the secret of which he had so wickedly become possessed having told the past he discussed the present and made arrangements for the future only gabriel and myself and graham know the truth now dearest he concluded for this unhappy man mosk may be already accounted as one dead next week you and i must take a journey to some distant parish in the west of england and there become man and wife for the second time gabriel will keep silent george and lucy need never know the truth and so my dearest all things at least to the public eye shall be as they were you need not grieve amy or accuse yourself unjustly if we have sinned we have sinned innocently and the burden of evil cannot be laid on you or me stephen krant is to blame and he has paid for his wickedness with his life so far as we may so far as we are able we must right the wrong god has afflicted us my dearest but god has also protected us therefore let us thank him with humble hearts for his many mercies he will strengthen us to bear the burden through him we shall do valiantly for the lord god is a sun and shield the lord will give grace and glory no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly how wonderful are women for weeks bishop pendle had been dreading this interview with his delicate nervous sensitive wife he had expected tears sighs loud sorrow bursts of hysterical weeping the wringing of hands and all the undisciplined grief of the feminine nature but the unexpected occurred as it invariably does with the sex in question to the bishop's unconcealed amazement mrs pendle neither wept nor fainted she controlled her emotion with a power of will which he had never credited her with possessing and her first thought was not for herself but for her companion in misfortune placing her hands on either side of the bishop's face she kissed him fondly tenderly pityingly my poor darling how you must have suffered she said softly why did you not tell me of this long ago so that i might share your sorrow i was afraid afraid to to speak amy gasped the bishop overwhelmed by her extraordinary composure you need not have been afraid george i am no fair-weather wife oh, alas alas sighed the bishop i am your wife cried mrs pendle answering his thought after the manner of women that wicked cruel man died to me thirty years ago in the eyes of the law my in the eyes of god i am your wife interrupted mrs pendle vehemently for over twenty-five years we have been all in all to one another i bear your name i am the mother of your children do you think these things won't outweigh the claims of that wretch who ill-treated and deserted me who lied about his death and extorted money for his forgery to satisfy your scruples i am willing to marry you again but to my mind there is no need even though that brute came back from the grave to create it he amy amy the man is dead i know he is he died thirty years ago don't tell me otherwise i am married to you and my children can hold up their heads with any one if stephen krant had come to me with his villainous tempting i should have defied him scorned him trod him under foot she rose in a tempest of passion and stamped on the carpet 
he would have told he, he would have disgraced us there can be no disgrace in innocence flashed out mrs pendle fierily we married you and i in all good faith he was reported dead you saw his grave i deny that the man came to life you cannot deny facts said the bishop shaking his head can't i i deny anything so far as that wretch is concerned he fascinated me when i was a weak foolish girl as a serpent fascinates a bird he married me for my money and when it was gone his love went with it he treated me like the low-minded brute he was you know he did george you know he did when he was shot in alsace i thanked god i did i did i did hush amy hush said dr pendle trying to soothe her excitement you will make yourself ill no i won't george i am as calm as you are i can't help feeling excited i wished to forget that man and the unhappy life he led me i did forget him in your love and in the happiness of our children it was the sight of that student with a scarred face that made me think of him why oh why did i speak about him to lucy and gabriel why why you were thoughtless my dear i was mad george mad i should have held my tongue but i didn't and my poor boy knows the truth you should have denied it i could not deny it ah you have not a mother's heart i would have denied and lied and swore its falsity on the bible sooner than that one of my darlings should have known of it amy amy you are out of your mind to speak like this i deny what is true i a, a priest a you are a man before everything a man and a father and a servant of the most high rebuked the bishop sternly well you look on it in a different light to what i do you suffered i should not have suffered i don't suffer now i am not going back thirty years to make my heart ache she paused and clenched her hands are you sure that he is dead she asked harshly quite sure dead and buried there can be no doubt about it this time is it necessary that we should marry again absolutely necessary said the bishop decisively then the sooner we get it over the better replied mrs pendle petulantly here she wrenched the wedding ring off her finger take this i have no right to wear it neither maid wife nor widow what should i do with a ring and she began to laugh stop that amy cried the bishop sharply for he saw that after all she was becoming hysterical put the ring again on your finger until such time as i can replace it by another you are Krant's widow and as his widow i shall marry you next week as a drop of cold water let fall into boiling coffee causes the bubbling to subside so did these few stern words cool down mrs pendle's excitement she overcame her emotion she replaced the ring on her finger and again resumed her seat by the bishop my poor dear george said she smoothing his white hair you are not angry with me not angry amy but i am rather vexed that you should speak so bitterly well darling i won't speak bitterly again stephen is dead so do not let us think about him any more next week we shall marry again and all our troubles will be at an end they will please god said the bishop solemnly and oh amy dearest let us thank him for his great mercy do you think he has been merciful asked mrs pendle doubtfully for her religious emotion was not strong enough to blind her to the stubborn fact that their troubles had been undeserved that they were innocent sinners most merciful murmured the bishop bowing his head has he not shown us how to expiate our sin our sin no george i won't agree to that we have not sinned we married in the fullest belief that stephen was dead my dear all that is past and done with let us look to the future and thank the almighty that he has delivered us out of our troubles yes i thank him for that george said mrs pendle meekly enough that is my own dear amy answered the bishop and producing his pocket bible he opened it at random his eye alighted on a verse of jeremiah which he read out with thankful emotion and i will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked and i will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible end of chapter thirty six chapter thirty seven of the bishop's secret by fergus hume 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 37 Dea Ex Machina as may be guessed captain pendle now that the course of true love ran smoother was an assiduous visitor to the jenny wren house he and mab were all in all to one another and in the egotism of their love did not trouble themselves about the doings of their neighbours it is true that george was relieved and pleased to hear of mosk's arrest and confession because gabriel was thereby exonerated from all suspicion of having committed a vile crime but when reassured on this point he ceased to interest himself in the matter he was ignorant that his brother loved bell mosk as neither baltic nor the bishop had so far enlightened him else he might not have been quite so indifferent to the impending trial of the wretched criminal as it was the hot excitement prevalent in Burminster left him cold and both he and mab might have been dwellers in the moon for all the interest they displayed in the topic of the day they lived according to the selfish custom of lovers in an arcadia of their own creation and were oblivious to the doings beyond its borders which disregard was natural enough in their then state of mind however george being in the world and of the world occasionally brought to mab such scraps of news as he thought might interest her he told her of his mother's return of her renewed health of her pleasure in hearing that the engagement had been sanctioned by the bishop and delivered a message to the effect that she wished to see and embrace her future daughter-in-law all of which information gave mab wondrous pleasure and miss whichello a considerable amount of satisfaction since she saw that there would be no further question of her niece's unsuitability for george you deserve some reward for your good news said mab and produced a silk knitted necktie of martial red so here it is dearest cried captain pendle kissing the scarf i shall wear it next to my heart then thinking the kiss wasted on irresponsive silk he transferred it to the cheek of his lady-love nonsense said miss whichello smiling broadly wear it round your neck like a sensible lover are lovers ever sensible inquired the captain with a twinkle i know one who isn't cried mab playfully no sir removing an eager arm you will shock auntie auntie has become hardened to such shocks smiled miss whichello auntie has been as melancholy as an owl of late retorted mab caressing the old lady ever since the arrest of that man mosk she has been quite wretched oh don't speak of him mab hello said george with sudden recollection i knew there was something else to tell you mosk is dead miss whichello gave a faint shriek and tightly clasped the hand of her niece dead she gasped pale-cheeked and low-toned mosk dead as a door-mail rejoined george admiring his present he hanged himself last night with his braces so that the gallows have lost a victim and Burminster society a sensation trial of george cried mab in alarm don't talk so you will make auntie faint and indeed the little old lady looked as though she were on the point of swooning her face was white her skin was cold and leaning back her head she had closed her eyes captain pendle's item of news had produced so unexpected a result that he and mab stared at one another in surprise you shouldn't tell these horrors george my love how was i to know your aunt took an interest in the man i don't take an interest in him protested miss whichello faintly but he killed jentham and now he kills himself it's horrible horrible but necessary assented george cheerfully a man who murders another can't expect to get off scot-free mosk has only done for himself what the law would have done for him i'm sorry for baltic however the missionary why george because this suicide will be such a disappointment to him he has been trying to make the poor devil beg pardon poor wretch repent but it would seem that he has not been successful did he not confess to mr baltic asked miss whichello anxiously i believe so he repented that far do you know what he told him that he had killed jentham and had stolen his money did he say if he had found any papers on jentham's body not that i know of replied george staring why had jentham any particular papers in his possession oh i don't know i can't really say answered miss whichello confusedly and rose unsteadily to her feet 
mab my dear you will excuse me i am not very well i shall go to my bedroom let me come too auntie oh no no miss whichello waved her niece back i wish to be alone and she left the room abruptly without a look at either of the young people they could not understand this strange behaviour mab womanlike turned to captain pendle it is all your fault george talking of murders and suicides i'm awfully sorry said the captain penitently but i thought you would like to hear the news not the police news thank you said mab with dignity why not something to talk about you know you have me to talk about captain pendle oh george sprang forward let us discuss that subject at once you deserve some punishment for calling me out of my name there wicked one george very faintly i shall not allow it you should ask permission waste of time said the practical george and slipped his arm round her waist oh indeed indignantly well i here captain pendle punished her again after which mab said that he was like all men that he ought to be ashamed of himself etc 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 then she frowned then she smiled and finally became a meek and patient grisel to the unfeigned delight of the superior mind so the pair forgot mosk and his wretched death forgot miss whichello and her strange conduct and retreated from the world into their arcadia paradise elysium in which it is best that all sensible people should leave this pair of foolish lovers miss whichello had other things to think of than this billing and cooing she went to her bedroom and lay down for ten minutes or so then she got up again and began pacing restlessly to and fro her thoughts were busy with mosk with his victim with baltic she wondered if jentham had been in possession of certain papers if these had been stolen by mosk if they were now in the pocket of baltic this last idea made her blood turn cold and her heart drum a loud tattoo she covered her face with her hands she sat down she rose up and in a nervous fever of apprehension leaned against the wall then after the manner of those overwrought she began to talk aloud i must tell someone i must have advice she muttered clenching her hands it is of no use seeing mr baltic he is a stranger he may refuse to help me dr graham no he is too cynical the bishop she paused and struck her hands lightly together the bishop i shall see him and tell him all for his son's sake he will help my poor darling having made up her mind to this course miss whichello put on her old-fashioned silk cloak and poke bonnet then she fished a bundle of papers yellow with age out of a tin box and slipped them into her capacious pocket biting her lips and rubbing her cheeks to bring back the colour she glided downstairs stole past the drawing-room door like a guilty creature and in another minute was in the square here she took a passing fly and ordered the man to drive her to the palace as speedily as possible i trust i am acting for the best murmured the little old lady with a sigh i think i am for if bishop pendle cannot help me no one else can after thirty years oh god my poor poor darling in the greek drama when the affairs of the dramatis personae become so entangled by circumstance or fate or sheer folly as to be beyond their capability of reducing them to order those involved in such disorder were accustomed to summon a deity to accomplish what was impossible for mortals to achieve then stepped the god out of a machine to redress the wrong and reward the right to separate the sheep from the goats and to deliver a moral speech to the audience commanding them to note how impossible it was for man to dispense with the guidance and judgment and powerful aid of the olympian hierarchy miss whichello's mission was something similar and although both she and bishop pendle were ignorant that she represented the goddess out of a machine who was to settle all things in a way conducive to the happiness of all persons yet such was the case impelled by fate she sought out the very man to whom her mission was most acceptable and seated face to face with bishop pendle in that library which had been the scene of so many famous interviews she unconsciously gave him a piece of information which put an end to all his troubles she had certainly arrived at the eleventh hour and might just as well have presented herself earlier 
but destiny the playwright of the universe always decrees that her dramas should play their appointed time and never permits her arbitrator to appear until immediately before the fall of the green curtain so far as the Burminster drama was concerned the crucial moment was at hand the actor or rather actress who was to remedy all things was on the scene and shortly the curtain would fall on a situation of the rough made smooth then red fire marriage bells triumphant virtue and cowering guilt with a rhyming tag delivered by the prettiest actress of all's well that ends well i come to consult you confidentially said miss whichello when she and the bishop were alone in the library i wish to ask for your advice my advice and my friendship are both at your service my dear lady replied the courteous bishop it's about mab's parents blurted out the little old lady oh the bishop looked grave you are about to tell me the truth of those rumours which were prevalent in Burminster when you brought miss arden home to your house yes i dare say mrs pansey said all sorts of wicked things about me bishop well no dr pendle wriggled uneasily she spoke rather of your sister than of you i do not wish to repeat scandal miss whichello so let us say no more about the matter your niece shall marry my son be assured of that it is foolish to rake up the past added the bishop with a sigh i must rake up the past i must tell you the truth said miss whichello in firm tones if only to put a stop to mrs pansey's evil tongue what did she say bishop oh, really really my dear lady i bishop tell me what she said about my sister i will know reluctantly the bishop spoke out at this direct request she said that your sister had eloped in london with a man who afterwards refused to marry her that she had a child and that such a child is your niece miss arden whom you brought to Burminster after the death of your unhappy sister a fine mixture of truth and fiction indeed said the old lady in a haughty voice i am obliged to mrs pansey for the way in which she has distorted facts i fear indeed that mrs pansey exaggerates said dr pendle shaking his head with all due respect bishop she is a wicked old sapphira cried miss whichello and forthwith produced a bundle of papers out of her pocket my unfortunate sister annie did run away but she was married to her lover on the very day she left our house in london and my darling mab is as legitimate as your son george dr pendle the bishop winced at this unlucky illustration have you a proof of this marriage miss whichello he asked with a glance at the papers of course i have she replied untying the red tape with trembling fingers here is the certificate of marriage which my poor annie gave me on her dying bed i would have shown it before to all Burminster had i known of mrs pansey's false reports look at it bishop she thrust it into his hand anne whichello spinster pharaoh bosville bachelor they were married at st chad's church hampstead in the month of december eighteen sixty nine here is mab's certificate of birth she was christened in the same church and born in eighteen seventy the year of the franco-german war so as this is ninety-seven she is now twenty-seven years of age just two years older than your son captain pendle with much interest the bishop examined the two certificates of birth and marriage which miss whichello placed before him they were both legally perfect and he saw plainly that however badly bosville might have behaved afterwards to ann bosville she was undoubtedly his wife not that he would have married her if he could have helped it went on miss whichello while the bishop looked at the documents but annie had a little money not much which she was to receive on her wedding day so the wretch married her and wrote to my dear father for the money which of course under grandfather's will had to be paid father never would see annie again but when the poor darling wrote to me a year afterwards that she was dying with a little child by her side what could i do but go and comfort her ah poor darling annie sobbed the little old lady she was sadly changed from the bright beautiful girl i remembered her husband turned out a brute and a ruffian and a spendthrift he wasted all her money and left her within six months of the marriage the wretch annie tried to support herself by needlework but she took cold in her starving condition and broke down 
then mab was born and she wrote to me i went at once bishop but arrived just in time to get those papers and close my dear annie's eyes afterwards i brought mab back with me to Bermondster, but i kept her for some time in london on account of my father when i did bring her here and i showed him the marriage certificate he got quite fond of the little pet so all these years mab has lived with me quite like my own sweet child and your son is a lucky man to win her love added the old maid rather incoherently it is not every one that i would give my dear annie's child to i can tell you bishop so that's the whole story and a sadly common one it is it does you great credit miss whichello said dr pendle patting her hand and i have the highest respect both for you and your niece i am proud my dear lady that she should become my daughter but tell me how your unhappy sister became acquainted with this man he was a violinist replied miss whichello a public violinist and played most beautifully annie heard him and saw him and lost her head over his looks and genius he called himself amaru but his real name was pharaoh bosville a strange name miss whichello it is a gypsy name bishop bosville was a gypsy he learned the violin in hungary or spain i don't know which and played wonderfully afterwards he had an accident which hurt his hand and he could not play that was the reason he married annie just for her money the wretch a gypsy murmured the bishop who had turned pale yes an english gypsy but like all those people he wandered far and near the accident which hurt his hand also marked his cheek with a scar the right cheek gasped dr pendle leaning forward why yes said miss whichello rather astonished at the bishop's emotion that was how i recognized him here when he called himself jentham he with a cry the bishop sprang to his feet in a state of uncontrollable agitation shaking and white was was jentham b b bosville he stammered are are you sure i am certain replied miss whichello with a scared look i have seen him dozens of times bishop her voice rose in a scream for dr pendle had fallen forward on his desk oh my god cried the bishop oh god most merciful the little old lady was trembling violently she thought that the bishop had suddenly gone out of his mind nor was she reassured when he stood up and looked at her with a face down which the tears were streaming never had miss whichello seen a man weeping before and the sight terrified her much more than an outburst of anger would have done she looked at the bishop he looked at her and they were both ashy white both overcome with nervous emotion after a moment the bishop opened a drawer and took out a bundle of papers out of these he selected the marriage certificate of his wife and krant and compared it with the certificate of pharaoh bosville and anne whichello thank god he said again in a tremulous voice this man as bosville married your sister in eighteen sixty nine as krant he married mrs pendle in eighteen seventy married mrs pendle shrieked miss whichello darting forward yes she was a mrs krant when i married her and as her husband was reported dead i believed her to be his widow but she was not his widow no for krant was jentham and jentham was alive after my marriage i don't mean that cried miss whichello laying a finger on her sister's certificate but jentham as bosville married annie in eighteen sixty nine he married my wife in october eighteen seventy said the bishop breathlessly then his second marriage was a false one said miss whichello for in that year in that month my sister was still alive mrs pendle was never his wife no thank god said the bishop clasping his hands she is my own true wife after all End of chapter thirty seven chapter thirty eight of the bishop's secret by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty eight exit mr cargram once informed of the welcome truth dr pendle lost no time in having it verified by documents and extraneous evidence 
this was not the affair of hours but of days since it entailed a visit to st chad's church at hampstead and a rigorous examination of the original marriage and death certificates also as bosville alias Krant, alias jentham was said to be a gipsy on the authority of miss whichello and as the information that baltic was in the confidence of mother jael had trickled through brace and graham to the bishop the last named considered it advisable that the ex-sailor should be informed of the actual truth now that dr pendle was personally satisfied of the legality of his marriage he had no hesitation in acquainting baltic with his life history particularly as the man could obtain from mother jael an assurance in writing if necessary that bosville and jentham were one and the same for the satisfaction of all parties concerned it was indispensable that proof positive should be procured and the matter settled beyond all doubt the position as affecting both the private feelings and social status of bishop and mrs pendle was too serious a one to be dealt with otherwise than in the most circumspect manner after miss whichello's visit and revelation dr pendle immediately sought out his wife to explain that after all doubts and difficulties and lies and forgeries they were as legally bound to one another as any couple in the three kingdoms that their children were legitimate and could bear their father's name and that the evil which had survived the death of its author was now but shadow and wind in a word non-existent mrs pendle who had borne the shock of her pseudo-husband's resurrection so bravely was quite overwhelmed by the good news of her re-established position and fainted outright when her husband broke it to her but for lucy's sake as the bishop did not wish lucy to know or even suspect anything she afterwards controlled her feelings better and relieved from the apprehension of coming danger speedily recovered her health and spirits she was thus at a week's end enabled to attend in the library a council of six people summoned by her husband to adjust the situation the good bishop was nothing if not methodical and thorough and he was determined that the matter of the false and true marriages should be threshed out to the last grain therefore the council was held ex aqueo et bono on this momentous occasion there were present the bishop himself and mrs pendle who sat close beside his chair also miss whichello fluttered and anxious in juxtaposition with dr graham and gabriel who had placed himself near baltic the sedate and solemn-faced when all were assembled the bishop lost no time in speaking of the business which had brought them together he related in detail the imposture of jentham the murder by mosk who since had taken his own life and the revelation of miss whichello ending with the production of the documents proving the several marriages and a short statement explaining the same here said dr pendle is the certificate of marriage between pharaoh bosville and anne whichello dated december eighteen sixty nine they lived together as man and wife for six months up to may eighteen seventy after which bosville deserted the unhappy lady after spending all her money the wretch put in miss whichello angrily bosville continued the bishop had previously made the acquaintance of my wife then amy lancaster under the false name of stephen Cromp, and so far won her love that thinking him a single man she consented to marry him no bishop contradicted mrs pendle very positively he did not win my love he fascinated me with his good looks and charming manners for in spite of the scar on his cheek stephen was very handsome some friend introduced him to my father as a hungarian exile hiding under the name of krant from austrian vengeance and my father enthusiastic on the subject of patriotism admitted him to our house i was then a weak foolish girl and his wicked brilliancy drew me towards him when he learned that i had money of my own he proposed to marry me my father objected but i was infatuated by stephen's arts and became his wife in october eighteen seventy quite so my love assented her husband mildly as an inexperienced girl you were at the mercy of that bilio you were married as you say in october eighteen seventy here to prove that statement is the certificate and the bishop passed it to baltic but at the time of such marriage mrs bosville was still alive miss whichello can vouch for this important fact 
ah that i can sighed the little old lady shaking her head my poor darling sister did not die until january eighteen seventy one and i was present to close her weary weary eyes is not that the certificate of her death you are holding yes answered the bishop simply and gave the paper into her outstretched hand you can now understand my friends he continued addressing the company generally that as mrs bosville was alive in october eighteen seventy the marriage which her husband then contracted with miss lancaster was a false one that is clear enough murmured the attentive baltic nodding it thus appears resumed the bishop concisely that when i married as i thought amy krant a widow in september eighteen seventy one i really and truly wedded amy lancaster a spinster therefore this lady and here the bishop clasped tenderly the hand of mrs pendle is my true dear wife and has been legally so these many years notwithstanding bosville's infamous assertion to the contrary thank god thank god cried mrs pendle with joyful tears gabriel my darling boy and she stretched out her disengaged hand to caress her son gabriel kissed it with unconcealed emotion in the meantime dr graham was examining the bishop's marriage certificate with sharp attention as he thought he espied a flaw pardon me my dear pendle said he in his crisp voice but i see that mrs pendle became your wife under a name which we now know was not then her own does that false name vitiate the marriage by no means replied the bishop promptly i took counsel's opinion on that point when i was in london it is as follows and dr pendle read an extract from a legal-looking document a marriage which is made in ignorance in a false name is perfectly good the law on the subject appears to be this if a person to conceal his or her identity assumes either a wrong name or description so as to practically obtain a secret marriage the marriage is void but if the wrong name or description is adopted by accident or innocently the marriage is good therefore added dr pendle placing the paper on one side mrs pendle was not boswell's wife on two distinct grounds firstly because his true wife was alive when he married her secondly because he fraudulently made her his wife by giving a false name and description regarding my own marriage it is a good one in law because mrs pendle's false name of krant was adopted in all innocence there is no court in the realm of great britain concluded the bishop with conviction that would not uphold my marriage as true and lawful and god be thanked that such is the case god be thanked said gabriel in his turn and said it with heartfelt earnestness graham bubbling over with pleasure jumped up in his restless way and gave a friendly hand in turn to dr pendle and his wife i congratulate you both my dear friends said he not without emotion you have won through your troubles at last and can now live in much deserved peace for the rest of your lives deus nobis hac otia fecit hey bishop you know the mantuan well well you have paid forfeit to the gods pendle and they will no longer envy your good fortune or seek to destroy it graham graham said the bishop with kindly tolerance always these pagan sentiments ay ay i am a pagan suckled in a creed outworn quoted the doctor rubbing his hands well we cannot all be bishops we can all be christians said baltic gravely ah retorted graham what we should be and what we are mr baltic are points capable of infinite discussion at present we should all be smiling and thankful which added he breaking off miss whichello is not i regret to see i am thinking of my poor sister sobbed the old lady how do i know but that the villain did not deceive her also by making her his wife under a false name no madam interposed baltic eagerly bosville was the man's true name therefore he was legally married your sister's husband i wrote down a statement by mother jael that jentham was really pharaoh bosville and at my request she signed the same here it is signed by her and witnessed by me i shall give it to you my lord that you may lock it up safely with those certificates Oh, thank you mr baltic said the bishop taking the slip of paper tendered by the missionary but i trust that uh, that this woman knows little of the truth 
she knows nothing my lord save that bosville for his own purposes took the names of amaru and jentham at different times the rogue was cunning enough to keep his own counsel of his life amongst the gentiles of his marriages false and true mother jael is ignorant set your mind at rest sir she will never trouble you in any way good said dr pendle drawing a long breath of relief then as such is the case my friends i think it advisable that we should keep our knowledge of bosville's iniquities to ourselves i do not wish my son george or my daughter lucy to learn the sad story of the past such knowledge would only vex them unnecessarily and i'm sure i don't want mab to know what a villain her father was broke in miss whichello thank god she is unlike him in every way save that she takes after him in looks when captain pendle talks of mab's rich eastern beauty i shiver all over he little knows that he speaks the truth and that mab has arab blood in her veins not arab blood my dear lady cried graham alertly the gipsies do not come from arabia but as is believed from the north of india they appeared in europe about the fifteenth century calling themselves falsely enough egyptians but both burrow and leland are agreed that i don't want to hear about the gipsies interrupted miss whichello cutting short the doctor's disquisition all i know is that if bosville or jentham or whatever he called himself is a sample of them they are a wicked lot of moabites i wonder the bishop lets his son marry the child of one i do indeed dear miss whichello said mrs pendle putting her arm round the poor lady's neck both the bishop and myself are proud that mab should become our daughter and george's wife and after all she added naively neither of them will ever know the truth i hope not i'm sure wept miss whichello i buried that miserable man at my own expense as he was mab's father and i have had a stone put up to him with his last name jentham inscribed on it so that no one might ask questions which might have been asked had i written his real name no one will ask questions said the bishop soothingly and if they do no answers will be forthcoming we are all agreed on that point quite agreed answered baltic as spokesman for the rest we shall let the dead past bury its dead and god bless the future amen said dr pendle and bowed his grey head in a silence more eloquent than words so far the rough was made smooth with as much skill as could be exercised by mortal brains but after dr pendle had dismissed his friends there yet remained to him an unpleasant task the performance of which in justice to himself could not longer be postponed this was the punishment and dismissal of michael cargrim who indeed merited a little leniency at the hands of the man whose confidence he had so shamefully abused serpents should be crushed traitors should be punished however unpleasant may be the exercise of the judicial function for to permit evil men to continue in their evil doings is to encourage vicious habits detrimental to the well-being of humanity the more just the judge the more severe should he be towards such calculating sinners lest infected by example mankind should become even more corrupt than it is bishop pendle was a kindly man who wished to think the best of his fellow-creatures and usually did so but he could not blind himself to the base and plotting nature of cargrim and for the sake of his family for the well-being of the church for the benefit of the schemer himself he summoned him to receive rebuke and punishment he was not now the patron the benefactor but the judge the ecclesiastical superior severe and impartial cargrim obeyed the summons unwillingly enough as he knew very well that he was about to receive the righteous reward of his deeds a day or so before when lamenting to baltic that dr pendle had proved innocent the man had rebuked him for his baseness and had given him to understand that the bishop was fully aware of the contemptible part which he had acted deserted by his former ally ignorant of dr pendle's secret convinced of mosk's guilt the chaplain was in anything but a pleasant position he was reaping what he had so industriously sown he was caught in his own snare and saw no way of defending his conduct in a word he was ruined and now stood before his injured superior with pale face and hanging head ready to be blamed and sentenced without uttering one word on his own behalf 
nor had he possessed the insolence to do so could he have thought of that one unnecessary word michael said the bishop mildly i have been informed by mr baltic that you accused me of a terrible crime may i ask on what grounds you did so cargrim made no reply but flushing and paling alternately looked shamefaced at the carpet i must answer myself i see continued dr pendle after a short silence you thought that because i met jentham on the heath to pay him some money i murdered him in the viciousness of my heart why should you think so ill of me my poor boy have i not stood in the place of your father have i not treated you as my own son you know that i have and my reward is that these many weeks you have been secretly trying to ruin me even had i been guilty cried the bishop raising his voice it was not your place to proclaim the shame of one who has cherished you if you had such wicked thoughts in your heart why did you not come boldly before me and accuse me to my face i should then have known how to answer you i can forgive malice yes even malice but not deceit did you never think of my delicate wife of my innocent family when plotting and scheming my ruin with a smiling face alas alas michael how could you act in a way so unworthy of a christian of a gentleman what is the use of crying over spilt milk said cargrim doggedly you have the advantage now and can do what you will what do you mean by talking like that said the bishop sternly have the advantage now indeed i never lost the advantage sir so far as you are concerned i did not murder that wretched man for you know that mosk confessed how he shot him for the sake of the money i gave him i knew of jentham in other days under another name and when he asked me for money i gave it to him my reason for doing so i do not choose to tell you mr cargrim it is not your right to question my actions i am not only your elder but your ecclesiastic superior to whom as a priest you are bound to yield obedience that obedience i now exact you must suffer for your sins you can't hurt me returned cargrim with defiance i have no wish to hurt you answered the bishop mildly but for your own good you must be punished and punish you i will so far as lies in my power i am ready to be punished my lord you have the whip hand so i must submit michael michael harden not your heart repent of your wickedness if it is in you to do so i cannot spare you if i would bonis nocet quis quis pepepseret malis that is a true saying which as a priest i should obey and which i intend to obey if only for your own benefit after punishment comes repentance and amendment cargrim scowled it is no use talking further my lord he said roughly as i have acted like a fool i must take a fool's wages you are indeed a fool rejoined the bishop coldly and an ungrateful fool to boot or you would not thus answer one who has your interest at heart but as you take up such a position i shall be brief you must leave my house at once and for very shame i should advise you to leave the church leave the church echoed cargrim in dismay i have said it as a bishop i cannot entrust to a guilty man the care of immortal souls guilty i am guilty of nothing do you call malice falsehood dissimulation nothing you cannot unfrock me for what i have done said cargrim evading a direct reply you may have the will but you have not the power dr pendle looked at him in amazement yours is indeed an evil heart when you can use such language to me he said sorrowfully i see that it is useless to argue with you in your present fallen condition fallen condition my lord yes poor lad fallen not only as a priest but as a man however i shall plead no more go where you will do what you will although i advise you once more not to insult an offended god by offering prayers for others which you need for yourself yet as i am unwilling that you should starve i shall instruct my banker in london to pay you a monthly sum of money until you are beyond want now go michael i am bitterly disappointed in you and by your own acts you have put it out of my power to keep you by my side go repent and pray 
the chaplain with a look of malice on his face walked or rather slunk towards the door you magnify my paltry sins he flung back what of your own great ones dare you wretched man to speak against your spiritual head thundered the bishop starting to his feet vested with the imperious authority of the church go quit my sight lest i cast you out from amongst us go before the blaze of that righteous wrath cargrim livid and trembling crept away like a beaten hound End of chapter thirty eight chapter thirty nine of the bishop's secret by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty nine all's well that ends well bell bell do not give me up i must gabriel it is my duty it is your cruelty ah you never loved me as i love you that is truer than you think my poor boy i thought that i loved you but i was wrong it was your position which made me anxious to marry you it was your weak nature which made me pity you but i do not love you i never did love you and it is better that you should know the truth before we part part oh bell bell part repeated bell firmly and for ever gabriel's head drooped on his breast and he sighed as one long past tears who hears the clods falling on the coffin in which his beloved lies he and bell mosk were seated in the little parlour at the back of the bar and they were alone in the house save for one upstairs in the room of mrs mosk who watched beside the dead on hearing of her husband's rash act the poor wife miserable as she had been with the man yet felt her earlier love for him so far revive as to declare that her heart was broken she moaned and wept and refused all comfort until one night she closed her eyes on the world which had been so harsh and bitter so bell was an orphan bereft of father and mother and crushed to the earth by sorrow and shame in her own way she had loved her father and his evil deed and evil end had struck her to the heart she was even glad when her mother died for she well knew that the sensitive woman would never have held up her head again after the disgrace which had befallen her and bell with a white face and dry eyes long past weeping sat in the dingy parlour refusing the only comfort which the world could give her weary heart poor bell poor pretty bell think gabriel she continued in a hard tearless voice think what shame i would bring upon you were i weak enough to consent to become your wife i had not much to give you before i have less than nothing now i never pretended to be a lady but i thought that as your wife i should never disgrace you that's all past and done with now i always knew you were a true gentleman honourable and kind no one but a gentleman like you would have kept his word with the daughter of a murderer but you have done so dear and i thank and bless you for your kindness the only way in which i can show how grateful i am is to give you back your ring take it gabriel and god be good to you for your upright kindness there was that in her tone which made gabriel feel that her decision was irrevocable he mechanically took the ring she returned to him and slipped it on his finger never again was it removed from where he placed it at that moment and in after days it often reminded him of the one love of his life with a second sigh hopeless and resigned he rose to his feet and looked at the dark figure in the twilight of the room what are your plans bell he asked in an unemotional voice which he hardly recognized as his own i am going away from beorminster next week answered the girl listlessly sir harry has arranged all about this hotel and has been most kind in every way i have a little money as sir harry paid me for the furniture and the stock in trade of course i had to pay f father's debts she could hardly speak the words so there is not much left still i have sufficient to take me to london and keep me until i can get a situation as as a barmaid asked gabriel in a low voice as a barmaid she replied coldly what else am i fit for can i not help you no you have given me all the help you could by showing me how much you respect me i do more than respect you bell i love you 
i am glad of that replied bell softly it is a great thing for a miserable girl like me to be loved bell bell no one can cast a stone at you i am the daughter of a murderer gabriel and i know better than you what the world's charity is do you think i would stay in this place where cruel people would remind me daily and hourly of my father's sin ah oh, my dear i know what would be said and i don't wish to hear it i shall bury my poor mother and go away never to return my poor bell god has indeed laid a heavy burden upon you don't her voice broke and the long absent tears came into her eyes don't speak kindly to me gabriel i can't bear kindness i have made up my mind to bear the worst go away your goodness only makes things the harder for me after all i am only a woman and as a woman i must weep she broke down and her tears flowed quickly i shall go said gabriel feeling helpless for indeed he could do nothing good-bye bell he faltered good-bye she sobbed god bless you gabriel with a sick heart moved slowly towards the door just as he reached it bell rose swiftly and crossing the room threw her arms round his neck weeping as though her overcharged heart would break i shall never kiss you again she wailed never never again god bless you and keep you my poor darling faltered gabriel and god bless you for a good man you have been to me she sobbed and then they parted never to meet again in this world and that was the end of gabriel pendle's romance at first he thought of going to the south seas as a missionary but his father's entreaties that he should avoid so extreme a course prevailed and in the end he went no further from Bermondster than heathcroft vicarage mr lee died a few days after bell vanished from the little county town and gabriel was presented with a living by the bishop he is a conscientious worker an earnest priest a popular vicar but his heart is still sore for bell who so nobly gave him up to bear her own innocent disgrace alone where bell is now he does not know nobody in Bermondster knows not even mrs pansey for she has disappeared like a drop of water in the wild waste ocean of london town and gabriel works on amid the poor and needy with a cheerful face but a sore heart for it is early days yet and his heart wounds are recent no one save the bishop knows how he loved and lost poor bell but mrs pendle with the double instinct of woman and mother guesses that her favourite son has his own pitiful romance and would fain know of it that she might comfort him in his sorrow but gabriel has never told her he will never tell her but go silent and unmarried through life true to the memory of the rough commonplace woman who proved herself so noble and honourable in adversity and so no more of these poor souls it is more pleasant to talk of the whichello pansy war bella matronis detesta saith the latin poet who knew little of the sex to make such a remark to be sure he was talking of public wars and not of domestic or social battles but he should have been more explicit women are born fighters with their tongues and an illustration of this truth was given in Bermondster when miss whichello threw down the gauge to mrs pansey the little old lady knew well enough that when george and mab were married the archdeacon's widow would use her famous memory to recall the scandal she had set afloat nearly thirty years before therefore to defeat mrs pansey once and for all she called on that good lady and dared her to say that there was any disgrace attached to mab's parentage mrs pansey anticipating an easy victory shook out her skirts and was up in arms at once i know for a fact that your sister anne did not marry the man she eloped with cried mrs pansey shaking her head viciously who told you this fact demanded miss whichello indignantly i i can't remember at present but that's no matter it's true it is not true and you know it is an invention of your own spiteful mind mrs pansey my sister was married on the day she left home and i have her marriage certificate to prove it i showed it to bishop pendle because you poisoned his mind with your malicious lies and he is quite satisfied oh any story would satisfy the bishop sneered mrs pansey we all know what he is we do an honourable christian gentleman 
and we all know what you are, a scandal-mongering, spiteful, soured cat. Hoity-toity, fine language, this. It is the kind of language you deserve, ma'am. All your life you have been making mischief with your vile tongue. Woman, roared Mrs. Pansy, white with wrath, no one ever dared to speak like this to me. It's a pity they didn't, then, retorted the undaunted Miss Whichello. It would have been the better for you, and for Berminster also. Would it indeed, ma'am, gasped her adversary, beginning to feel nervous. Oh, really, with a hysterical titter, you and your certificate, I don't believe you have it. Ask the bishop if I have not. He is satisfied, and that is all that is necessary, you wicked old woman. You, you leave my house. I shall do no such thing. Here I am, and here I'll stay, until I speak my mind. And Miss Whichello thumped the floor with her umbrella, while she gathered breath to continue. I haven't the certificate of my sister's marriage, haven't I? I'll show it to you in a court of law, Mrs. Pansy, when you are in the dock. The dock, ma'am! Me, in the dock! screeched Mrs. Pansy, shaking all over, but more from fear than wrath. How, how dare you! I dare anything to stop your wicked tongue. Everybody hates you. Some people are fools enough to fear you, but I don't," cried Miss Whichello, erecting her crest. No, not a bit. One word against me or against Mab, and I'll have you up for defamation of character, as sure as my name's Selina Whichello. I, I, I don't want to say a word, mumbled Mrs. Pansy, beginning to give way, after the manner of bullies, when bravely faced. You had better not. I have the bishop and all Berminster on my side, and you'll be turned out of the town if you don't mind your own business. Oh, I know what I'm talking about, and Miss Whichello gave a crow of triumph like a victorious bantam. I am not accustomed to this, this violence, sniffed Mrs. Pansy, producing her handkerchief. If you, if you don't go, I'll call my servants. Do, and I'll tell them what I think of you. I'm going now. Miss Whichello rose briskly. I've had my say out, and you know what I intend to do if you meddle with my affairs. Good day, Mrs. Pansy, and good-bye, for it's a long time before I'll ever cross words with you again, ma'am. And the little old lady marched out of the room with all the honours of war. Mrs. Pansy was completely crushed. She knew quite well that Miss Whichello was speaking the truth about the marriage, and that none of her own inventions could stand against the production of the certificate. Moreover, she could not battle against the Bishop of Berminster, or risk a realization of Miss Whichello's threat to have her into court. On the whole, the archdeacon's widow concluded that it would be best for her to accept her defeat quietly and hold her tongue. This she did, and never afterwards spoke anything but good about young Mrs. Pendle and her aunt. She even sent a wedding present, which was accepted by the victor as the spoils of war, and was so lenient in her speeches regarding the young couple that all Berminster was amazed, and wished to know if Mrs. Pansy was getting ready to join the late archdeacon. Hitherto the old lady had stormed and bullied her way through a meek and terrified world but now she had been met and conquered and utterly overthrown. Her nerve was gone, and with it went her influence. Never again did she exercise her venomous tongue. To use a vulgar but expressive phrase, Mrs. Pansy was wiped out. Shortly before the marriage of George and Mab, the tribe of gypsies over which Mother Jael ruled vanished into the nowhere. Whither they went nobody knew, and nobody inquired, but their disappearance was a relief both to Miss Whichello and the bishop. The latter had decided that, to run no risks, it was necessary Mab should be married under her true name of Bosville, and as Mother Jael knew that such was Jentham's real name, Miss Whichello fancied she might come to hear that Mab was called so, and make inquiries likely to lead to unpleasantness. But Mother Jael went away in a happy moment, so Miss Whichello explained to her niece and George that the name of the former was not Arden, but Bosville. It is necessary that I should tell you this, dear, on account of the marriage, said the little old lady. Your parents, my dearest Mab, are dead and gone, but your father was alive when I took you to live with me, and I called you by another name so that he might not claim you. He was not a good man, my love. 
never mind aunty cried mab embracing the old lady i don't want to hear about him you are both my father and my mother and i know that what you say is right i suppose she added turning shyly to george that captain pendle loves miss bosville as much as he did miss arden a rose by any other name and all the rest of it replied george smiling what does it matter my darling you will be mab pendle soon so that will settle everything even your meek husband george said miss bosville solemnly if there is one word in the english language which does not describe you it is meek really and if there is one name in the same tongue which fits you like a glove it is guess angel cried mab promptly george laughed near it said he but not quite what i mean the missing word will be told when we are on our honeymoon in this way the matter was arranged and mab as miss bosville was married to captain pendle on the selfsame day at the selfsame hour that lucy became lady brace if some remarks were made on the name inscribed in the register of the cathedral few people paid any attention to them and those who did received from miss whichello the same skilful explanation as she had given the young couple moreover as mother jael was not present to make inquiries and as mrs pansey had not the courage to hint at scandal the matter died a natural death but when the honeymoon was waning mab reminded george of his promise to supply the missing word is it goose she asked playfully no my sweetest though it ought to be replied george pinching his wife's pretty ear it is mab pendle and he kissed her brisk dr graham was at the double wedding in his most amiable and least cynical mood he congratulated the bishop and mrs pendle shook hands warmly with the bridegroom and just as warmly on the basis of a lifelong friendship kissed the brides and after the wedding breakfast at which he made the best speech he had an argument with baltic about his penal conception of christianity the ex-sailor had been very mournful after the suicide of mosk as the rash act had proved how shallow had been the man's repentance but what can you expect said graham to him it is impossible to terrify people into a legitimate belief in religion i don't want to do that sir replied baltic soberly i wish to lead them to the throne with love and tenderness i can hardly call your method by such names my friend you simply ruin people in this life to fit them in their own despite for their next existence when all is lost doctor men seek god perhaps but that's a shabby way of seeking him if i could not be converted of my own free will i certainly shouldn't care about being driven to take such a course your system my friend is ingenious but impossible i have yet to prove that it is impossible doctor hm i dare say you'll succeed in gaining disciples said graham with a shrug there is no belief strange enough for some men to doubt after mormonism and joseph smith's deification i am prepared to believe that humanity will go to any length in its search after the unseen no doubt you'll form a sect in time mr baltic if so call your disciples hobsonites why dr graham because the gist of your preaching so far as i can understand is a hobson's choice retorted the doctor when your flock of criminals lose everything through your exposure of their crimes they have nothing left but religion nothing left but god you mean sir and god is everything no doubt i agree with the latter part of your epigram baltic although your god is not my god there is only one god doctor true my friend but you and i see him under different forms and seek him in different ways our goal is the same precisely and that undeniable fact does away with the necessity of further argument good-bye mr baltic i am glad to have met you original people always attract me and with a handshake and a kindly nod the little doctor bustled off so in his turn baltic departed from Bermondster and lost himself in the roaring tides of london it is yet too early to measure the result of his work to prognosticate if his peculiar views will meet with a reception likely to encourage their development into a distinct sect but there can be no doubt that his truth and earnestness will some day and perhaps at no very distant date meet with their reward every prophet convinced of the absolute truth of his mission succeeds in finding those to whom his particular view of the hereafter is acceptable beyond all others 
So, after all, Baltic the untutored sailor may become the founder of a sect. What his particular ism will be called it is impossible to say, but taking into consideration the man's extraordinary conception of Christianity as a punishing religion, the motto of his new faith should certainly be Cernit omnia Deus Vindex. And Baltic can find the remark cut and dried for his quotation in the last pages of the English dictionary. So the story is told, the drama is played, and Bishop Pendle was well pleased that it should be so. He had no taste for excitement or for dramatic surprises, and was content that the moving incidents of the last few weeks should thus end. He had been tortured sufficiently in mind and body. He had, in Dr. Graham's phrase, paid his forfeit to the gods in expiation of a too happy fortune. Therefore he might now hope to pass his remaining days in peace and quiet. George and Lucy were happily married, Gabriel was close at hand to be a staff upon which he could lean in his old age, and his beloved wife, the companion of so many peaceful years, was still his wife, nearer and dearer than ever. When the brides had departed with their several grooms, when the wedding guests had scattered to the four winds of heaven, Bishop Pendle took his wife's hand within his own and led her into the library. Here he sat him down by her side, and opened the book of all books, with reverential thankfulness of soul. I called upon thy name, O Lord, out of the low dungeon. Thou drewest near in the day that I called upon thee, thou saidst, Fear not. And the words, to these so sorely tried of late, were as the dew to the thirsty herb. End of chapter 39 End of the Bishop's Secret by Fergus Hume